Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Are you still there? I believe that interpolation is hardly rhetorical, Mr. Spade. To what have you been up, if you'll pardon the expression? And has that girl regained her facilities? I uh, wouldn't know, but her uh, faculties are as good as ever, if you'll pardon the expression. Mr. Spade, sometimes I think you're a regular philanthropist. Don't you mean philanderer? How much money did you make out of that case? Well, I uh, broke even, anyway. That's what I mean. You're a philanthropist. Well, you know best, Bernadine. By the way, was that man really murdered with the bus saw, or was that just publicity? He really was, Bernadine. Why? There just happened to be one lying around. Oh, I don't mean that. Why was he killed? For the wheel of life. Oh. You're not going to ask what that is? Some curio, no doubt. Listen, Bernadine, the wheel of life is, uh... Oh, well. I suppose I don't have to tell you to stay where you are. Just sit quietly with your book in your hand, and I'll be right down to dictate my report on the wheel of life caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Come on, mister, give the gals a break. Treat them to a look-see at a really handsome head of hair, neat, well-groomed hair, the way yours is going to look when you spruce up with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Famous Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. So, how about it, men? Why hold off any longer when now's the time to get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic? Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. I went down to St. James Infirmary to see my baby there. Ready, Bernadine, little flower? I'm way ahead of you. Keep it clean. No more than three erasures per page. Okie dokie? Oak. I mean doke. I mean date. Oh, I'd love to. July 11, 1948. To uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco police. Subject, the uh, wheel of life caper. Now, don't go away, Bernadine. I don't know why these things always have to happen to me. Under private detectives in the San Francisco Classified Directory, there are listed somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 agencies, several with large display ads. But somehow she managed to find me. It's all so strange, Mr. Spade. I hardly know where to begin. Well, the beginning is always a pretty good place to start, Miss O'Farrell. Yes, the beginning. It was like waking out of a nightmare you can't remember. Everything seemed out of proportion. Even the buildings along the street seemed to be leaning at a crazy angle. And then I realized I was traveling down a hill. I looked wildly around for something to help me get my bearings, and there was a street sign, O'Farrell, stuck in my mind, so I gave it to your secretary when she asked for my name. Uh Uh-huh. And what's your real name? I don't know. I don't know who I am, where I came from, or where I'm going. Mr. Spade, I'm so frightened. Uh, Now, wait a minute. A lot of people suffer from uh, temporary loss of memory. Uh, Most of them recover But amnesia is a sickness, and I am not a doctor. Oh, and you won't even try to help me? Well, I can give you the name of a good head doctor right here in the building. There's also uh, missing persons. But I'm not a missing person. I'm right here. Yeah, I mean, where you aren't, somebody might be missing you, Nespa. But the police! Oh, I'd rather not. I I might be wanted for some crime. How do I know? You sure you want to find out? Oh, yes, I do. I do. It's terrible not knowing. But I want to find out for myself. Can't you understand that? What do you think I can do for you? You might save my life. From what? 
I'll try to tell you exactly how it happened. First, I looked at my watch. It was three minutes past ten. The cable car stopped at the corner and a man got on. I, I couldn't remember ever having seen him before, but then I couldn't remember anything. He sat down beside me and he caught hold of my arm. I tried to pull away. Well, you can see the marks where he... Yeah. Well, who was he? He acted as if I were... I think I know what you mean. Did you uh, find out who he was? No, no, I was too frightened to speak. What did he say? He sort of growled it out of the side of his mouth, but it sounded as if he said, Lathrop wants to see you. Mm-hmm. You remember anybody named Lathrop? I can't remember anything before three minutes past ten this morning. Well, let's go on with since then. The guy grabbed you, said somebody named Lathrop wanted to see you, and then what? Well, I-, I went into a panic. I managed to jerk away from him, and I jumped off the moving car, and then I looked in the classified section, and I found you. Why me? Well, I don't know. The name, I guess. A spade to dig up my past. Please, Miss O'Farrell. <laughs> Do you think I'm very silly? No, I think you're very beautiful. I wish you could remember whether you're married or not. Oh, no. Well, at least I have no wedding ring. Uh, what have you got? I mean, besides what's visible. Well, I couldn't find much of anything. I went over my clothing. There don't seem to be any, seem to be any marks of any kind. Mm-hmm. Well, you got any money? Uh, a little over $300. Let's have it. The purse, too. All right. Uh huh. Lipstick, aspirin, bobby pins, Kleenex. Uh, nothing here. They couldn't have been bought in any drugstore. <sighs> powder. <coughs> hey, what kind of powder is this? Uh, then there was this in my coat pocket. A match folder. Sailor's Rest Bar, Hotel Calcutta, eleven hundred Embarcadero. Little number written inside. One twenty. What's that? A room number? I don't know. My purse. You have to destroy. It. Here's ten dollars of your own money. Buy a new one. Well. Did you find something? Coin, Chinese bit. Good luck piece, probably sewn in by whoever made it, maybe in China. That, uh, ring any bells? Mm, no. No, I'm afraid not. Shoe. What? Your right shoe. Let's see it. Take it off. Uh, you aren't going to tear it up the way you did the purse, are you? Uh, dust. Plaster dust. Is that a clue? I don't know, is it? I'm not a detective. Well, you are in this case, baby. If it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't mean anything. Well, it doesn't. That's everything. What am I going to do? Well, let me see. First, we better give you a name. Oh, Farrell's all right. You look like, uh, well, uh, Lana would do, but, oh, well, that's in use. Uh, how about, uh, Poppy for forgetfulness? Poppy O'Farrell. <laughs> that's a funny name. Oh, no, you think so? Huh? Uh, I think I like it. You do? I think I like you, too. I liked her, too. There may have been blanks in her brain, but the rest of her figured. In the elevator, I started adding it up, and by the time we reached the street floor, it came to quite a tidy sum. Where are we going, Sam? Far, I hope. But uh, first, we're going to find you a place to stay. Oh, yes, we must be practical. No use overdoing it, huh? Oh, no, Sam, I didn't mean... <gasps> Wait... What's the matter? You remember something? That man, the one who followed me this morning, he's standing right out there waiting. The one in the straw hat leaning against the newsstand? Yes. Where are you going, Sam? You stay here. I just remembered something I hoped I could forget. Hello, Shuggy. What brings you back to town? Do I know you? That doesn't matter. I know you. The name you were using when you blew this town was Shuggy Bellows. You wouldn't take the risk of showing your face here again unless the caper was worth it. You've got a big nose. Keep it clean. You've been tailing that girl all day. Why? Damn what damn. Who's Lathrop? I don't remember. Okay, I'll give you a chance to think it over. Hey, officer! You dirty hey, shamash yelling no, down. No, no, you don't. Come here. Here, here what's going on here? Break it up. <coughs> oh, oh, Mr. Spade. Hey, is this fella giving you trouble now? Yeah, what kind of a beat are you pounding here, Clancy? Letting a cheap grifter like this walk around with an armpit full of gun? Or are they handing out permits to characters like these this day? Uh, these well, days? now, uh, how about that, son? Uh, have you a permit now? And a goop, copper. Oh, so, one of them clever lads he is. What? Well, Come along, me bucko, before I lose me temper and give you your lumps out. Okay, okay, I'm coming. That's better now. Uh, much obliged, Mr. Spade. I'll pay you for this, Thomas. And I goop to you, too. I was sure he would, but I was also sure that I wouldn't have to worry about him for the rest of the night. I checked Poppy O'Farrell in at the Belvedere, locked her in her room, and told Tiny Stover, the house dick, to keep an eye on her. When I left him, he was, and uh, he seemed to be enjoying his work. Then I headed for the Embarcadero. (laughs) 
I found the Hotel Calcutta, but I couldn't find the lobby. There wasn't any. It had been squeezed out by the sailor's rest bar. So I tried the bosun-type bartender. Howdy, mate. You, you got business aboard? Yeah, where do I find the purser? He went ashore. All the officers went ashore except the janitor. He's passed out in his bunk. Oh, uh-huh. how about the passengers? Uh, you're in the thick of them right now. They spend most of their time and their money right here. Uh, which one belongs to 120? Uh, you a dick? Yeah, but I got ten bucks. Well, what I can tell you ain't worth it, but thanks anyway. He stayed in his cabin. I only saw him at once. That's when he went ashore. I says to the deck steward, that's room clerk to you, who's a general. He says, name of Coralinko. I noticed him because he was a real creep, see? Six foot four, a solid brass. His head stuck up in the air, and he didn't move nothing from his stern to his shoulders. A real Frankenstein. Hey, do I keep a ten? Yeah. Do I get a look at his room? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Who's stopping you? So I went. Nobody stopped me until I opened the door to 120. Then I stopped myself. It was an inside room with one small window and an air shaft. But it looked as if a flurry of snow had blown in. The floor and the rest of the flat surfaces were sprinkled with a fine, dirty white powder. It wasn't snow, it was dust. Plaster dust. Like the stuff I'd found in Poppy's handbag and on her shoes. I shook the place down, not expecting to find anything. I didn't until I opened the wardrobe. the body of a well-dressed ship surgeon, but his uniform was rumpled, torn, and bloodstained. From the look of him, his throat had been cut. I wondered if Poppy would be able to jog her memory that far back. When I found the murder weapon, I hoped she couldn't. I really did. It was not a knife. It was not even a razor. It was an electric buzzsaw. That tore it. Makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Wheel of Life caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Times being what they are, I could use a little publicity. And so could you, Lieutenant Dundee, what with the elections coming up and you with no promotion all these years. This one time, I got it instead of you and wished I hadn't. The morning papers called it the buzzsaw murder and went on shamelessly from there. Horror killing related by private eye. Stan Slade, ex-Pinkerton man, mum on Mystery Woman. Elderly sleuth, dodges photographers, denies hotel visit, was in bed with Apple and Good Book, says Peeper. There wasn't a word of truth in it, mainly because nobody could get at the facts. I wasted most of the day down at headquarters trying to find out what name Shuggy Bellows had been booked under. Then I dropped in at the Belvedere. Poppy had checked out. I decided to go back to my office and drink poison. I hardly got the desk drawer open when a sobering influence walked in. It was a Mr. Six Feet Four of Solid Brass. The Frankenstein who had been described to me by the bartender as the occupant of room 120. Excuse me. I am Korlenko. Please, I shall sit down. I am so heavy. Make yourself at home. Oh. 
Mr. Swade. Uh, Swade. Uh, uh, excuse me. I am so heavy. I, I am Korlenko. So you told me. I am really Spade myself. So, why are she hiding from me? Who? That girl, Miss Paget. Her, I am paying one month in advance, $300 American. Me, she have dessert. I am not rich, only moderately wealthy. But you understand, it's not a question from money yes, alone. That ship's doctor, he was most kind to me. He cared to me even after I arrive. Now he are dead for his pains, his dirty trick. Yeah, 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 I know how you feel. Now, if you'll uh, take it a little easy, I think we'll get farther. You say this girl's name is uh, Paget, and she traveled with you. Uh, from Macau, da. Uh, where she is the Florence Nightingale for Portuguese hospitals, forcing me to employ her, all others being Chinese nuns. That figures. You were uh, sick? No, only I am so heavy, they are breaking my back in traffic accident, a uh, rickshaw collusion. You're uh, wearing a plastic cast? Yes, like a turtle, I am close with my neck sticking out. Look, see? Now it is better as before. The ship's doctor trimmed the rough edges with buzz saw. Buzz, 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 I can walk. But it's like suit from armor, for which I alive. Look. I looked again where he opened his shirt front, exposing the gray-white shell of plaster that surrounded his trunk from collarbone to hips. In a six-inch circle over the left side of his chest, I counted four bullet gouges. I dug one of the slugs out and examined it. It was 32 caliber. The plastic cast, which was molded to the shape of his body, was no more than an inch thick. I didn't see how it had stopped the slugs, but it had. About then, the parts of Korolenko that were not held rigid in the cast began to tremble violently. Why are they doing this? Why? To a virtually helpless man. Why, Mr. Spade? Why? 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 Uh, where did you have that cast put on? Don't I said Macau? The Portuguese hospital there? The same. They are hanging me up with the neck and plastering me. Comes a great pain, they put me to sleep from anesthetic. I, I are waking up in ambulance arriving at shipboard. Why you wish I should tell you my operation? More important things we should be discussing. Yeah, I think so, too. I think Miss Paget and her friends had something they wanted to smuggle out of Macau and into San Francisco, and you're it. Oh, excuse me. I, I am not comprehensible. Look, I mean, while you were out with the anesthetic... They uh, planted the goods, whatever they are, in or under your cast. Oh, oh, that is why I am so heavy. The wheel, the wheel. The what? The wheel. Look, I show you. He hauled a manila envelope out of his overcoat pocket and waved it on my face. I took it over to my desk and fished out the contents. It was a set of X-ray films. Three of his spine showing the fractures, four of the skull, three I couldn't figure out, and one of his rib cage. Only something new had been added. In silhouette, it looked like the wheel off of a child's wagon. What is it, this wheel? What to do? What to do? Six months, I must remain in this straight jacket. If I remove it, I die. If I keep it on, it, they kill me to get their smuggled. Well, you look to me like the luckiest man alive. That wheel or whatever it is saved your life by stopping four slugs. But still, I shall die. How shall I die? When shall I die? Your best advices, please. Korolenko, I think you'd better die right now. Excuse me? It's the only safe place for you. The morgue. I called my friend Maxie the morgue man, gave him pitch number 137596. He agreed to play along. An hour later, I stood on the curb, head bowed, hat in hand, as the morgue wagon drove away into the gathering mist. Stay facing away, uh. What do you want, Shuggy? I want to blast this gun straight through you, and I will if you give me any excuse at all. You sound like you mean that, Shuggy. You're getting smart, Shamus. Now get going. Where to? Mr. Lathrop wants to see you. Shuggy, dear boy, you've not failed me this time. This will be the fabled Mr. Spade, eh? Come in, come in, come in. Ah, sit down, Mr. Spade. 
We'll talk. Tell your guns to get that pistol out of my ribs. Oh, yes, indeed, Sugar. You mustn't overdo it. And get him out of here. I'm tired and nervous, and my price goes up a thousand bucks every minute he's in this room. When I get to ten thousand, I kill him. Then the price jumps to a hundred to take care of me on a murder rap. I should ought to plug you downstairs. Come, come, Sugar. Don't be ungracious. You wait in the other room now. Okay, it's your party. I'll get mine later. <laughs> oh, dear. His bite's much worse than his bark, Mr. Spade. Don't start boring me so early in the evening. I came here to talk about the wheel. Oh, so you know about the wheel. I do better than that. I've got it. That may well be, but uh, do you know what to do with it? I got two possibilities. I can turn it over to the cops and you with it, or I can sit on it until it hatches. <laughs> A quaint conceit, sir. Round and round the little wheel goes, and where it shall stop, nobody knows. That's where you're wrong. It stops right here. So you better start placing your bets. Yeah, just what do you mean by that, sir? There's part of it. What is it? It's one of the slugs your guns will throw at Korolenko. I got three more just like it that I dug out of him before he was carried to the morgue. Well, huh. an advantage, I'll admit. But uh, hardly worth your while to take advantage of. Don't be too sure of that. Just uh, how much do you know about the wheel? So far, it's been worth two human lives to you at the risk of your own. That tells me all I need to know. Oh, no, not quite. Men have been killed in hold-ups for a few paltry sovereigns, but the wheel oh, is a horse of another color. Well, let's not change wheel horses in midstream, Mr. Lathrop. <laughs> yes. You must understand that the wheel has no absolute finitive value. Uh, monetarily speaking, the British Museum might pay close on to 5,000 pounds, hot as it is for the privilege of returning it. <laughs> Occidentals aren't the puka saibs that they once were in the Orient. The theft of the wheel, if countenanced by the Western powers, would have most grave consequences. Most grave. Uh, are you attending, sir? Wake me up when you get to the point. Ah, well, the point, sir, is this. That little wheel, that little wheel of gold, is the wheel of life, which the Buddha himself is said to have received into his hands from paradise. Now, given such a relic, a few old Buddhist monks can set up a shrine which even in the most miserable surroundings can attract enough pilgrims to outgross Radio City, Madison Square Garden, and Miami Beach in season. To say nothing of Hialeah. Uh, yes, quite. In short, we propose to act as booking agents for the wheel on a royalty basis with the percentage of the house. Mm -hmm. Why did you bring it to San Francisco? But good God, sir. Were we to bargain in the Orient, we should be hacked to pieces in our beds. I'll settle for a lump sum and let you do the bargaining. Uh, and uh, your price, sir? We can talk money later. First, I got to give the cops somebody for the doctor's murder and for Korolenko. Uh -huh. Well, that ought not to be too difficult. Uh, when may I expect delivery? I'll check on it. I went out to St. James Infirmary. <laughs> City Mark. Maxie, Sam Spade. Yeah, Sammy. Uh, deal's okay. Send it up. The address is... Sam, the... Sam, wait. Yeah? Sam, he ain't here no more. What happened? Somebody claimed him. A girl. Eh, said she's his daughter. What did he do? When I'm playing dead like you told him to. Maxie, where did she send him? Uh, Avalon Mortuary, corner of Lynch and Hate. Okay, uh... Uh, by the way... Uh, yes, Sammy? Uh, Maxie, put some clean sheets in that morgue wagon, size 16. I may be your next passenger. At the Avalon Mortuary, the night watchman let me in. He said Mr. Korolenko's daughter had brought an overnight bag and was keeping a vigil by his beer in slumber room number seven. I approached on tiptoe. Just as I reached the door... I heard the most terrible sound I've ever heard. It was a buzzsaw biting into plaster. How deep, I didn't like to think. I did the first thing that popped into my head. I grabbed up a lamp from a console, smashed the bulb, and plunged it into a vase of flowers. As luck would have it, slumber room number seven was on the same fuse box. As luck would not have it, I was facing a desperate woman in the dark. I hugged the carpet while she emptied her gun. I hoped she didn't have a spare. I forgot about the buzzsaw. The room lighted up momentarily from the lights inside my head, and I staggered back against the wall. I waited for her to get her bearings again. There was no hope of me getting mine. Then I heard a big, hollow thud. The whole room shook, and the lights went on. Poppy O'Farrell and or Paget lay on the floor under the stony weight of Coralenko plus 60 pounds of plaster. Get up! Get up, you... Oh, 
crushing me. I can't. I am so heavy. You, uh, you comfortable there, Korolenko? Comfortable in such situation? Do you ask the turtle, are he comfortable? Is Faker on bed of nails? Is equally here as elsewhere. Yeah, okay, okay. Just, just hold her there until I get a statement. And he did. Item, statement by the aforesaid. It was like waking out of a nightmare you can't remember. Everything seemed out of proportion. That was Even her story, was and I had to admire the way she stuck to it. But if you keep trying, I'm sure she'll get back enough of her memory to confess that she planted the wheel of life in Korolenko's turtle shell when she decided to double-cross Shuggy and Lathrop. They never tumbled to her hiding place. They were gunning for Korolenko because they thought Poppy was working with him, which was true in a way, but not the way that they thought. That's why they tortured the doctor in an effort to learn Kay's whereabouts. I understand your boys have picked up the rest of the trio, and they can tell you everything except why I conceived the brilliant idea of having Korolenko play dead. Between you and me, uh, amnesia's a handy little gadget to have around, Dundee. I'm trying to draw a few strategic blanks myself. Period. End of report. Pardon me, Mr. Spade. Yes. There are just a few little coincidentals that I do not find entirely reprehensible. Such, uh, such as? Well, I don't want to appear lucid or anything of that type. Believe but... me, you doesn't. I mean, don't it? Oh, you say the sweetest thing. Mm. Uh, but it's about the wheel. Oh, yes, the wheel. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You type that up. I've got to call in about that now. <laughs> Tonight, when you're making out your must-do list for tomorrow, why not include a reminder to get Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair? Honestly, men, you'll be delighted with the neat, natural way Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair, the way it relieves that annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Just try it and see if I'm not giving you a good steer. Make a note right now to call at your drug or toilet goods counter for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Uh, did you assert in the lowdown on the Wheel of Life? I certainly didn't. No, we won't know about that for six months. <laughs> because definitively, I mean definitely, that plastic cast has to stay on them. Doctor's orders, you know. Oh, but I won't be here six months from now. You can say that again. But I won't be here six months from now. Stop repeating yourself. But you just said you can say that again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just as distinctly as if I was sitting here. Uh-huh. That's what I like about you, Bernadine. A, a woman of distinction. That's what you are. Well, if you want to take me dancing, why don't you just say so? Oh, Bernadine. It's leap year, and I always say discrimination is the better part of value. You are absolutely corrupt. Well, I'm glad I'm right about something. Good night, Mr. Spade. Good night, and I'll say if it kills me, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spears' absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away If you're thinking of volunteering for the US Army or Air Force, here's a word of reassurance. As an Army and Air Force man, you'll become a skilled professional in a specialized field. The training you get will always be useful, not only in military, but in civilian life as well. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Uh, This is Sam, Blackleg Spade, the third most dangerous gambler on the Barbary Coast. Oh, Sam, not horses again. Horses, women, and the gaming tables, Effie, the the versions of the elite. Well, divert yourself with this, Sam. The phone company has sent the pink notice. Uh Aha, pay it no mind, sweetheart. We are healed. We have hit the cashier's cage, annexed the pot, broken the bank, and we're standing on velvet. Sam, are you sober? Uh, definitely velvet. Hmm, warm, too. Sam, from where are you calling from? You're wrong, Effie. It's a drugstore. Stay where you are. I'll be right down to deal out my report on the hot hundred grand caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. It's smart to buy things the whole family can use, isn't it? That's why I say it's smart to buy Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. To mom, to dad, to the children, Wild Root Cream Oil is really a friend indeed. Non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil with lanolin grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. I hope you have a big family-sized bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil in your home. Get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Date, uh, September 19, 1948, to uh, robbery detail, San Francisco Police, Attention Sergeant Walsh. Uh, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596, uh, dear Joe. Here's the rundown on that hot hundred grand. It started pleasantly enough when my secretary, Miss Effie Perrine, cute little mouse, eased into my private office, closed the door behind her, and leaned back against it with that air of pained resignation, which generally means there's a customer outside that she doesn't approve of, but that I'll see her anyway. It's up to you, Sam. She's very well dressed, and I imagine she can afford you. How do you uh, deduce that? Well, she dropped her purse. I didn't get time to count it all, but there was a hundred-dollar bill on top. Well, sure, in, Effie. Sam. Go ahead, say it. Oh, I don't know, Sam. Sometimes, well, does just money... No. No, that's one of the reasons I hire you. What's the matter with it? Nothing. That's just it, Sam. She's very Mm good-looking, cultivated, and very kind and considerate. And she seems sincerely troubled. You mean her act is a little too good? I felt that too, Sam. Thanks, Angel. I'll keep that in mind. Tell her to come in. All right, Sam. Mr. Spade will see you, Mrs. Kilcourse. Thank you. Thank you for seeing me, Mr. Spade. My pleasure. Uh, Won't you sit down? Oh, thank you. I'm Lorraine Kilcourse, Mr. Spade. It's about my husband, Leonard Kilcourse. Husband? Oh. We've only been married a short time. It was a quiet ceremony at the San Cedro Mission. Mm -hmm. Leonard didn't want to subject me to any publicity. The difference in our ages, you know? You mean you want me to keep it a secret? Oh, no. No, except for the newspapers, of course. Naturally, all of Leonard's friends know. Well, he doesn't have many from what I've heard. I've thought it strange, too, that such a prominent man should have such a small circle of acquaintances. I met him only a short time before I married him. He's been very kind and absolutely devoted to me and... I suppose I should feel ashamed of myself for for coming to you. But there are so many things about him that are mysterious that I... Sometimes I... I I can't seem to find my handkerchief. Here. Kleenex. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I uh, take it you're not a San Francisco girl. No. No, I met him at a dude ranch. Well, uh, maybe I can clear up some of your mysteries for free. The reason your husband doesn't have many friends is because they keep dropping dead. I don't understand you. 
Oh, forget it. He's a big public servant. He's built a lot of sidewalks. The streets of this city are paved with his good intentions. His name is on a thousand manhole covers. If the names of his former business associates land on headstones, it's nothing to me. I got my own racket. Well, what? I think my husband is paying blackmail to someone. Uh Uh-huh. And upon what do you base your suspicions, Mrs. K? It started about a month ago. He began withdrawing large sums from our joint account. First it was 10000 then then 20000 and last week, 50000 mm-hmm. and, and this morning, he closed out the balance of the account. $100,000. Yeah, well, he's got it to spend, Mrs. Kilcoy. Well, I, I won't pretend the money doesn't interest me, but what's behind it, Mr. Spade? Each time he withdraws these cash sums, he, he leaves the house without a word to me. And sometimes doesn't return until dawn. My husband is not fond of nightlife, Mr. Spade. Only a desperate situation could induce him to leave the house after dark. Yeah, so I've heard. They say that's how he kept his health as long as he has. All right, uh, you want me to trail him, find out what he does with the money. Just one question. Why'd you pick me for the job? I... I... Why, your reputation... That's local. You say you're new in San Francisco. Well, I, I do read the local papers. Your picture was in only two weeks ago. Yeah, well, that caver didn't help my reputation. I like your looks. A nice, honest face. A man I could trust. Well, I don't buy that. And I'm sentimental, too. Your picture reminded me of someone who was very dear to me. My brother. Of course, you're nothing like him, really, but, but you do look alike... I suppose that sounds like a silly woman's reason for... Yeah. What's your address? Well, I have a little place of my own out on Divisadero. The Balboa Apartments near Normandy Terrace. Mm-hmm. You'd better keep in touch with me there. I don't want Leonard to know. The Kilcourse Mansion is at 1316 Clarendon. 1316. Mm-hmm. He returns from his office around six in the evening. Do you have a car? No. I need one? Well, I don't know where he may go. Now, here are the keys to my car. It's parked in front of the main entrance, a gray Plymouth. He won't recognize the car. My, my, it's my brother's. Now, about your fee. A hundred bucks now. If I need more, I'll leave you now. I had an uneasy feeling I would need more. The last detective that tried to follow Leonard Kilcourse had hospital insurance. I don't. But I'm a gambler at heart, so I parked Lorraine's Plymouth across the street from the Kilcourse mansion and waited. At 9 and a p.m., Mr. Kilcourse, much, much too old for her, came out the front door and flagged down a taxi. I made an illegal U-turn and followed. The trail ended across the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County. It was a country club-type building on top of a hill overlooking the bay. It did business under the name of Ernie Nogales' Racket Club. The racket had nothing to do with tennis. It came from two sources. The moans and groans of the customers losing money at the roulette wheels and crap tables. And the glad hand the management threw at my quarry as I followed him in. Well, Mr. Kilcourt, surprised to see you. Since when you go out of the dock? Well, I thought a little nightlife might agree with me, Nogales. Oh, 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 that sounds like you, Mr. Kilcourt. I didn't know you better. I think you was afraid to go out night. <laughs> well, now, I was thinking of buying this place to retire to. Ah. But I figured it'd be cheaper to win it at your roulette table. <laughs> What's your limit here? Ten thousand. But for you, wide open. The sky. A hot hundred grand for a starter? <laughs> well, any time they catch you with hot money, Mr. Kilo. <laughs> Come over to the cashier. Yeah. I sell you the chips myself. <laughs> I didn't have to bother making myself inconspicuous. Everybody in the joint stopped playing to watch Kilcourse while he shoved his hundred grand roll through the cashier's window and scooped up four stacks of thousand buck chips. Make your bets, please. All right, you. Spin that wheel. Huh? How much you got there? Twenty-five grand. Any objections? Is that okay, Mr. Nogales? Uh, spin it, Joe. I'm covering through the table personally. Okay, sir. Around and round the little ball goes. Fifteen pay, fifteen and the red. Maybe next time, Mr. Kimco. Why don't you double up, play the red and the black? It's safer. I'll stay with the numbers. Fifty thousand on fifteen. Ah, spin it. It's okay, Joe. I'm still covering. Well, it's your money, Mr. Nogales. Number four pays. Number four and the red again. Well, 
25 grand more on 15. Uh, look, Mr. Kilcoris, go on, enjoy yourself, take it off your income tax, but please spend those... Spread them out a little there, those chips, huh? It looks bad for the house. What kind of a joint is this? Can't you cover the bets? Okay, Joe. He asked for it. Okay, sir. I didn't wait to see where the little ball went on the last spin of the wheel. I would have made a side bet with any taker that Kilcourse wanted to lose that hundred grand. I would also have made book he knew I was following him. As I left the table and walked out of the club, I braced myself for what usually comes next. There would either be a dead body in the car or somebody would crease my noggin with a sap. But nothing happened. I switched on the headlights and stood in the glare of them for fully a minute, but nobody even shot at me. I flushed the shrubbery. No gunman. Checked the ignition wires. No booby traps. Driving back to town, I racked my brain for some way to bring them out into the open. I felt like a man with his life savings all on one number waiting for the wheel to stop spinning, which wasn't far from the truth. Not much of a cliffhanger, but the best we could do this week. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin, It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way... Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the hot hundred grand caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Yeah. Uh, this uh, Mrs. Kilcourse's apartment? Yeah. She here? Yeah. Well, uh, can I come in? Yeah. Tommy? Yeah. Who is that, Mr. Spade? Yeah. Oh, this is, this is the detective I was telling you about, Tommy. Remember? Yeah. The one who looked so much like you? Yeah. No. Oh, excuse me. This is my brother, Tommy Lane. Yeah. I mean, uh... Tommy, won't you run down to the corner and buy me some cigarettes for about 20 minutes? I have something to talk over with Mr. Spade. Yeah. Nice boy, your brother. Small vocabulary, but big feet. Well, he, he's shy. Now, what did you find out about Mr. K- uh, my husband, Mr. Spade? He uh, dropped a hundred grand in a gambling joint. Ernie Nogales' racket club. You know it? No, but I know Ernie Nogales. I knew him in Reno before I met Leonard. He lost his license there for running a crooked wheel. The way Kilcourse was playing tonight, that wheel didn't have to be crooked. He was trying to lose that hundred grand. But why? Why would he do a thing like that? One of two reasons. Either he's paying off to Nogales or he's paying off to somebody else and Nogales is the go-between. Well, I don't believe it. Ernie is a crooked gambler, but he doesn't touch blackmail. And your husband isn't stupid enough to drop a hundred grand in three turns of a wheel. Anyway, I'm not tangled with him and or the Ernie Nogales mob for a hundred bucks of your money or anybody else's. Here, take it. Well, but... And here are your car keys. No, no, wait, please. You, you can't desert me now. Why not? Well, I haven't told you everything. I'd hoped I wouldn't have to. About your brother? How did you know? The only place you get a green suntan is in a pokey. Besides, the act's kind of stir-crazy. Spent a little time in solitary, didn't he? He won't talk about it. But that's it, Sam. 
That's why Leonard is paying that blackmail money to Nogales. Uh, you just said Nogales wouldn't touch blackmail. Any other corrections you'd like to make in your copy before we proceed? Yes. Well, I might as well tell you everything. Why not? I knew when I came to you this morning that my husband was paying this money to Nogales. I knew because I asked him to. You and Ernie Nogales are working together? I'm not that rotten. I didn't say you were, but you're a rotten liar. There's that much in your favor. But I'm telling the truth now, Sam. You must believe me. Everything that has happened is my fault. I persuaded Nogales to give my brother a job in his place in Reno. Mm -hmm. They quarreled, and when he got closed down, he, he blamed Tommy. He swore he'd kill him when he got out of prison. That's why I begged my husband to pay him to save Tommy's life. Who did rat on Nogales about that crooked wheel in Reno? I did. That's why I feel responsible. Leonard is so fine, so, so generous. But I can't let him go on paying for my mistake. Yeah, like you said, he's going to run out of money. Look at me, Sam. Do I look like the kind of a woman to whom money means everything in the world? No, but you're looking at me, not at Kilcourse. You're laughing at me. Oh, I know what you think. Perhaps I did make a mistake in marrying Leonard, but he was so kind, so considerate, like my father. Everybody reminds you of your relatives. You don't believe my story? Well, since you asked. Well, all right, then. Here's the truth. I'm really Jack the Ripper's granddaughter. My parents were terribly wealthy. I harpooned my mother in her Beverly Hills swimming pool, set fire to my father with a $50,000 negotiable bond, and eloped with John Wilkes Booth. That brings us up to 1865. Shall I go on? Don't stop. It's great. Oh, get out of here. Get out of here and leave me alone. After you've told me all your secrets, I'm not that rotten. You won't help me. You never intended to. Why go on torturing me? Oh, now, stop that. Please, please. I, I believe you. I believe all your stories. Now, uh, what is my next smart move? Sam, the only way to stop Ernie Nogales is to prove that he's running a crooked wheel. And then he'd pay back all that blackmail money, and, and he wouldn't dare lay a hand on Tommy. Well, it's going to be hard to prove and expensive. Oh, but... I'll have to lose a little on that wheel before I can figure the way it's rigged. How much can you invest? Well, I, I have about a thousand dollars of my own. With you? Yes. Here, you take it. Hmm. Smells nice. Sam... Yeah? Sam, after all this is over, and after I've put things to right with Leonard, I should have told him before this, but I owed him so much, I... Oh, Sam, I'm so glad it's you. Yeah. Me too, Angel. Go now, darling, before I beg you not to. What time does that joint close? Well, it... Well, it runs all night, I think. Good. Let's stay up late and raid the icebox. Around 2 in the a.m., when I low-geared the Plymouth up the long, steep driveway to Ernie Nogales' racket club, backed into the parking space nearest the road with a car headed downhill for a quick getaway, just in case, and I went in. The joint was still going full blast. I bought 500 bucks worth of chips, swaggered over to the table where Kilcourse had dropped his hundred grand and nonchalantly flipped the blue chip onto the red. A police bet, sir, ladies and gentlemen. Make your game. Okay, that's all. Around and round the little ball goes. Uh... I didn't look to see where the little ball went. Most of the money was on red, so it was bound to turn up black. A red, please. What? Number 15. Place your bets, please. Make your game, ladies and gentlemen. Around and round the game. The chips were spread around more the next turn, so I stacked 100 at the bottom of the 1 to 34 column. With a crooked wheel, my 100 made it the best bet to lose. And 19, and the red wins again. Hey! I plunked 500 down on number 5 and raked in 17,500. I left my original bet on the table. When the little ball fell into the pocket, I was 35,000 bucks to the good from my point of view, but not from my clients. I doubled my bet and looked apprehensively around. There were no surly characters edging up behind me. In fact, the only surly character in sight was Ernie Nogales, and he looked happy. That didn't make much sense. When my bankroll got to 105,000, I played a hunch. I threw five grand of it back on the table and lost it. That made a kind of sense. I cashed in the rest of my chips and squeezed the hundred grand U.S. currency into my inside pocket. If anybody aimed for my heart, it was thick enough to stop the slug, which was some comfort. But what I saw when I walked out to the parking lot was no comfort at all. I'd gotten just a glimpse of it through some trees. 
A sedan backed into a driveway halfway down the hill. It was blacked out except for five glowing cigar ends that showed through the windows. I could think of only one reason for five cigar smokers to be parked in that particular spot at that particular moment. The Plymouth is where I had parked it, pointing straight down the hill. I slammed the door but didn't get in. Then I listened. The car down the hill was getting ready, too. I cracked the door of the Plymouth wide enough to get my arm inside and pressed the starter with the heel of my hand. I switched on the lights, pushed the clutch with my left hand, used my right to shift it into low, and I pulled the hand throttle out all the way and let it go. Big idea busting into my office. We're going to have a talk, no, Gallus? Please, don't wave that heater at me. It makes me nervous. I don't like guns. I don't either. That's why I'm here. Put your hands on top of the desk and keep them there. All right. Give me back that roll. I give you clean money for it. It was a gamble, so I lost. Can you blame me? Where'd you get this money? I buy it. Fifty cents on the dollar. I don't ask where it came from, but I read the papers. I figured it was that ship row, that shipyard payroll job a few days back. Like it just fell in my lap. I figured it'd make 50 grand instead of kill course five. I guess that was dirty trick you just out of stir, Tommy, huh? I got news for you, no, Gallus. I didn't know this money was hot, and I am not Tommy Lane. No? Then what? Private Dick. Tommy's sister hired me to take the fall for him. Look, I uh, got most of the caper. Kilcourse wanted to pay Tommy a hundred grand. You rigged the wheel so Kilcourse would lose it one night and Tommy would win it back the next night. Now, uh, what was Kilcourse paying him off for? No caper, legitimate. He was sent up for bribing a public official. You mean he was the payoff man for Kilcourse's contracting firm? Sure, legitimate business. And the grand jury went out after Kilcourse. Tommy took the rap, that's all, for a price. Yeah, a hundred grand. Thanks, Nogales. That's all I needed. Oh, Sam. I was afraid I might be too late. You are, sweetheart. Oh, I have so many things to explain. Where, 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 where can you talk? Right in here. But who's this man? Why, that's your old sweetie from Reno, Ernie Nogales, oh. remember? What's the matter with you two? You oh. crazy? Oh, Sam, I should have told you the truth from the beginning. Check. For Nogales yarn, I can understand. But why did you tell me you were Kilcross's wife? I was desperate. I had to say something. It was the only explanation I could think of for my interest in this case without yeah. telling the truth. But you were making a pigeon out of me. I don't know about such things, Sam. All I know is I'm here in time to warn you. You mustn't walk out of here with that money. Listen. They may kill you to get it back. They already did. They're combing the wreckage of that car right now, looking for my body. <gasps> then Tommy was right. They did mean to kill him. How'd he get the rumble? While he was in prison, from another man that killed Course Framed. He was in for life, so it was safe for him to talk. Hey, you two. Oh. Yeah, Nogales? That car that just drove up. I think that's Mr. Kilcourse. Oh, I... Hey, what's your let hurry? Me go, let me go! Come on, what's your hurry? Tommy's out there in that cab. I've got to warn him. Or a tip off Kilcourse. Which is it? No, Sam, you've got to believe Sit me. Sit down. Oh, Stop that. You two have fun. I'm getting out of here. Go ahead. Now, uh, listen, sweet Lorraine, you may as well save your breath for those explanations. You're staying right here until the cape is all wrapped up. Here he comes. Have you got a gun, Sam? Yeah. Well, you'd better have it ready. Mm -mm. But Sam... There's no Gallus. I want to see him. Uh, he was called out of town, sir. I'm in charge. Uh, you Mr. Kilcourse? That's right. I want to know why you people have been interfering with my business. It might interest you to know that this building site's on an old Spanish land grant. Title's very shaky. I'll run an eight-lane highway straight through the middle of it and turn the rest of it into a game preserve. <laughs> That's what I do to people who double-cross me. I tried to tell Mr. Nogales that, sir. He wouldn't listen to me. He tipped Tommy off for a split of the hundred grand. But I knew sooner or later we'd have to answer to you, Mr. Kilcourse. Oh, well, what's that? Here's your hundred grand, sir. Count it. Sam. Well, 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 well. <laughs> What's your name, son? Sam Spade, sir. Well, I'm glad to meet an honest lad. Well, come along. Uh, you too, young lady. We'll all walk out together. Sam, shut what up, are you... Shut what? Up. Uh, Spade, huh? Yes, sir. I'm a private detective, but I'm ambitious. Hmm. Politic? Uh, yes, sir. Well, <laughs> we'll run you for assembly. In the meantime, I believe there's an opening in one of the public services. Garbage disposal. Uh, executive end, of course. Uh, where the devil is that man with my car? Oh, there he is. Now, uh, you drop around to my office in the morning. Thank you, and good night, Mr. Kilcourse. Uh, uh, drive on, Horace. Back to the city. Oh, Sam. 
How could you? Hmm? All those lies and, and just handing over the money like that. It, it wasn't yours. It wasn't Tommy's either, sweetheart. Get in. Well, Tommy, are you all right? Yeah. Drive us across the bridge, Tommy, will you? Yeah. Tommy. Yeah? Tommy, I'm afraid we'll have to do without the money. Yeah? S- Sam gave it to Mr. Kilcourse. Yeah? N- now, don't get excited, Tommy. I'm sure Sam had a reason. Didn't you, Sam? Yeah. I mean, that was marked money from a payroll job. Oh, then it won't do him any good. It'll set him up for a good long stretch if the eyewitness story that goes along with it is good enough. And you're just the girl to tell it, sweetheart. Am I uh, right, Tommy? Yeah. Uh, period, end of report. Already? But, Sam. Yeah? What happened? Who were the five men in the car, the ones who shot at that Plymouth in the mistaken belief that you were in it? Their names are of little account, Effie. Suffice it to say that Kilcourse pointed his pudgy finger at them in the hopes of keeping the charge of attempted murder out of his indictment. But I was too clever. I identified them. But, Sam, you didn't see anything but their cigars glowing in the darkness. Have you never heard of Sherlock Holmes monograph on the 49 varieties of tobacco ash, you oh, fool? Oh, but, Sam, Sherlock Holmes is only the segment of someone's imagination. He's a fictional detective. Well? You mean... Oh, Sam, you're tired. Yes, I am. It's affected your mind, winning no. all that money. Now, you just sit here and rest. All right. Think of the snowy mountaintops and blue skies. Uh, mm-hmm. I'll just go and type this up. Snowy mountaintops. Winter sports yet. And now, listen to this. If you haven't yet tried Wild Root Cream Oil, the famous hair tonic that grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff, then here's a wonderful way to get acquainted. Buy Wild Root Cream Oil in the new 25-cent size bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. And not that it made any difference, but how did you guess that she wasn't Mrs. Kilcourse? Simple. Kilcourse didn't recognize her. Sam, that was after you denounced her. I did no such thing. From the report, Sam, in black and white. Quote, why did you tell me you were Kilcourse's wife? Unquote. At that point, you assumed that she was not Mrs. Leonard Kilcourse. I did not. I merely wondered why she had told me. Well, with all the lies she told, you might have assumed anything she said was totally devoid of truth. And I did, sweetheart. I did. Oh. Oh, well, that's a relief. I was afraid for a while she'd taken you in. What's that got to do with the truth? Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorraine Tuttle is Effie. Sadie Thompson appeared as Lorraine Kilcourse. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin, score composed by Renee Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keep on all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right Away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak for hire. Sure. I'm Pat 
Philip Novak for hire. There's a sign out in front of my office reads that way. Pat Novak for hire. Oh, there's no way to dress it up. If you're in business down on the San Francisco waterfront, everything but murder is a parlor trick. If you rob a few graves, you can pay the rent. Nobody cares if you got sore eyelids. You get that way from winking at too many things. Oh, it's a good living if you don't run short of bail bonds and Benzedrine. I discovered that Friday night. After the fight broadcast, I wound up in a little whiskey barrel on Powell Street. I had a Glasgow farmer out of the red when they closed the bar, and I drifted across the street for a cup of coffee. When I came out, it was raining, and the street was deserted. I stood in the doorway and watched the dull neons through the rain. They looked splotched and dim, like watercolors rubbed with a damp rag. It was beginning to rain harder, and I started out of the doorway when she ducked in and bumped up against me. Oh! Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just wait for your blockers on the next one, huh? I guess I bumped into you. Don't go out on a limb. Uh, I'm very sorry. I, I guess I didn't know where I was going. You seem to be headed in the right direction. How do you mean? Forget I noticed. It's raining awfully hard. Hmm. Huh. I wonder if you ever noticed how... When it rains, you feel lonely and lost? Yes. Yes, that's it. How when it rains, you feel lonely and... Lost. Yeah, well, we're both great readers, so if you'll let me get by, I want to get a cab. Yes, I... I wonder if I could ask you something funny. The bars are closed. No, I... I meant coffee. I'll pay for it. All right. In here? Sure. Come on. The counter will do. All right. What's it gonna be? Hey! You back again? Yeah, two coffees. How come? I'm nervous. Two coffees. You like a bear claw, maybe? You know what we want? Two coffees? Yeah. Be right with you. Thank you. I know it's funny asking you in here, but... I have to talk to someone. I don't know what I'm doing. I won't argue. I've been away a long time. I guess a long time. Yeah, the kids will be glad to see you back. Huh? Stop it, will you, sis? Get to the point. Put the show on the road. Yes. I think I've lost my memory. At least it seems that way at first. Who are you? I don't know. I suppose you don't believe it. No, but I convince hard. Here you are. Two coffees. Everything all right? Yeah, yeah, everything's fine. I'll be down here. If you need anything else? You thought up a name yet, Buster? Well, you'd be crazy to believe me. I guess you'd be crazy, but... I can't remember anything Yes. Now, look, lady, if you got amnesia, see the police. But you don't believe me. I don't know. Maybe you are leveling. But if you're off your rocker, go to the police. But suppose... Suppose there's something that happened before and the police would be looking for me. Please, would you try to help me? How bad are you? Do you know what town you're in? Yes. Have you been here before? Do you live here? I think maybe. I... It seems like a place I've been. All right, I'll put you in a cab. You go see the police. No. I feel funny. I... I think I'll go outside for a minute. I don't want Hilda to know. Please, I'm... I'm going to... Oh, please, help me. Mister, your girlfriend's on the floor. Yeah, any suggestions? No, she's your date. All right, here, give me a hand, will you? Well, where are you going to take her? The hospital. It's an amnesia case. I hope your memory's good. Huh? You'll need it for answers. Your girlfriend's passed out for good. Don't tell me. I feel a pulse, mister. You're gonna have to start over. Because she's all used up. Well, that's good. You got a wailing wall? Sure. Use the counter. While I call homicide. <laughs> It didn't take 2020 vision to see I was in trouble. Maybe it was an accident, maybe it wasn't. I didn't have any idea why she keeled over there, but with a figure like hers, I knew it wasn't old age. 
I'd call to homicide, Matt Hellman was going to be in the picture soon. And then I'd stand about as much chance as a cornfield in a stone quarry. Well, I went through the girl's stuff. She had no identification. There were a couple of snapshots of her, but no name. I told the waiter my name and where Hellman could find me. And then I got out of there. I looked up Jocko Madigan, an ex-doctor who liked his booze pretty well. Smart guy, but he used a mason jar for a jigger. I finally found him holed up in some after-hours joint on Geary Street. He was talkative. Hello, Patsy. A small jug for Mr. Novak, waiter. I want to talk to you, Jocko. Patsy, you shouldn't be here. It's after hours. Yeah, look, Jocko, I need some help. What do you know about amnesia? Oh, a temporary blessing. I thought I had it myself once. Oh, stop it, will you? But it just turned out to be a case of bad bourbon, a peasant's drink, I've decided. Get up the street level long enough for me to talk. I'm in trouble. Yes? I met some blister tonight who took a dive after one cup of coffee. Oh, I see. She had amnesia, or she thinks she did. Oh, well, she's dead. Why worry about amnesia? <laughs> it's a minor ailment. Because Hellman's going to think I had something to do with it. She picked out my lap. Don't you see how it's going to add up? I have high hopes. i got to do something in a hurry. Uh, was she a nice girl? Yes, I guess so. How come you met her? Oh, what difference does it make? Tell me about amnesia. Could she phony it? Maybe. Not for long. What makes you think she did? I don't know. She acted like a butterfly with a jag on, and she headed straight for me. It just doesn't add. No. What cell block can I find you in? You can get off your spine and go to work for me. You know the hospital circuit. Hit them all and find out everything you can about recent amnesia cases. Well, how far back do I go? Until you find one that jibes with this girl. It's impossible. Where do I start? I feel like Noah when they told him to beat the flood. She's blonde, blue eyes, expensive clothes. How big? Just the right size for a good dream. Start checking now and give me a ring at my place. No identification? Uh, none. She only said one thing when she fell. Oh, something crude? No, she mentioned a gal by the name of Hilda. That should be easy to trace. Sure. Just look it up in the phone book. You will find it uh, somewhere between Hellman and Homicide. Right, lover? <laughs> Well, there wasn't anything I could do for the next few hours except sublet from an ostrich. I had to keep undercover because all I had to work on was a couple of snapshots and a girl named Hilda. Neither figured to get me out of this mess. Hellman was bound to ask a lot of questions because I had as much business being with a dead girl as Lucky Luciano in a finishing school. After I left Jocko, I took a C-car downtown and I went home to grab some sleep. When I walked in the apartment, the lights were out. Well, that didn't make any difference. Hellman's badge was shining like a lake in Ireland. He was making himself at home with my ice cubes. Hello, Novak. Put the light on so I can watch you turn pale. All right, Hellman, get to the point. Sure. Who was your girlfriend? I don't know. She was the coy type. So are you, Novak. You're going to look good sucking your thumb in the gas chamber. I suppose your coroner is full of good news. She died of an overdose of sleeping pills. The coroner's report is murder. How about the space mark suicide? No dice. You don't take sleeping pills, then tour the town for a spot to take a nap. So she died in a coffee joint. What am I supposed to do, carry a stomach pump? You're supposed to tell me who she is. We'll go from there. I don't know, neither did she. I've got that down as a lie. You file it any way you want, Hellman. She was amnesia. So are you, Novak. All right, hire a medium then. I told you. She came into the restaurant a total stranger. We got social, but she died a total stranger. How are you going to prove it? I don't know. If I knew who she was, I wouldn't play footsie with you. Do I have to draw a map? She came in trying to sort out her marbles and never got there. I see. What did you find out? How about clothes markings? That's your department. How about laundry marks? I don't know. I guess she washed her own. Look, Novak, you're a big boy now. You're in a spot. If you want to help, now's the time to do it. You got everything I know. From here on, you work the ball downfield. All right. You just answer the doorbell from time to time. When you see a guy grinning out there, that'll be me coming to pinch you for murder. Well, that'll take lots of doing, mister, and lots of proof. You remember that. I'll try, Novak. But I may get amnesia. Good night, big shot. <laughs> When Hellman left, I backed into my headache and went to bed. Oh, sure, I was in a spot now. The scorecard said murder, and I was the medalist on the first round. If the police didn't know who she was, that meant she had no record we could work on. I still had the funny hunch about that gal pulling a phony. But if it was phony, I was worse off. I had all the best arrows in town pointing to me, and 
Once Hellman began to build a case, I could throw away those vacation folders. I slept until about nine. The phone began to ring, and I rolled over, expecting to hear Gabriel on the other end of the line. It was just Jocko. Hello, Novak talking. This is Jocko. I've been working all night. We'll build a monument later. What'd you find out? The morning paper says the girl was murdered. Yeah, Hellman gave me a preview. What'd you find out at the hospitals? I've got a complete list of amnesia victims. I know more lost souls than a Hong Kong bartender. Yeah? Most of them are men uh, trying to get away from the little woman. Well, you're a big help, Jocko. Don't hang up till you hear about the girl. Go ahead. Nothing on file for the last eight years. In 1941, a 17-year-old girl walked out of California General Hospital. She hasn't been heard of since. How's the description? Oh, it fits like last year's bathing suit. She was Marcia Halpern, the daughter of Emery Halpern. Yeah? Who's he? A pocket-heavy guy down on Montgomery Street. Well, get right down there. Thanks, Jocko. You saved my life. Well, I hadn't intended to go that far. See you later. <laughs> was my one chance, even if the odds looked bad. I called up Halpern's office. They said he wasn't in to try him at home. He was listed for a place up on Pacific Heights, so I took a cab over there. When I walked in the lobby, I could tell old man Halpern was making as much money as you can without your own printing press. The apartment made Buckingham Palace look like something George had picked up at a fire sale. The doorman was a sober-looking specimen, the kind of guy that breathes every other Tuesday. He gave me the fish eye as I went up the elevator to the third floor. Halpern's apartment was at the east end. The butler showed me in, and I waited in the living room. It was a real cozy place, about the size of a small rugby field. A door opened on the side, and 200 pounds of Regency oozed into the room like a wet ghost. Good morning. I'm Mr. Taylor. I'm Novak. Where's Halpern? Well, Mr. Halpern is away on a business trip. I'm Mark Taylor, the family lawyer. <laughs> I believe that's the phrase. Oh. Well, I'll drop by later, huh? Uh, perhaps I can help you. I take care of most of Mr. Halpin's business now. Did you know his daughter? Uh, yes, yes. It was quite tragic. That's what I hear. She was a victim of amnesia. She forgot all the details of her home. Must have been a temptation. Did the police ever th do anything on her? Well, the police were not advised. Mr. Halpin hired private detectives, but she was never found. Yes, it was quite tragic. You wear your mourning a long way, Taylor. She'd be about 25 now, wouldn't she? Taffy hair, blue eyes, nice figure. I believe she had leanings in that direction. Why, Mr. Novak? I think I may know where she is. You don't know what that would mean to this family, Mr. Novak. You don't know what it would mean to me, Mr. Taylor. Here's a snapshot. Yeah, let me see it. Well, Taylor, this is not a B movie. This is a picture of Marsha Halpern. You sure? I don't make many mistakes, Mr. Novak. All right, if you've used up your quota. She's downtown. I'll get in touch with Mr. Halpin right away. No, take your time. She's dead. She... When? Last night, she got sleepy. When? Yeah, that's right. Somebody gave her enough sleeping pills to stock a drugstore. I see. After all these years, to come back, and then this. Uh, it was most... Most tragic? Yes, yes, I was about to say that. It'll be a great blow to Mr. Halpin. It'll be a very great blow to Mr. Halpin. Have the police any ideas? A few. Do you know anybody named Hilda? No, why? No, just sweeping out the corners. When's Halpin due? This afternoon. I have a range of... Excuse me, please. All right. Hello, this is Mark Taylor. No, that can't be right. Well, when did it happen? Uh, yes. Yes, please keep me advised. You ought to wear a purple suit, Taylor. I have bad news, Mr. Novak. Brace yourself. I'm lightheaded. Go ahead. Mr. Halpern was killed in a motor accident last night. His car plunged down a ravine near Sacramento. Mm -hmm. That's very strange. Yeah. That must have been a great blow to Mr. Halpern. <laughs> Downstairs. 
All the way down, I had the funny feeling that something was wrong. The way a person feels when he goes into a doctor's office with an incurable disease. It may have been Taylor. I don't know. He seemed all right, but I still had that feeling that something was out of place, like a broken line in a perfect picture. I crossed the street and called Hellman. It was too early in the day because he was as sad as a tap dancer in moccasins. Hellman talking. This is Novak. How's the case? You look better every minute. How's the identification? We're moving slow. So far, we know she's a woman. That's right. Her name's Marcia Halpern. She disappeared in 1941 with amnesia. San Francisco? Yeah. She's the daughter of Emery Halpern. Uh, we'll check with old man Halpern. You better send your best man because he rolled a car and killed himself last night. Where? Sacramento. I got news for you, too. Yeah? We got a statement from that waiter. Who wrote it? He says you brought that girl in for coffee. Also, you were nice and chummy. I knew her for five minutes. With you, that's a lifetime. The guy said you were good friends. That's the way our story's gonna read. You suit yourself. I'm busy. Yeah? Where you going? Same place you are, Hellman, Sacramento. If I didn't move fast, I was deader than a Philadelphia nightclub. When they start taking statements, you can wire for flowers. I called Jocko and told him to check up on old man Halpern's estate. I borrowed a car and drove up to Sacramento. The accident was just outside of there. When I got to the spot, Hellman was already in charge. He's going to make a fight for the job at last judgment. They were down in the ravine and Hellman was beating around the bushes, making more noise than a Venetian blind and a typhoon. Hello, Hellman. Did you find anything? Get your own haystack. I'm busy. Where's the body? You get the blues if you don't see one corpse today. He's up in town. Did you notice those tracks up there in the road? Yeah. Double tracks don't mean a thing. Oh, sure. Maybe two cars fell down and one got lost. Wake up, Hellman. If he drove over the side, he sure had a tough time making up his mind. When you're through on that pipe, I'll send over another. I'm going over to the car. Hellman went over to the car and I started looking through the bushes. I don't know what I expected to find. Maybe an old boy scout... After about ten minutes, I shifted over to the other side, and it showed up right near the ground under a bush. Hellman must have seen me because he came right over. Hey, what is it? What'd you find? A handkerchief. Oh. Hmm. That's funny. What's funny about it? So it's a handkerchief. The old man had a nose, didn't he? Well, he must have loved it then. This hanky's loaded with perfume. Take a whiff here. Yeah. Recognize it? Sure. I don't know about you, but I smell a rat. Things began to move. This was the first break, and Hellman knew it. I went back to town, and I tried to get in touch with Jocko, but he was running up a tab somewhere, so I drove over to see Mark Taylor again. When I got to the apartment, I found out he wasn't in, but the pinch hitter was all right. When she opened the door, I got a nice warm feeling, like a melted cheese sandwich. She was standing there in a dark, silk evening gown. It was strapless, and she had no worries. When she spoke, it was like saying, put another log on the fire. Good evening. Taylor in here? Won't you come in? Sure. Mr. Taylor won't be in for a while. I'm waiting for him myself. I see. I'm Pat Novak. Is it urgent? Anything I can do? If it were, you'd get my vote. Who are you? I'm Hilda Travis. I'm a friend of the family. Which family? Would a drink take off the rough edges, Mr. Novak? It might. Good, I'll make one. I brought Taylor a present. How nice. A girdle, maybe? Or am I being catty? No, a handkerchief. This one. Do you like it? Should I? I thought you might want it for a keepsake. I found it in a ditch up in Sacramento about ten feet from Emery Halpern. Poor Emery. Here's your drink. Thanks. Poor Emery. It's full of perfume. You want to smell? That wouldn't do any good. You want to know if it matches my perfume? It's your idea. Go ahead. All right. Now, closer. That's it. See? Yeah. It's early in the evening, Mr. Novak. Don't blow a fuse. I won't until I find out who killed Marcia Halpern. Good luck, for everybody's sake. By the way, the uh, police think you killed her, don't they? Did Taylor brief you? A little. I asked him this morning if he knew a girl named Hilda. He must have forgotten. Yeah, everybody's got amnesia. Just to make things easy, did you kill her? Just to make them hard, did you? I see. Well, just tell Taylor I called. Don't be a savage, Mr. Novak. You haven't finished your drink. And it's raining outside. I'll finish this one. That's good. Sit down beside me here. We'll finish our drinks and pray for a cloudburst. She 
turned out to be an old-fashioned girl. She had about eight of them before I got out of there. I tried to pump her, but she wouldn't talk about Marcia Halpern. I just became a family friend. After I left, I ducked into a drugstore and started phoning Jocko. I finally caught him at the hunt room. He'd worked his way below the label already. Hello, Patsy. I'm having a wonderful time. Yeah, what'd you find out? I just heard a funny story. It's old. What about Halpern? He barely changed his will after the girl died. The whole estate goes to her. Who's next in line? A fellow named Mark Taylor. That's the new part of the will, drawn up three weeks ago. Good boy, Jocko. So I looked up the dope on Mark Taylor. He's a family friend. It's a new club. Go on. Looks all right. Some funny bank book stuff, though. For instance? Well, he drew 3,000 bucks out last month for a Lisbon passage. A girl named Helen Dupre. Maybe she's a foreign cinema discovery. He's no talent, Scout. Meet me down in Homicide in ten minutes, Jocko. If we're lucky, we'll show Hellman something. What? How to draw to an inside straight. Hurry up and don't stop for a bracer. Well, just don't smell my breath. See you soon, lover. I'd explained everything I could to Hellman when Jocko got there. I went over it for him and sent him out on an errand. He was to meet Hellman and come up to Taylor's apartment. I went on ahead. It was about 11 o'clock when I knocked on the door. Mm, Mr. Novak, so soon. Yeah, I'm coming in. Hello, Taylor. I won't say you're wearing out your welcome, Mr. Novak, but it's getting very thin. You better take time out and pack your bags. Is that nice, Patsy? Because a guy named Hellman wants you for murder. We've been over that once, Mr. Novak. Yeah, but we got a whole new infield this time. Hellman thinks you killed a girl named Helen Dupre. I don't know a girl named Helen Dupre. The bank vouchers say yes. They say you brought her over here six weeks ago. Wait a minute, Pat. Oh, you made the team too, Angel. They got you all fixed up for old man Halpern's case up in Sacramento. Get out of here, Novak. I left a drink here. Find a bar there. Get out of here. I wouldn't want to jam this gun through your face. Come on in, Hellman. Did you bring him with you? Yeah. Come in here, fella. Is that the girl? Yeah, that's her. Where'd you see her before? Sacramento last night. He's crazy. It's a plant, Mark. Tell him more, Junior. You sure she's the one? Yeah. She was on the road, and I seen her at the car with this old fella. Hang on, lady. The road gets bumpy from here on. My lights were out, so I guess she didn't see me. Take this little guy out of here. I got a story. I seen you hit the old fella, then start the car down the bank. I didn't hit him on the head. I told you that, Mark. Yes, you did. Tell him, Mark. Tell him I was here. How can I when you tipped our mitt? That's right, Taylor. Get out while you can. Tell him I was here, Mark. Well, you little fool, don't you know you've told them already? You're a bum guy, Mark. You've been a bum guy all along. I keep my mouth shut. I'll give you a chance to talk. I'll tell you about him, Novak. Shut up, you little half witch. You're all right on the straightaway, but you're a bad guy on the curves, Mark. Keep still, Angel. For a tin horn punk like you, I'll talk lots. You'd better say it fast. Yeah. You get any prize in the house, Taylor. Take your choice. Are you working for a living, Hellman? Yep. All right, then, let's go. Yeah. See you downtown, Novak. Is she all right, Jocko? I'm out of practice. Well, Patsy. You like it this way, baby? No complaints. I've always gone first class. I wouldn't like it the other way. Yeah. I could have used a little more time. But I'm not greedy. It's still raining out, Patsy. No. It stopped raining. It's beginning to clear up and over... Come on, Jocko. I'm talking to myself. Well, it seems that Marcia Halpern was dead for years. Somewhere on the other side, a girl named Helen Dupre got the story out of her. She looked a lot like Marcia Halpern, so she waited until after the war and contacted this Mark Taylor. They cooked up a hoax and the pot boiled over. She was supposed to fake amnesia and stumble into the hospital. The pictures in the wallet would be printed. Mark would identify her as Marcia Halpern. The same night they planned to kill the old man the way they did. That way, Helen Dupre and Mark could split the dough. But they figured it wrong. 
Another girl named Hilda Travers had the story, too. She put the squeeze on Mark, and he blundered. He found out he didn't need a phony Marcia Halpern after all. The new clause in the will gave Mark the dough. So he loaded Helen Dupre with sleeping pills while Hilda gave the old man his last ride. All he had to do was wait for the dough and then split with Hilda. A few things went wrong. Sometimes it only takes one. Helen did her part, but she was no Bernhard. And then at the last minute, she knew something was wrong and mentioned Hilda. I kind of began to wonder when Mark identified that picture so fast. After more than eight years, he identified it immediately. And then there was that handkerchief. From there in, it was free wheeling. All we had to have was a witness. Oh, that guy from Sacramento? Well, he was some actor that Jocko picked up in the hunt room. Hellman finally cleaned up the mess. Taylor's in the clink and... Of course, the girl already picked up her end of the check. Oh, she was nice, too, if you don't mind claw marks. Well, it all worked out, and Hellman's happy, except that actor keeps calling him up for parts. American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the third of a new series, Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Jocko Madigan is played by Jack Lewis. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basim Ablam. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Pat. Novak, for hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. Down on the waterfront in San Francisco, billing doesn't mean much. Everybody's got the same act. They're all out to turn a fast buck, and when you're in business down here, everything but murder is a parlor trick. Once in a while, your eyelids get sore from winking at too much, but it's a living. You get to meet the best people in town. There's only one hooker you're liable to wake up some morning dead. Because around the waterfront, you don't need a union card for trouble. It sneaks up and paws you like a wet ghost. I found that out when I met Bruno Zweiss. I closed up early Tuesday night, and I went home to catch up on last month's sleep. I don't know how long I was in bed. Must have been about 11 when I woke up. The room was dark and as stale as last year's Christmas candy. I had the goofy feeling that somebody was in the room with me. I was breathing kind of hard and I stopped to have a listen. Somebody was sitting on my bed, either that or the landlord had put in an echo. I listened again. Hello, Novak. You're mixed up, friend. I pay the rent here. Get your hands away from the light, Novak. Just be a good boy and you can collect your old age pension. Now, look, I'm not crazy about waking up with strangers sitting on my bed, especially if they got baritone voices. Now, say your piece and beat it. Don't get jumpy, mister. When your eyes get used to the dark, you're going to see a gun about a foot away from your nostrils. I want the keys to your boat, Novak. Get them in the morning at 25 bucks a smell. I want them now. Just tell me where they are. I'll do the rest. Don't get big hearted. <laughs> I don't want chatter and cocktails. I want those keys. Unless you want your face to look like a rump roast, you'll start talking. 
The keys are in the bottom drawer of the desk. That's the boy. Gonna borrow your bow the wire. You get it back by noon tomorrow. Here's the boat keys. Two of them are. The rest open the front door of the U.S. Mint. Sorry I can't stay around, Novak. You sound like a card. Slip tight, Novak. This will have to do for a lullaby. <laughs> didn't even give me time to pick a dream. I stretched out on the floor as dead as a Philadelphia nightclub. I don't know how long I stayed out of the ball game. Must have been a couple of hours, because when the phone rang, it was past midnight. I reached over to pick it up, but my hands were as steady as a maple leaf in a hurricane, and my head was big enough to sell by the pound. I finally found it in the dark and started talking. Hello? Hello, Novak. This is Joe Paz down at Pier 19. You awake? Sure. Hey, you sound groggy. No, it's a sedative. What's on your mind? One of your boats just drifted in. <laughs> Guess what? I don't have to. It's smashed up and you want to offer me 50 bucks salvage. Hey, <laughs> that's right, Milbank. You're psychic. I'm a patsy, you mean. Some gunsel borrowed the boat a couple of hours ago. Came in here, told me a bedtime story, and took the keys. Well, you better hop right down here. It'll keep, Joe. No, it won't. Hurry up or you'll run a dead heat with homicide. There's a dead guy in the boat. Well, it must be my playmate. I don't know. He didn't say. But you better grab a cab and get on down here. There's going to be a lot of questions. Sure. If you need any good answers, save a couple for me. From now on, there was no waste motion. I knew that. If homicide was on the case, that meant Inspector Hellman. Well, he's a real nice guy, if you like his type. I had to do something soon. If I didn't, I'd have about as much chance as a pound of liver at a cat show. So I jumped into some clothes, and I was starting out of the apartment when I missed my wallet. The keys were attached, and that gunsel had taken the whole works. I began to get mad. For 70 bucks, you can get a scotch hangover instead of the kind I had. And if you're lucky, a couple of good memories. So when I drew up at Pier 19, it didn't look like the sunny side of the street. Joe Powers was waiting for me. Hey, you got the first round, Patsy. Homicide hasn't showed yet. I'm full of luck tonight. Where's the boat? Oh, right over here. Lots of fog tonight, huh, Joe? You're walking on it. Well, there it is. How's your insurance, Patsy? All right, except I'm not carrying any on that dead guy. Who is he, Joe? I don't know. He's your passenger. You roll him. All right, give me a hand. No, push him over on the other side, will you, so I can get in the pocket? Is he the same guy that took the keys? I don't know. If he is, he never looked lovelier. There's nothing in this pocket. This one's empty, except for a comb. He sure spent my 70 bucks in a hurry. Must have thrown in the wallet for a nightcap. No identification. We should have bought a scorecard. Hey. Hey, here on the floor. It's a key. Let me see that, Joe. Room 425 Royal Arms Hotel. Where is it? That's a dive down on Turk Street. Well, say hello to Homicide for me. Oh, you're not bright tonight, Novak. Well, I'm not going to stay around here. They'll pick me up faster than a gin fizz. Well, what am I going to tell them? Anything you like, Joe. Shift into freewheeling and let them follow. But I'm not going to hang around for a pinch. I'm one boat and 70 bucks short. Tell it to Homicide. I don't like manual labor that much. See you later. I started for the Royal Arms Hotel, and on the way, I picked up the only honest guy I know, a bottle baby by the name of Jocko Madigan. He's a good man, except he thinks it's a waste of the taxpayer's money to put alcohol in torpedoes. I hauled him out of the hunt room bar, and we walked down the street to the Royal Arms Hotel. It was the perfect spot for a missionary. The lobby looked like the first act of rain. There was a pinball machine in one corner a couple of last year's girls in this year's slacks, and a bleary-eyed little night clerk. He looked like a well-groomed laundry bag. He gave us the fish eye as we started upstairs. Room 425 was down at the end of the hall. Chaco didn't care if we ever got there. 
Patsy, we have no business coming up here. We're in search of fool's gold. Or in search of my 70 bucks. Exactly. I view you as my penance, Patsy. The sackcloth for a misspent life. If you can shake off that buzz, you'll find out I'm in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you're a patsy. And you're dangerous because you move in the twilight zone between good and evil without any predisposition toward either one. Yeah, all right. Here it is. 425. Nobody home. Let's go in. It's housebreaking. Now, look, Jocko, I want my 70 bucks. I'm going in. Patsy, sometimes you terrify me. I think you'd pick the lock to the gates of heaven. I would if they had my 70 bucks. Come on. The guy's dead down in my boat. We won't hurt his feelings. We'll just snooze around a minute and get up. It was a pretty room if you like dead women on your rugs. She was stretched out in a pale yellow dressing gown, as quiet as an April morning and twice as pretty. A dull red scar ran across her temple where somebody had laid an iron shovel. She didn't belong in this hotel because she was wearing a necklace and a bracelet that left a gap in somebody's pocket. And from the ringside, she looked all right. Jocko noticed it, too. She has lots of character. Yeah, but where's my 70 bucks? She's a nightclub dancer. How do you know? Her picture's plastered all over the wall there. She's the headliner at El Palateo, Miss Rita Malloy. I wonder who the guy on the desk is there. Boyfriend, probably. Let's get out of here, Patsy. Oh, wait a minute. How about that dead guy in the boat? Where does he fit in? I'll listen to that one, Novak. Oh, Hellman. What happened to the girl? She died laughing at you? It's Rita Malloy, a piece of change from the El Palateo. Uh-huh. Got a hat, Novak? No. Nope. Then you're all ready. Come on. Oh, get your brain lined up and look at her. She's been dead a couple of hours. You're still eligible, Novak. On your way down, you can explain that guy at Pier 19. Oh, you can't be that dumb, Hellman. I'm smart enough to see you peeking over the eight ball. You look like a ten-to-one shot, Novak, and I got my money on you all the way. If you're going to make this thing add up, you can't do it alone. I'll try. Well, that's what Furpo said. So I don't look good on this one. I'll look worse if I leave it up to you. You couldn't find a hangnail if you knew what hand it was on. You got 24 hours, Novak. I'm going to piece things together, and then I'm going to make a pinch. Pick out a soft spot. Yeah? Yeah. Stay near the phone. If it rings and a man answers, that'll be homicide. Good night. Hellman was right. I looked like a sure bet for the Rhoda Gravure section. I was beginning to run out of silver linings, and I knew it. I didn't have an answer for anything. The guy in the boat was still a stranger, and Rita Malloy was still dead. I was sitting in the middle of a high-stake game with a pair of trays. When we left the hotel room, I had the funny feeling that there was something wrong back there. I didn't know what... I just knew there was something wrong, the way you feel when you pick up the wrong hat and put it on. The position of the body, those pictures on the desk, I didn't know, but there was one detail that didn't set right. Well, I told Jocko to hang around headquarters, and I started for the El Palateo. It was like all the rest, a little melancholy bar on Mason, a fire trap with a cover charge. The decor looked like early Franco. The floor show was on as I fought my way up to the bar. Excuse me, please. I'm sorry, lady. Can I get through here, please? How about a drink? Your idea. What do you want? Scotch. Soda or water? Water. You got a nice club here. We like it. 80 cents. Too bad about Rita Malloy. Yeah. You don't seem heartbroken about it. I'm not a mother. Eighty cents. Anything wrong, Eddie? No, boss. This guy's crying in his beer about Rita Malloy. Oh. I'm Manny Ryan. You own the club? A piece of it. My name's Novak. Call me Patsy at the moment. The police think I killed Rita Malloy. When you go on trial, Mr. Novak. I don't. That's why I came down here to find out which one of your people killed her. I see. She was mixed up to her ears with some thick hoodlum. You, Mr. Novak? No, a guy right out of your set. He came rolling in with the tide this morning, playing rigor mortis all over my boat. Look, Novak, you better go see someone else to tell your troubles to. I'm a busy man. Yeah, well, so am I, getting out of a murder rap. You knew her, Ryan. 
In fact, I got an idea you knew her pretty well. Let's not talk that way about the dead. Your picture splattered all over her apartment. Were you engaged to her? That's one way of putting it. You better have a big fat alibi ready for tonight. Homicide's going to think you killed her. I'm betting on you for the finals, Novak. I don't need an alibi. She was a friend of mine. That's why you need one. People just hate their enemies, but they kill their friends. You better stay out of the public library, Patsy. You're not smart enough to understand epigrams. I'm smart enough to find out where you were from 10 o'clock until midnight. Go ahead. Circle around the club. But keep a drink in your hand. We run for profit. I didn't get much out of the doorman. He wanted a first mortgage to talk, but one of the busboys opened up. He told me that Ryan and the girl had brawled the night before. Also, that Ryan left the club for about an hour tonight. Well, that put him on the list anyway. But it began to look more and more like a one-horse race. Well, I got one other lead. A clarinet player in the band wanted to harmonize with Rita Malloy, but there wasn't much else to go on. And then I spotted the gal who had taken Rita Malloy's job in the show. She was just finishing her number, and so I followed her back to a dressing room. When she opened the door, I got a nice warm feeling like a melted cheese sandwich, and I was looking around for a rope to hang on. She was pretty. And when she said hello, you knew it was time to send in the varsity. Good evening. For some people, you mind if I come in? It's late in the season. I can't be choosy. Uh, I'm Pat Novak. I'm Tony Drake. What do I do? Tremble? Talk, mostly. Did you know Rita Malloy? Around here, that was an occupational hazard. The police think I killed her. Did you? No. When I got there, they were tearing down the goalposts. Oh, that's too bad. I'd have been very grateful. Uh, that's something I'd like to try. Are you switching the topic, Mr. Novak, or have I been in the big city too long? I just want to know who killed her. You got any ideas? Nope. How about your boss? Maybe. She was getting a little frayed around the edges. How's his temper? No worse than a cobra's. He might have done it, but I doubt it. Anybody else? He was putting in a little overtime with a thug. Not a big, porky guy with a deep voice? I never saw him. I just heard that he was trying. Must have been quite a line. Anybody else? How about that clarinet player? Mm, no play. He was just a salmon swimming upstream. I see. Well, do me a favor, will you, Tony? All right. You only get one, so make it a good one. They're tailoring me for a trip over the hill unless I show up with a fistful of answers. Now, can you give me a list of all of Rita Malloy's friends? I can write them all down on a piece of confetti. I mean everybody close to her. The people around the club here. The people on the outside. I'll pick it up in a half hour at your apartment. At my apartment? Yeah, at your apartment. All right, don't get sore. I was just inquiring, not complaining. All right. One other thing, Angel. Yes, Patsy? Don't forget to put yourself on that list. Be seeing you. Well, it was good to get out of there. When she started walking towards you, you felt like a shovel full of scrap iron in a Pittsburgh blast furnace. Well, I called up Jocko at headquarters. He didn't seem to be worried about me. He was thirsty. The guy on the boat hadn't been identified yet. The coroner said he died of severe bruises and that Rita Malloy checked out with a fractured skull. I gave Jocko Tony Drake's number and I started for her apartment. I couldn't have done better with Aladdin's lamp. She had the list and a bottle on hand. I went over the list with her and then it turned out she had insomnia. The radio was turned down to room temperature. I was working on my fifth drink when the phone rang. Let it ring, Patsy. Oh, I better get it, baby. I think you're a sissy. No, prison pallor wouldn't look good on me. Hello. Patsy? Yeah? Are you busy? Well, depends on your point of view. What's up? I'm not tearing you away from that list of suspects. Let's have it, Jocko. Uh, they just identified the dead guy on your boat. His name is Bruno Swice. He's wanted in Miami, Florida. He's a hired gunman. Good. Now jump over and see Paul Stangle at the Chronicle Morgue, huh? I already have. There's no tie-up between Bruno Swice and Rita Malloy. There's got to be. Those two killings are tied up like ham and eggs. Hellman just got a report from the Harbor Patrol. They found a buoy knocked out of place. They figure your boat did it and Bruno got killed in the crash. What does that do to things? Oh, it 
clarifies them enormously. This way you're going to hang for only one murder. Good night, lover. <laughs> I knew Jocko was right. Hellman could rig me as long as he had only one case to work on. He's a single-celled animal, and this was just about big enough to fit into his brain. Well, I left Tony's apartment and walked over to the El Palateo. It must have been about four o'clock in the morning. It was still dark enough for me to kick in a back window without being seen. I headed straight for Manny Ryan's office, and I started going through his stuff. It was like trying to separate a ton of salt and sugar dumped in the same bin. I went through most of the drawers, and in the last one, I got a hold of something. I grabbed the phone on Ryan's desk and I called Hellman. Well, I wasn't sure, but I figured he could try this one on for size anyway. Police headquarters. Give me Hellman and Homicide. Yeah. They must have put their best men on his trail because they found him inside a half hour. Hello, Novak. I'm in Manny Ryan's office. He owns the El Palateo. I just rifled his desk. That's a minor offense for you. I got a hold of last month's phone bill. Guess what? It's too high. The office put through two calls to Key West, Florida, the last part of this month. Four o'clock. I'm barely interested. Go ahead. Bruno's Weiss hired out as a gunman. San Francisco is a long way from home plate. That means somebody sent for him. And you're trying to put the finger on Manny Ryan. That's right. That silver frame you picked up at Rita Malloy's? Take a look at the guy in it. That's her boyfriend, Manny Ryan. Uh, we'll check on it. In the meantime, keep squirming, Novak. You look pretty. Oh, you're smooth, Hellman. Smart talk's not going to keep you out of the chair, Novak. Stay handy. We've only got a short extension cord. Yeah, well... Hello, Hellman. Hello, Lupos. Frank, is Jocko Madigan there? Good. Put him on, huh? Hello, Jocko. Now listen, I'm up at Manny Ryan's place. Yeah, that's right. I'm not sure, but I think that Ryan's the... Mm. My head must have looked like a jackpot. Everybody in town was hitting it. I rolled over and played dead for about five hours. It feels better when you've had a dress rehearsal. I woke up in my apartment. The sun was streaming through the window and hit the bed. I looked like the muslin counter after a sale. It turned out I was the host and didn't know it. Jocko was sitting at the table having breakfast. The bottle was almost half shot. Good morning. How's the other world? <sighs> Uh, can't so you I leave that stuff alone? Guy, no. Do you I have a headache? A boozer, but of course I have a headache. Well, well I haven't, so stop lecturing me. Head How'd I get up here? I dragged you here by the heels. Down I here. met all the other hucksters on the way. All right, stop being funny and help me up. Huh? I am the victim of a common error. You don't like me because I'm not entertaining when I drink. You don't object to my drinking, you object to my lack of wit. Oh, shut up, will Well, you? it's discouraging to be condemned on moral principle when it's really a flaw in nature. Uh, by the way, I think they're going to arrest you for the murder of Rita Malloy. What about Ryan? I've recommended Clemens. All right, come on, what about Ryan? You bungled it. By the time Hellman got to him, he had an alibi all framed... The calls to Key West could have been made by anybody in the club, and Ryan's covered for the time of the murder. How about the others? They look good, too. Your girlfriend, Tony Drake, was gone for a while the night of the murder. Hellman won't bite. She's just sitting there ready to spring an alibi. That's right. With legs like that, she can dig up a cousin. You better get worried, Patsy. I am, I am. The El Palateo is a dead-end street. I don't know where to go from there. That guy Bruno in the boat could help. There's some connection between Bruno's wife and Rita Malloy. You're the only connection I can think of. Yeah. Hello, Novak. This is Hellman. Yeah. You were right about Bruno's wife and Rita Malloy. We just went through her safety deposit box. I'll bet you handled the money. She had a clipping on Bruno's wife from a Miami paper, 1937. Go on. Divorce action between Zweiss and Miss Olga Pryor. Well, did you look up Olga Pryor? That's where we run out of gas. Nobody knew her. We have no description. Well, how about Rita Malloy? Any dope on her before 1937? I was going to ask you. You were in the room with her when she died. Don't you know? No, I don't. I'm disappointed. I figured you'd know a little about her habits. Huh? You wrote the book, mister. I figured you for an answer. Yeah, I got one. And you just gave it to me, Hellman. Huh? Meet me at the El Palateo in a half hour. Now, if you're a real good boy, I'll tell you who killed Rita Malloy. Are you going to be there? Yeah. That's all I want to know, Novak. <laughs> Thank you. 
Things were falling into place like a fixed roulette wheel. Right from the first, I knew that there was something goofy about the picture in Rita Malloy's hotel room. I wasn't sure. I just knew I had something in the back of my mind. I didn't tumble until Hellman tipped the mitt. And then everything was cakes and ale. I sent Jocko up to room 425 in the Royal Arms Hotel, and I told him to get a description of every dress in the closet. I checked at the desk, and I got the name of Rita Malloy's cleaners. I ducked over there, and I got a list of every dress that she turned in for three months. I met Jocko, and we compared the list of dresses. Well, it jibed fine, except for one thing. There was a missing white dress. It had been to the cleaners before. It wasn't there now, and it wasn't in that hotel room. Well, we went over to the El Palateo to find it. Jocko didn't want to buy the scheme at all. Patsy, I protest the notion of breaking into a lady's dressing room. Well, stop worrying, will you? She's not going to be there. Then it's futile as well as immodest. Besides, uh, how do you know Rita didn't throw away the dress? I'll give you better than track odds on that one, Jocko. Here we are. Come on. Now, look, you take the closets and find that white dress. I'm going through the desk for grease paint. You should be going through a woman's closet. It's more in the nature of things. Just look, huh? Well, there's enough grease paint here for the whole Iroquois tribe. Did you find anything? Yes. Watch this. Just look for the white dress, Jocko. Hey, what's that in the corner? Where? Over here. I don't see anything. Well, down here, look, see? Oh. Well, well. That feels good, doesn't it, Jocko? Like a spell of perfect weather. Same grease paint? Well, it won't take us long to check. Here, you open a couple of these jars. Don't huh? forget your apron, Patsy. Hello, Tony. What are you doing? Getting ready to build a fire under you. You're going to make nice smoke, too. I liked you better when you were dumb, Patsy. You don't look good with a Ph.D. Oh, put away the gun, baby. Remember, this is your second trip to the plate. Give me the dress, Patsy. It won't fit. I'll worry about that. Just toss it over by the door here. I'll do better. I'll bring Stay it. Stay where you are, Patsy. It's my ticket out, chum. You're a good guy, Patsy. Stay out of my way. It's your role, baby. Patsy! Patsy, please stay away from me. Come on, give me that gun. Patsy, please! Give me that gun! <laughs> Sorry, Patsy. That's all I could do. Yeah, sure. You want to take a look at her, Jocko? Put it down on the floor. Yeah. What do you say, Jocko? No dice. Well, you can't win them all, Tony. You play too rough, Patsy. You still got a good batting average, Novak. Hello, Hellman. You better make a fast pinch. She do it? Yeah. She got kind of clumsy in the last round, didn't she? Not at all, copper. They had me coming and going. When you're as far back as I am, they don't pick up the option. Let's get out of here, Jocko. I'll check with you later, Hellman. Be a good boy, Patsy. I'm going to miss you. You were getting to be my favorite hobby. Yeah. I don't know how you were on the distance stuff. But you were sure something on the sprints. Yeah. Be nice to her, Copper. She could go in the mud herself. It was blackmail, of course. Tony was once married to Bruno's wife. Rita Malloy found out and started to squeeze Tony. Well, Tony wouldn't buy that, so she killed Rita Malloy in her hotel room. She made one mistake. I didn't tumble until Hellman mentioned a woman's habits. Then I knew what was wrong with that picture back in Malloy's hotel room. It hit me like a discordant note in music. Rita Malloy was lying on the floor in a dressing gown, but... She was still wearing her bracelet and necklace. Well, when a woman undresses, she always takes her jewelry off first, and then she takes off her dress. Rita Malloy didn't do that, so I took a flyer and decided that somebody had taken the dress off her and put on a dressing gown. Why? Well, because there was something wrong with the dress. It pointed too much in one direction. Oh, it could be a lot of things, but probably grease paint. 
Tony called Bruno out here. He was supposed to use my boat to dump the body, and when he didn't make it, Tony got scared and lugged away the dress. My 70 bucks? Well, it would have looked better on a fixed fight. Well, Hellman asked only one question. How did I happen to know that when a woman undresses, she always takes off her jewelry first? I must have read it somewhere. The Armed Forces Radio Service has just brought you Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Pat Novak is produced by William P. Russo. Jocko Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adler. Be with us again next week when over most of these same stations we'll bring you Pat Novak for Hire. Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now let's drop in for our weekly visit to Sherlock Holmes' friend and ours, Dr. Watson. Well, Dr. Watson, how are you this evening? Uh, never better, Mr. Bell, thank you. And you? Fine, thanks. Uh Uh-huh, I see. You've kept your promise to open your dispatch box and bring out your files in connection with the adventure of the Carpathian Horror. Indeed I have, Mr. Bell, just as I promised. And a most macabre adventure it was, too. I'm eager to hear it. So you shall, Mr. Bell, so you shall. But first, uh, am I correct in deducing that you'd like to have a word with with our listeners? (laughs) A most accurate deduction, Dr. Watson. Men, if you want your hair to look handsomely groomed from morning until night, use Kremel hair tonic. Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oil to keep hair perfectly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Kremel never gives hair that offensive, cheap, greasy look. Kremel always looks and feels so clean on both hair and scalp. Try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the adventure of the Carpathian horror? It all began with this very letter which I have here in my hand, Mr. Bell. A letter from a most prosaic firm of solicitors. Holmes and I were at breakfast one spring morning in June 902, shortly after the end of the South African War. Holmes had been bored and restless since the conclusion of our last case, and this was the first time that I'd heard him laugh for days. I must say, Watson, that the Morning Post has brought at least one unusual communication... For a mixture of the modern and the medieval, of the uh, practical and the wildly fanciful, this letter is really the limit. Oh? Why, Holmes? Listen. 
24, Gray's Inn, London, June the 4th. Re-vampires. Re-what? Re-vampires. The legal mind is always precise, no matter how odd the subject. The letter goes on as follows. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Sir, our client, Count Paul Romani of Grasny in Carpathia, whose trustees we are, has made inquiry from us in a communication of even date concerning vampires and demoniac possession. As our firm specializes entirely in trusteeships and chancery work, the matter hardly comes within our purview, and we trust that you will be able to take the matter in hand. We hope you will call upon us at your earliest convenience with a view toward undertaking the case. Please ask for our Mr. Atterbury. We remain, sir, faithfully yours, Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Entwistle and Dodd. Oh, Scott Holmes, that's the weirdest farrago of legal jargon and sheer nonsense that I've ever heard. I wonder, Watson... The mention of Carpathia is most significant. Significant of what? Uh, for one thing, that remote and mountainous section of southeastern Europe has been the stronghold for centuries of all the legends of vampirism. Oh, rubbish. Oh, come, come, Watson. Where's your spirit of adventure? After weeks of lying in the doldrums, here's a fresh breeze from the unexpected uh, environs of Gray's Inn. Come on, it's a beautiful morning for a walk. Well, where to? Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Entwistle and Dodd. And then, I hope, Carpathia. Really, Holmes, of all the forsaken spots that I've ever seen, this is the worst. Not a light in sight, not a sign of human habitation. And you've dragged me two-thirds of the way across Europe on what will unquestionably prove... A wild goose chase. At least we have our fishing rods with us, my dear fellow. And we can always console ourselves with the promise of some of the best trout streams to be found anywhere. And you must admit that this mountainous Carpathian country offers some superb scenery. I <laughs> might admit it if I could see it, as it's uh, black as the ace of spades, to coin a phrase. <laughs> ah, there we are. Here, look out of the window on this side. And there are the lights of the castle. Cheerful looking place, I must say. When did that fellow Atterbury say that it had been built? The first Count Romany built it in 1410. 1410? That's given it almost 500 years in which to disintegrate. Do me a pile of stone if ever I saw one. Look at all those turrets and battlements. Probably damper inside than out. Well, we'll soon see. Aye, careful with that luggage driver, careful. And here you are, my man. Well, they follow that driver. You'd think the devil was after him the way he drove off. He shut up the moment he heard our destination. Evidently, the Count's local reputation is not an enviable one. Well, I can't say that we're getting a very warm reception. Well, they must have heard us, driver. Well, here's the door, but I can't see any sign of a bell. And they seem a trifle short of modern conveniences. Let's try the knocker. Oh, I really think this is perfectly outrageous, Holmes. Why the devil's a... Yes, the name. What you say? It's the name. Oh, foreign Holmes. Uh, do you speak English? What you want? Nobody can come in. Count Romania see nobody. Uh, Count Romania is expecting us. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. You got letter? Yes. Here. Come. What did I tell you, Holmes? Look at these walls. Simply oozing dampness. You, uh, wait here. There, Watson. That's better, isn't it? That fire will take the chill out of your bones. I need something to counteract the effect of all those family portraits. <laughs> Rum-looking lot, aren't they? Remarkably interesting collection. Curious how the family likeness remains unmistakable through so many generations. Well, judging from the looks of that fellow in the wig, cirrhosis of the liver must have been another of the family's inheritances. Hard-drinking crew, probably. Terrible, Mr. Holmes. I'm Count Romany. I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Thank you, Count Romany. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Dr. Watson, it was good of you to come so far. Uh, something to drink, gentlemen? Oh, a little something would go very well, thank you. Good. I don't know just how much my solicitors in London may have told you, Mr. Holmes. A very little, Count Romany. Uh, so little, in fact, that I must confess my surprise at your perfect command of our language. Oh, well, my father had me educated in England. Very sound, sir. Couldn't do better. Sit down, gentlemen. Sit down. I... I hardly know where to begin my story. 
The whole thing so horrible. Perhaps it'll make it a bit easier for you if I tell you that Mr. Atterbury showed me your letters to him. Then you know that... that I believe I'm going mad. Or worse. Oh, Dr. Watson will bear me out, Count Romany, when I tell you that uh, people who really are on the verge of insanity never think it of themselves. Oh, no, that's quite so, quite so. I wish I could share that belief. But you see these portraits of my family. There have been strange legends coming down through the years of occasional weird and nameless horrors that have taken possession of each fourth generation. The fourth Romany died mad. The eighth lived out his life in a locked and guarded tower of the castle. And I am the twelfth Roman. All old families have legends. That's uh, hardly a basis for any fear. I, I quite agree with you. But some months ago, my father died, and I became the twelfth count. A few weeks later, I retired to bed one evening after reading quietly here in the library. Only to undergo a dream of such vividness that I shall never forget it. A dream of brightly colored corridors. Their length stretching endlessly into the distance. There are walls echoing with strange, unworldly music. In my dream, I hurried from empty room to empty room through floods of brilliant, very colored light. I saw no people, no living thing, only the rooms of ruby and gold and jet and sapphire and emerald. At times, the music seemed to be far away, thin and cold, as though coming from the depths of interstellar space. And then again, it would seem so near that, that I was certain I would find its source in the next room that I entered. In my endless search for I knew not what. At last, after a ounce of time, I awoke to find myself in my own bedroom. Oh, but my dear fellow, my dear fellow, a vivid dream's nothing unusual. It wasn't a dream, Doctor. It was what I saw upon awaking in my room. My door was still locked. But the rug bore the imprint of wet and naked feet. And across the foot of my bed there lay, still dripping, some strands of weed from the moat of the castle. Surely there's a natural explanation for that. Yes, my boy. Are you by any chance subject to walking in your sleep? No, Dr. Watson. And even if I were, I could not have walked through a locked and bolted door. And the windows? The windows of my room give on a wall of the castle that drops sheer for 60 feet. Nothing but a fly could go up or down. Well, Mr. Holmes, the next morning, a dog belonging to one of the local woodcutters was found dead in the castle moat. And with no blood left in his body. And the next time, time Count Romany, I'm certain there must have been repetitions to bring you to your present fear. The next dream came a few weeks later. Again, I saw the brilliantly colored rooms. Again, I heard the unearthly music. And when you awoke? I was in my bed. And for a moment, I thought that nothing was wrong. Then... When I turned up the lamp, I saw streaks of gray across my bedspread and grayish footprints upon the rug. Dust? Dust, Mr. Holmes. And a moment later, I received horrible confirmation of its source. For lying beside me on the pillow was the heavy, ancient wrought iron key which unlocked the burial vaults of the Roman. Oh, extraordinary thing. Since your action in sending for me shows that you don't lack for moral courage, Count Romany. I'm certain that you paid an immediate visit to your family vault. Quite right, Mr. Holmes, quite right. In the company of my cousin Peter and several of the servants, and with torches to light our way, we visited the subterranean vault which is cut into the mountainside under the castle. And you found? We... We found that the coffins of the fourth and eighth Count Romany had been opened. Their lids shoved aside, and the bones of my ancestors tumbled out upon the stone. Lord. Here, 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 my boy. Here. Drink this. You'll feel better. Thank you, Doctor. Well, now you understand, Mr. Holmes, why I sent for you. I do indeed. I consulted doctors. They gave me pills to make me sleep when sleep was the one thing I dreaded. The local priest spoke learnedly of exorcism and its possession by the devils. But it could not put an end to my dreams. The servants have run away in superstitious fear. Oh, except old Anton, who admitted you. The peasants flee at the sight of me. Only my cousin Peter Hallis, who has stayed bravely and loyally at my side, still remains with me. Mr. Holmes, am I mad? Tell me, am I mad? Or am I cursed by some fearful family taint? All that I can tell you at the moment, Count Romany, 
is that the priest was not mistaken when he said the devil has been at work here. I must apologize, gentlemen, for our limited cuisine. But with all of the staff gone except old Anton, our meals are rather scratch affairs. Oh, my dear Count Romani, your wine cellar more than makes up for it. You know, if you would take my prescription, Paul, and get out on a horse every day for a few hours of hunting, you would have a better appetite. <laughs> my cousin Peter is quite a materialist, gentlemen. He believes that all the evils of the flesh and the spirit can be cured by enough exercise. <laughs> and I will wager that Dr. Watson agrees with me, eh? Huh? And Doctor. Well, there's a good deal to be said for your theory, Mr. Hellas. Men sana in corpore sana, you know. <laughs> your cousin is, of course, familiar with the events you described to us earlier, Count Romanian. Of course, Mr. Holmes. I've no secrets from good old Peter here. And what is your opinion of these strange events, Mr. Halash? Too much reading, too much thinking, too much brooding about the sins of our ancestors. I only hope that you and Dr. Watson can persuade Paul that all these dreams of his are just a lot of nonsense. Well, I hope so, too, I assure you. Uh, and now, gentlemen, I imagine you're ready to retire. We've had a long and wearying trip. I'll ring for Anton. Should there be a recurrence of your dreams, Count Romani? Please call me the instant you awaken. Oh, well, damp walls or no damp walls, I shall have no trouble sleeping tonight. I'm afraid you will, Watson. What? Huh? I intend that one of us shall keep the Count's door under observation all night. For heaven's sake, why? There's no doubt in your mind the poor chap is definitely unbalanced, is there? Is that your opinion? Certainly. Oh, curious cake of delusions I overheard. Poor chap, absolutely certifiable. Nevertheless, Watson, we shall keep watch. I'll take the first, and I shall call you at midnight. What's the matter? Watson, wake up. Uh, what's up? I thought you were on watch. Oh, I must have dropped off. I can't understand Let how. Let wait. Uh, what is it? The Count. Come quick. Look, look Mr. Mr. Holmes. My cousin. There in his bed. Good heavens, Holmes. There's blood smeared all over his hands and on the bedclothes. But no sign of a wound. Just a minute. I can feel his pulse. He's only fainted. Now, what happened? I, I heard him cry out. I ran down to his room. The door was half open and Paul was lying across the bed. Just as you see him now. It is the curse of the Roman youth. Anton, stop that nonsense. No nonsense. Priests say my master possessed by evil spirit. What's that? Sounds like someone riding hard. Coming this way. I will go to the door. Uh, you were right, Holmes. I can't find any sign of a wound on his body. I can't imagine where the blood came from. I very much fear that I can. What do you mean? Holmes. Holmes. Count Roman. Oh, my dream, Holmes. My dream. I had it again tonight. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. That's the police inspector from Grazdia. A young girl was murdered tonight. Oh, no. And the prints of a man's naked feet led directly here to the castle. Just a moment, we'll find out what happens next in the strange case of Count Romany. Men, when you buy a hair tonic, get your money's worth. Enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. But Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. You simply can't beat Cremel to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. No wonder Kreml is preferred among America's most successful men. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kreml daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what happened after Count Romani's third and most terrible dream? Well, Romani was such a, in such a state of profound shock over the horror that had taken place that I thought it best to administer a strong sedative. 
Leaving Anton to watch over his master, Holmes and I, with Mr. Peter Hallish, to act as interpreter, drove down with the police inspector to the home of the murdered girl. Ask the inspector to bring that lamp a little nearer, will you, Mr. Hallash? Jose de Orlenfight. Shocking, Holmes. Simply shocking. Her injuries look as though they'd been done by a wild animal. You're quite right, Watson. <laughs> My poor cousin. Well, no court could hold him legally responsible. He'd have to be put away, of course. Hello, what's... What's all that shouting outside? It's the peasants. The news must have spread. They're shouting, To each our fellow Kosh, they burned the castle. Follow of vampire. Death to the vampire. Hakasuk cell. Hang him. Well, Holmes, we'd better drive back to the castle immediately. That mob's in an angry temper. They mustn't be allowed to wreak their vengeance on that poor mad boy. Quite right, Watson. I've seen all I wish to hear. Come, Mr. Hallish, we'd better be getting back to the castle just as fast as we can. As a medical man, Dr. Watson, do you think that there's any chance that my cousin, under proper treatment and care, might eventually be brought back to normality? Well, I'm afraid not, Mr. Hallish. In fact, these cases generally grow progressively worse. Well, here's the poor fellow's room. He's probably still asleep from the effects of the sedative that I gave him. Ah, oh, Anton, is the Count still asleep? Well, oh, speak up, man. The bed, it's empty. He's gone. Gone? Gone? He's gone where you never find him. My master, no way for you to lock him up like animals. What shall we do? Where has he gone? Those peasants will be here in an hour. Holmes? What are you looking for? For something that should be here on the desk. Something the Count showed us last night. The key to the Roman burial vault. But, but why should he... Why should he take that, Mr. Holmes? Gone right enough. Bring that lamp, Watson. We may yet be in time to avert the final disaster. Careful, Doctor. Steps ahead here. The floor is very slippery. This passageway must have been cut out of the very heart of the mountain. It was. they deep in the rock itself. If all these twistings and turnings haven't confused my sense of direction, we must be almost under the castle. That's right, Mr. Holmes. The burial vault is dying. Oh, boy. Are you there, Watson? Oh. Yes, sir. My feet simply went right out from under me. It's broke the lamp, I'm afraid. I know the passageway. It's not much farther to the burial chamber. We will have to go slowly, though. Make what speed you can. I'll keep my hand on your shoulder. Watson... Do the same with me. I only hope it hasn't occurred to him to lock the door of the vault after he entered it. If it did, we're beaten. Be careful now. The passage bends sharp to the right. Just a bit farther along. Well, wouldn't it be more merciful, Holmes, to let the poor fellow take his own way out? After all, the best we can save him for is a living death in a madhouse. Ah, that's a glimmer of light just ahead. The door to the vault. It's ajar. He must have a lamp inside. Let me go first. Faint, I can't see much. What are all those big, bulky shapes? The stone coffins of our ancestors. There's something moving over there in the shadow behind that stone pillar. It's a count. He's got a knife. He's... Don't go, Robin. Be careful, Holmes. He's mad. Let me go. Let me finish it. Oh, I don't want to stop. Drop that knife. No, no. Give me a hand here, Watson. I've got it. I've got it. Oh, you're wounded. Oh, it's nothing. Just a scratch on my head. Why did you have to interfere? I'd be better off dead. Come, Paul. You mustn't talk like that. Take the lamp, Mr. Hallash, and lead the way. I want to get your cousin back up to the castle at once. Against my rule to take a drink before breakfast, but this morning I'll break that rule. Thank you, Anton. Sit here, Count Romany. And you, Mr. Hallash, over there. Anton, lock that door and remain in case I should need you. Oh, what is the use of prolonging the agony, Mr. Holmes? If you'd let me finish things down there... We haven't much time left, Count Romany. The peasants from the village may be here at any moment. Well, then turn me over to them and let them do what they want. You know we would never do that, Paul. We will protect you no matter what happens. And no matter what you may have done. After all... You weren't responsible for your actions. I'm afraid I must correct you there, Mr. Hallash. Count Romania is and has been fully as responsible for everything he has done as any other sane person. What sort of riddle are you asking us, Holmes? Are you attempting to deny Count Romania's uh, dreams, the episode of the dog, the burial vault, and the horrible death of that girl? I'm not offering a riddle, Watson, but its solution. 
Your dreams, Count Romani, had one feature which immediately led me to suspect their unnatural origin. You spoke of brilliant colors, of unearthly music, of a distorted sense of space and time. All characteristics of the dreams, or more properly, visions induced by the drug Cannabis Indica, more commonly known as hashish. Good heaven. And since you showed none of the signs of the habitual drug taker, it was at once obvious to me that your dreams were being induced by someone else. Someone who administered the drug to you in your food or wine on those occasions when they desired you to have one of your hallucinations. But last night, the girl, the blood... The blood stains were the final confirmation, if I needed any, that you had not committed the crime. The real killer slipped badly there. It did not occur to him when smearing the blood upon you and the bedclothes that during a four-mile walk from where that poor girl was killed, the gull, the blood would have dried upon you and not come off upon the bedclothes. Peter Hallash, have you ever seen an execution in this country? Why do you address me? What have I to do with all this? Who but you would inherit the Romany title and estates? No, no! In the early hours of dawn, the prisoner is led out, his hands tied behind him, the priest walking in front and the jailers on each side. Mr. Holmes! He's led to this the stained wooden enough. block in the center of the prison courtyard, where there stands a giant figure in full evening dress, his hands covered by white gloves, his face masked. It is the execution. Stop it! Then, as Stop the wicked man Holmes. is bent forward on the block... The executioner raises his gleaming axe high into the air for the final blow. I've had enough. I... Have you ever seen that, Peter Hallash? No, no. I am innocent. I swear it. Do you think a judge will believe you? No. He did not do it. He speaks true. It was I. You shall do nothing to harm him. Can't on you. I, this is impossible. I do it for my master and for revenge. But you never take me alive. Stop him out of the window. <laughs> no need to look out of the window. It's a drop of a hundred feet to the courtyard below. Oh. And perhaps it was best it ended that way. But, Holmes, I, I, I still don't understand. It's not difficult if you study the facts. Oh, poor Anton. But why did you accuse me, Holmes? Anton's fanatic plot to drive the Count to madness or suicide and to see, see you in his place almost succeeded, Mr. Halash. When his sleeve slipped upward and I saw the cut he'd made on his arm to supply the blood, I knew that he was the girl's murderer. But there was only one way by which I could force the truth from him. And I suspected that his devotion to you was so strong that only an accusation against you would unseal his lips. A hatred that Anton must have nursed since childhood. I knew that my father had wronged his family, but... Well, I, I thought that was all dead and buried history. Not to a fanatical Carpathian peasant, Count Romany. Mr. Holmes, you've given me back my life, my sanity. There was never any question of your sanity, Count Romany. I saw that from the moment you first told me about the story of your dreams. Well, nevertheless, I don't know how I can ever thank you properly. If um, you and your cousin will introduce Watson and myself to some of your famous local fishing, I'll consider it thanks enough. And that uh, reminds me, Watson. Would you mind taking down a telegram for me? This little cut uh, momentarily precludes the use of my right a hand. A telegram? Of course, um... Oh, you'll find the pen and ink on the table there. All ready. Who's it to? Messrs. Uh, Wilkinson, Wilkinson... Entwistle and Dodd. Gray's in London, England. How do you spell Dodd? The two Ds, Watson. Re-vampires. Gentlemen, I take pleasure in informing you that I have brought the matter of your client, Count Paul Romagny, to a satisfactory conclusion. Trusting to be favored by you with any further such commissions that uh, may arise, I remain your obedient servant, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> friends here is specially transcribed for you as a famous celebrity, that great authority on feminine beauty, the king of glamour, John Robert Powers himself, Mr. Powers. Thank you, Joe. Well, that was quite a send-off. I thought it might be of interest to our audience tonight if I brought along one of my Powers girls. As you know, these lovely Powers girls appear on magazine covers, they star in exclusive fashion shows, and very appropriately are called long-stemmed American beauties. So tonight I'd like you to meet... Miss Maria Morton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mmm, that's a very attractive spring hat you're wearing, Maria. Like it? Yes, very much. But how about removing it so we can see those lovely shining locks? Why, of course. I'd love to. Mmm, Maria, your hair certainly looks like a million dollars. Thanks to you, Mr. Powers. To me? Yes. The first advice you gave me when I became a Powers model was to always wash my hair with cremel shampoo. 
And I must say, never in my life have I used any shampoo that left my hair more radiant. Yes, I'm completely sold on Cremel Shampoo. You see, Cremel Shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair to reveal all its natural brilliant luster. And don't forget to mention the built-in oil base. And that's what helps keep the hair from becoming dry and brittle. The Powers girls tell me that after Cremel Shampoo, their hair holds a wave and curl much better. In fact, I certainly recommend Cramble Shampoo not only to the Powers girls, but to every woman who wants to bring out the radiant, shining beauty in her hair. Thank you very much, Mr. Powers, for this beauty tip. And many thanks to your beautiful model. And now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, next week I think I should tell you about the strange death of a young Sussex schoolmaster. And how Holmes solved one of the most bizarre and most terrifying mysteries that we ever encountered. I call it The Adventure of the Lion's Mane. Tonight's adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Sussex Vampire. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time, when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the lion's mane. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Well, here we are again visiting the genial Dr. Watson in his cheerful study. We sit back in our comfortable chair and wait to hear another exciting story. What could be pleasant? <laughs> you go again, Mr. Bell, flattering me again. If only Sherlock Holmes were here to make the picture complete. No, Mr. Bell, you know that's impossible. He retired to Sussex years ago and took up bee farming. I suppose you visited him there. Naturally. As a matter of fact, I remember one Saturday towards the end of July in 1907 that we... Is this the beginning of a story, Dr. Watson? I shouldn't be surprised. But hadn't you better have your word with our listeners first? Yes, Dr. Watson, I had. Men... I'm sure you'll be interested to learn that a recent survey showed that Kreml hair tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives and most successful men. But after all, why shouldn't it be? Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. Such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Kreml always keeps the hair neatly in place longer with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet it never leaves your hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. After you apply Kreml, you can rub your hand over your hair and your hair always feels so delightfully clean. Notice, too, how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Just use a little Kreml on your hair in the morning, and at night your hair looks as neatly groomed as when you first combed it in the morning. Remember, no other hair tonic keeps your hair more handsomely groomed. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, I'm all ears. Well, I was paying Holmes one of my frequent visits. His cottage is situated on the southern slope of the Sussex Downs, commanding an excellent view of the English Channel. At this point, the coast is made up of chalk cliffs, which can only be descended by a single tortuous path, which is steep and slippery. At the bottom of the path, there are curves and hollows, which make splendid swimming pools, and are filled afresh with each flow of the tide... And warmed by the sun. What town is Mr. Holmes' place near? A village called Falworth. But even that is at a distance, and the house is quite lonely. Half a mile away is Holmes' only neighbor. And who is that? Harold Stackhurst, who's the headmaster of the well-known preparatory school, the Gables. 
A private school, I suppose you would call it. It was summer, and most of the boys were away on holiday, except a few who were catching up. The teaching staff was reduced to three. First of all, there was Harold Stackhurst himself, who was an old pal of mine. We went to school together. He was a splendid fellow and a well-known blue for rowing in his day. Assisting him were two younger men, Fitzroy McPherson, red-headed and cheerful. In summer and winter, he went for his morning swim. Winter swimming, quite a spartan. <laughs> yes, indeed. The other schoolmaster was Ian Murdoch, a tall, dark man, taciturn and aloof, with occasional outbursts of temper. The villain of the piece, hmm? There you go, anticipating again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Stop this. Well, it was early one morning, just after sunrise. There'd been a severe gale the day before, but the wind and the waves had finally abated and everything looked newly washed and fresh. The air had a decided nip to it, and Holmes and I were on our way down to the beach for our morning flight. I say, Holmes, that water's blue this morning, isn't it? Rather cold-looking, if you ask me. Do you good, Watson. Your circulation needs toning up. You can run all the way home. Run up the cliff path? Oh, that's the hard... Rubbish. The boys do it. Well, I'm not under the delusion that I'm still in my first youth. <laughs> Hello. Isn't that Stackhurst coming along the cliff? He's got a towel over his arm, obviously going down to the beach. He's not afraid of a little cold water. And he's almost as old as you are. He's older. Oh? Oh, great deal older. He was two forms above me at school. Dear, dear, quite an old man. I had no idea oh, that... Stop ragging me, Holmes. Hello there, Sackhurst. Hello. Hello. Going swimming? Yes, wait for us. Come on, Watson. Oh, bless my soul if it isn't Watson. Delighted to see you, old chap. I thought you weren't coming down for another well, month. Well, I just couldn't stay away any longer. I'm so fond of the swimming here. Yes, Watson has just been saying that there's nothing like a good dip before breakfast to tone up the system. <laughs> What did you say, Watson? Oh, I think, I think so. Stankhurst, where are your two young assistants? McPherson and Murdoch, the gloomy Scot. I've never known them to miss their matutinal plunge. Oh, well, Murdoch has had to keep some of the boys at their algebra. He'll be along later. Uh, McPherson has gone on ahead. I expect he's in the water now. Any more outbursts of temper on Murdoch's part lately? No, not since last week, when he found a boy putting toads in his bed. <laughs> His temper is ferocious, Holmes. I suppose I should give him dismissal, but he's such a confoundedly good teacher. A little bit of temper won't harm the boys now and then. Help to keep them in line. Yes, I'll wager the next fellow who wants to put extraneous objects in Murdoch's bed will think twice about it. Look, there's someone staggering up the edge of the cliffs. Yes, he's in bathing trunks and an overcoat flapping in the wind. What's the matter with him? He's drunk, probably. Look at him real. A fine example for my boys. Um, who the devil can it be? It's... Yes, it's McPherson. I could tell that red hair anywhere. He's trying to wave to us. I've never known him to behave like this. He's not drunk. He is in agony. He needs help. Hurry, Watson, run. I say, he, he, he's fainted. No, 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 he's, he's trying to get up again. Help! Well, he, he's writhing on the ground. Courage, old boy. We're coming. Pain. Pain. I can't breathe. He's killing me. What is it? What's happened to you? <laughs> The maid. The lion's maid. But, good heavens, he's having convulsions. His face is turning purple. Uh, yeah, now he's stopped. Thank heaven. How is he, Watson? I can't see him breathe. He, uh... Wait a minute. Yes, he's, he's dead. Some terrific shock. His heart gave out. Look, he's bitten through his lower lip in a paroxysm of his agony. What could it have been? He's not wounded. No signs of a struggle. Take that coat off. Let's take a look at him. Easy now, easy. Good heavens, Holmes, his back. Just look at his back. Great red welts round his shoulders and round his ribs. Oh, this is terrible. What was it he tried to tell us? He said something about a lion. A lion's mane, to be exact. Well, you don't think he's being clawed by a lion or some wild beast? In this part of England? It, it, it's, it's unthinkable. Quite. Besides, the claws of an animal would have dug deeper. These welts are inflamed and there are little red spots at certain intervals. It looks as if someone has used a lash on him. A thin iron scourge with knots. Poisoned knots. Who could it have been? There's been no one along the edge of the cliff. And we can see for miles. No, no, on the beach. And there are some fishing boats, but they're too far out. 
I wonder... Uh, did anyone bear him a grudge? Had he quarreled with anyone? Why, no. Uh, that is, not recently. I... Hello. What's up? Why do you all look so serious? Well, hello, Murdoch. Now, where did you come from? The classroom. I just left the boys. But what's the matter with McPherson? What's he lying like that for? He's dead. Murdered. He's been flogged to death. Dead? That's horrible. Who could have... We don't know. Is there anything I can do? Yes. Yes, go back to the house. Send for the police and keep the boys indoors. I don't want them mixed up in this. Certainly, of course. Dead, I... I can't believe it. Stankhurst, you stay here with the body. Watson and I will go down to the beach to see what we can find. Good. But don't be any longer than you can help. Come along, Watson. Here's the path leading down the face of the cliff. The only path for miles. If he was attacked down on the beach, the murderer is still there. I say, he may be armed. I'd better go back for my revolver. Suppose the murderer goes for us. Oh, rubbish. Come along. We've no time to waste. They escape. Careful. There's clay here. Slippery. Look, Holmes. Footprints. Yes, the same ones descending and then returning again. But first, and undoubtedly, that means no one else has been to the beach by this path since the storm. And here's the mark of his hand where he fell, and the print of both knees. That's all that the path holds for us, now to the beach itself. Look, look, there's quite a lagoon left by the tide. His towel is lying beside it. Folded and dry so he didn't enter the water. There's his sweater beside the pool. Look here, on the sand, footprints. Naked and with a canvas shoe. Crescents again, that proves he made ready to bathe, but the towel shows he returned without bathing, or at any rate, without drying himself. Well, look, Holmes, there are some distant figures up there on the beach. Mm, too far away. Besides, this lagoon lay between them and the person. Perhaps the fishing boat. Perhaps, but I can see no sign of a boat having been beached along this shore. Yes, but then, uh, who, uh, how... Uh... Quite. Couldn't have been Stackhurst. We saw him coming from the direction of the gables. Hmm. How about Murdoch? He has a glowering look. I don't trust him. Do you think that he really was up at the school with the boys? That is an alibi we shall have to look into. Uh, hello, Stackhurst. Why did you leave the body? Uh, Murdoch set down one of the gardeners to stand watch over it, so I, I came along. Besides, I, I just thought of something. Yes? Uh, you asked if anyone had a grudge against McPherson, and I, I thought I ought to tell you. Go on. Well... About a year ago, this chap Murdoch was rather fond of a girl down in the village. But McPherson cut him out. Well, Murdoch didn't seem to mind at the time, but about two months later, McPherson and Murdoch had a pretty bad row. Now, Murdoch was always a bit fiery, you know. Well, when McPherson's dog got excited, he went for Murdoch, and Murdoch went into one of his rages and threw the animal out of the window. Well, the dog wasn't hurt, and the, the quarrel was patched up. At least so we all thought. But you never know. Resentment sometimes smolders for a long time. Yeah, particularly if there's a woman in the case. Quite. Well, let's have a look at the towel and sweater. We've seen everything else there's to see down here. Hello. There's something in the pocket of the sweater. Hmm. It's a note. Dear me. A note of assignation. Huh? What's it say? We'll be there in the same place, darling. Oh, until there you are, then, woman. Oh, my me. love, Maudie. Why, that's the girl. The one I told you about, Maud Bellamy. McPherson was in love with her. Obviously. This whole affair has upset me so it may give the school a bad reputation. It was only by chance that several of the boys weren't with McPherson when it happened. I say, was it chance? After all, it was Murdoch who held them back. He was the one who insisted on algebra before breakfast. At present, I'm more interested in this girl than in Murdoch. Suppose we take a walk to Falworth and call on her. Oh, I do. I'm with you. Come along. Oh, not so fast, Watson. Not so fast. We'd better dress first. We might cause quite a stir parading down the village streets in these costumes. Remember, you've still got your bathing suit on. Oh, dear, yes, sir, I have. And I'd forgotten all about how, how chilly it was. In just a moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes discovers in his visit to Maud Bellamy. Men... I'm sure you'll agree that well-groomed hair adds a great deal to a man's appearance. And one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So start at once and take better care of the hair you've got. 
If you're smart, you'll use Kremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly in place without looking or feeling greasy. But Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kremel's light oils have a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, Kremel removes itchy, loose dandruff. Notice how alive, how tingling your scalp feels. And men, you like to massage Kremel on your scalp because it's such a clean product. It never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair, like so many men's, is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So for handsome groomed hair and a more hygienic scalp, use Kremel daily. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drugstore. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. That famous modern hair tonic which has become such a nationwide favorite. Now, Dr. Watson, you dressed and went over to Forworth to call on McPherson's girl. Is that right? Uh, that's right, Mr. Bell. Stackhouse pointed the house out to us. That's the Bellamy house over there, Mr. Holmes. The one with the corner tower and the slate roof. Maud is the daughter of old Tom Bellamy, who owns all the boats and bathing huts at Falworth. He was a fisherman to start with, but uh, now a man of some substance, I believe. Yes, judging from the house, he must have come up in the world. And Maud is the prettiest girl for miles around. Quite a beauty, in fact. She must have had scores of admirers. By Jove, look who's coming out of the front gate. I say, it's Murdoch. And what in thunder is he doing here? Hey there, Murdoch. What do you mean by coming over here? I thought I... I am your subordinate, sir, under your own roof. I am not aware that I owe you any account of my private actions. Your answer is pure impertinence. So is your question. This is not the first time that I've had to overlook your insubordinate ways. But it will certainly be the last... You will make arrangements to leave my school as soon as possible. I intended to go in any case. Lost the only person who made the Gables habitable. Insolence. How dare he, young whippersnapper. Mrs. Stackhouse, he seemed very eager to clear out of here. Perhaps you were a trifle hasty in giving him an excuse to go. I never thought of that. Uh, shall I tell the police to place him under arrest? No. We can prove nothing against him as yet. Better persuade him to stay until we are sure he didn't do it. Very well. It's against my principles, but I'll... I'll go after him and see what I can do. Splendid. Now, Watson, suppose we call on Miss Bellamy and present our condolences. I take it that Mr. Murdoch has already broken the news of the tragedy. Ring the bell, that's a good fellow. Well, don't you think it's a, a bit heartless, Holmes, calling at this time? If the girl has any character at all, she will want to help us discover the murder of her sweetheart... Any woman with any... What do you want? We would like to speak to Miss Bellamy. Well, you can't. You are her father, I take it. Yes, I'm her father, and I know you be, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. And I'm not having you mixing my daughter up in any of your dirty business. I thought you might want to help us solve the murder. Ah, you did, did you? Well, I'll have you know I consider Mr. McPherson's attentions to my maud was insulting. And my son, William, is of the same mind. Letters and meetings, but never a word of marriage. I'll not have you breaking her out. I'll not have her name dragged That's through the... That's all right, Father. I know that Fitzroy is dead. I want to help find his murderer. I'll not have you mixing... This is with... my business, Father. Let me manage it in my own way. I'll do anything you say, Mr. Holmes, to help bring them to justice. Why do you say them? Mr. McPherson was not a weakling. He was brave and strong. No single person could have inflicted such an outrage on him. Uh, one thing more. We found this note in the dead man's pocket. Can you throw any light on it? Did he go down to the beach expecting to meet you? No. I sent it. It's true. But we were to meet tonight. I see no reason for mystery. We were engaged to be married. We only kept it secret because Fitz didn't want to be ragged by the boys at the school. Here is my engagement ring. Well, you might have told me. I would, if you had shown a little more sympathy, Father. But the note, it didn't come by post. Who was your go-between? I'd rather not answer that question. It really has nothing to do with the matter. Do you realize that this go-between was the only person who knew of your meetings with young McPherson? Had he any reason to resent him? That's no business of yours. You had many suitors, I believe. Yeah, that she did. Was Ian Murdoch one of them? There was a time when I thought he was. But all that was changed when he found that Fitzroy and I cared for each other. Miss Bellamy, 
Do you think it natural that a hot-tempered young fellow like Murdoch would get over his feeling as easily as that? What are you trying to make me say? If you think Ian Murdoch had anything to do with a murder, you're wrong. A finer man never drew the breath of life. He wanted us to be happy. He wasn't the kind to think of himself first. He'd gotten over his feeling for me. Then why did he want to be the first to tell you the news of your fiancé's death? Because he was Fitzroy's friend. He thought it was his duty. He thought he... What does it matter? Fitz is dead. Why don't you find his murderer? What's the good of all this? Hmm. Thank you for your information, Miss Bellamy. Leave me alone, can't you? Leave me alone! Go and find the murderer if you're so clever. Perhaps we shall. Well, good day. Looks like another blank wall to me, Holmes. Perhaps. But even that is enlightening. There are only so many possibilities, Watson. We may finally arrive at the correct solution by crossing off all the rest. Detective on a case, you seem extraordinary lackadaisical. You spent the better part of the last three days up in your garret among your books. I've been looking for the solution, something I once read. It's in the back of my mind, but I can't seem to bring it into the light of my consciousness. Yes, and in the meantime, this Murdoch fellow may slip through our fingers. Once he leaves the school, we'll never be able to get our hands on him again. I wonder that he has, hasn't left before this. Oh, how can you sit there so calmly and say that, Holmes? You're losing your grip. Perhaps I am, perhaps I am, I... If I could only find the fact that I'm looking for. It began with a C. I'll swear it began with a C. Well, then, how about the old encyclopedia there? Look up all the C's in the book. But I'm not sure it is C. Oh, Holmes, you're being exasperating and exaggerating. You know that the murder didn't escape along the beach or even climb to the top of the cliff. But did it ever occur to you that it it might see be, be somebody hiding in one of those caves? Some sadistic maniac? Yes, it did occur to me. But it's not possible. I searched every one of those caves and there's no trace of human habitation in any of them. Oh, and my theory of the sadistic maniac's all wrong. Yes. Huh? Oh, huh? And horrible as that theory sounds, I'm convinced that the truth is even more horrible. That death came from the sea. And the truth is more ghastly than anything you can imagine. Oh, you make the chills run down my spine. I must say, I shall never have the courage to go swimming down there again. And a wise thing, too. At least for some time. Well, I must say, I don't see how young Murdoch has the nerve. Murdoch? Murdoch went swimming down on that beach? When? About a quarter of an hour ago, I saw him go by with a towel over his arm. Why didn't you tell me? Come on, we must bring him back. Poor boy, he hasn't a chance. Oh, oh good heavens, Holmes. I, I had no idea. Look. Something's happened. Someone's coming up the path. Stackhurst. He's carrying someone on his back. By thunder, it's Murdoch. And he's in bathing trunks. Help! Holmes! Watson! Something's happened to Murdoch! What is it? It's the same thing that killed young McPherson. I met him, st I met him staggering up the face of the cliff. He was too far gone for me to get him home, so I, I brought him here. Put him on the couch. Uh, have a look at him. His heart is giving out. He can hardly breathe. His face is turning quite black. Here, quick, Holmes. Pour me out a glass of that brandy over there. Right. Hold his head while I, I try to get it down. That's it. That's it. If he can only swallow. That's it. Now, now some more. That's better. Take the bottle. You can't give him too much. His, his color is coming back. He's, he's beginning to breathe again. His heart is getting stronger. Look, it, he's trying to talk. It lashed me. In the water. It lashed me. Now I remember. In the water, of course. Oh, the pain. It's terrible. I can't stand it. Give me something. Morphine. Anything. I don't give him a sedative. It might affect the heart. Holmes, here, get the cotton wool there and the, and the olive oil. Right. Oh. What is it? It's a poison of some kind. It affects the nerves, apparently. Oh. Must be terribly painful. Oh. Here's the stuff you wanted. Good. But now saturate the cotton wool. Oh. You put a dressing... 
on his back. Oh. Now, that's right. You oh. use plenty of oil. Oh. There we are. That's better. Oh, that's much better. By Jove, he's fainted. I don't think so. He's just fallen asleep from sheer exhaustion. Well, Watson... How's our patient coming along? Splendid. Uh, the nurse says we can move him tomorrow. Splendid physique that boy must have had to stand up under the strain. I says, Techist, we all owe that chap an apology for suspecting him of uh, McPherson's death. Yes. But who in Zunder did kill him? I'll show him to you, if you like. You, you discovered the murderer? Yes. One of the most gruesome instruments of torture ever devised. He is waiting for us at the foot of this cliff. But is it safe to go down? You said that murder... Yes, if you don't go too near. Come along. All right, if you say so. Well, the tide's coming in. I don't see any murderer. I mean... No, he's not as obvious as all that. Treacherous as well as deadly. I must say that this place gets on my nerves since the tragedy. I, I haven't allowed the boys to go in swimming lately. I, I suppose it's foolish of me. I... On the contrary. You would have had a few more tragedies if you'd allowed them to swim. This death strikes like lightning. There's no escaping it. But, great God, if, if it's as dangerous as all that, we'd better get back up the cliff before before the murderer finds us. We're quite safe unless we take a dip in the lagoon McPherson went swimming in. Well, but I thought you said that he, he didn't go into the water. So I did. The towel fooled me. The truth of the matter is that he was in such agony when he came out that he failed to use the towel. That's what threw me off the track in the first place. But the murderer... Down here. Where's he? Under the cliff where the lagoon is quite deep. Ah, there's your murderer on that rocky shelf about three feet below the surface. Look down there. See it? Why, it's a tangled mass. Great Scott, it's alive. It's vibrating and waving. A hairy creature with streaks of silver amongst its, its yellow stresses. Oh, what a, what a foul and sinister thing. Sinister enough. The death that comes from the sea... As fatal as a cobra and more far-reaching. That is Cyanea, the fearful stinger, sometimes called the lion's mane. Well, I've been born and bred in these parts, and I've never seen anything like it. Ugh, look at that foul thing. Well, it doesn't belong to Sussex, I swear. Just as well for Sussex. The southwest gale must have brought it up. What do you say? Shall we end this murder forever? Oh, shall we end it by all means? Very well. I think this boulder should do the trick. Help me move it. It's too heavy for one man. Right. There she goes. Good. The boulder has settled right on the filthy creature, pinning it to the ledge. Uh, one edge of yellow membrane is still flapping. Not for long. Notice the oily scum oozing out from under the stone rising slowly to the surface. That is the end of the killer. Lion's mane. I've never heard of that before, Dr. Watson. Ah, uh, Mr. Bell, now that I, Holmes discovered the article that he'd been searching for and read it to us. The full name of the dreadful creature is Cynia capillata. It radiates almost invisible filaments to the distance of 50 feet. Within that radius, it is as deadly and far more painful than the bite of a poisonous snake. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell you about next week's story. But first, ladies, here's a sensational beauty tip direct from Hollywood. When you want your hair to look its radiant best for an important date... Do this the night before. Give your hair a glamour bath with Cremel Shampoo. I certainly agree with that, Mr. Bell. And you know, Cremel Shampoo is the shampoo used by those famous beauties, the flowers models. Cremel Shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. 
It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays that way for days. And please bear in mind that Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Yes, Cremel shampoo uncovers all the natural highlights that lie concealed in every woman's hair. Yet it never dries the hair. In fact, Cremel shampoo has a built-in oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Cremel shampoo whips up a luxuriant, active foam, even in the hardest water. It rinses out so easily and never leaves any dull, soapy film. So, ladies, why not buy a bottle of Cremel shampoo at any drug counter and glamour bathe your hair to tantalizing loveliness? K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, next week I think I'll tell you where Holmes and I visited a mad scientist who lived on a rocky island in one of the Scottish lochs. And of the strange things that happened there, I call it the adventure of the island of death. Tonight's adventure was adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Lion's Mane. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures, Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at the same time, regardless of whether you change to daylight saving time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the island of death. This is Tom Conway. Your help is vital in the drive on cancer, the disease that must be stopped. Help save future lives. Give to the cancer drive. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Once again, it's Monday night, and time to call on our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's waiting for us in his study, so let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, there you are, Mr. Bell. I was just having a glass of extremely mellow port. Perhaps you'd care to join me. Thank you, Dr. Watson. You're always the perfect host, just as you are the perfect storyteller. Oh, you flatter me, my boy, though I must confess that the ingredients which make up tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure are so strangely assorted that even an old gentleman like myself can hardly fail to make it an exciting yarn. And just what are the ingredients in tonight's story, Dr. Watson? Well, let me see. Take an almost deserted island set deep in a Scottish loch. Sprinkle it generously with the following assorted selections of humanity. One measure of evil scientist. A faint wisp of human skeleton. A considerable pinch of fat lady. A handful of professional contortionist. And a dash of midget. Agitate these ingredients well, then add to the mixture a detective by the name of Sherlock Holmes and a certain doctor by the name of Watson. (laughs) Season generously with fear, danger, and sudden death. And you have the recipe for the story I call The Island of Death. Dr. Watson, you're you're beginning to make the hackles rise in the back of my neck. Indeed, then, since hackle means hair, I think perhaps you'd better have your word with our listeners before I begin my story. Yes, I will. Men, if you want to be a success in life, if you want to look like a success in life, remember that well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. I've heard so many men complain lately that the hairdressing they use is too greasy or too highly perfumed, that it leaves a sticky and flaky residue on the hair. That's why I urge you to try Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed, every hair in place, with a rich, healthy-looking luster. And it gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Yet Kreml never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Kreml, just run your hand over your hair. 
Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. So tempting for the ladies to touch. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Kremel always gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut look. As if you just combed it. And it keeps it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. And now, Dr. Watson, how about the new Sherlock Holmes story, The Island of Death? Well, Mr. Bell, as I told you, most of that exciting adventure took place on a tiny island in the Scottish Lake District. However, it began innocuously enough, as so many of our adventures began, in our rooms at Baker Street. It was on a stormy September evening, and Holmes and I were seated on either side of our fireplace. I remember after dinner that he began to analyze the old cliché that truth is indeed stranger than fiction. I can almost hear him now, as he said... My dear Watson, the true picture of the criminal world is stranger than anything which the mind of man could invent. Oh, I'm not sure that I agree with you, Holmes. The police reports and the papers are usually quite undistinguished and dull. True, old chap. But that's the fault of the reporters. Depend upon it, Watson, there's nothing so unnatural as the commonplace. Oh, let's put it to a practical test. I pick up the evening paper. Uh, here is the first heading upon which I come. A husband's cruelty to his wife. Now, there's a half a column of print, and I bet you that without reading it, I can tell you the gist of the trouble. I accept your bet, Watson. Give me your deduction. Oh, it's not very hard. There is, of course, the other woman. The extra drink, the push, the blow, the bruise, and the sympathetic sister or landlady. The crudest of writers could invent nothing more crude. <laughs> your example is an unfortunate one for your argument, old fellow. Very fortunate, old The old article to which you refer is the Dundas separation case. Hmm? The husband was a teetotaler. There was no other woman, and the conduct complained of was that he had drifted into the unfortunate habit of winding up every meal by taking out his false teeth and hurling them at his wife. An action which I think you will agree is uh, not likely to occur to the imagination of the average storyteller. Hurling false teeth? Oh, absolutely fantastic. Quite. Uh, what else could that be? You expecting a visitor? Yes, Watson, I am. And he might well prove a client who will point out the moral of our little discussion. Oh, what makes you say that? The gentleman calling on me is a distinctly colorful personality by the name of Stephen Singer. He's nearly seven feet tall, and yet he weighs under eight stone. A card from him this morning informed me of his intention of calling here at seven o'clock tonight. You said that he weighs under eight stone? That's only 130 pounds. He must be a human skeleton. That was the unfortunate title applied to him at the circus sideshow at which I first met him. Good Scott, circus freaks here in Baker Street. Huh. I'll have seen everything. Freak is an unkind and inappropriate word, Watson. Stephen Singer is a fellow human being, and a more than usually, unusually worthy one. In the case of the Bagshot Circus murders, he was good enough to take advantage of his uh, almost unique physical proportion and oblige me by hiding in the barrel of a circus cannon. His evidence was instrumental in sending a diabolical murderer to the gallows. Uh, let him in, will you, Watson? Yeah, of course. Good evening, Mr. Singer. Come along in, won't you? It's, it's all right. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. It's good to see you again, Stephen. Hello, Mr. Holmes. Don't want to make a nuisance of myself, but I did have a little problem, and I thought perhaps you'd help me with it. Of course, Stephen. Sit down, won't you? By the way, this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Doctor? How do you do, Mr. Singer? My friend was just telling me that you once held him, helped him in a, in a murder case. Oh, that. To hurt nothing. Just slipped myself into the cannon barrel and heard one or two things I wasn't meant to. <laughs> Nevertheless, your help was invaluable, Stephen. I shall be only too happy to do what I can to repay the favor. What's your problem? Well, uh, perhaps I'm imagining things and perhaps I'm not. But wouldn't you say it was a rum thing if a professor offered me and three of my pals from the circus 50 quid apiece to go to some island in Scotland for a week? Yes, indeed. I should say that uh, that's extremely odd. Can you give me a few more facts? Well, Mr. Holmes, this professor come to the circus three nights ago when we was playing at Stafford at a bow. Hmm. What was his name? Uh, professor McElwraith. Funny-looking cove with a bushy red beard he was. Indeed. I've heard of the gentleman. I understand that he is something of a rebel in the medical profession. He returned from Vienna recently where he's been studying under Dr. Freud. Dr. Freud? Never heard of him. You will, Watson, you will. Mm -hmm. He devotes himself to the psychological aspects of the human body. Pray continue with your story, Stephen. Well, Mr. Holmes, he approached me and three of me pals. And uh, who are those uh, pals? Well, there was Bill Carew, the major we call him. He's a midget. And there was Belle Brackett, the fat lady. And the third was a bloke who joined the circus two days ago. Jeff Walton is his name. I haven't seen his act, but he builds himself as the injured rubber man. 
Uh, Professor, promised us 50 quid apiece our tickets on the Scotch Express tomorrow morning and told us he'd have a boat waiting to ferry us out to his island when we got there. Holmes, there's something devilish going on here. Professor who studies psychology wants four people to go to a lonely island. A midget, a contortionist, a fat lady, and the fourth... Oh, oh. Uh, that's all right. I'm used to a doctor. The force, a human skeleton. Oh, I wouldn't say that. That's what you were going to say. Now, we all agreed to go up there. Uh, we didn't like the bloke, but none of us can turn down 50 quid. Mm, but we got to talking after he'd gone. Supposing he's up to doing us a bit of no good. And anyway, he made us sign that paper. Paper? What paper? I don't remember it too well, Mr. Holmes, but it did say that if anything was to happen to us, the professor wasn't responsible. That's what started us to talking and worrying after he'd gone. And that's why I've come to you. I'm glad that you did, Stephen. Did you inform your friends of your decision to come to see me? See me? Uh, no, Mr. Holmes, I didn't. I might have done it if I'd have been sure you wouldn't have laughed at me. I'm convinced that this is no laughing matter, Stephen. Unless I'm much mistaken, there's devil's work afoot. And then you'll come up there with us, Mr. Holmes? Yes. Tomorrow morning, Dr. Watson and I will meet you in Scotland. <laughs> The lake looks extremely choppy, Holmes. The boat's quite small. I hope it's not too far to the island. I'm a wretched sailor, you know. I'm sure it'll be a smooth trip, Watson. Well, I certainly hope so. Hello? Here comes Singer with the other three. Great Scott. What strange-looking traveling companions. Well, since they traveled on an earlier train, I think it's time to have Stephen introduce us. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Mr. Holmes. I'd like you to meet some pals of mine. Uh, Dr. Watson, Mr. Holmes... This is Miss Bell Brackett. Uh, careful, Bell, watch your step on the gangplank. Well, dearie, got to be a strong plank to hold me up. How are you, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson? How do you do? How do, you do? Oh, thank you. Uh, this is Bert Olney. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Don't know what you do on the bill, Governors, but I can kick the back of my head with both feet at once. Oh, really? Very useful, I should imagine. Providing you're not standing up. What's your act, gentlemen? Act? Well, we haven't exactly got an act. Just regard us as friends of Stephen's. We thought a little trip to the Highlands might do us good. Huh. It'll do me 50 pounds worth of good. That's all I know. Put 50 more pounds on me, dearie, and I'd explode. No. And this is Bill Carew, the major, we call him. And Dr. Watson, and Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Good evening, gentlemen. I do hope this isn't going to be a long journey. I'm really rather a poor sailor. Well, I just said the same thing myself, Mr. Carew. Oh, call me Major. Everyone calls me Major. I suppose it's incongruous when you consider that I'm only four foot three, but I do like, like the nickname. Have a cigar. Cigar? Oh, no, thank you, Rose. Well, Major. we're all aboard, Mr. Holmes. Might as well get going, I suppose. Why not, Stephen? All right, Captain. We're all here. You may as well get started. Dr. Watson. Uh... Yes, Mr. Alden? Do me a favour, will you? Give us a scratch between the shoulder blades. Give you a what? A scratch between the shoulder blades. Oh, that's, just... oh, that's it. As soon as we cross the border, these Scots fleas started to bite on me. Thank you kindly. A starlit night, Watson, and a spanking breeze. I wonder what adventure lies in store for us. I have a feeling that Professor Mac McElrath may not be too glad to see us. Why did you come here, Holmes? I know who you are and what you do. Why are you so interested in my obscure experiments? For two reasons, Professor McElwraith. First, Stephen Singer is a friend of mine, and second, I have an insatiable curiosity, particularly for experiments that require obscurity. I want to know why a student of psychology wishes to isolate four malformed humans on a lonely island. All right, stay. Stay into the devil with your boat. You can't leave this island until I give the word, oh, my inquisitive yeah. friends. Well, 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 quiet! Quiet! Now, four of you and my employees for the next few days. Two of you, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, are uninvited guests. Professional meddlers, as they assured me. And I've no reason to doubt that assurance. <laughs> Holmes, here, the man's as mad as a hatter. Quiet, Watson. Uh, since you're all to be on my island during my experiments... 
I should like you to study this map and acquaint yourself with the place. Here you'll see are the guest houses, all interconnected by telephones. And I've installed the very latest form of that admirable new device. Now, down this path lies the snake house. Snakes? I can't bear snakes. It may not be necessary for you to meet them, Miss Brackett. Of course, I do use them in my experiments. Oh! Now, this path over here leads to the haunted watchtower. An interesting edifice, as you will discover. Seven enemies of James VI met a most peculiar death there. <laughs> You'll find that they continue to meet that death quite regularly. Look here, Professor. I don't like the sound of these. Nor do I. You tell us what these experiments are that you keep talking about. With pleasure. Tell us. I've long known that the malformation of the body, of uh, freaks, if you'll forgive the expression, is caused by glandular deficiencies and imbalances. My studies have convinced me that these same glandular defects produce psychological alterations. For instance, you, Miss Brackett, weigh four times as much as you, Mr. Singer. It'll be interesting to see how differently each of you reacts to the same stimuli. What do you think we are? Guinea pigs? Well, you talk of applying different stimuli to these people, Professor McElwraith. What kind of stimuli do you intend to apply, may I ask? Every stimulus that the many resources of this island will enable me to apply. Fear, hunger, desire, envy, hatred. This should prove most illuminating. Most illuminating. I won't stand for it. We're human beings, not a bunch of animals. That's right. Let's go out. Larry, you're right, Bill. Of course he is. The bloke's barmy. Let's get on the boat and go back. I quite agree with you, sir. You're com absolutely inhuman, Professor. Mind your own business, you meddling fool. I paid these people to come here. And they're going to stay. You and your friend are more than welcome to leave, however. No, Professor. I shall make myself personally responsible for seeing that these good people return to the mainland tonight. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Indeed. Then you must be an extremely strong swimmer, Mr. Holmes. What do you mean? The boat left this island an hour ago. It will not return for five days. You fools. You grotesque idiots. You're trapped. So go to your quarters, all of you. Go on. And don't be surprised if I begin my experiments before the night is over. Well, Holmes, if we are marooned on an island with a madman and four members of a circus, I suppose we might as well make the best of it. Oh, dear. I think I'll turn in. What the devil's that? The telephone. The wretched instrument. They're just a passing fad. They'll never catch on. You mark my words. Yes, what is it? Mr. Holmes. Are you in your cottage? Since I'm obviously at the other end of this wire, yes. Dr. Watson, is he with you? Yes, why? I'm worried, Holmes. A few moments ago, I caught a glimpse of a figure standing near my library window. I'm speaking from there now. I thought it might be you or Dr. Watson. But if it isn't, I'm afraid... And well, you might be, if only of your own conscience. I'm afraid of them, the freaks. They're so angry. They might will... I'd hardly blame them. If you're frightened for your safety, the best thing to do is to let us all leave here at once. Are you sure it's impossible to summon the boat before five days are gone? Well, no, I did lie about that. I could give a signal in the morning by hoisting a flag on the watchtower. Just a moment. That was a stone dust against my window. I'll be back, Holmes. Don't hang up. What does that devil want, Holmes? Sounds distinctly subdued. He's frightened, Watson. He says there's someone lurking outside his window. Holmes! Are you still there? Yes, Professor. What's that, wrong? That frigate just standing in the shadows. I can see it from where I'm talking. I can't see the face, but it's... Holmes! It's raising its arm! It's got it! Oh. I'm afraid it's murder, Watson. Quick! We must get over to the big house as fast as we can. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll find out just what happened to Professor McElwraith. Every man who takes pride in his appearance should know that handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. And when you buy a hair tonic, be sure to get your money's worth. Be sure that you enjoy the extra advantages of Kreml hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains an amazing combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Kreml keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day. 
and it always gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance. Never sticky or greasy. But men, Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kremel leaves your scalp feeling so alive. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes, and it's simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if you, like so many men, have hair so dry it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Let Kremel help keep your scalp hygienic, your hair always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, when you got over to the big house, did you find Professor McElraith was dead? Yes, Mr. Bell. A quick examination of his crumpled body told me that he was beyond mortal aid. Holmes lost no time in examining that room of death. This crime isn't very hard to reconstruct, Watson. The dead man was standing here as he spoke his last words to me on this telephone. Yes, and the window is beside the instrument. The glass in one pane is shattered. Yes, at a height of approximately five feet. Oh, the professor was shot in the temple. He was about six feet tall. The line from his wound through the broken pane would indicate that the killer stood out there in the rose garden. Watch up, Mr. Holmes. Yes, we heard a shot. Anyone get a theory? Yes, I'm afraid they did. Professor McElraith has just been murdered. Murdered? Well, can't say I'm sorry. Perhaps not, Major. But the fact remains that his killer must be brought to justice. By the way, only three of you are here. Yes, where's Bert Alner, the contortionist? I don't know. He went straight to his cottage when we got back from the big house. Uh, that's the last I saw of him. You know, it's a funny thing. I was only half awake, Mr. Holmes, but I thought I heard two shots, uh, about five minutes apart. Two shots? And Bert Alner has not appeared? We must go over to his cottage at once. <laughs> Is he hurt bad, Dr. Watson? No, a flesh wound in the back. He was lucky. Curious. Observe the revolver lying on the floor beside him. The same caliber as the one used to kill the professor. Ah, see what Bert's done, Mr. Holmes. He killed the professor to save us all. That's right, Stephen. And then he tried to kill himself because he knew you'd catch him, Mr. Holmes. That's the way it must have been. Oh, he was a brave man. An interesting theory. Yes, but only a theory. Look at the position of the wound. I'll stake my medical reputation that it couldn't possibly have been self-inflicted. Holmes, this has been an attempt at another murder. More coffee, Watson? No, thank you, Holmes. I've drunk a blasted gallon and I'm still sleepy. And I've smoked almost the entire <sighs> supply of tobacco I brought on this trip, and I'm still very wide awake. I asked questions until well after midnight. And what did I learn? That the servants all alibi each other. Precisely. And... and that of our party of four, no one is able to provide an alibi for the other. So that it must be one of them. As ill-assorted a group of suspects as we ever met. Yes. It's a strange business. Why the attack on Olney? The professor, yes, that's quite understandable. But why Olney? What singled him out from the others? Oh, I don't know. He's a contortionist, but he's perfectly normal-looking. He, he doesn't seem like a freak. Of course. That's it. Thank you, Watson. You've given me the other end of the thread. Oh, have I? Round up the others and bring them to the haunted tower. The dawn is beginning to break, but before we hang that signal for rescue, I shall find the answer to this bizarre problem. Before we fix this signal flag, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to warn you that as soon as we reach land, I shall turn Professor McElwraith's murderer over to the authorities. Let it go, Mr. Holmes. Whoever it was did us all a good turn. Let's forget it. I'm afraid that murder is not a matter to be forgotten, Major. But surely you haven't forgotten the attempt on your own life, Mr. Olney. I feel nearly as good as new, Governor. I think the Major's right. Let's forget it. No, Mr. Olney. Not even on your request. Because the whole case centers around you. Who? Oh, me? Last night, while the murderer was standing outside his window, the professor telephoned me. He wanted to know if both Dr. Watson and I were in our cottage. The implication is obvious. You mean that the mysterious figure he'd seen resembled us in Bill? Precisely, Watson. 
Now, Mr. Singer's nearly seven feet tall. You, Miss Brackett, if you'll forgive me, could hardly be mistaken for us. You said it, dear. Oh, no, because the Major, he told us that he's only four foot three. It must have been you, Mr. Holner. But I got shot, too. And you said when you examined me that it was impossible. I could have done it. Medically impossible for a normal man, but I'd forgotten your profession. You're a contortionist. You could easily have shot yourself at, at, at such an angle. What do you have to say, Mr. Olney? That I, uh... Why not admit the truth? You're not a contortionist, are you? No, Mr. Holmes, I'm not. You see, my, my twin brother got the bit for this here job, but he had another engagement. And since the professor was so particular about the date, my brother told me to come here and we'd split the fee. But how did you know that he wasn't a contortionist, Holmes? You should remember, Watson. Huh? When we first saw him on the boat, he complained of the Scottish fleas and asked you to scratch between his shoulders. So he did, yes. A real contortionist would not have needed your assistance. So your medical verdict still holds good, Watson. Olney could not have shot himself. But you've ruled the rest of us out, Mr. Holmes. Not quite, Stephen. The simplest answer is that the mysterious figure that the professor described was disguised. Disguised? That theory would be confirmed by the fact that the killer, when he was in the garden, saw the professor standing at the telephone and deliberately attracted his attention by throwing a pebble at the window. Look here, Mr. Holmes, the sun's well up. I'm tired of all this theory stuff. I'm going to hang the flag on the tower. Very well, Major. But, Mr. Holmes, don't keep us on edge like this. Yes, dearie. You said someone disguised themselves. Now, who was it? Well, surely the answer is apparent. Not to me, it ain't. Could you, Miss Brackett, have reduced your excessive weight to appear the size of a normal man? No. Nor could you, Stephen, have decreased your excessive height. But the Major could have made himself appear taller with improvised stilts. And the Major's the only possibly gu guilty party. The Major? Well, I mean, it's hard to believe he'd done it. Well, even if he did, I still don't think we ought to turn him in, Mr. Holmes. Oh, no. Remember, he did it for us, dearie. Well, he didn't really hurt me when he took that shot at me. But that's just it, Orny. I might have been tempted if it were only the professor's murder. But he deliberately tried not to murder you, Mr. Olney, but to make it appear that you had killed the professor. But if he's arrested, there'll be a trial, dearie. And if there's a trial, you know how it'll be. They'll make out it was all because he's a freak. It'll be, it'll be harder than ever for people to accept us just as, uh, as people. It bears right, Mr. Holmes. It'd be bad for all of us. I think the Major has thought of that possibility. Look at him up there on the tower. He's hoisted the flag. Huh? He... Now he's teetering on, on the edge of the parapet. He's going to... Major! Major! Blimey, he jumped. Must be a couple of hundred feet down there. He doesn't have a chance. Ah, oh, the poor Major. He done it for us. Come on, oh, Belle. I'll take you back to the cottage. Major. I suggest we all return to our quarters and pack. This unhappy tragedy has reached its final conclusion. What a shocking business. You're right, Dr. Watson. When I came to you in Baker Street, I never dreamed it would end up like this. One thing I'd like to say, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Stephen? I, I want to thank you, uh, not just for solving the case, but because you treated all of us not as freaks, but as ordinary human beings. Makes a big difference, you know. I know of only one way to treat people, Stephen, and that is as each person deserves to be treated. If Professor McElwraith had only realized that truth, he would not have paid with his life. <laughs> When you girls go out on an important date, you naturally want your hair to appear just as beautiful and lustrous as it can be. So here's a tip from some of the world's most divinely beautiful girls, Powers Models. Girls who are famous for their enchantingly lovely silken sheen hair. We glamour bathe our hair with cremel shampoo. And I want to state that no other shampoo leaves the hair more sparkling clean. Really, girls... You'll be amazed how cremel shampoo brings out all your hair's natural gleaming luster. It leaves hair shimmering with brilliant highlights that last for days. Cremel shampoo is not a cream shampoo, not a soapless shampoo, not a drying detergent. After a cremel shampoo, the hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights. Cremel shampoo even has a built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. How right you are, Mr. Bell. Cremel shampoo leaves the hair so much softer, silkier, with satin smoothness. The hair holds a wave better, too. So, ladies, buy a bottle of cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to have naturally lustrous hair and a vision of shining beauty. K-R-E-M-L, 
Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, I'll never see it next week. Well, now, next week, I think I'll tell you uh, about another of our encounters with the infamous Professor Moriarty and how Holmes deduced that an apparently unimportant robbery in a Sussex vicarage was in reality part of a plot that threatened the safety of all England. I call it the strange adventure of the pointless robbery. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Case of Identity. Nigel Bruce appeared through the courtesy of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the permission of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time, when Dr. Watson will tell us about the strange adventure of the pointless robbery. America is strong only if her school system is strong. Today it's overcrowded and inadequate. So support your Parent Teachers Association. Do all you can to improve conditions in America's schools. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. And now for that pleasant moment when we pay our weekly visit to Sherlock Holmes' celebrated friend, the eminent Dr. John H. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Come in and sit down. Oh, I thought you might have forgotten your date, Dr. Watson, when I saw that your door was closed. <laughs> Not at all, my dear fellow. Rather the opposite. I'm afraid I neglected to keep an eye on the time. I was so deeply engrossed in searching through my files. With satisfactory results, I trust? Well, I hope you will find them so. You may remember after I told you the story of the lion's mane the week before last that you asked if Holmes had any other adventures in his beekeeping days. I do indeed, Dr. Watson. Well, I've been running through my notes concerning the remarkable affair of the pointless robbery. And I think you'll find it thrilling enough to keep you on the edge of your chair. I'm sure we all will, Dr. Watson. But first, men, I'm sure you'll be interested to hear why Kreml hair tonic is preferred among America's most prosperous and successful men. Kreml keeps hair handsomely groomed from morning until night just the way you combed it in the morning. Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This wonderful, natural-looking hairdressing has just enough light oil to keep hair perfectly groomed with an attractive, healthy-looking luster. Yet Cremel never leaves the hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. Cremel always looks and feels so clean on both hair and scalp. Be sure to try it, men. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what's the story of the pointless robbery? Well, it all began, Mr. Bell, on a delightful summer morning in August 1913. I was spending the first day of a week's holiday visiting Holmes at the small farm on the South Downs to which he'd retired and where he was devoting himself to nothing more serious than the raising of bees. <coughs> I must say, Holmes, that the quality of breakfast here convinces me that I've discovered the real reason your devotion to rustic life. A very sound deduction, Watson. And there's much to be said for the peaceful atmosphere of the countryside after the noisy hubbub of London. A peace which I fear may be only too transient, Watson. I suggest that you omit reading the morning paper during uh, your stay. All that talk of war in Europe, you mean? Nonsense, Holmes. In this year of our Lord, 1913, no civilized nation would dream of resorting to the outmoded fallacies of armed force. I trust you're right, Watson. I trust you're right. 
But, uh... uh I say, Holmes, you, you've got a visitor. Somebody's coming up the path. It's Mr. Kenmore, the rector of our local church. Another donation is indicated, no doubt. It would take the national budget to keep the church's ancient organ in good repair. Be a good fellow, Watson, and open the door while I refill the teapot. Uh, that you are, Holmes. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. Good morning, Mr. Kenmore. This is my good friend, Dr. Watson. How, How do you do, do, do sir? Doctor? A cup of tea? Uh, no, 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 thank you. No tea. And I must apologize for this unwarranted intrusion at such an early hour. Uh, some pressing matter in connection with the church? Uh, no, Mr. Holmes. The cause of my visit is a most mysterious and disturbing occurrence which took place at my residence last night. Oh, really? Uh, suppose you give me the facts. Uh, no doubt it will seem a minor matter to you, but I feel considerable agitation over it. Briefly, at some time last night, the rectory was broken into by thieves who ransacked the entire house, with the exception of the rooms in which my daughter Alice and I were sleeping. Oh, gracious me. And what was stolen? Uh, nothing. Nothing whatever. Was the thief frightened off? No, Mr. Holmes. We knew nothing of it until Alice came downstairs this morning to prepare my breakfast. She found the house in a state of the utmost confusion, obvious signs of forcible entry, and not a single thing missing. Odd. Very odd. I... I hesitate to ask you, Mr. Holmes, to concern yourself with such a trifle, but... You know our worthy constable, Tom Wilson. Yes, an excellent man when it comes to unlighted bicycle lamps, but beyond that... Uh, come, Watson, let's accompany Mr. Kenmore to the rectory and see what we can discover. So you see, Mr. Holmes, as Father told you, absolutely nothing seems to be missing. Not that the possessions of a country rector are of such great value. Nevertheless, that silver service on the sideboard would undoubtedly attract any thief's eye. A family inheritance, Mr. Holmes, one of my few valuables. I see that you've got rather quite a large library, Mr. Kenmore. Any books of great value there? Not at all, Dr. Watson. Sound suggestion, though, Watson. Oh, <laughs> This uh, French window which gives onto the garden seems to be where the thief made his entry. Quite. A circle of glass cut out of one of the panes. Then a gloved hand reaching in to turn the key. A gloved hand, Mr. Holmes? Undoubtedly, my dear. The blurred impressions are quite characteristic. And now that you've seen everything, Mr. Holmes, what do you make of it? It presents a most interesting problem, Mr. Kenmore. The disorder of the rooms would indicate a search for some definite object, even though you assure me that you know of nothing of value in your possession. And we must wait for developments. I think you and your daughter should most certainly be on your guard against the thief's return. You really think uh, there is... Mr. Kenmore, a... my friend is apt to see criminals behind every bush. The natural result of a, a lifelong career. Oh, perhaps, <laughs> Watson, perhaps. Well, we must be getting along. Uh, I wonder, Mr. Holmes, if you and Dr. Watson would do me a great favor before oh, you go. Of course, if it's in our power. Well, what is it? Would you think me too bold... If I asked you to let me take a snapshot of you both? Oh, really, Alice. Uh, I gave Alice a camera for her birthday last week, Mr. Holmes, and ever since then she's been making life miserable for everyone. I'm sure you could find two handsomer subjects, my dear. But Watson and I will be glad to have you immortalize our creatures. Yes, of course, naturally. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. I brought my camera down from my room, hoping you'd say yes. Well, I'm very sorry I was just wearing this old Norfolk jacket. <laughs> if you stand here, right beside the front door... Uh, well, just a moment. The wind's blowing my hair about a bit. Ah, there we are. <laughs> All right. Just look this way. Fine. Thank you so much. I hope you'll spare me a print or two if they turn out, my dear. I'll be very glad to. As a matter of fact, that was the last picture in the roll. Now I can take it down to the village and have Mr. Dilworthy, the chemist, develop it for me. I say, well, we're, we're passing by the chemist's shop. Uh, can't I drop it off for you? Thank you very much, Mr. Watson. That's very kind. Here it is. And thank you again, Mr. Holmes, for your kindness in troubling yourself with my problem. Not at all. And remember, Mr. Kenmore, be on your guard against a return visit. Looks to me as though you're falling asleep over your book, Watson. <laughs> I must admit, Holmes, that the combination of country air and that excellent dinner had a very soporific effect on me. Oh, don't apologize. We country dwellers keep early hours. <laughs> Certainly different from the old days in Baker Street. 
I'm surprised that you don't miss the excitement of the chase, Holmes. Professor Moriarty was the spice who kept the daily routine from becoming monotonous. But apparently he too seems to be in retirement. Oh, have you any news of him, Holmes? The last I heard, Scotland Yard had him fairly definitely located in South America. South America, huh? Which would indicate to anyone knowing the professor as well as I do that he may be anywhere on the face of the globe with the exception of South America. <laughs> well, old fella, I'm going upstairs to sleep to sleep. What the devil's that? The church bell. Come on, Watson. There must be something wrong at the rectory. <laughs> And I thought the quickest way of raising the alarm, Mr. Holmes, was to sound the church bell. Very wise. Uh, tell me, Mr. Kenmore, what was the first thing you heard? A sharp cry from my daughter awakened me, followed by a thud. I rushed into her room and found her. Well, she'll be all right, don't you worry, Mr. Kenmore. I've had to take several stitches, but she'll have a slight concussion for the next few days. But there's no cause for alarm. Oh, thank heaven, Doctor. When I rushed in and saw her lying on the floor... Her assailant had fled by the time you entered? The open window showed only too clearly the miscreant's path. Well, you keep her in bed for a few days, give her a light diet, and she'll be right as rain. Oh, oh that face, the window... Oh, she's very conscious, oh. poor girl, to be quite expected after oh. such a blow. No, don't touch me. Please, it's there, there on the shelf. No... No. The sleeping draft that I gave her will take effect soon. I blame myself, Mr. Holmes, for not having paid more attention to your warning. But I... That's thought... of no importance now, Mr. Kenmore. Uh, what's that? Uh, someone at the door. Pardon me. Wilson, high time you got here. You received my message? Oh, take your message as it brought me here, Mr. Kenmore. Ah, uh, worthy constable, Watson. There's been worse things happening in the village. What is it, Wilson? Oh... Oh, good evening, Mr. Holmes. Oh, there's fair devil's work afoot tonight. Oh, come, come, my man, what's up? Well, it's Mr. Dilworthy, the chemist. Well, what about him? In his rooms where he lives, back of his shop. Dead. Oh, lying there on the floor with his head crushed in something savage. Dilworthy? Oh, horrible. Some prowling thief. No? Oh, no, sir. With the cash box sitting there in plain sight... With four pound and some odd shillings plain to see and not a penny touched. Dilworthy, wait a moment. The ransacking of this house, the attack on Miss Alice, and now this. There's only one common denominator which applies to all three. I don't understand, Mr. Holmes. That film from Alice's camera, Watson. After we left here this morning and went to the village, you left it at Dilworthy's? Of course, I... Oh, it's got a... Oh, matter of fact, Holmes, I'm, I'm afraid I, I forgot all about it. Here's the roll in, in my pocket. I must apologize to Miss Alice. Not a bit of it, Watson. What do you mean, not a bit of it, Watson? I'm convinced that roll of film holds the solution of the mysterious events of the past 24 hours. And due to your convenient lapse of memory, we are in possession of the prize. But what prize are we in possession of? That, Watson, remains to be seen. Come, we just have time to catch the late train for London. A vis visit to Scotland Yard's laboratory will reveal the precious secret which that film is evidently concealing. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll find out what that precious secret is. Men, when you buy a hair tonic, why not buy one that does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome? Why not get your money's worth and buy Kreml hair tonic? No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly groomed and attractive looking. In addition, Kreml is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff and leaves the scalp feeling so clean, refreshed, and alive. No wonder Kreml is preferred among America's most successful men. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use this highly specialized hair tonic daily for better groomed hair, a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. And now, Dr. Watson, what did you discover on that precious roll of film which had already caused the death of one person and a murderous assault upon another? Well, as soon as we reached Scotland Yard's laboratory, Holmes wasted no time in getting permission to develop the photographs. Just hand me that second tray, will you, Watson? The one this side of the red lamp. There you are. There. That does it. Look, Watson. 
The images are starting to appear. Well, I'll take your word for it. That red lamp gives about as much light as a glowworm. Sorry, but that's all we can use until we finish the development. Look, Watson. They're coming much, much, much more strongly now. Yes, I see. That seems to be a picture of the rector. Doesn't look to me as though that were worth committing murder for. There are 12 pictures on the roll, Watson. This next one seems to be a somewhat out-of-focus picture of the directory. Uh, that third one, Sharper, haven't a croaky match. I'm quite sure that we haven't gone tearing off on a wild goose chase, Holmes. Impossible, Watson. All the evidence indicates that this film must have been the objective. Ah, now that looks more interesting. Two girls on the beach in bathing suits. I say, Holmes. What? That girl on the left got a fine figure, eh? Undoubtedly. <laughs> but the composition is not improved by those other people in the middle background. I think that... Watson, hand me that lens. The large magnifier there. Ah, I thought you were displaying a cavalier lack of interest in such a shapely young lady. Well, I trust it's repaying your intense study. Look, Watson. Look here. Examine it closely through the lens. Oh, a daring bathing suit, I must say. <laughs> Has no sleeves. Not the girl, you idiot. What? Huh? The girl? The two men in the background. Oh. Take a good look at that one on the right. Oh, there's certainly something familiar about him. Holmes. Holmes, it, it can't be. But it is, Watson. Beyond any shadow of doubt, Professor Moriarty himself, and no nearer to South America than the beaches of England. But I... I don't see why Moriarty should have been so anxious to secure this film. After all, Holmes, there's nothing particularly damning in, in a photograph of two men seated on a beach. When one of them is the world's most notorious criminal... And when he's quite ready to commit murder to regain the film? Watson, ask the inspector to call us a car. Where are we going? You and I and this precious film are paying a visit to Sir Edward at the Foreign Office at once. Your deduction was absolutely sound, Holmes. You recognize Moriarty's companion then, Sir Edward? Beyond any question. He goes by many names, but our files would indicate that the real one is von Schelling, probably the cleverest among the senior members of the Imperial German Secret Service. Good heavens, a spy. Yes, precisely, Dr. Watson. I should imagine, Sir Edward, that his dealings with Moriarty must be of great importance since they required him to come to England in person. I'm quite sure of it. But the peaceful surroundings of the South Downs and the quiet beaches, what would a spy be doing there? With Portsmouth, England's greatest naval base only a few miles away, and the present situation in Europe, Professor Moriarty does not concern himself with trifles. Under the circumstances, I have no hesitation in telling you two gentlemen that the first trials of our new battle cruisers have been taking place off Portsmouth these last few days. Great Scott! Yes, Doctor in what we thought was the utmost secrecy. There's still a ray of hope, Sir Edward. Moriarty would not have gone to such lengths to suppress this photograph had his transactions with von Schelling been completed. Do you mean, Holmes, that there may still be time to forestall him? Dr. Watson and I will do whatever is in our power, Sir Edward. <laughs> Judging from the sudden change in your expression after your silence this past hour, you've evidently had an inspiration. We must bait a trap, Watson. And that film must be our bait. Professor Moriarty must be in the fury of his bungling subordinates, who have twice failed to recover it. If I know the professor, he'll make the next attempt himself. Oh, you can't take an advertisement in the newspaper, Holmes, to lure Moriarty into a trap. If Alice and her father will cooperate, I have a method that is better than any advertisement. Oh? What's that? Evidently, Watson, you're not acquainted with the post office and the postmistress of the average village, to which Fallworth is no exception. She fills the function of a town crier with the utmost efficiency. She will be our advertisement. Good morning, Mr. Kenmore. And how are you this fine morning? 
And how is poor Miss Alice coming along? Very well indeed, thank you, Mrs. Roberts. Ah, that's a blessing. And what can I do for you today? A shilling's worth of penny stamps, please. I do hope the young lady will be up and about again soon. We miss her cheery face. You know, Mrs. Roberts, there was an odd thing about that robbery at the rectory. What was that? All the intruder took was Alice's camera. Fancy that. After he struck her down. Not a very valuable bit of loot. No, indeed. Alice is glad she happened to remove the film that very afternoon. It's still on the library desk. Is it really now? I must remember to have it developed. Well, it's a mercy that nothing worse happened. Oh, I almost forgot. Here's your stamps, Mr. Kenmore. <laughs> And I think I can assure you, Mr. Holmes, uh, knowing our worthy postmistress as I do, that the misinformation I gave her has by now been widely disseminated. Excellent, Mr. Kenmore. And uh, I appreciate what you and Alice have been willing to risk on behalf of your country. At least the falsehood I told was in a worthy cause. I only wish Dr. Watson would let me get out of bed and come downstairs into the library with you when you take up your vigil tonight. I'd like to see that those horrible men get their just desserts. Really, my dear? You sound almost bloodthirsty. Well, I can't say that I blame Miss Ellis for that. If someone had given me a crack on the head, I'd look forward to that downfall. Mr. Kenmore, I would have felt happier if you and Alice were not in the house. But with my knowledge of Moriarty, I fear that he may have the place under observation. And the departure of you and your daughter might make him suspicious. Is that why you and Dr. Watson are wearing those filthy farmer's clothes, Mr. Holmes? Precisely, my dear. Hmm. Eight o'clock. Time we were beginning our vigil. Mr. Kenmore, you will remain on guard with Alice here in her room. No matter what happens in the library, this is your post of duty. Very well, Mr. Holmes. You have your service, Revolver Watson? Certainly. Come then. We must be concealed and in readiness for our visitor at whatever hour he may arrive. <laughs> Only two o'clock. I'm so cramped from standing behind these curtains that I thought it must be the morning. What price the peaceful countryside now, Watson? Well, I must say that... What? What is it? A faint sound on the gravel path. It might be a nocturnal animal or... No. There it is again. Footsteps. Is your gun ready, Watson? Ready, Holmes. It'll probably come through the French windows. It's the most inviting entrance. On your guard... Cutting up a pane of glass. Don't move. We've got you covered. The light switch, Watson, with your left hand. There. Well, Professor Moriarty, we meet again. If it isn't Mr. Sherlock Holmes... And Dr. Watson. Keep that gun on him, Watson, while I see if he's carrying a weapon. And render myself liable to a long prison sentence. My dear Holmes, your retirement to pastoral pursuits must have impaired your reasoning powers. It's all right, Watson. He's unarmed. You can lower your hands now, Professor. But I'd strongly advise against making any sudden move. I wish he would, the dirty traitor. I'm inclined to agree with your sentiments, Watson. Moriarty, for once I intend to take the law into my own hands... I can forgive a criminal, or a forger, or a thief, or even a murderer. But a traitor is something else. I don't understand what you're driving at. Certain backward Balkan countries, Moriarty, have an extremely convenient system of disposing of unwanted prisoners. They are invariably shot while attempting to escape. You, you wouldn't dare. You who have always stood on the side of the law. Have you ever known me to break my word? I assure you, Moriarty... That unless you consent to turn over von Schaling to us, together with any information you have for him, you will be dead by the time I count ten. And I promise you that Watson won't hesitate either. Yeah, you bet I won't, Holmes. Take your choice, Moriarty. One, two, three, four. All right, Holmes. You win. This time. Hmm. A wise decision. Where were you to meet von Schaling? And what were you to deliver to him? At midnight, tomorrow, on a beach six miles south of here. 
He has a rendezvous there with the submarine that is to take him back to Germany. And the figures on the new cruisers are hidden at my lodgings in Portsmouth. We'll keep that appointment with von Schelling tomorrow night. And to make sure that you have no chance for further treachery, you'll remain with us until he's in our hands. This is the spot, Professor Moriarty? 500 yards south of the abandoned dock, yes. Very well. Watson and I will remain here behind these bushes. You, Professor, will walk out alone onto the sands. I intend to take no chances of scaring off our current quarry. I haven't much choice in the matter. Just a moment. Yes? Remember that we have you in plain sight, that the moonlight is strong, and that the slightest sign of treachery will be the signal for your well-deserved execution. I won't forget, Mr. Holmes. I hate to think of his going scot-free, Holmes. You cannot hate it more than I do, Watson. But letting him go free is a cheap price to pay for the scotching of his plans and the capture of von Schelling. Here comes a car. This must be von Schelling. No one else would be on this deserted road at this hour of night. Oh, the, the car's stopping. There's only one man in it. He's getting out. It is von Schelling. Ha! Yeah, Professor. I knew I could depend on you. Right, Watson. Uh, put up your hands, you. The devil Look out, Watson. <laughs> Quick work, Watson. Oh, curse you, Moriarty. You have betrayed me. Precisely, Herr von Schelling. But why should the fact that a traitor will engage in a double betrayal surprise you? He'll be all right, Holmes. Barring a nasty flesh wound in his leg. Well, Mr. Holmes, you have the papers and the spy. I've kept my part of the bargain. Now you keep yours. Don't worry, Moriarty, I shall. But you can count yourself lucky that the stakes for which we were playing were far more value than your traitorous life. I promise you that next time we meet, you will pay your long overdue reckoning. <laughs> I shall look forward to it. Au revoir. Till our next meeting. What infernal cheek. I hate to see him go free. No more than I do, Watson. Well, at least we've had the best of the bargain. Now let's load our prisoner into the car. And, and who are you, anyway? The devil? Oh, hardly so eminent a personage, von Schelling. My name is Sherlock Holmes. So? I might have guessed. Oh, he's fainted. Just as well, perhaps. Here, Holmes, we'll, we'll put him in the back seat of the, of the, of the car. Well, you've got the spy. That finishes that. I wonder. There's an east wind coming, Watson. East wind? Well, I don't think so, Holmes. It's, it's particularly warm. <laughs> Good old Watson. You're the one fixed point in a changing age. There's an east wind coming all the same. Such a wind as never blew on England yet. It will be cold and bitter. And a good many of us may wither before its blast. But it's God's own wind, nonetheless. And a cleaner, better, stronger land will lie in the sunshine when the storm has cleared. Start the car up, Watson. It's time we're on our way. And now may I introduce one of the outstanding authorities on feminine beauty... He is John Robert Powers, who has received hundreds of thousands of requests from girls all over the country. Girls wishing to join his exclusive Powers Girls. And now, especially transcribed, Mr. John Robert Powers. Good evening, friends. I'm very happy tonight to bring along one of my very attractive Powers Girls, Miss Pat Fordyce. And maybe we can coax Pat to tell us what she considers one of the most important requirements of a Powers Girl. How about it, Pat? Well, I think one of the most important requisites is lovely, shining, bright hair. Hair that reflects natural, glossy luster and highlights. I certainly agree, Pat. And I heartily agree with you about using cremel shampoo. Yes, Pat, I advise all my Powers girls to use cremel shampoo. In my opinion, no other shampoo leaves the hair more radiant with such natural gloss and highlights. Why, I've interviewed hundreds of girls with beautiful faces, but with such dull, lifeless-looking hair. Then after using cremel shampoo, what a difference. 
their hair emerges a vision of shining beauty. I love its rich, velvety oil base, too. A very good point, Pat. Because this oil base actually helps hair from becoming dry or brittle. Cremel shampoo also whips up a wonderful, luxurious, active foam, even in the hardest water. Yes, Pat, to glamour bathe the hair, you simply can't beat Cremel shampoo. And I sincerely recommend it to every girl who is discouraged about the way her hair looks. To every girl who wants her hair to look its shining best. Thank you, Mr. Powers, and also your very, very beautiful Powers girls, Miss Pat Fordyce. And now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Uh, next week, I think I shall tell you a weird story about the strange experience of Mr. John Scott Eccles, wherein Holmes solves the murder of a certain Aloysius, or as you say, Aloysius, Garcia, and finds a kitchen full of voodoo fetishes. I call the story The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, His Last Bow. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to listen next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of Wisteria Lodge. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, once again, here we are in Dr. Watson's comfortable study. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Sit down, my boy, and make yourself comfortable. Thank you. <sighs> Warm tonight, isn't it? It is indeed. Quite summery, in fact. Let's see. Tonight you're going to tell us about the strange adventure of Mr. John Scott Eccles at Wisteria Lodge, aren't you? Yes, and I think I can promise you that you'll find it weird enough to make you shiver a bit in, in spite of the weather. Good. I can hardly wait. Men, if you want that prosperous, successful look which stands out in the crowd, remember, well-groomed hair means a lot to a man's appearance. And I'm sure you'll want to know why so many of America's most prosperous and successful men use Kremel hair tonic. You see, Kremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. Why it keeps hair neatly in place longer. Yet Kremel never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy, sticky, or dirty. Kremel never leaves hair feeling cakey or stiff. Just make this test, men. After you apply Kremel, rub your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or your hat band. Kremel always gives your hair such a handsome, clean-cut appearance, as if your barber had just combed it. At the end of the day, your hair looks just as neatly groomed as when you combed it in the morning. Buy a bottle at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, what about the strange experience of Mr. John Scott Eccles and Wisteria Lodge? It was a bleak, wintry day. The year was 1892, I believe. We were in our rooms in Baker Street, and Holmes had received a telegram during lunch. He'd read it and sent off a reply. The lunch things were subsequently cleared away, and Holmes was standing in front of the fireplace, smoking his pipe, a thoughtful look on his face. Suddenly... He turned to me with a mischievous twinkle in his eyes. Watson, you are supposed to be a man of letters. How would you define the word grotesque? Grotesque? Why, well, something uh, strange, remarkable. No, there's more in it than that. Grotesque. There's an underlying suggestion of the tragic and the terrible. Yes, but why all this introspection? Who's been using the word now? 
Now, this telegram, read it. Oh, let's have a look. I've just had most incredible and grotesque experience. May I consult you? Signed, J.S. Eccles. And sent from the Chang Cross Post Office. Huh. Eccles. I wonder if it's a man or a woman. Man, of course. No woman would have sent a reply paid telegram. No? No. She would have come herself. Ah, and that, if I'm not mistaken, is Mr. Eccles himself. Let's take a peek at him before Mrs. Hudson lets him in. Watson, don't joggle the curtain like that. It's too obvious. Respectable looking, eh, Holmes? Notice the grey whiskers? <laughs> Pompous old bird. Yes. Everything from his spats to the gold rimmed spectacles and top hat pronounce him a conservative. A churchman, a good citizen, orthodox and conventional to the last degree. Yes, but what is such a paragon coming here for? Accidents, my dear Watson, sometimes happen even in the best regulated circles. Shh, here he is. Come in. Ah, good day. Mr. Eccles, I presume? Yes. Eccles. John Scott Eccles. I've just had a most upsetting and unpleasant experience, Mr. Holmes. Most improper, most outrageous. Pray sit down, Mr. Eccles. Oh, thank you. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? It's an outrage. That's what it is. Oh, sorry. Mm. <laughs> May I ask, Mr. Eccles, why you didn't come to me at once? Well, what do you mean? It's now quarter past two. Your telegram was dispatched at quarter past one. And yet one glance at the somewhat uh, disheveled state of your attire shows that the uh, disturbance dates from the moment of your waking. You're right, Mr. Holmes. I never gave a thought to my appearance. My one idea was to get out of that house. But I've been busy since then, running round to the house agents, you know. The fellow's rent was paid right enough. Come, come, Mr. Eccles. I'm afraid you've acquired my friend Dr. Watson's deplorable habit. Huh? He is prone to tell his stories wrong end foremost. Now, look here, Holmes. I really don't Don't interrupt, Watson. Now, Mr. Eccles, will you please give us the facts of the case? Now what? Come in. Aha! Oh, so it's you, Lestrade, the watchdog of Scotland Yard. I might have known no one else would come thundering at the door in that fashion. I thought I'd find him here. Are you or are you not Mr. John Scott Eccles of Popham House Lee? Naturally, he is. You traced him through his telegram to me. It's all perfectly obvious, so why be so melodramatic? Who is this gentleman? Allow me to introduce Inspector Lestrade, mastermind of Scotland Yard. Well, you've got a blazes, Mr. Holmes. It's Mr. Eccles I'm after. And what for, if I may be so impertinent? The murder of Mr. Aloysius Garcia of Wisteria Lodge near Isha. Dead? You say he's dead? No, none of that surprise stuff. This letter was found in his pocket. You wrote it, didn't you? Oh, of course. You accepted but... his invitation to spend last night in his house, didn't you? Yes, You but... did stay the night there, eh? Yes, but I could explain. Explain, eh? One moment, Lestrade. Mr. Eccles was on the verge of telling me what happened during his visit. I suggest we allow him to proceed. Draw up a chair, Lestrade. You might learn something. Oh, very well, but I warn you, Mr. Eccles, anything you say may be used in evidence against you. <laughs> but I'm sure my story but also... Oh, dear me. Go on, please. Go on. Oh, oh yes, yes. Well, you see, Mr. Holmes, I'm a bachelor of a rather sociable turn of mind. I cultivate a large number of friends, among them Mr. Gerald Melville. Gerald Melville, the retired brewer? Oh, yes, that's the one. Well, nothing like a glass of Melville's double brew to quench a thirst on, on a hot day, eh, Lestrade? Oh, Watson, don't interrupt. Oh, sorry. Well, uh, it was there some weeks ago that I met a fellow named Garth. He was, I understood, of Spanish descent and connected with the embassy. We struck up quite a friendship. One thing led to another, ended by his inviting me to spend a few days at his house, Wisteria Lodge, between Isha and Oxford. Hmm. How many were there in his household? He had uh, a sort of valid butler, a countryman of his, named Jose, and a half-breed cook called Grogo. A queer household to find in the heart of Surrey, eh, Holmes? Uh, yes, Dr. Watson. So I thought at the time. It proved a good deal queerer than I expected. Yeah, now, let's get to the point. You went to the house? Uh, yes. I arrived last night, a few hours after dinner. Drove over from Isha. Storm was brewing. The house was fair-sized, a crazy tumble-down affair. I'll admit I had some doubts as to the wisdom of my visit as we went up the drive. <laughs> Delighted to see you, my dear friend. Delighted. I was afraid you might not reach this place before the storm arrived. Jose, you will take the Senor Eccles things to his room. The one in front, across the hall from my own. Si, Senor. Ah, that is he, my priceless Jose. A bidding looking fellow, I must say, Garcia. Looks more like a brigand than a servant. Yes. That is what makes him so truly remarkable. Ah, but come in here into my study. There is a fire and some good red wine and a sandwich for you, which my good Groco has made especially. 
In here. Come. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. Well, this is better. I'll admit I was chilled from that drive. And your hall is a trifle drafty, my dear Gasser. But here we are, what you call cozy, eh? Yeah. Come, sit by the fire. Oh, that feels good. A glass of wine, no? Not a bad idea. Good. I will have one, too. So, and here is your sandwich. Mm, thank you. Oh, by Jove. I say, this sandwich is hot. Yes, a Spanish specialty. It is full of onion. Mm, so I notice. Dears, what was that? Sounds like someone at the front door. There it is again. I say, Garcia, you look white as a sheet. Is anything the better? No. No, nothing. Nothing at all. Oh, only that it is so late for someone to be calling. Well, look here. I'll go to the door if you're afraid. No, 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 senor. It is not necessary. Jose will go. Ah, listen. He is going now. I wonder who it is on a night like this. Come in. What is it, Jose? What has happened? A uh, message for you, senor. A letter. Good. Give it to me. Mm. So... So, that is it. It is what, senor? Never mind, Jose. And close the door. Look here, Garcia. What's the matter? Did the letter have bad news? Bad news? The letter? Oh, but no, senor. Uh, just an invitation. I do not even bother to answer. See, it goes into the fire. Why are you trembling? Trembling? Me? It is the cold. I am not accustomed to this climate. But it is late, and I am a bad host, no? You want to go to bed? Not particularly. And uh, look here. If you're afraid of something, I'm perfectly willing to sit up all night. Afraid? Come, i show you to your room. You will take this candle, please. Oh, no, no, that's a bad draft you have in this hall, Garcia. I can hardly keep the candle from blowing out. This way, please. This is your room, senor. I am in there, across the hall. Good. Then you can call to me if you get the jumps again. Or if I see a ghost, eh? <laughs> Good night, Signore. Good night. And pleasant dreams. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> More apt to have nightmares in a place like this. <laughs> Not even a fire in here. Looks like an iceberg. <laughs> Storm's getting near. What a clock. Sounds like the knell of doom. Oh, right, oh, midnight. I had no idea it was so late. My watch must have stopped. Oh, it says only 11.15. Suppose I forgot to wind it. Senor Eccles. Senor Eccles, are you still awake? Well, if I hadn't been, that clock would have wakened me. So sorry. But never mind. Next time it strikes only once for one o'clock. Yeah, that's a revelation. Uh, what I want to say, senor, is the bell by the bed. If you will ring it in the morning when you wake up, Jose will bring you your hot water. Oh, thanks. Good night again, senor. So far, I have seen no ghosts. <laughs> no. What does he mean by that? Ghosts. Oh, this would certainly be the place for them. Yeah, that storm is going to break any minute now. If that candle wouldn't flicker so. Weird shadows. I don't like the way they move about. Get to my nerves. Better blow the candle out. That'll finish them. Now, if I can get a little sleep. Oh, what a bed. What's that? So you think you heard a scream, Mr. Eggles? Well, I wasn't sure. A storm broke at about that time. It may have been a wind. What a curious evening. The most curious thing about it was the clock. Do you often let your watch run down, Mr. Eccles? No, I can't say that I do. Well, uh, next morning the storm had cleared. I woke about dawn and tossed about half an hour. When I found that I couldn't go back to sleep, I rang for my hot water. That bed should be in a museum. Oh, it's even colder than last night. Confound that, Jose. Where's my hot water? I never did like the country. 
That fellow's probably still asleep. Maybe if I shout. Jose! I say, Jose! I don't like it. This place is too quiet. Jose! Grogo, where are you? What the deuce? Why doesn't all this bellowing wake Garcia? Must be a sound sleeper. Garcia! Garcia, are you up? Confound the man. Oh, you don't suppose? Oh, nonsense. I'm getting as jumpy as he was last night. Garcia, wake up! I say, I'd better go in and see if the man's all right. I say, Garcia, are you? Garcia! What? Well, look here. He's gone. The bed hasn't been slept in. Garcia! Jose! Garcia! Thoroughly upset, Mr. Holmes. I ran from room to room, shouting. They were empty. The men were gone. My host, the footman, the cook, all vanished in the night. Quite a unique experience, eh, Watson? Yes, one of the most... I was furious. I packed my bag, set off to visit the chief land agent in the village. And I found everything in order. Garcia had rented the place right enough, but even paid three months in advance. My next step was to come into town, call at the Spanish embassy. Yes? They had never heard of Garcia. That is the end of my story. Well, I admit it seems to fit in with what we discovered at Wisteria Lodge. We even found the note you spoke of. But Garcia threw it into the fire. I saw him do it. It was a dog grate. He overpitched it. I found this crumpled up at the back. Yes, that's it. I recognize the paper. Hmm. May I see it? Huh? What's it, sir? Our own colors. Green and white. Green open. White shut. Main stair, first corridor, seventh right, green bays. Godspeed, sign D. Hmm. Woman's writing. An assignation of some sort, I'd say. Well, why should he turn pale if it was just an amorous intrigue? It was more than that. She writes Godspeed. It was a serious and dangerous undertaking. Oh, who do you suppose she is? She signs a sub D. He was Paris and... She must have been two. D. R. That might stand for Dolores. Very good, Watson. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but unfortunately, she wasn't Spanish. Wasn't Spanish? Why not? She writes to our Spanish friend in English. Oh, what's And there were others in it, too. The envelope is addressed in a different hand, a man's writing. And the print of a man's cufflink has been pressed into the ceiling wax. A remarkable note. There's something about it I don't quite like. Hmm. Lestrade, where did you say Garcia was found? Oxshot Common, about an eighth of a mile from his home. Head battered in. Footprints? Well, there weren't any we could see. The rain had washed them out. Robbed? No, no. His watch and money were left intact. Well, Mr. Reckles, if you don't mind stepping around the yard, I'd like your story in writing. Certainly. I'll come at once. But I should like to retain your services, Mr. Holmes. I shall be delighted to uh, collaborate with Scotland Yard, if Lestrade doesn't mind. And what good would it do if I did? Ah, then it's settled. I suggest we take a run down to Isha, eh, Watson? I find I have a longing for the country. Yeah, I'm coming too. Splendid. Suppose we meet tonight at Mr. Garcia's poetically named villa. What was it? Ah, yes. Wisteria Lodge. I fancy it will be a case of Cherche la Femme. Cherche la... Oh, French. Uh, look for the woman. No. Oh, what woman? Uh, the woman who wrote that note. If I'm not mistaken, she's in a decidedly dangerous position. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll find out what Sherlock Holmes discovers on the visit to Wisteria Lodge. Every man who takes pride in his appearance should know that handsome, healthy-looking hair needs a hygienic scalp. That's why, when you buy a hair tonic, be sure to get your money's worth. Don't settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Cremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients the like of which has never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. Cremel keeps dry, stubborn hair neatly in place all day and always gives hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never sticky or greasy. But men, Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Cremel leaves your scalp feeling so alive and tingling. At the same time, it removes itchy, loose dandruff. It's simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So, men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Let Kreml help keep your scalp hygienic. 
Your hair always looking handsome, always looking its very best. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, you and Sherlock Holmes went down to Wisteria Lodge. Yes, Mr. Barrow, that night found us walking in the neighborhood of Isha. It was pitch black, and there was a wind blowing. Look here, Holmes, why go plodding about on a night like this? There's another storm brewing up. Why not wait until daylight? It's too dark to see anything now anywhere, even the road. Oh, stop grumbling, Watson. We promised Lestrade we'd pick him up at the villa. Yes, but Besides, I... we've got to rescue that woman. That note was written under pressure. The writing was shaky. Someone else addressed the envelope, sent it off, and lured Garcia to his death. She's probably being kept prisoner at this moment, unless they've killed her, too. How are we going to find her? The note ran, Main stair, first corridor, seventh white, green bays. That indicates a large house. Yes, but there aren't many large houses in the neighborhood. Quite. Moreover, it had to be a house Garcia could get to, do what he intended to do, and be back by 12 o'clock. Less than an hour's time. What do you mean? I mean that Garcia invited our friend Mr. Eccles to visit him with one purpose in mind. Oh, huh? what was that? He wanted an alibi. That is why the clock struck 12 when Mr. Eccles' watch indicated it was only quarter past 11, which was the correct time, by the way. Garcia intended to be somewhere else at 12 o'clock. Yes, but where? Somewhere within the radius of a mile. There are only two large houses within this radius. One belongs to Lord Weaverly, a conservative old fellow he's out of the question. The other, High Gables, was rented just last month by a man who calls himself Henderson, but who looks like a foreigner. The whole house is run by foreign servants with the exception of an English governess for his little girl. Do you think that she may be the woman in question? I only know she has not been seen for the last three days. Hmm, it looks bad. Well, if I'm not mistaken, that is a light from Wisteria Lodge shining through the trees. The stars here ahead of us. Lugubrious looking place. Hey, Holmes? Yes. One across the driveway. That's Lestrade sitting in the middle of the study with a light beside him. What's the matter with a man? He's as stiff as a ramrod. Tap on the window, Watson. Oh, 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 it's you. Thank God for that. What's up, Lestrade? Open the window. Oh, I never expected to see the day when I'd be so glad to see your face, Mr. Holmes. It's been a bad evening. Here, Watson. Step over the sill. That's it. You can close the window behind you. Now then, Lestrade, what's been giving you the jumps? Well, it's a lonely, silent house, and what with that queer thing in the kitchen, when I heard you tapping at the window, I thought it had come again. It? What is it? The devil, for all I know. I got here a bit earlier. I was sitting here reading a book when all of a sudden something made me look up, and there was a face looking in at me through the lower pane. Good Scott. And what was it like? Well, it wasn't black, and was it white, sort of a clay color. Like it was dead and had earth on it, and the size of it, twice as big as yours. Good gracious me. But the look on the face was the worst of it. Great goggle eyes and a line of white teeth like a hungry beast. I tell you, I couldn't move a finger. I just shut my eyes and held my breath, and when I got the courage to look again, it was gone. Like that, into thin air. Hmm. Let's have a look round the house. Uh, wait till you see what's in the kitchen. Well, no time like the present. You know the place, Lestrade. You lead the way. Not a near life. I'll go with you, but not ahead of you. Oh, all right. Here. Down this corridor to the right. Watson, you had better hold the lamp. Lestrade's hand doesn't seem to be as steady as usual. This is the kitchen. Untidy looking place. Look. What an extraordinary thing. Chicken feathers all over the room. Hmm, Yes. A white cock torn savagely to pieces. And over in that corner is a goat with its throat slit and blood all over the place. How perfectly beastly. Yeah, but that's not the worst of it. Look here, Father Sink. Here's something to make your flesh creep. Ugh, what a sinister, shriveled up thing. Looks like a barbaric doll or a mummified monkey. That is no doll, Watson. Nor yet a monkey. That was once a human being. A South American native, to be exact. What? Down there, some of the wilder tribes have a secret process by which they can dry and dwarf the bodies of their dead enemies until they look like this. It's a voodoo fetish. And all this mess of blood and slain animals indicates a South American voodoo sacrifice. South American? Green and white, of course. What is it, Holmes? Never mind, Watson. No time for discussion. Hurry, we must go to High Gables and find the governess. She must be made to talk while she's still able. <laughs> Thank 
left the house. Governess's room is at the back. Hello. What's this? Closed carriage without lights drawn up at the front door and baggage piled on top. We're trying to make a getaway. We must stop them. <sighs> How can we? We've got no warrant. Thank heavens I'm not a member of the official police. My revolver's warrant enough for me. Look, look. The front door's opening. Two men are coming out. The one in the great coat is Henderson, as he calls himself. I think I can tell you his real name if I get a look at his face. They're carrying something between them. Oh, it's a woman. The governor's. Why can't she walk? What have they done to her? They're putting her in the carriage. Come on. We must stop them. Now then, hands up, both of you. Carlo, drive on. Be good then. Drive on. No, you don't, Carlo. One move to pick up those reins and you'll get a bullet through you. Now then, what have you done to that woman? She's sick. We are taking her to London. You must not stop us. Lestrade, light the carriage lamp. Watson, take a look at that woman. What seems to be the matter with her? Hmm. Pulse? Pupils of eyes? Oh, yes, she, mm. she's been drugged. Opium. Oh, she's half conscious. You will kill her. She is sick. We must get her to a doctor. Every moment is vital. No. Don't let him. He's a devil. He killed Garcia. Don't listen to her. She's delirious. We must go to a doctor. I am a doctor, my good man. Don't worry. She's in good hands. Dr. Watson will take care of her. Now, Lestrade, if you will remove the gentleman's hat so we can have a good look at his face. Aha. Uh -huh. As I expected. Lestrade, arrest this man. He is the murderer of Garcia, and heaven knows how many other poor souls. Yeah, but who is he? Don Murillo, the tiger of San Pedro, the most bloodthirsty tyrant that ever ruled a helpless people. <laughs> I must say, Dr. Watson, I'm still a bit confused. Yes, and so was I, Mr. Bell, until the English governess explained the whole thing to me. John Murillo had been a dictator of the country of San Pedro in South America. Its colors are green and white. Yes, I know. He was a terrible man who had no scruples about butchering anyone who stood in his way politically. One of his victims had been the Spanish husband of the English lady who later became Murillo's governess. Oh, I see. His reign of terror ended in a revolution, but he managed to escape the country with all the government funds. The inhabitants of San Pedro plotted to bring him to justice, but failed until the Englishwoman managed to worm her way into his household. So that's why she was there. Yes, it is. She and a party headed by Garcia planned to kidnap Murillo and take him back to San Pedro, where he could be tried for his crimes. Murillo, however, suspected the governess, intercepted her note, and uh, killed Garcia. Well, that's perfectly clear now. Oh, just one more thing. The hideous face at the window, what was that? Oh, that, that was Grogo, Garcia's huge native cook, who was sneaking back to get his voodoo fetish, the shriveled mummy. <laughs> that was certainly a blood-curdling story. Dr. Watson will return in just a moment to give us a hint about next week's story. Here's something of real interest for our lady listeners. I'm sure we all know or have heard how beautiful Powers models are. But did you know that these famous beauties make up to $35,000 a year? Which shows they have brains as well as beauty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but seriously, Joe, what impresses me most is that Powers models can afford to spend a fortune on their hair. Yet when they wash it... They rely on inexpensive cremel shampoo. Which proves how wonderful cremel shampoo really is. Powers models were among the first to discover that no other shampoo leaves hair more shining bright with natural gloss and luster. And under no circumstances does cremel shampoo ever dry the hair. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a harsh soap or drying detergent. Cremel shampoo is entirely different. I'll check with that, Joe. After a cremel shampoo, the hair actually radiates natural, brilliant highlights. And cremel shampoo even has a built-in oil base, which helps keep hair from becoming dry or brittle. It rinses out so easily and positively never, never leaves any dull, soapy film. So, ladies, always wash your hair with cremel shampoo. It leaves hair a vision of shining, sparkling beauty, yet in no way hurts its texture. K-R-E-M-L, cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? 
Well, now let me think. Next week. I think... No, I won't. Next week, I think I'll tell you about another one of our meetings with the the infamous Professor Moriarty. Yes, that's what I'll tell you. It's a strange story. A very strange story of violence and sudden death. Death that struck from the London shadows. I call it The Adventure of the Harley Street Murders. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes mystery was adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Nigel Bruce appeared through the courtesy of California Pictures. Tom Conway, by permission of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time, when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the Harley Street Murders. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Monday evening again in time for the weekly visit with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting us, so let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, oh, there you are, Mr. Bell. Drop your usual chair and settle down. Hmm. That's it. Thanks, Dr. Watson. And now, how about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Well, I think it'll intrigue you, Mr. Bell, for in it, Sherlock Holmes once again crossed swords with his most famous opponent, the man whom Holmes referred to as a Napoleon of crime. The redoubtable Professor Moriarty. And who came off best on this occasion? Supposing you let me tell the story from the beginning, my boy, and then you can decide the matter for yourself. <laughs> All right, Dr. Watson. But before you get too far into the story tonight, perhaps I might... Uh... Have a word with our listeners? Of course, Mr. Bowen. While you're doing that, I'll get my pipe lighted. So many men today who use only water to keep their hair in place find that after the water dries... Those stubborn hairs and cowlick get out of place, and their hair never looks neatly groomed or attractive. Yet these men are reluctant to plaster their hair down with a heavy, greasy hairdressing. And who can blame them? That's why I urge you to try Kremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed all day long. Every hair in place. Kremel gives hair a rich, healthy-looking luster, too. Yet it never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you apply Cremel, just run your hand over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hatband. And how the ladies admire that natural, well-groomed look which Cremel always gives. Yes, Cremel gives your hair a handsome, clean-cut appearance. As if your barber had just combed it. And it helps keep it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the case of the Harley Street murders? Well, Mr. Bell, that story began on a December evening at the turn of the century. I had occasion to visit a certain doctor that night, I remember. And after an early dinner in Baker Street, I was able to persuade Sherlock Holmes to walk with me on my mission to nearby Harley Street. Holmes was never very keen on indulging in exercise for its own sake, and as we tramped through the frosty streets, his noticeably bad humor made me realize that I might have been wiser to have left him at home amid the material comforts of our flat. Finally, he turned to me. 
We should have taken a hansom cab, Watson. Why, Holmes? It's not more than a ten-minute walk. A cab would have taken three. The remaining seven minutes might have been more comfortably employed at home. Rubbish. A brisk walk after dinner is good for one. It uh, aids the digestion. My digestion is as uncomplicated as that of a horse. Mm -hmm. I've never been able to understand the hearty Englishman who believes that a resounding plunge into ice-cold water or running round Hyde Park on a rainy day in an attenuated pair of shorts are the obvious ways of inducing glowing health and a happy digestion. Personally, I think such asinine behavior is merely conducive to double pneumonia. Then why did you come with a... Because you said you were going to call on Dr. Ingleby. You're familiar with the name? Oh, yes. Uh, then perhaps you'd be rather startled to learn that Dr. Ingleby is a woman. Uh, no, Watson. I was well aware of the fact. Oh, well, how do you know? Because I read an article of hers in the current medical bulletin. It was signed Sarah Ingleby, M.D. I've yet to meet a man with the Christian name of Sarah, therefore oh. I deduce she's a woman. Amazing deduction. Quite amazing. But you haven't told me why you're calling on her tonight, Watson. Well, I knew her slightly at the University of London. Nice woman, though I never can understand why a woman wants to be a doctor. Anyway, I'm on the committee for collecting a present for old Professor Taylor on his retirement. She was one of his pet students, and I'm hoping for a substantial contribution from the lady. Hello. That was the police whistle. Yes, and look at the crowd up there ahead. Come on, Watson. Come on, come on, then. That keeps back there. Oh, hello. Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Evening, gentlemen. Good evening. What's wrong, Lestrade? Murder. That's what's wrong, Mr. Holmes. Murder? Yeah, come and look what we found at the foot of the basement steps half an hour ago. Get out of the way and keep them back, constable. <laughs> There you are, gentlemen. Take a look at that. Great Scott. A well-dressed man and lying in a pool of blood. Yeah, he was well-dressed all right when we found him. Had a nice shiny knife sticking through the third button of his waistcoat. And has he been identified? Yes, Mr. Holmes. He's Dr. Marsden. His consulting room is on the second floor. Must have been stabbed as he came out of the front door and then chucked down this basement. Hmm. Was he robbed? No, sir. His wallet had three five-pound notes in it. They, they weren't touched. Nor was the uh, gold watch and chain he was wearing. Have you been able to unearth any clue as to motive, Inspector? Not a blooming one, Doctor. Uh, just been talking with his nurse. From what she says, he didn't have an enemy in the world. No robbery, no apparent motive, no clues, eh, Lestrade? Provoking problem. Well, come on, Watson. We must be on our way. Huh? You, you mean that you're going to leave? Oh, I thought this would be a case after your own heart, Mr. Holmes. I was hoping you'd give me a bit of help. No, Lestrade, it's no concern of mine. Let Scotland Yard do its own work for once. Come on, Watson. The doctor we're interested in is alive and a woman. Oh, well, I don't think Dr. Ingleby will see you, gentlemen. She didn't tell me she's expecting anyone. Nevertheless, my good woman, I think if you mention my name, she'll gladly give us a few moments. Well, you can come in. Oh, it's very kind of you. What were the names again, please? Uh, Dr. Watson and uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Who is it, Agnes? It's uh, a Dr. Watson and a Mr. Holmes, ma'am. I told him that you weren't in the habit yes, of this. all right, Agnes. Uh, you can leave us. Yes, ma'am. Oh, <coughs> but... <laughs> Perhaps you, you remember me, Dr. Ingleby. Yes, indeed, Dr. Watson. At the university, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, do come into the sitting room, won't you? And you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, isn't it? Yes, Dr. Ingleby. I'm flattered to meet so famous a man. Thank you, madam. And uh, may I say how glad I am to have this opportunity of making your acquaintance. Thank you. I read your article in the current medical journal with intense interest. Your invention of a new type of surgical knife that applies a local anesthetic at the same time as it cuts should prove extremely valuable. I wish the Royal College of Surgeons would agree with you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, you've encountered opposition from them, Dr. Ingleby? Great opposition. Yeah. It seems odd that every stride in medical science should be countered by opposition of the very people it would assist. But I'm sure you haven't come here to discuss my new discovery, gentlemen. Well, as a matter of fact, Dr. Ingleby, I'm on the committee that's raising a fund for a parting present for old Professor Taylor. Oh. You were a student of his, and I thought Oh, yes, that, of course. Uh, I'd like to contribute, Dr. Watson. Uh, how would uh, ten guineas be? Oh, that's, that's very generous of you. <laughs> oh, no. It's Dr. McKinney to see you, Mum. David, how nice to see you. Hello, Sarah, my dear. 
Oh, let me introduce you. Uh, Dr. David McKenna, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and do? Dr. Watson. How are you, Doctor? Did you hear about the trouble down the street, Sarah? You mean about Dr. Marsden? Aye. Yes. But please don't talk about it, David. It's too awful. Oh, Dr. Watson, I'll just write that check oh, for you now. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. McKenna, it's fortunate that I met you here. I was planning to call on you in the next few days. Surely not in my professional capacity. Your friend here is an excellent oh, doctor. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. No, Dr. McKenna, I was curious to talk to you since I heard that you were the executor of the Galbraith Estates. Uh, have you been having any difficulties, may I ask? Funny you should ask me that. For the past week, I've been absolutely pestered by some confounded mathematics professor who wants to buy the Cornish property. But I'm not going to settle. I'm keeping the place in trust for the year. A professor of mathematics, huh? Very interesting. Tell me, Dr. McKenna, have any attempts been made on your life recently? Well, you're positively psychic, Holmes. On Wednesday, I was nearly run down by a horse van in Welbeck Street. I swear it wasn't an accident. Mm -hmm. On Thursday night, I was assaulted by a footpad as I was approaching my house. Sweet. Fortunately, I'm something of a boxer and I was able to drive him away. I see. And only this morning, as I was walking down Pier Street, a brick came down from the roof of one of the houses and shattered to pieces at my feet. Good Lord, you've, uh, you've informed the police, of course. No, I haven't. I can take care of myself. Then please let me warn you, Dr. McKenna. Watch yourself carefully. Until the estate is settled, receive no private visits from strangers. Mr. Holmes, may I ask what knowledge you have of my affairs? I'm afraid that at the moment, sir, I'm not in a position to be any more explicit. However, I repeat my warning with the utmost gravity. Well, my soul, you're being very mysterious. Here's your check, Dr. Watson. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Ingleby. That's very, very kind of you. Watson, I think we should be on our way. Good evening, Dr. Ingleby. Good, Good night, Dr. McKenna. Good, Good night. Good night. Holmes. Watson. Holmes. I've never seen you so, so confoundedly mysterious. Shh, listen. Curious chap, that Sherlock Holmes. Fancy his warning me like that. Oh, it's his profession. He sends murder everywhere. Except under his own nose. Extraordinary remark. Get your coat, Watson. Let's get back to Baker Street. This is quite a three-pipe problem. You know, Holmes, I'm suspicious of that woman. She behaved very queerly when the murder was mentioned, and that remark of hers a moment ago was very odd, too. You're leaping to conclusions, my dear Watson. At the moment, I'm much more interested in the fact that the mysterious mathematics professor in whose path Dr. McKenna stands is undoubtedly our old friend, the professor. Hi, Archie. Right. You think that he was connected with that murder tonight, too? Indirectly, yes, Watson. And I fear that before we unravel this complicated skein of circumstances, several more members of the medical profession are doomed to die. <laughs> Get your papa, get your late night final, new murders in Arley Street. Extra late night final, another doctor murdered in Arley Street. Evening papa, extra, fifth doctor slain in Arley Street. Extra, extra, get your papa. You know, Holmes, it's extraordinary the way these medical murders are baffling the police. I expect Lestrade will be around soon to try and interest you in them again. But I am interested, Watson. Oh? The crimes are wanton, apparently motiveless, yet dexterously executed. A fascinating field for speculation. But I'm even more interested in the probable next move of Professor Moriarty. I know that Dr. McKenna stands in his way. Moriarty, so I've discovered, covets the Cornish portions of the Galbraith Estates. Oh, does he? He has certain plans connected with the caves there. Oh, perhaps he does, but I must say that my interests lie here in London. Five murders in a week. All of the victims are doctors. <laughs> Quite frankly, I'm beginning to feel a little uneasy myself. Quite understandable. Uh, by the way, didn't the new copy of the bulletin of the Royal College of Surgeons arrive in the post? Yes, yes, I, I just skimmed through it here. Wait a minute. Ah, there you are. Thank you. Aha. Uh -huh. Just as I thought. Listen to this, Watson. Hand me the new copy of the Bulletin of the Royal College of Surgeons, Carter, will you? Here it is, Professor Moriarty. Ah, uh -huh. just as I thought, Carter. 
I had already concluded that these much-publicized medical murders were in all likelihood committed by a half-madman who felt himself persecuted by doctors. Well... But why these particular doctors, I ask myself? Here is the answer, Carter. The names of all the murdered men are on one committee. Illuminating, Carter, isn't it? Yes, it is, Professor. <laughs> Very illuminating. Illuminating, Watson, isn't it? Yes, it is, Holmes. <laughs> all the murdered men were on one committee. A committee that emphatically rejected as impractical Dr. Sarah Ingleby's invention. Then it begins to look as if I was right in suspecting her. Yes, old chap, it seems that your guesswork hit upon the truth. But now we have to work fast. Our first step should be obvious. To call on Dr. McKenna, I suppose. He's the only member of that medical committee who is still living. He is undoubtedly in grave danger. But I've warned him to be on his guard. No, Watson, our next step is to strike at the source of this deviltry. We'll call on Dr. Sarah Ingleby at once. But you can't see the doctor, Mr. Holmes. She went out not ten minutes ago. Did she leave alone? No, sir. A man came to see her. He stayed talking for half an hour and then they went out together. Mm. Can you describe the man? Let me see. He was very tall and thin with a, an eye forehead and deep-set eyes. Professor Moriarty. Precisely. Thank you. You've been extremely helpful. I'm glad to have been of service, I'm sure, gentlemen. What do you suppose Moriarty has to do with Dr. Ingleby, Holmes? I shall suppose nothing, Watson. One of the reasons that Moriarty and I have so often ended in a stalemate is that each of us is eminently capable of reconstructing the processes of the other's mind. Let me think. If I were Moriarty... Great heavens, Watson. We must act at once. Moriarty has just secured the most dangerous weapon of his entire career. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes as he endeavors to solve the strange case of the Harley Street murders. Men, if you want to be a success and look successful in life... Remember that well-groomed hair adds a great deal to a man's appearance. And one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So start at once and take better care of the hair you've got. And if you're smart, you'll use Cremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly in place without looking or feeling greasy. But men, Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Cremel's light oils have a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, Kreml removes itchy, loose dandruff. Notice how alive, how tingling your scalp feels. And you like to massage Kreml on your scalp because it's such a clean product. It never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair, like so many men's, is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So men for handsomely groomed hair and a more hygienic scalp, use Kreml daily. Buy a bottle of Kreml at any drugstore. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. That famous modern hair tonic which is preferred among America's top executives and most successful men. Now, Dr. Watson, you certainly had me on the edge of my chair there. What happened next? Well, Mr. Bell, supposing I pick up my story at the exact place I left off. And Sherlock Holmes turned to me and said... Yes, Watson. Moriarty has just secured the most dangerous weapon of his entire career. Come along. A weapon? Oh, I don't understand, Holmes. I warned Dr. McKenna to admit no stranger to his house because I know that Moriarty aims at his death. But the person he is sure to admit is the woman to whom he's so obviously devoted. Dr. Sarah Ingleby. Yes, Watson. The pattern begins to become frighteningly clear. And if Moriarty is half the brain I know him to be, I can just imagine how devilishly persuasive he's being at this very moment. And so you see, my dear Dr. Ingleby, 
that your real enemy is not that committed. But they banned the use of my new discovery, Professor Moriarty. They ruined my life's work. And so I made them pay with their own lives. Oh, quite so, my dear. And I sympathize and admire the way you uh, erased them. Masterly, quite masterly. But they were mere tools. It is Dr. McKenna who was behind that committee. I can't believe that David would have done that. He told me he loved me. All the more reason why he was jealous of your scientific attainments. He resents women in his field. He told me that himself. <laughs> he planned to destroy you as a doctor. He told you that? That and much more that I couldn't repeat to you, my dear. Then he must die, too. Of course. He must. I can't thank you enough for opening my eyes, Professor. Now I know what I must do. But you must have steady nerves for so great a task, my dear. Uh, yes. I yes. have here some capsules of my own manufacture. I think if you'll take one, you'll find it extremely efficacious. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> and now I shall call on David McKenna... Dr. McKenna, you must believe me when I tell you that you're in desperate danger. But, Mr. Yes, Holmes... yes, Doctor. That's why we came directly to you after calling on on, uh, on the person that we believe to be the murderer. And who is that person, may I ask? I'm afraid I can't answer that question for you at the moment, Dr. McKenna. Uh, not until my strong suspicion is confirmed. I can tell you, however, that a dangerous criminal by the name of Moriarty has a new and perfect weapon in his power. Weapon? Yes, a lunatic whose murderous hate could be turned against you. Well, it all sounds very melodramatic. Well, perhaps it does, but you'll be wise to listen to my friend. I wouldn't be at all surprised if the murderer is approaching your house now. What? And it's someone that you would admit unquestioningly, and who would strike you down on the spot. I must implore you to retire, Dr. McCann. But what are you and Dr. Watson going to do? Bait a trap, here in your sitting room. Oh, very well. I suppose I'd be stupid to ignore your warning. But I wish you could be a little more specific. I'll be in my library on the first floor. What bait are you going to use for the trap, Holmes? You, old chap. Who? Huh? Me? Yes. You're not unlike Dr. McKenna in build. And I'm sure you will have little difficulty in imitating his Scotch accent. If, uh... You sit at the writing desk here, with your back to the door, so I'll turn down the gaslight. When Dr. McKenna's visitor arrives, I shall be in hiding behind this curtain. And in the meanwhile? We must wait, Watson. And I don't think we shall have to wait very long. the bell now. Yes. The maid's going to answer the door. I'll slip behind these curtains. Keep up the deception as long as you can, Watson. We want to catch her red-handed. But be careful. Undoubtedly, she's carrying a knife. You always give me the best job, don't you? They're coming. All right, all right. Come on. Who's that? David. Is that you? Hey, sir, that's me. Excuse me, I'll, I'll just finish this letter. You'll and... never finish it, David. No, you don't. Oh, you devil! It's all right, Watson. I've got her out. Oh, I can't hear it. Oh, 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 what kind of a trap is this? One that has caught you very neatly, Dr. Ingleby. I'll take that knife, thank you. Do you oh. admit that you came here to kill Dr. McKenna? Oh, of course I do. Why did you fool stop me? I'd have killed him just like I killed the others. <laughs> if you could have seen their stupid faces A knife so clean and easy <laughs> It really was surprisingly easy I gloried in killing them <laughs> But this last I gloried attempt in it. This last attempt wasn't your own idea, was it? No, it wasn't I must say I didn't believe that David was against me too Then what made you change your mind? Change... Change... Mind? Yes who suggested the idea to you? Yes. Professor. Uh, oh, Professor. Uh. Good. Fine. 
found it. She's fainted just as she was going to give us vital information. That's the trouble with women. They get so highly emotional. That's not the trouble with this woman, Watson. She didn't faint. She's dead. Hello, Miss Rose. Dr. Watson. Good morning, Miss Rose. Good morning, Rose. Inspector. Yeah. I thought you'd be coming around to see us at Scotland Yard before you were through. Going to crow over us, I suppose. No, Lestrade, I have no intention of crowing. I blame myself for not having solved the case sooner. Well, the newspapers don't blame you, Holmes. I've never seen such eulogies. Yes, Doctor. And once again, the Yard gets all the brickbats. Wish you'd come in on the case with, uh, with me when I first asked you, Mr. Holmes. Well, no good crying over spilt milk. Case is closed. Yeah, with you and Dr. Watson both hearing her confession, all that's left to do is to have a statement drawn up and have you gentlemen sign it. Yeah, too bad she went and committed suicide, though. I still don't understand how she did it while we were holding her arms. I quite agree, Watson. That's why I came to Scotland Yard. Oh, uh, you want to see the post-mortem report, don't you, Mr. Holmes? It's here on the desk somewhere. She used cyanide, you know. Well, that's the fastest acting poison known. True, Watson. But I'll swear she didn't swallow anything while we were holding her. That's what puzzles me. Ah, here's the doctor's report, Mr. Holmes. Enlightening. Most enlightening. Well, why'd you say that, Mr. Holmes? Dr. Ingleby did not commit suicide. She, too, was murdered. Murdered? But she died in full view of us. How could she be murdered? Look at the post-mortem report. Something else significant besides poison was found. Oh, look. It says here that uh, heavy traces of gelatine were found in the stomach. Precisely. There's the answer. Gelatine? <laughs> but what does that prove? Merely that the woman had eaten some jellied pudding. Yes, exactly. But remember, gelatin is also used to coat capsules. But that still doesn't explain how she swallowed it before our very eyes. That's just the point, Watson. She didn't. Remember that they were extensive traces of gelatin. A capsule of extremely thick gelatin would not dissolve for some time. Obviously, Moriarty gave her the capsule. She swallowed it. And before the gelatine had melted and released the deadly poison, she had ample time to commit another murder had we not prevented her. As ingenious and diabolical a murder as ever I encountered. Great Scott, Sir Moriarty used her as a tool to kill Dr. McKenna, knowing that she herself would drop dead before she could incriminate him. Exactly, Watson. Well, blow me down, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> Professor Moriarty's outwitted you again. I wouldn't quite say that, Lestrade. I'd call it another stalemate. You know, Mr. Holmes, I begin to think you're never going to catch him for us. I refuse to share your pessimism, Inspector. This has been another stalemate, yes. But you mark my words. Moriarty's reign will not last forever. There will come a day, Lestrade. Yes, there will come a day. <laughs> Ladies, when you want to look your radiant best, you naturally want your hair to appear just as beautiful and lustrous as it can be. So here's a tip from some of the world's most divinely beautiful girls, Powers Models, girls who are famous for their enchantingly lovely silken sheen hair. We glamour bathe our hair with cremel shampoo. And I want to state right here and now that no other shampoo leaves the hair more sparkling clean. Really, girls... You'll be amazed how cremel shampoo reveals all your hair's natural gleaming luster. It leaves hair shimmering with brilliant highlights that last for days. Cremel shampoo is not a cream shampoo, not a soapless shampoo, not a harsh soap, not a drying detergent. After a cremel shampoo, the hair fairly radiates natural glossy highlights. And cremel shampoo never dries or breaks the hair. In fact, it even has a built-in oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. How right you are, Mr. Bell. Cremel shampoo leaves the hair so much softer, silkier, with satin smoothness. The hair holds a wave better, too. 
So, ladies, buy a bottle of Cremel shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to have naturally lustrous hair, a vision of shining beauty. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel shampoo. And now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes, by a brilliant deductive reasoning, proved that what appeared to be a simple case of accidental drowning was in reality a diabolical murder. I call it The Adventure of the Submerged Baronet. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal International Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell, speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time, when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the submerged baronet. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, transcribed with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The quick twilight of winter has drained off Broadway, flowed in the side streets, for an instant lingered on the sea edge of the steel island, and somewhere a switch pulled, a dynamo released. The avenue strikes fire, and the night has begun. End of a winter day, and you went to the room and died with it. Or oh, the other thing, flung yourself into nighttime, and the loudspeakers to sob for you, and the crepe paper man dolls to dance for you, and the hawkers with a guided tour. Nighttime, kid. A way of life. And at headquarters, the file on the day's violence, closing. The desk, clear it of empty coffee container, tray of cigarette butts. The unfinished report dealing with alley assault. Staple it, put it in tomorrow's drawer. The man who waits for you is a man of infinite patience. Take all the time you want, Danny. Well, thank you, Gino. Take the whole evening to close shop if you want. Well, I'll be ready in just Do a... not take into consideration for a minute that even now, Mrs. Tartaglia is biting her knuckles, tapping her left foot like this because the lasagna is sagging. Oh, Gino, I just want it to... It goes without saying, Danny, how pleased we are to have you to a dinner at our house after so many invitations extended, so many rejected for this well, and I'm that. ready, Gino. Get the lights, huh? And then we'll go, huh, Danny? And I will stop on the way for a bottle of wine... Danny, consider you work hard today. Consider the lights are out. Consider... Danny Clover speaking. I'm dying, man. You want to come watch? Who is this? It's running away from me, man. You come watch out, Joey Condon. Me, Joey. Where? West 49, 2312. Hurry, man, or you'll never make it. A man, Gino, hurt, dying. I'm sorry, Gino. You know what? Danny. Squad car now, and nighttime ride, Broadway, and leave at Crowd Ebb down 49th, 10th Avenue, and park the squad car. Look for an address. Find it. Rooming house available to transients and those tired enough to want to take advantage of the monthly rates. Name Joey Condon on small directory in small vestibule, room 5. Corridor. Come on in. It's open. Open to the world. To everybody who wants a sight to see. <laughs> Ain't I a sight? Who did this to you? Ain't I a sight? I'll get some help. Oh, wait, wait. I ain't gonna be alone when it happens. Don't go nowhere. 
cut like this. Just tell me who... Things that happen, cut like this. The way it flows out of you, huh? I'm dreamy. You get... You get sleepy for the whole world. You don't hate nobody. You don't feel anything. <laughs> Furnished room on West 49th, cubicle of limbo, and decor to match. Wall where phone was, pencil scrawled with the lonely names, first names of women, some underlined. And end table, cigarette charred where solitude had been ground and blistered into veneer. Other things. And this, the man who had lived it. A man named Joey Condon, dead of a knife wound. And do now the things of death, the call to headquarters to report it, to say... Come for it. And search of a dead man. Wallet and loose cigarettes. And separate card and cellophane. Joey Condon, member of the Musicians Union. And another call and a voice that says, Joey worked the pinwheel club on West 5-2. Joey was the trumpet man there. Joey's had it, fella. And hang up. And in corridor, the familiar sound. Foot scrapings of the violence collectors. Meet them. Tell them about it. Leave them with it. And nighttime becomes the pinwheel club. And the rhythm of night in the narrow room is Dixieland. The man who owns it all just can't stand still. It reaches him, he says. Every night, you'd think I'd get crass and jaded. But every night, reaches out to me. What I told you, Mr. Robert... Every Say Avery to me. All right, Avery. What I told you, that hasn't reached you yet, huh? About Joey? Yeah, about Joey. I'll level. You're nothing. You know why? Tell me, Avery. You're nothing because you came running to tell me Joey isn't going to be here tonight. He's dead. I don't need that. What? One of the boys in the band don't show up. Nobody cries. Me, who bought him, I don't cry. They don't show up. We know they got reasons. Last night was Joey's turn. To be honest with you, I didn't expect Joey for a week. What are you talking about? Last night, some people took Joey right out of the band because they couldn't stand it anymore in a public place. Had to let Joey happen to them in their own place. Who did? The Woods. Charlie Wood. Laura Wood. Went mad for the horn. Took it out of here. To a party. Last night. You know where they live, Avery? Ask the hat check girl on the way away from me, huh? She's very kindly to all. On the way away from me, huh? Nothing, man. Take a drink, bottles inside. What'd you go away for in the first place? Come on. What am I doing holding your drink? Take it. No, thanks. Where's your lady? Huh? You went out to get a lady, didn't you? This afternoon with the rest of everybody? All the ladies went out to get lads and all the lads to get ladies. Routine to keep the party going, right? Got three days worth of bottles. Started last night. Let's see, we can hold out till, uh... Hey, don't you remember anything? Your name's Wood, isn't it? See, you remember. Your wife's... Uh... Laura, see how good you remember. The party started at the pinwheel. See? And that's where you met Joey Condon. Where's Joey? You know where Joey is. I haven't seen him since... I... Since when? Hey, I haven't seen you either. You know something? What? You weren't at the party last night, today either. You didn't go out of here look police. Oh. oh. What for? Nobody's making a disturbance here, sir. Even Joey put a mute on his horn. When's the last time you saw Joey? I'm going to think about it. Um. I'm thinking about it. Go right ahead. He didn't have fun, I guess. He left. About... Uh, Four o'clock this morning was here maybe three hours, and then he left. Where's your wife, Mr. Wood? You think I'd send Laura out? Well, then she's home, huh? 
Sleeping. Laura's sleeping and waiting for the fun to happen again. Go wake her. She's tired. This party's been going on. Yeah, I know, for nearly 24 hours. Go wake her. What for? I want to talk to her. You going to wake her or do I just barge right in? You don't believe me, huh? I'll show you. Laura. Cut it out. That bed's not been slept in, Mr. Wood. You know where she is. You tell me. Laura's not here. Hasn't been for a long time. For how long? Long, long. For how long? Well, she'll come back. She she left with Joey. You made me tell you. You made me say what my wife did. Went out. Where did they go? I don't know. Find her for me, will you? Find her. Please find her. Laura. Laura. wait for him some more, till the time when the concern wasn't distilled from booze, till he began to finger the old scar on his cheek, till he could tell me this. About five foot three, blonde, 25, wearing a mink coat and a dress, white, and a beauty mark. I'll get you a picture. And leave there. Back to headquarters and put out an all-points bulletin for Laura. And from one lead, legwork. Woman fitting description seen walking Lenox Avenue this afternoon. Cab driver reports fare answering description to Bank Street in Greenwich Village. Bartender in Greenwich Village reports selling a fifth of scotch to such person about 8 o'clock tonight. Desk clerk in Greenwich says he wasn't committing himself but try room 312. Three flights up and you got to walk it, mister. Straight back to the end of the hall to your right. And uh, would you mind taking this bottle of scotch up to her she just ordered? Give the bottle and hold out your hat for a tip. All right, don't take off your hat. Here's a dollar for you, anyhow, to show you how... You're Laura Wood, aren't you? Yeah, here's some more money. Buy yourself a trumpet. Come back and play... Like Joey? Nobody can play like Joey. He's dead. You sure? Sure. I wanted you to be sure before I gave you an impression. Now I'll give it to you. Joey's dead. (laughs) <laughs> you are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Now that the inauguration is history... CBS Radio is looking ahead and planning for another great event of 1953, England's coronation. Yes, when Queen Elizabeth is crowned, mid the traditional pomp and ceremony that has accompanied British coronations for centuries, CBS Radio will be on the scene. A great squadron of reporters and observers will bring you every important highlight of the historic occasion. In politics, in world affairs, in great moments of history like the coronation... CBS Radio is first, because CBS Radio News plans far ahead of the headlines. The chill wind puffs down from the river, and Broadway is a place of regret. The new dreams made for the new year show their first fray, and the golden girls are wrapped in fur coats someone else could afford. It's the time of the galosh, the noisy radiator, and the cold linoleum on the bare feet. And the mornings are filled with the numbing hours and dead cigarettes and bottoms of coffee cups. It's January's end. Snow time, muffler time. The time to get an invitation from your sister-in-law Bernice in sunny California instead of just snapshots. The winter room where I was, my part of police headquarters, new morning, new details. Detective Mugovan lighting his new pipe, and then a shiny Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. Good morning, Danny. How are you this morning? Hi, Gino. Did you give my apologies to your wife? She understood, Danny. I told her what happened. She went over to her rocker, rocked, and when she was finished rocking, she said she understood. 
She told me to convey to you the message that her good Italian food awaits your pleasure at any time. Oh, thank her for me. I did. Detective Muggerman? Yeah, Gino. You're invited too. Just as long as there will be no repetition of what happened the last time. I promise. It was only wine, Mugovan. How could I'm you... telling you for the hundredth time, Gino, I wasn't drunk. Then how did you do what you did? Gino. All right. I won't tell. Danny... What do you do at your house, Gino? Danny, Mrs. Laura Wood is outside for an interview. What did Mugovan do? Mrs. Wood, having spent the night in the pokey, is now in a sober condition and will be most happy to talk to you. This way to see Danny Clover... Oh, please sit down, Mrs. Wood. That'll be all, Sergeant. How do you feel? Well, next time, don't drink so much. I need you. You may need me, Mrs. Wood. You see, if you're innocent, you might need a cop to prove it. That's why you might need me. Innocent of what? Don't you remember? Joey Condon was murdered. You think I did it? Did you? You can drop dead if you like. I'll say, oh, my... Well, what can you expect, Danny? Your husband's a rum pot, too. Poor cops. I'll send you both National Geographic magazines and a fifth of seltzer. What were you doing in that hotel, Mrs. Wood? Drinking. Just wander around town and booze it up, huh? Yeah. I before last met a trumpet player. You know who, Joey Condon. Took him home with some people, then we left, did pieces of the town. We two and another fella. We got off for a while at Joey's place. Joey was through but I kept going, me and the fella. Oh, I'm a girl with stamina. But then you'll never know. What fella? Can you imagine a jazz hound watchmaker? What fella? Name's Georgie Prince. Winds watches all day. Unwinds all night. Took me to listen to records. Georgie's place over his clock shop on West 28th. That fella's a walking mainspring. Mrs. Wood's lawyer, Danny. Show him in. Counselor to Laura Wood is a glistening man. Curve of sun on gold rim of glasses. A newly shaven and powdered cheek. On freshly pink fingernails flying open the zipper of the briefcase. The yellowed smile. The brief legal type curtsy. The ritual of the writ and sign on the dotted line for girl. Receiver, offer an arm. And when girl murder suspect like Laura pats tenderly a counselor's cheek. Dog baby baby. No gleam and glisten like it. Anywhere in the world. And they leave. <laughs> when the tenderness and light has trailed away, check a name against city directory, confirm an address, go there. And on a shop window slapped against basement brownstone, the name George Prince, and a function, watch repairs. And inside, a man sits behind a glass partition, peering into a delicate mechanism of a lady's watch, bites a lip, does something to it, views it now with naked eye, then... <laughs> He's nice. Very nice. Uh, yeah? Anything I can do for you, sir? You, uh, Georgie Prince? Uh, look around, all alone, no one to help me. That makes me Georgie. Police. Uh, get out from behind that thing, Mr. Prince. You'll be able to make out the badge better. Yeah? Okay, yeah. yeah. I'm so used to working real close, my eyes. Well, you sure please all right, sir. You sure are. But but why? A girl's been telling me about you, Mr. Prince. Me? A girl told you about me? I, I did a watch for her? Who? What? Laura Wood. You know Laura Wood, don't you, Mr. Prince? I don't think so. She told you about me? You were with her last night. What are you yes. with? Yes, I was with her last night. For a while, that don't make me know her. That that kind of girl, you don't know her just from one part of the night. It'll take a long time. Impressed you, huh? Very, very much. And Joey Condon. Joey Condon, Mr. Prince. He was a part of last night, too. You, Laura, Joey. A very fine jazz musician. I read in the paper he was killed last night. I want to go to his funeral. It should be very big. You kill him? No. No, I... I'm a watch repairer. Nights I go places where I can go crazy, forget what I am, be somebody else. I don't kill. I've, I've thought about it, but I couldn't kill. Last night you went to a place like that, Mr. Prince? Oh, lots of them. Lots. With Joey and with Laura. She was his. I was along because Joey said I'd, I'd give Laura laughs. Then... Then what? 
in Joey's room, the three of us for a while, drinking, screaming. Then all of a sudden, it, it wasn't me she was laughing at, but him, Joey. And she says, uh, you're nice, Mr. Prince. You and me, huh? That's what she said. And you left Joey's place with her. Lots of after-hour places Laura knew about, just me and her. Places I never dreamed. And then I took her back here to listen to some of my records. Around morning, she started laughing at me again. Scratches my face hard. Runs out, leaves me standing there. Uh, hey. Uh, what? You see Laura again, tell her I didn't mind. I didn't mind one little bit. Wait up, Danny. I'm just on my way to your office. What do you got? Some rundown on that sweet character, Mrs. Wood. Oh. Very sweet character. I said, oh, Mugovan. That's not the secret word, huh? Okay, rundown on Mrs. Wood and E. Laura Brennan. Married Charles Wood three years ago. That's fine, fine. You stop me again. When Sometimes you... I get you in a bad humor, don't I? Is that all you got? Well, she has a record. Record narcotics. Took a cure. Oh, and something else. A man once signed a complaint against her for cutting him all up. Cutting him? Yeah, with a bottle. A man signed the complaint before Laura was brought to trial to withdrew it. That's interesting. What man was that kind? A chap owns a pinwheel nightclub named Avery Roberts. Mm-hmm. You've talked to him for quite a while once before, haven't you, Danny? Long enough so that he'll remember me, Mugovan. Hits you how different this joint is when it's empty, Mr. Clover. Hits me right here between the eyes. You want to listen to me, Avery? I know, I know. You're going to say to me, Laura. Uh huh. <laughs> I was told you signed a complaint against her. For the bottle bit? Yeah, I'll show you. I'll unbutton my shirt. See? Funny bit she did on the torso, huh? Then you withdrew the complaint. And it eats you why? Uh huh. It made a thing. What? It made a big thing in the newspapers. How a girl cut me up with a broken bottle. Pictures and everything, especially pictures of Laura. Look, Avery... You said it eats you why, didn't you? Why I withdrew the complaint. I'm telling you why. Because Laura had her pictures in the paper. It's a slogan, Mr. Clover. A picture's worth more than a billion words. And a picture of Laura in the New York dailies and a rundown on her type of excitement, it's only natural. What is... A fellow of the type, Charlie Wood, crowds me against the bar the next day, presses a wad of printed matter into my empty palm, and says, for withdrawing the complaint against your girl. Charles Wood, her husband? Charlie boy. Avid reader of the daily papers. Student of photographs. Buyer for a lot of pain. A week later, he married it. What else? You don't get around much, do you? Just tell what else. Let me see now, uh... There was a cutting of that little piano play in the village. That was with Laura's high heel. That was two years ago. There was the rapping of a French horn around the neck of a French horn player. I forget who. And there was a scar on Charlie's face, just for Charlie alone. Solid year ago. That's what else about Charlie. Yeah. You're not coming back here anymore, huh, Mr. Clover? That's good. That's real good. Well, hi. You didn't drop dead. You want to try for it inside? Come on in. You come for the fifth of seltzer. I know a funny bit that goes with... Where's your husband? Oh, he'll be very good in a bit. I'll call him. A little later. I want to talk to you. For what? Joey Condon. One of the other times you said that name to me, I went like this. <laughs> Only louder. Let's pose this name, then. Avery Roberts. You're going to do what to a name? Pose it? Then what am I supposed to do? Get your husband. Sure. I've had him. Now you can have him. Charlie! Charles, Carlo. What do you want? Get in here, pet. We got company. 
bring around a ball of yarn sometime, I'll show you why I call him Pet. Laura. Him, Pet. I was just pitching you. What do you want here, Clover? I just want you to join this discussion we're having. Oh, Pet here's a real big joiner. What were you talking about, Clover? A man named Avery Roberts. What about him? I'm trying to figure out why you paid him off to drop his complaint against your wife. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Wood. That badge you carry makes you have a big mouth spread, huh, Clover? Tell him, Pet. Tell him why you settled with Avery. Ah. You saw my picture in the paper, Mr. Clover. He read about me. Now you know, Clover. Now you can be on your way. And Laura appealed to you, huh? I married her, didn't I? Sure. My pet got me out of hock, and I'm a grateful girl. Mrs. Wood, mm-hmm. you've got quite a record. Leave her alone. Man wants to talk about me, pet. I don't mind. Shut up, Laura. How'd you get that scar on your face, Mr. What Wood? What difference is Your that? wife, huh? We were drinking. There was an accident. I'm sorry, pet. Another thing I can't figure. What are you talking about? Your wife. I told you, leave her alone. When she drinks, she gets violent. That's my problem. And he's happy. You know what I do to my pet, Mr. Clover? Why don't you shut up? Why don't you get out of here? I fascinate him. He told me. When she gets drunk, she gets violent. When she... I've been a good girl for years. Then a trumpet player sets you off again. Look, all we did was have a party. Must have been a pretty dull party, Laura. Yep, a lot of dull. So you left it with a trumpet player and another man. A little watchmaker didn't matter. Charlie knew that, didn't you, Charlie? What are you trying to do to me, Laura? You followed them, didn't you, Mr. Wood? What are you trying to do to me, Laura? It's done, Pat. You followed them. When your wife left, you killed Joey Condon. Listen to me. What? Well, Pat? You... You, you just listen to me. We're waiting, pet. I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. The things that have happened. What things, Charlie? Married to you. And what you made me do. You know something, Mr. Clover? You know something. What? Can you imagine a man being jealous of her? I was. Pet... Charlie, Carlos. Get away from me, get away. Aw. All I want to do is kiss you goodbye. That bit. Come along, Mr. Wooden. The other streets never paid off, so you walk Broadway. And Broadway is different. It twists you into the nighttime and whirls you in your puppet dance with the spinning lights, rocks you, and tosses you up in the air, and bangs you against the gutter. And you can't quit, because this is the street that never does. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Laura, and Whitfield Connor as Charles Wood. Featured in the cast were Sidney Miller and James McCallion. Bill Anders speaking. We're not lazy, a little smug maybe, but not lazy. You see, we don't think we have to carry on about Amos and Andy and tell folks what they already know. It's probably not even necessary to remind folks that the one and only Amos and Andy show is a part of the Sunday Fun Day lineup on CBS Radio. Let's face it, everybody knows and everybody who loves to laugh listens on most of these same stations every Sunday. Stay tuned now for the Vaughn Monroe Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations.
remember, Lionel Barrymore is your host on the Sunday Night Playhouse on the CBS Radio Network. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the cold of winter, Broadway is seen through a misty chill, and it's that time again. Make the big wish, Palm Beach and the 15-day tour to sunny Cuba. Make the annual excursion to the travel bureau to ask prices. Then step next door again and purchase the steaming knish against the blasts of January. And the next door down, and stand under the music shop loudspeaker and listen to the record of La Cucaracha. Button up your overcoat. Walk Broadway. It's touched you, and it can never rub off. Just off Broadway, 11 o'clock in the morning time on West 39th, apartment house, and this. Languid attitude of hand against the floor, trail of blood upward to girl on bed, shot and dying. And this, the doctor bending over her. And in the living room, this, the protesting man. Oh, who, who are you calling a killer, mister? I'm no killer, I'm a mover. Mr. Barnes... You want uh, an item of furniture moved, a stick or a house load, you call me and I come with my truck and I move you. You want a killer, girl, you should call somebody else, not me, mister. Listen, why should Nobody I... Nobody called you a killer, Mr. Barnes. I'd just like to know how you happen to find this girl, that's all. Well, it, yesterday comes a call. I got a big ad in the yellow section of the phone book, a picture of my truck and all. Well, yesterday comes a call... Oh. Take your time. I've stumbled on some strange things in my line of work, mister. Like the time I was moving some wine... Oh, just tell me about this morning. You got a call? Uh, yesterday. All, all here on the order sheet. Pick up apartment full of furniture, this address, take it to this address. Here, right here on the paper. It's written down, so how could it not be so? It, it's written down, so how can it not be so? I'll just take the paper. Thanks. Go on. So, look under where it says special instructions, and it will prove to you that the dame who called, Helen Selby, she said her name was, she said in case nobody's home, walk in and start moving. That's the way it happened. You knocked, nobody answered, you walked in. Sure. Walked around, cased the joint. The trunks were already packed, and right over there, walked into the bedroom, looked, looked again, called the police. L look on a paper, will you? It's written down. I can't be lying to you. The time then for waiting, measured like this, brief span of morning sun to lie against the face of a wounded girl. Gold drift of January light on throat of dying girl. Till ambulance came and the young men of the stretcher to lift her, carry her to another place, another room, suitably darkened. And time now for you to leave. Ride then through late January City, uptown and east to where river reflects late morning and shadows of men staring into it. And late morning wishes cast into its waters. And uptown into the 70s, to a delivery address on a moving man's order sheet. 1212 East 78th, Brownstone House, January trees in concrete wells against its facade. Lace curtains, stoop, freshly scrubbed. Yes, what is it? I'm from the police, Danny Clover. So? Uh, I'd like to talk to you. May I come in? Well, I don't know. You see, this is... Can't you tell me about it inside? Yes, yes, I, I think I can. I think it'll be all right. Now, please come in. The living room there. But please be careful of things and... Uh, and what? 
what I've been trying to tell you. This isn't really my house, and it's a very nice house. I just live here with a friend. It's his house. Who's? Leo's. Leo Pearson. Oh, I'm sure your friend won't mind, Mr. Uh... Alex. Alex Ewing. And I'm not sure that Leo won't mind. He's very careful about his nice things, and so am I, and we get along real fine together. You see, Leo is a very lonely man. Oh? Huh? Oh, yes. You see, his wife and child were killed in an automobile accident. My, it's almost a year ago. A year. And Leo was, a, was very lonely, and he asked me to come live with him. And, well, I did, and it's worked out just fine. Police, why have you come here? A girl, a young woman, was having her things moved into this house this morning. A young woman? Helen Selby. The moving man found her in her bedroom. She'd been shot. She's dying. Oh. Oh. Yes, Mr. Ewing? Uh, nothing. Just that it's such a terrible thing to be wounded, to die. A young girl. Uh, such a terrible thing. Yes. Helen Selby, you know her? No, no. I never heard of the young woman until now. And your friend, uh, Mr. Ewing? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I wandered for an instant. Uh, that young woman, perhaps Leo knows her, but he hasn't said anything to me about it. She was going to move in here? Yes. Where is Leo? Well, I don't know. He went out early this morning. He didn't say where. He said to take care of things, Alex. And I scrubbed the stoop and did other little things around. And well, I made lunch. And Kate, uh, shall I tell him you want to talk to him when he comes home? Yes. I'll do that. I'll tell him first thing. Well, let me show you to the door, Mr. Clover. Danny? Hmm? Come on in, Muggerman. I've got a few things here. Uh, items on the girl. Uh, yeah, here. The name's Helen Selby, all right. Went through a packed stuff, found this driver's license from California, thumbprint on it, checks so the girl's okay. What else? Uh, 23 years old. Let's see, um... Yeah. Yeah, what? Oh, take it easy for a minute, will you? I'm trying to figure out my own notes. Uh, yeah, she's, uh, employed as a secretary at the Sun Up the Sundown Trucking Company. <laughs> Sun Up the Sundown. Great, huh? Where's it located? Uh, downtown, Danny Perry Street. I got the address here somewhere. Do me a favor, Morgan. Sure. Give me the address. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And the Sun Up to Sundown Trucking Company is easily found. It stands out from the rest of Perry Street because the grime of its brick facades is emblazoned with yellow painted suns. Sun ascending, sun descending. And the entire miracle powered by great stake trucks. And the demigod at the reins of the cab wearing the billboard grin and a winged helmet. And inside, the golden girl, marked receptionist. Sunflower behind beat-up desk who slides out from behind it. The better for you to receive the impact of her slim stalks. Also happens to handle office personnel. Can tell you all about Helen Selby. Hired in December for the winter rush. Clerk typist, 5750 per. Here a week and a half when glommed onto a driver, Chris Miller. Other personnel, it has taken as long as five weeks to glom onto Chris Boy. And if you're fast on your stems, boy, chick, you might catch Chris by the loading platform, truck number 367. Right through there. And if it's no burden, mention to Chris, reception was inquiring after his health. And slim finger on a buzzer, and a door is released. A corridor, then loading platform, and truck 367, and the man standing beside it. You Chris Miller? Uh, some other time. I felt I got a schedule eating on me. Here. Police, Chris, look. Uh, you'll explain up front after how you file the schedule up, huh? I was told you know Helen Selby. You got all sizes blabbermouth here on you. You know her? Oh, you want to know her, too? I'll give you a knockdown. State your qualifications. Your girlfriend's been shot. She's dying. Someone opens her mouth and spills out my name and Helen's, and right away you figure I did that to her. To Helen, with gun and pistol. Did you? I don't know her long enough to get that excited about her, that kind of emotion in me she hasn't had a chance to store up yet. You'll tell me about it, Chris, about the emotions between you and Helen, I mean. Helen, uh, dying? Yeah. Where? Police emergency hospital. I get a chance from the schedule. I'll check her there. Right now, I got no way to make it work out. I... Here or downtown, Chris? From New Year's, she came out here for something, the platform. Happened to let a 
A remark dropped. There was a whole new year ahead of her with nothing in it but her so far. I happened to remark how come tan on her face and her arms. She said from California. Well, I heard from California. Could be a blast, so <laughs> I invite her. Well, that was New Year's. After that, a few bars and a few movies, a couple of dances, records in her apartment. That's all. Helen and me, me and Helen, our match. Well, look, yeah, I know, a uh, schedule. Danny. Uh, don't apologize for being late, Dan. I got here as soon as I got your message, Dr. Sinski. Too late, huh? Helen Selby died 15 minutes ago. It wouldn't have mattered what time you got here. She never regained consciousness. Well... That's as good comment as any. Me, a doctor with 30 years in hospitals like this, I never thought of a better comment. Well, sums it up. Oh, Danny. Uh-huh. A man came into a room a few minutes ago. He said his name was Leo Pearson. He said he was a relative. I let him stay. Leo Pearson? That's right. I've been at his house. I've been looking for him. Thanks, doctor. Mr. Pearson? Mr. Pearson? She's dead. I want to... Uh, so soon I found her. I lost her. My niece, dear Helen, I, I'm sorry, my dear. So sorry. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. Written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Truly a leader in its field, your Sunday night playhouse has, for years, made a specialty of historical dramas and literary adaptations. Every week, Lionel Barrymore is your narrator and host. Tomorrow night, again, on most of these same stations, enjoy your Sunday night playhouse, presented by CBS Radio. <laughs> Morning sunlight strays through January wind, and Broadway robs minutes from the time clock to stop running, to stand still for the splatter of warmth, crowd clusters in sun pools, and for the latecomers, room only on the fringes of warmth, the chill place, the shadow place, where a vendor stood last night and hawked his night merchandise, and sold out before you got there, late for that, too. So move on, smile the secret smile, nibble on the bone. At office, on worksheet, there will be a demerit for the sunbathers. And for you, a pat on the cold cheek for promptness. In my office at headquarters, a man who last night had stood at the side of a dead girl, a murdered girl, who had not wept, who had sung some tuneless thing, a man of regret. She had loveliness, a gentleness also, Helen Selby. Mr. Pearson. She offered this to my house and to me, and... There could have been happiness in it. I so arranged it. You mean about her moving in with you? Mr. Clover. Yes? Yeah? You were in my house. That's right. Then you saw how I live. It's a nice house. Your friend. My friend Alex. He told me of you. You know of Alex? Well, that he's your friend, that he lives with you. That he said he knew nothing about Helen Selby. Alex, that... to me, was once a partner in coin collector business many years ago. Alex was a man without... Poise, without serenity, and then because he was so, he sold to me his share of the business and squandered the money, became a man of pity. I arranged for him a place and a home for the old and the helpless, <laughs> home for the men of pity. Then you took him out of there and brought him to your house. You know of my wife, my son, you know of this? Well, Alex told me they Killed, were... Killed, struck down in an accident, taken from me, and I... I was alone. And one day I thought... Alex, of course, Alex, and I brought him to my house. About Helen Selby, tell me about her. Of Helen? How you met her, how you got to know a young woman well enough to ask her to come live in your house. Helen is kin of my wife's blood, and I am an old gentleman. What who... was she to your wife? Niece to my wife. 
child of my wife's sister, who was in California many years. Then you knew her before she came to New York? No, no, I, I did not know of Helen. Her mother, my wife's sister, is dead now many years. Of the child, we had known nothing until Helen came to me, to my house. When? Maybe a month. Helen came, say to me she is of my wife's sister, show me old letters such as between sisters, show me an album of pictures when she is baby. And the thing came quickly in my thoughts. What thing, Mr. Pearson? Uh, Mr. Pearson? And the laughter of youth and the touch of youth. Helen said to me once, how lonely you must be, old gentleman. How quick are the eyes of youth. And you asked her to come live with you? Yes, yes, I asked her, and I said to her, with your husband, too, stay with me, Helen, this big house, for you, for... Husband? She tell me a boy she love, a boy who wished to marry her. I, I have a big house, many empty rooms, and nice things for a girl. Now it's, again, death, and only death, and rooms of em. <laughs> it's not gentleman to cry before... <laughs> and after that, after the grief washed over him and broke and carried him with it to some shore of the mind, to the far away and desolate place of lost images, after that, the small things, fold the handkerchief neatly and replace it in the breast pocket, straighten the tie, flick the lint, neat man going out of doors where people could see him. And after he leaves, sit with it for a while and think. Helen Selby, dead girl, was going to be married, her uncle said, which didn't jibe with previous information. So call the sun up to sundown trucking company, and the solar voice on the other end tells you that Chris Miller is off today and gives you his home address warmly. So get Detective Mugovan, squad car ride, address, and Chris Miller entertains from his bed. This is going to be a real fine day, I can tell that. Not enough. We got a cold radiator. I gotta have you. Get out of the bed, Chris. We want to talk to you. Uh, show me where it says I can't roll over on my side and tuck the chin on the elbow and converse. So, Mary, you gonna get different answers from me in a bathrobe? You know about Helen? Hey, how's Helen? Dead. Uh-huh. Helen. Look, Sonny, I got a confession to make. It's about the beds in the pokey. There's been some complaint leave about. Leave him alone, I... Martin. He crying? Just leave him alone. I'm okay. Just give me a second again. I might rob you. Okay. You shoot Helen, Chris? No. We found out Helen was going to get married. To you? Yeah, to me. You know a man named Leo Pearson? He killed Helen? You know him? No. Helen was going to live with him. Yeah, I know about that. And then you were going to move in? Yeah, later, after we got married. What were you waiting for, Sonny? I wanted to get married right away, set up housekeeping here. Not for Helen, no, not not good enough. She used to like fancy. She's a good kid, but uh, like fancy, you know. Sure, you know. Not quite. You tell us. Well, move in with Uncle and get to. I don't know how she put it. Get the feel of the place. And then we get married, and I move in too. Makes sense, doesn't it? I used to tell Helen it made sense. I don't know. Telephone's ringing, Danny. May I, Danny? Oh, of course you may, Gino. Thank you kindly. Lieutenant Clover's office, Sergeant Tartaglia at this end. Yes. Oh, I see. I will do that. And your address, madam? Kill me, madam. I happen never to have heard of your place, so the address, if you please. Uh Uh-huh. Thank you. I will forward your message to the proper party. No trouble at all. And you also, madam. Thank you. Danny. What, you know? Bessie Hancock. Huh? 
Miss Bessie Hancock of the Hancock Home for the Aged, 190th and Riverside Drive. She has read in the papers of Mr. Leo Pearson of our current murder case, and she has certain information which may or may not be important, she said. Also, Order the squad cards, you know. Of course, Danny. Goes without saying. Right uptown now, along the road that bans Manhattan from the river. Riverside Drive and chill afternoon. 190th Street. Look across the brown water to the Palisades. And make a turn at the sign of the clenched fist and pointing finger. Hancock, home for the aged. Gentle and loving care. Park the car and walk through the swinging gate. Up the path, lined by last year's grass and last rainfall's footprints. The porch, with an old gentleman on one side of the steps, an old lady on the other, rocking. Faster, a stationary race between them. The lady who answers the door has a lorgnette pinned to one side of her blouse and a watch pinned to the other. Yes? I'm from the police. My name's Clover. Yes, won't you... Oh, just a moment, please. Uh, still angry, Mrs. Cochran? Oh, don't be. That's Mr. Settlin's way, that's all. He wants to talk to you, don't you, Mr. Settlin? Be nice, Mr. Settlin. Uh, please come in, Mr. Clover. Uh, this way... Thanks. Oh, you may sit down. <sighs> Was something wrong? Oh, Mrs. Cochran and Mr. Settlin. I want everybody to be happy, and they're not happy. Not with each other. Oh. Mr. Settlin plays pranks with frogs, and now he's taken to answering ads in magazines and signing Mrs. Cochran's name. Oh, such ads. Oh. It's about the phone call you made a while ago to the police. I know. You know, I wonder if I was right. About what? About having that music piped into here. I started it last week, and since then my boarders don't use the game room so much. The checkerboards and the dominoes, they just sit and rock and listen and don't seem to be happy at all. I want everybody to be happy. Was Alex Ewing happy? Alex Ewing? Then you know why I want to talk to you. Oh, I made an assumption. I, I spoke with Leo Pearson. He told me he paid the bills for Alex in a home for the aged. Then you called. And... Oh, Alex was miserable. He made us all miserable. The things he would do. Oh? Get up in the middle of a meal and make speeches. How this was a prison. How he wasn't really old. How he would rather be dead than stay here. If Mr. Pearson wasn't paying me so much money to keep him here... And well, after Mr. Pearson's wife and son were killed, he took Alex out of here and into his own home. Yes, thank goodness. For instance, you see that big stain on the wall? Hmm? Mashed potatoes. Alex... Uh, why exactly did you call me, Mrs. Hancock? Oh, I don't know whether it's important. Last week, Mr. Pearson came in here and made arrangements for us to take Alex back. Today was supposed to be the day, as a matter of fact. Of course I charged him more money. You can understand that. If my boarders get miserable again, I should be paid for it, surely. And I do want everybody to be happy. Mr. Clover, good evening, sir, good evening. Hello, Mr. Pearson. Uh, mind if I come in? Please do. I, I am pleased to see you. Thank you. Would you care for some wine? Thanks, no. Is Mr. Ewing here? <laughs> Did I ask a funny question? No, no, forgive me. It is only that Alex is in the library poised over a chess problem. Therefore, he is here and he is not here. I'd like to talk to him. <laughs> we will go to him this way. Alex? Don't bother me. Go away, go away. Castle to King 4, Queen to Bishop 4, and mate. In another minute. Perhaps Mr. Clover's in a hurry. What? Look up, Alex. Good evening, Mr. Clover. 
Hello, Alex. And now we will chat, Leo. Yes? Uh, we were having a very fine evening. What does Mr. Clover want? Ask him, Alex. I'm sure both of you know. It's about the murder of Helen Selby. More questions, Mr. Clover? I've told you everything. I've told no, you... I'm sorry, Mr. Pearson, but you haven't. I, I don't understand. What about Alex here? I've got nothing to well, do with it. quiet a minute, Alex. Let's hear what Mr. Clover has to say. Very well, but I have nothing to do with any of it. What haven't I told you, Mr. Clover, about Alex? That you were going to send him back to that home for the agent. Not now, not anymore. Alex? Uh, yes, sir? Tell me uh, about that home. I don't want to talk about it. It's all right, Alex. You're not going back there. I understand you weren't happy there, Alex. It was a prison. Why should I want to talk about it? I was there. It seemed very nice. Uh, why, why do you say it was a prison? I'm 62. I'm not old. Alex, friend. I'm not old. Old is when you're ready to sit in a chair and rock. Old is when no one wants you. Alex. I'm not going back there. But Alex, I told you you're not going back there. Now let's talk about Helen Selby. <laughs> a lovely girl. Whoever killed her, what reason could he have? I think I know, Mr. Pearson. I'm not old. She called me an old man. You said you didn't know her. Uh, know her? I talked to her once. Well, a schemer. I could tell that. When did you talk to her? She was here once, for you. I sent her away. Schemer. Something like that, what I was going to say. I think she was going to move in here. She, later her husband. And take your house over. Already she convinced you to throw me out of here, to send me back That's to... why you killed her, isn't it? I'm not an old man. You killed her because it's on account of her you were going back to that place. Alex? Here's where I'm happy, Leo. You killed her? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, murderer. Well, what are you? An old fool. Let a young girl come in here and walk around like this and talk like this. Yes, uncle. Yes, uncle. I know how she talked. I know how she walked. I watched. She was my niece. Welcome here. I wanted her here. Let her go, Alex. Like this, Leo. Like this. <laughs> like this she walks. You fool. You lonely fool. This man's taking me away, and you're going to be alone. Big house, Leo. Lots of rooms. Lots of echo, Leo. Take me away, Mr. Clover. It's a panic in neon, this Broadway, where pleasure is a packaged commodity and pain. Where bargains prevail for numbness and the fleeting smile, sometimes on installments. It's a place that dares you, and one way or another, it'll rock you to sleep. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Herb Butterfield was heard as Alex, and Lou Merrill as Leo. Featured in the cast were Gloria Gordon, High Everback, and Lamont Johnson. Bill Anders speaking. Sunday night all over America, everything stops with the laughter when it's Jack Benny time on CBS Radio. Join the gang again tomorrow night. Jack, Mary, Dennis, Don, Bob Rochester. For more of that special kind of comedy that everyone recognizes by its Jack Benny trademark. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS Radio Network.
plays my beat from Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The February winds spin, dance, race in the morning avenue, and Broadway lurches in their wake, and hands are frozen to early editions of newspaper, and winter lies against cheek and mouth, and search the headlines for what the winds are taking to die with them. And search memory, too, for January images sworn to remembrance. Ice on masks of freighter bound for the tropics. And further back, deeper in memory, the holiday time and the holiday women. And they dance by now in chill embrace of winter wind. And solace is the corner coffee stand and the donut. And waiting a little way up the street, the time clock. Downtown, the new morning is emergency ward of police hospital, and the wall clock that jerks its hands into the eight o'clock time, and a man, Dr. Sinsky. Shock, exposure. For a whole night, the girl lay in an alley and no one to... Over the phone, you said... uh... I know what I said, poison. There were symptoms. The lab confirmed my diagnosis just minutes ago. Pretty. Yes. Now that dead is asleep, her prettiness has returned. Um... Here, Danny. Here's the history on her. Identified from things in her pocketbook as Peggy Warner, age 28. Where was she found? A moment, Danny. Alley emptying into 19th Street, back of Tate's Bar and Grill on 3rd Avenue. Mm-hmm. A woman came running to patrolman Carnes on the beat, yelled a drunk girl was sleeping in the alley and that... Poison, shock, exposure. What are her chances, Doctor? What do you want me to say, Danny? I gave her sleep for a little while. To give her back her life? What do you want me to say, Danny? And outside now, the morning is a wind wall, so adjust yourself to it. One hand in overcoat pocket, one hand on hat, lower the head. Short walk to squad car, and the drive downtown. Crowd going to work time, rush beneath long triangles of gray and splinters of sunshine. Uncadenced quick step of pedestrian, and blare of the car born, taking turns according to the green light and the red. Left on 3rd Avenue and cruise for an address. Tate's Bar. Find it. Park. And Tate's Bar is five booths, four empty, ten bar stools, half of them occupied. And the bartender flashes his nine o'clock in the morning smile at you, takes it back at the flash of the badge, assures you his name is Tate, and assures you... My time is yours. Just a few questions about last night, Mr. Tate. Last night was different. There was a girl lying in the alley out back. Her name was Peggy Warner. Is Miss Warner in the habit of... Look around you for a minute. So? You just bear with me. Peggy Warner, Mr. Brazier. You just bear with me. We'll come to Peggy. This place of mine, this bar, a convenience. I cater to those who demand their booze. Me, personally, I wouldn't be caught even with my nose to a cork for the aroma. What's this got to do with... I'm going to tell you why I fired her. Go on. So, there are those who booze it from early morning on. I cater to this necessity. Notice the place, clean. The jukebox music, adjusted to soft tone level. The customers, voice is low. This I demand. Talk becomes above library level. Into the gutter they must go. Now we will consider Peggy. Thank you. So you'll understand. I said thank you. Eight months ago, I got a whim. Hire a barmaid. I approve of women waiting on men. Dames, I don't allow in here to drink. But to wait on in uniform and all, I have a whim where this is nice for the self-respect of those who like the bottle. I hired Peggy. Eight months ago. About that. Then I caught her drinking with a customer. Two days after she started to work here, I bounced her. What about last night? She came back looking for a job. She looked like she just swam her way to the top of a beer crock. Out the back way, she did go on my arm. No job for me to her. I see. What else can you tell me about her? Eight months ago, when I fired her first... Yeah, maybe you'd like to know about that. About what? The customer who she drank with. She merely walked around to his end of the bar, went out with him hand in hand. And? Well, the guy's name was... I'll get it for you. His address, too. I got around here someplace. But whatever this guy's name was, I saw him the next morning at his house. Oh? Yeah. Next morning, I got a messenger with a $10 bill and a note from Peggy. Bring my dress and street shoes around to this address. I did. The man I mentioned opened the door for me, took the bundle, and slammed the door in my face. Sure, I'll get his name and address for you.
Yes? What do you want? I'm from the police, Danny Clover. And please I, be uh... brief. You've chosen a very bad time. A woman's morning is quite crowded enough without... Charles Blake live here? Charles Blake, I was given this address. Charles is my husband. Well, do I have to stand out here and discuss it, whatever you... No, Mrs. Blake. Well, then let's go inside. I'm chilled to the bone. Here in the hall will do. Just let me warm myself at the register a moment. Ooh. Now, what's this about Charles? I want to talk to him. Where is he? In his office, maybe. Out with one of his clients, maybe. What do police have to do with Charles? A girl was found in an alley early this morning. Oh, there you go again. I've read how you people do things. Make it sound big. Toy with it. Act smart and fresh and knowing. You'll let me finish, Mrs. Blake? What alley? What girl? Some girl Charles is supposed to know? Something you found in an alley and right away... What girl? Peggy Warner. Girl, your husband. Oh, Peggy. That one? <laughs> Funny, Mrs. Blake? Oh, I just like a girl like that. Where else but in an alley? Strikes me funny I was so right about her. Do you mind? What else did you feel about her, Mrs. Blake? That she had a fresh mouth and she was sloppy and lazy and had to be yelled at to make her do things? She was our maid, you know. I didn't know. Oh, yes. Charles brought her home one evening and said to me, standing right there, he said to me, he said, Martha, I've brought you that maid you've always wanted. And Tom... Tom. Tom, my son. Tom said, you've always wanted one, Mother. Let's try it for a while. And I thought about it and I said, all right. All right, Charles. All right, son, if you both think we need one. And was she drunk when you people found her? She was poisoned. She's dying. And I tried it. For two weeks, I really tried it, honestly, but I, I just couldn't bear her anymore. Sloppy and just fresh-mouthed, and we paid her off and dismissed her and... Oh, excuse me. Hello? Yes, Tom. Where are you? Oh, no. No, I don't think so. I'd rather you didn't. Not here. You tell your father... Not now, Tom. You and your father are not to... Now, you listen to me. Your son, Mrs. Blake? Just a minute, Tom. Yes, it's my son. Do you mind waiting and he's out... with his father? Why, why, yes. He's with Charles, and I... I don't see any need for them to traipse all the way up here from downtown, just... You're right, Mrs. Blake. As long as they're downtown, just tell them to drop in at headquarters right away. Ask for me. Now, go on. Tell him, Mrs. Blake. Tom? Yes, there's someone with me. A Mr. Clover from the police. He wants you and your father to go to police headquarters right away. Well, I, I don't know, son. I don't know. I'll tell him. Son? Tom? He hung up. They'll be there? Yes. Miss Clover? Yes? That girl. It's all she was, what I told you. It's all she deserves. <laughs> Uh, just sit down, gentlemen. What's this all about? What are my father and I doing in a police station? Pop, I told Take you... Take it easy, son. Mr. Clover must have a reason. What do you do for a living, Mr. Blake? I'm a tax consultant. What about you? I used to help out my father. I'm on my own now. And he's very good, Mr. Clover. Look, Mr. Clover, my father and I were on our way home. Either one of you know a girl named Peggy Warner? Come now, Mr. Clover, surely you asked my wife the same question, and surely she told you that Peggy once worked for us. Tell me about her. Of course. She worked for us. Made. She was unsatisfactory as a worker. She was fired. Who fired her? I don't remember who fired her, Tom. What is all this? A maid waved a dust mop around she our house. She was found in an alley, poisoned. Suicide? Well, for one thing, she's not dead yet. For another... I still don't get this at all. We haven't seen Peggy since last summer sometime. July, around then. That go for you too, Mr. Blake? Of course. Now, tell me about how you first met her, Mr. Blake. How do you know it was I? About Tate's bar. Tell me about that. I'll be glad to. My office was nearby. I stopped in for a quick one at Tate's bar. Peggy waited on me. I drank to her health. She told me she wished she could drink to mine. I bought her a drink. She drank it. Her boss saw her, fired her. You figured it was your responsibility to take care of her, is that it? Mm, not to take care of her, to see that she got located again. Listen, you... My mother had been screaming for a maid, so my father brought her one. Peggy was a lousy maid, that's all. And I'll tell you something else. My mother didn't like the way she took too long to clean up my room. That make you happy? No sense making up lies, Tom. There's nothing... Who's to... lying? 
I see. Well, that's about it, Mr. Clover, all we can tell you. Honestly, now, my son and I were having a beer together. My wife is expecting us. She'll worry. Sure, go home. If, if I need you, you'll be there, won't you? Of course, but why should you need us anymore? Let's get out of here, Pop. And son walks away from it. Opens door for father. Grins. You want to make a production out of it, Pop? Let's get out of here. Come on, Pop. The man said... Pop, you listening? For a little while longer, the father sits in silence, then rises, walks past the boy into corridor without waiting, without a word to him. And boy winks at me and closes door. And through window, morning drifts the streets, and chill is grayer now. And over a doorway, neon sparks, sputters, flows in twisted tube. A man looks up, enters, and brief flurry of wind people on Winter Street. Danny? Danny? Hmm? Come on in, Doctor. I've just come up from emergency war checking my patients. Uh, that girl this morning. Peggy Warner? Yeah, her too. Well, what about her, Doctor? This about her. The question you asked of me this morning? What question? You said, what chances, Doctor? I didn't have an answer for you then. Now I have. Now there's nothing to ask anymore. She's dead. Peggy Warner is dead. When you look through your window, what do you see, Danny? Tell me. Tell me about it. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. You've heard about the devastation spread in Holland by the hurricane. No doubt it touched your heart, in common with all Americans. And if you've been wondering what you can do to help these brave people in their hour of desperate need, please listen. The State Department and the Executive Office of the President suggest that you send immediately a check to CARE, C-A-R-E, CARE, New York. Holland's greatest need is for blankets. CARE can send more faster with your dollars. To relieve an immediate pressing need, make your relief money for Holland go farthest by sending your check to CARE, New York. <laughs> When it begins, when the February part of winter comes around, there's a kind of joy on Broadway. The time is starting to end. Peek under the calendar page and know that spring will come again. And the smile you make makes a little warm inside. But there'll be the winter things to remember. The evenings, just as nighttime drifted in, when lights danced their patterns just for you. And later, when you made the stars do things just for her. And winter park, snow in black tumbled hair... And Hudson Dawn, fingers against cool curve of cheek and laughter. It's starting to end, but there's still time. Run after it. Hurry. And the rush of new morning at police headquarters, the way it happens always, but with minor variations according to the big Aries of Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. Money. Money. Uh, Gino? Take a handful of peanuts, Danny, and sing along. Go ahead. Uh, Oh, thanks, Gino. I'll save them for later. I saw Mrs. Tartaglia put them in my lunchbox, and I couldn't wait. And three peanut butter sandwiches... Like peanuts, huh? (laughs) What's the matter? What a question. It's like asking a fellow if he likes gherkins. What? A question. Gino, do you have anything for me? Indeed I do. Let me have it, please. Some questions. Like asking a fellow... So help me, Gino. Uh, Very well, Danny. A check into the background of Miss Peggy Wanna deceased. Nothing on the blotter at records. So far as we can tell, Miss Wanna was a law-abiding citizen. However... However what? A hurry-up wire to Baltimore, to the Social Security office, and a relay to the folk down there of Miss Wanna's Social Security number taken from her effects reveal the following. Go on. Miss Wanna was a bad employment risk for some reason or another. A list of places where she worked for the last eight months is this long. Here, Danny. You can see for yourself. Mm. After the bar job, she was employed as a waitress in the village tea shop. Then there's an elevator operator at a fancy dress shop on Park. Do you know? uh, Yes, Danny? I can read. Thank you very much, Gino. You were good today. Very good. Tell Mrs. Tartaglia. The 
there'll be a very small wait for a table, sir, so if you'll just give me your name. Danny Clover. Danny Clover. With one L, of course. You see? There you are in big block letters on my pad, right under Mrs. Trafer and party of three. And if you'll nuzzle among those others on the bench, we'll have you teed and fed in just the smallest time. I'm not eating. Then we'll put you with someone who is. And if you're fortunate, you'll get a fat one who's dieting, and you can have her blue plate dessert with your tea. I'm from the police. You're a police? It's about Peggy Warner, a girl who used to work here. That one? Mm Mm-hmm. But she died today. It's all over the noon editions. A little while ago, I had a midday snack over it in the kitchen with the salad boy. Look, uh... An August girl, that one. And you know August girls. No, tell me. You don't know how odd like this they are. They blow in with the August wind, always at evening. Ask for a job or given it, and first thing you know, the season hits them. And there's nothing to do but sack them, fire them, give them the boot, the old heave-ho. Weather affects their work? You really don't know, do you? This uh, Peggy, this August thing, was doing very well on table. So well, in fact, I put her on tea leaves. Huh? Fortunes, of course. The extra charge is minute, and the men seemed to like it when it was Peggy at the leaves. But when she made their futures all come true, went out with them on the side, dated them at odd hours, what else is a person to do, I ask? The heave huh? Your compassion is so welcome. Oh, pardon. Mrs. Trafer, we're ready for you. That table near the fireplace. Peggy Warner, is that the name? That's right. She worked here in this dress shop, didn't she? Why? What about her? What about her is that she's dead. Why is because I'm a policeman and I'm asking. Miss Warner worked here. She ran the elevator. I was floor manager in the college shop at the time. I remember her. I'm glad you do, because I want you to tell me about her. (laughs) There are only three floors here. There's not much to tell. She lasted three weeks here, Mr. Austin. How come such a short time? She's dead. That's right. And there's an investigation. That's right. Murder? We're pretty sure of it. I see. She nearly cost me my job. That's why I signed the complaint slip against her for personnel. It was on my account she was discharged. I know. That's why the manager of this place sent me to you for a fuller explanation. Sometimes cheapness attracts a man, I'm sorry to say. You? I took her out a few times, three beers and a second-run movie each time. And goodbyes each time, not good night. I didn't like myself. So you had her fired? I couldn't stand her around. I'm thinking of marrying a lovely girl who... Well, I had to get rid of Peggy. I did. Now she's dead. Now I can stop looking for her. And leave him. And to other places where a girl, now dead, had worked, had been fired... Had made other brief impressions. A charrette in a theater on West 125th Street. Handled uniform and flashlight real clever until one day showed an early matinee movie lover to a loge seat. Sat down in the empty one next to him right through second feature, newsreel, animated cartoon. Candy intermission also while the lights were up. Also laughed loud through very sad passages. Fired. Turned in flashlight and uniform. And a five and dime on East 26th Street. Long changed several men customers till one day she did it to lady store detective. Laughed right in her face. Fired. And the home insulating firm where Peggy Warner had been hired as house-to-house canvasser had made a house call. After an hour, phoned the home office, said she thought she needed a vacation. Our canvassers work on a volume basis. Fired. The life work, the employment rundown on Peggy Warner. And forget the rest of the list. Go back to headquarters. And a man in your office waiting for you. You been hustling, Danny? Gino said you've been waiting. He said Detective Muggervin had something for me. You got something, Muggervin? I've been making a routine rundown on Charles Blake. I figured maybe I could save you some legwork. Oh, tell me. Charles Blake, you remember the big-hearted fellow meets a girl, buys her drink, gives her a job in his own home, and made for the wife and kid? I remember. What about him? Well, Charles has been separated from his wife six months now. A stunner, huh? Go on. Uh, he hasn't lived in his home. Kindly folk, neighbors, clients, very glad to cooperate with you boys of the police department, that type. They told me. Told me other things. And you'll tell me, huh? <laughs> it's what I knew you'd ask, Danny. Yeah. They told me uh, how Charlie Blake didn't deserve a nice home like this, a nice wife, how Charlie was a chaser, also a hunter. All right, he hasn't been in his home for six months. You find out where he has been? 
Uh, you got that list Tartaglia gave you? Places where Peggy Warner worked? Yeah. Uh, give it to oh, me. Oh, look, right? Muggerman, I've been through the list. Oh, I just know. give it to me, huh? Thanks. Now, uh, come over here to the wall map, Danny, a map of the city. I've been circling some spots on it while I waited. Uh, here, 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 here. Well, what about it? Uh, places where Charles Blake has opened a tax consultant office in the last six months. Sometimes a living quarters, sometimes a rented room right in the neighborhood. A wanderer, huh, Danny? Yeah. And now check these against the addresses of places where Peggy Warner worked. Uh, here, West 125th Street. Charlie's office here. Hmm. Uh, this one, Mrs. Teamy's Tea Shop. Charlie here. Uh, Bank Street in the Village. Charlie's office on Bank. Uh, this one. Get a squad car, huh, Muggerman? That's why I waited, Danny, so you'd tell me to do that. What do you want here, Clover? Talk. Let's go inside. You're busting up a family evening. Why don't you come back Who some other time? Who is it, Tom? Tom? Okay, we go inside. Who, who... Oh. Hello, Mr. Clover. Good evening. Something you want, Mr. Clover? Where's your husband? Pop? What do you want with Pop? Where is he? Mother. Get him. He's upstairs. Still about that girl, Mr. Clover? That's right. I don't understand what gives you the right to come here, into our home, order people to do things Mrs. They... Blake, you're an intelligent woman. This has got murder in it. It's not a matter of ordering people. It's a matter of getting things done. Right now, all that has to be done is to talk to you and your husband and your son. And then what? We'll know who killed Peggy Warner. I'll tell you something, Mr. Clover. I'm beginning to get the impression that you're a ridiculous man. What do you want, Clover? I'm sure your son just told you it's still about Peggy. Oh, he's hinting, Charles. Hinting around that you, me, Tom, one of us had something to do with that girl's death. How does it feel to be back home, Mr. Blake? Tell him. It feels... I'll tell you how it feels. Look, Pop. Leave your father alone. I just want him to watch out what he's saying, that's all. I'm glad I'm home, Clover, that's all. And I'm glad he's home. What about you, Tom? Are you kidding? He's my father. Is it just a coincidence that your father came home after the paper screamed a girl named Peggy Warner was found dying in an alley? You've been nosing around, haven't you? Which one of you poisoned her? All right, then we'll go on. You brought Peggy into your house, Mr. Blake. Then she was discharged. Then you kept following. Set up your place of business close by her. Wherever she all went, right, you... All right, all right. Listen. What? It happens, that's all. So it happened to my father. But you threw him out of the house when it happened, didn't you, Mrs. Blake? He's back now. It's over. The girl is dead. My husband suffered. I suffered. And my son. We'll be a stronger family for it. Did you kill her, Mrs. Blake? Tom? Mr. Blake? What makes you so sure one of us killed her? You, because you couldn't get her out of your blood. She wrecked your family. She was wrecking your life. Tom? All right. She was... You know what kind of a girl she was. I knew. I knew the second day she was in. Shut up! Oh, sure, Pop. Go get angry. That's an emotion, too. You can have it. Sure, I had a motive for killing Peggy. What she was doing to you. Your motive, too, Mrs. Blake. Yes. Tom. Yeah? Whose idea was it for your father to come home? What difference does it make? It's important Tom. that... I... You killed her, Tom. Listen, Pop. What you have to kill her for? All right, she was what you said she was. But you don't know. You don't know. Let me tell you something, father of mine. I know. I know plenty. I know when a man makes a fool out of himself. I've seen fools, but you... Oh. My two men. Father, son. Charles. I'm sorry I hit you, son. It's okay. Charles, I'm trying to tell you something. I'm sorry about everything, Martha. I know, I know. I'm sorry, too. Now, pay attention to me, both of you. I killed that girl. Martha. I followed you and found out where she lived. Then I went there night before last, and I brought a bottle with me. Heart-to-heart -heart talk with whiskey. And it was poisoned whiskey. I killed her. 
Then I told Tom it was all right to bring you home. Why don't you slap him again, Charles? Hit your son, or me, for what you've done to us. We'd better go, Mrs. Blake. One more minute, Mr. Clover. I deserve that. I'm a woman who's kept a family together. Charles. What? I spoke with her first. She laughed at you. Live with that, Charles. In the minutes before dawn, Broadway lies huddled in a dreamless sleep. It's the time of no stars and the silent wind. But walk the streets, take the slow walk, and listen. It's there. It's always there. The sound of weeping. And you know that nighttime will never leave. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Irene Tedrow was heard as Martha, Herb Butterfield as Charles, and Sam Edwards as Tom. Featured in the cast were Marvin Miller and Peggy Weber. Bill Anders speaking. A tiny island paradise off the African coast, covered with colored tropical fruit and vegetation, Inhabited by brilliantly plumed tropical birds becomes a scene of fear and violence in tonight's episode of Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. A man, his wife, and the son they dote on are enveloped by strange events indeed until Tarzan decides to investigate. Don't miss Tarzan on most of these same CBS radio stations. Stay tuned now for the Vaughn Monroe Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. And remember, where there's gun smoke, there's Western Adventure, Saturday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Always my beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Into February on Broadway now, near the tail end of the winter wind, the frantic wind that drifts, that whips around corners, that gathers itself into squalls out of the secret hiding places it knows, then rushes down alleys searching for what the world has left behind. And things happen. Earmuffs bloom under turned-down hats. Discarded newspapers wing low, then scurry over pavements and wrap themselves around hurrying feet. And home suddenly becomes where the coffee is. Wind of February... Beauty and nylon on a street corner. And above it, where I was, 
where Detective Dennison was on top of Hotel Marquis. Platform over the street ringed by neon advertising rates and a Roomba band. Platform also serving the purpose of catching the body of a man who jumped or was pushed. Now hold the light over here a minute, Danny. I want to take a look at his wallet. Thanks. Name's Artie Blanchard. Home address upstate, Utica. Money in his wallet, too? Now, let's see. Hey, look here. Five $100 bills. Uh-huh, about a half a dozen fifties. How much you find in this coat pocket, Danny? A couple thousand, I guess. I didn't count it. Must have been that much in his pants pocket, too. Uh, hold the light a minute, will you? Hmm? If these bills aren't real, they're close enough to it to make me happy feeling them. Nope. No what? This man didn't jump. All this money, why should Stick he? Stick around for technical, Dennis, and I'll see you later. And so it was this. Entertainment for winter night. Look down over edge of Marquis. And gathering to it, lifting face to it, the crowd people, anchored in shadow pools, wavering, blurring, floating faces on wind drift. But the constant thing, pierce and dark of neon reflected pinpoint and ring of staring eyes. And from swell of crowd, a shelter detaches himself, runs wildly the street, shouts violence, summons more spectators. And the whisperer, too, elbows crowd, walks to a doorway to edge of woman, makes his whisper, shrugs, comes back to spectacle alone. The entertainment, and leave it. Back into hotel now, and to hotel manager who offers his services freely. The use of himself, his master key, his shock. I, I, I can't get used to it. Happens on and off in this hotel. Last time, six years ago, a young girl. I, I took a whole month off. I just can't get used to it. Mr. Blanchard's room on this corridor? Uh, yes, yes. Seemed a very usual kind of man, Mr. Blanchard. Especially out of the ordinary. Uh, for this kind of a hotel, I mean. He this was, was his room, Mr. Hockstetter? Uh, uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Can you open it, please? Uh, yes, I'll open it. I'll get it open for you. Yes. Very usual kind of man. And his friend, too. The man who shared this room with... It, it... Oh, how unusual. How very... And all that money. All that money just tossed around like across the bed on the dresser. And, and here, a clump of it on the... Just leave it alone, huh, Mr. Hockstetter. Huh? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I didn't mean to... But you must confess it's startling to walk into a room. A man is dead out there, and there's all those bills just thrown about as if they were confetti. Forties, tens, hundreds, fifty. Oh, you were saying, Mr. Austin. Uh, uh, what sort of madness could have hit him? Or maybe it was a kind of joy just before... I he... meant uh, you were saying someone shared this room with him. Uh, uh, yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm Mr. Joe Tobin. Hmm. Uh, they registered here, uh, let me think, uh, yes, uh, a week ago from Utica. I believe it was Utica. I can check. Don't bother uh, yourself. From Utica, me and Artie. Oh, Mr. Tobin. I'm afraid we have rather saddening news for you. you Don't see... bother. I know about Artie. Lobby dames are all excited with his name. What happened to him? One of your bellhops spread the word. You police? Uh-huh. I'm Joe Tobin. This was my bed, that one was Artie's. It's been like that for a lot of years now. Like what, Mr. Tobin? Hey... Bank night in the hotel room, huh? <laughs> How do you figure, officer? Somebody shove Artie through the window, then toss door around like it was corn for your pigeons? I asked you something, Mr. Tobin. Oh, that dough. Killers, Artie. Oh, you mean about me and Artie? How we were? Uh-huh. <laughs> Pals, friends, buddies, everything 50-50. Born and raised in Utica. Everything, but everything, half mine, half his. Finally kicked together ten grand, come to this large town to buy a filling station. Hardy had a brain. He said, filling station, Joe, in a year, double our investment. That's how we were. Everything 50-50. Except... Except what, Mr. Tobin? Except up to the point where it got squeezed out of him in a hotel marquee. That's where I cut out, and I don't die. I go back to Utica and live. You scared of something? That what happened to Artie can happen to you? How do I know what happened to Artie? Maybe it could, but it won't. Utica's nice. Man can live there nice with five grand in the kick, real nice. Another question. Where were you tonight? Where have you been? <laughs> Very large town, lots of places to do. I did a bushel of them. Then I got tired, come back here, got the word about Artie. I'm still tired. The fellow's mine, I lie down on my own bed, huh? And the dough on it, you can do One it. One thing, Mr. Tobin. Yeah. Yeah, I know. 
No use to get till I hear from you, huh? Oh. You know why? What? It ain't the same without Artie. Not one little bit. <laughs> Danny? Good morning, Gino. Yeah, what's the good word? Danny, if I am green this morning, blame it on my chlorophyll. That's a good word? On my soap, Danny, for I am not a greedy man. Well, what are you talking about? This morning, before you came in, I counted $25,000 of which not a cent belonged to me. So if green is the color of Tartaglia, blame it on... That's how much money Blanchard had with him, at 25000 On his person, plus what was found in his room. $25,212, of which not a sou is counterfeit. You know the last time I saw that much money, Danny? Well, please tell me. When I visited my cousin Kendall. The one from Baltimore? That's right. The one with the bad table manners, oh. the wealthy Tartaglia. He opened his safe for me once, for my birthday, and showed me. Can you imagine a man who can't even write his uh, name Gino. and ask him for the time of day you think he'll give it to Gino, you? please. With him, it's always just before three o'clock so he can go to the bank and cash another check. With him, it's all... Danny Clover speaking. This is Mrs. Miller. Yeah? Mrs. Dorothy Miller, 1612 East 27. Yes, uh, Mrs. Miller, what can I do for you? I read this morning that Mr. Blanchard is dead, that you found him on his hotel marquee. Well, that's right. What about it? I was with him last night. My address is 16... I have it. I'll be right there. Of course you will. Bye. It's, of course, apparent to you that I'm a widow. Mrs. Miller... You've but to look around you at this house. It's femininity. It's... It's graciousness. The fact that there is nothing, no trace of a man in it. You notice? Not for many months now. On the phone, you said you were with Mr. Blanchard last night. I'm coming to that. Do you mind? All right, go on. My husband, Les his name was, Les Miller, he died a year ago. And he left me this place and a filling station. And his dying words were, Mary again, Dorothy. You must not remember things. Mary again. The filling station, Mrs. Miller. The one you were going to sell to Artie Blanchard? How could you have possibly known? Uh, just tell me about Mr. Blanchard, huh, and about last night. But I'm coming to that. Let's make it now, huh, Mrs. Miller? If you insist. I've tried to get rid of that thing for months now. Not that it didn't bring in a nice income and all for a while. Make it possible for me to do things. Gay things I hadn't done when Les was around. <laughs> things Les would have died before his time if he'd known. But it became a yoke around my neck, and it began to lose money. After all, a woman is hardly cut out to compete on this level in a man's world. And you... And you are... offered it for sale, and Blanchard came to you to buy, and you went out with him last night. And... Of course. We set our deal, made arrangements to sign the papers today. He said something of a partner, and then he suggested we celebrate the occasion. Just Artie and I. He was... He was... Oh, what's the use of thinking about it? He's dead now. He was what, Mrs. Miller? You know, gay and flippant, little jokes, on team, sort of, and whispered into the ear. And I was having a very lovely time until... Until what? Until we went to a place I know on Broadway. A dance place with a jukebox and drinks in shadowy curtain little booths and Chinese food. And Tommy came up to us. Tommy? Tommy Jordan, sweet. He's a boy I met when I was doing Broadway one night. And Tommy remembered me. Tell me about Tommy. Sweet. And I remembered him, too. You know where he lives? On the second floor on West 43rd, corner of 9th Avenue. He once invited me to a party there, but, but of course I didn't go. And Tommy came up to you and Mr. Blanchard last night. And, and... I introduced him to Artie, and Artie invited him to a drink. He was nice. And then something about a crap game passed between them. And suddenly I was alone, all over again. How oh, dear that, Artie. Yes, Mrs. Miller? Oh, but what's the use of thinking about it now? He's dead now. That's all, Mr. Clover. That's all I had to tell you people. 
But if you see Tommy, please be gentle with him. Tommy? Open up, Tommy. Who is it? Police, open the door. I don't need any. Go away. Come on, Tommy. Okay. So you're a strong man, so what did it get you? Get down from that window, son. One more step closer and I'm going to jump. Why? Get out of here, that's all. You jump, you'll wind up with a pair of broken legs, that's all. One story up, not so high. You want me to meet you down in the alley or what? Which is it going to be? Okay. Okay. Now. That's right. Now we'll talk. Don't hurt me. Nobody's going to hurt you. Don't touch me. All right. Are you Blanchard? That's right. That's who I want to talk about. I'll tell you everything. I started it. I'm just a punk and I started it. I talked to a man and... He's dead. A punk. Me. Started it. Just a punk. And he's dead. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When choosing a career, most people want to be sure that they'll have a job when they're through studying. That's why the nursing profession is such an ideal one for young women who are high school graduates and in good health. After only three years of study, graduate nurses can find plenty of job opportunities in many interesting fields. For information on your chances in the nursing profession, inquire at your nearest hospital or nursing school. The finger of February sun traces the scars of a doorway, stains them gold, and Broadway listens and walks carefully the winter of a room, opens softly to whispering of sun. This could be what was waited for, longed for, held in wind-driven solitude, when delight will be measured once more in heat shimmer and slow drift of white cloud, when a million suns will fling gold against pavement and lie on the cheeks of summer women. So throw wide the door. And you were mistaken. And mid-afternoon of February is the pallor of a Broadway boy named Tommy Jordan. And the room of Tommy Jordan, room of peeling wallpaper and light bulb shaded with photo from movie magazine and grimy souvenirs of his street, leather pillow, stack of magazines. Room where I was and Tommy and in a little while, Detective Dennison. You want something, Sonny? Cigarette? Glass of water? Name it, Sonny. It's yours. Go somewhere and die, huh? I'm just worried about you, kid. The way you look. Last time I saw you, you were fancier. Younger, too. How old are you, Tommy? Older, like he said. I'm 19 since the last time he picked me up. You're going to let me talk? Sure, Tommy. You said you wanted to talk about Artie Blanchard. I didn't kill him. It's like I told you. Maybe I pointed a man on the way, but I didn't kill him. All right, kid. No argument. You're a punk, and you did something that got a man tossed out of a hotel window. That's a place for a man to die, on a hotel marquee. So we're agreed on everything Take now. Take it Tommy? Last night I got word there was a crap game to be had on for fun lovers. Well-heeled fun lovers. When the word hit me, I found someone. Hit him with it. Body Blanchard? Him. Funny the way he walked right out on that Mrs. Miller. People like to know about things like that. I touch their shoulder, whisper to them about it, and they leave women. Where was the game? You know, I've been so nervous and excited since I read Artie was dead. Uh, Everything else just ran out of my brain. I clean forgot where the game was last night. Maybe this you'll remember. Who else was in the game? All I know is Artie. He gave me 50 for the tip. Look, Tommy, not forgetting you're 19 and all and you're pale and nervous and just a punk kid with dirt in your ears. Answer it, Tommy. Oh, look, what difference is a phone call now? Here, talk. 
Hello? Yeah? Yeah, this is Tommy. Listen. Get that receiver given to me. You want to say something, Tommy? Uh-huh. That's a good kid. Bob Murray kid. Tonight's game, 6 o'clock. Empty store on 10th Avenue. Morland's novelty spelled right across the window. You got that? Uh-huh. Whisper the word in a couple of ears. Oh, hey, another thing. No more hot seat totsies like that Blanchard. The gamesters are sad from this type. <laughs> Happy dreams, kid. Get your coat, Tommy. You're going out. So book him. Tommy Jordan, boy from Broadway, purveyor of odds and ends, tout to those with frayed imaginations. Conductor of tours round the clock with refreshments on the hour. Tommy Jordan, middleman for the Moody. Book him and leave him. Back to the office, desk, pencil work. Work, segment of life devoted to the principle of the carbon paper and the triplicate, and to the coffee and cardboard container, and the ham on rye, sips and bites between erasures, which also consumes time, which erases the day, which causes the night. Other chores, squad car with five policemen ride through city street, downtown to 10th Avenue, to empty store, once where novelties were sold. Park, place the men, two in front, two in back. Walk over to the front entrance with Detective Dennison. Yeah? Bob Murray? Yeah. Tommy said there was a game. Tommy Jordan. Hurry up in. Uh-oh. Just leave the door open, mister. The two boys in Boo belong to us. They're getting cold. Yeah. Come on in, fellas. Now, let's all of us go in. Such a good game we're having. Where do you guys have to loss up in such In the a... back. Yeah, yeah. Come on, I'll show you. You guys, I swear, every... Th... Fellas... A raid, boys. That's nice. It's real nice. Open a back door for them, officer. Take them downtown. I'm sorry, fellas. I you stay nothing. here, Murray. Snap it up, boys. Snap it up. Wait for me, Dennison. I'll give you Murray in a few minutes. Uh, 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 just a little game. Yeah, uh, maybe a couple thousand on that table. So we're in that income tax bracket. So? So tell me about last night's game. The game? No different. It's about a man named Artie Blanchard. He wins. He's dead. Yeah? So I don't read the paper, so? You kill him? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a hard loser, mister, but not that hard. How much do you lose? Mm, Twelve G's, more or less. How much did Blanchard win altogether? I don't know. Cleaned everybody. Artie had a hot fist all night. Who was playing? Uh, just a small game. Yeah, I know, but who? Well, let me see. Uh, Teddy, uh, Teddy Webster. The Lucas brothers, me, and Artie, that's all. You know where I can get in touch with these people? You're asking for my cooperation, huh? I asked you something. Wait, wait, sure, sure. I'll tell you where. I'm glad for the opportunity to help. Hello, hello, hello. Police, I'm looking for Teddy Webster. But I'm Teddy, for Theodora. Surprised? Yes. Delighted? Look, Miss Webster... Inside, inside there is a spring. You hear it? You hear the music? Come close to it. Come inside. All this day I've played it over and over and over. And there's the feeling I will burst. I'll explode. I'll find green grass somewhere. Miss Webster? Yes? How old are you? Put your hand here to my throat and you'd know. Eighteen, I've been told. Only at eighteen is it like... Sounds crazy to say this. Then you must say it. Were you at a crap game last night? Exciting. The shadows and the green table, very, very exciting. A man named Artie Blanchard... I lost to him. And I think I kissed him on the cheek for it. Which does he remember, I wonder? How much do you lose? Ten thousand dollars, but I'm still ahead. Last week I... Left last night, ten thousand. But I'm very rich. My father sees to that. And he lets me have this place alone. And he understands the things I want. Miss Webster. Yes? Artie Blanchard was murdered last night. Dead? But when I left him at the game... Which did he remember, I wonder? My kiss? I'm sure of it, the kiss. Let's go, Miss Webster. I'm under arrest for gambling? That'll be exciting, too. Very, very, very. All I'm asking you to do is be quiet, that's all. Okay, let's try it softly, Mr. Lucas. How much did you lose at the dice game last night? How much did... Please, you want to wake my brother? In about two minutes, yeah. 
Give him the two minutes. Uh, he's tired. He was figuring a system for Vegas. It tired him out. Very fine mathematical brain, but it tires him. How about last night? Did he get real tired? Not very, no. He hardly got to hold the dice. That Blanchard was all oh, very hot. My brother Ray must have dropped maybe 14 Gs. He stood there trying to figure out by mathematics how to stop this guy Blanchard. How much did you lose, Mr. Lucas? Compared to Ray, I practically won. I lost four Gs. Let's go wake Ray, huh? Oh, we have to. We have to. Ray. Ray, wake up. That's the boy. We're arrested, Ray. Good evening, Mr. Tobin. This is Detective Dennison. Hi. Hi, how are you? Well, come in out of the draft. Hey, it's on the dresser. Well, I'm not going to tell anybody, boys. Pour yourself a drink. No, thanks. Well, what can I do for you? A few questions. Then what I can do for you is a few answers. Huh? Then I can go home to you. To Anxious to get back, huh? As soon as you give the word. What are you going to do when you get back? Get warm my way. Tell us about it. You got an eat about how it is in Utica? Matter of fact, yeah. Tell us, huh? You kidding? Look, Tobin, all this time we've been trying to be real subtle. What we really want to know is what you're going to do with all that money. My 5G. I hadn't thought about it. Might be a business. But you'll miss Artie, huh? Oh, sure will. Lots and lots. Nobody to go 50-50 with anymore. No. Nope. What are you going to do with the other 20,000? Get him. <laughs> you got me with a question. What are you going to do with the other 20,000? Hey, Clover. Uh huh? Are you sure you brought the right detective? This is going to sound real dull, too, Tobin. You want to listen? Well, we Utica fellas are polite. And... We got a ditty goes with that. You want to hear? Ah, no, save it. You can write it on the wall at the pokey. Lots of poets down there. Here's the way we figure, Tobin. You and Artie, partners, 50-50 on everything you said to yourself. Ah, I did that. So you're 5,000, Artie's 5,000, 10 grand altogether. Hey, that's good. Very, very good. Oh, this guy's a sweetheart, Danny. I'm going to enjoy writing him down. 10 grand, and Artie invested it in a crap game. I've talked to everyone in that game. $40,000 was lost, won by Artie. And? And this. Up against the wall, Tobin. Come on, come on, move. Oh, for what? Shake down, mister, up against the wall. Turn around, face it. Uh, let's get your hands behind your neck, huh? That's the baby. Uh, just what do you expect to find? Artie came back here with $50,000. 10000 half of it yours, and 40000 he won. We found half of it lying around this room. Where do you keep your wallet, Tobin? Uh, inside coat pocket. Now, I'll get it. Here, Danny, catch it. Hmm. Yeah. Bank draft of $5,000, Ruxton National Bank. Yeah, sure. I went down there this morning, got a draft for my money. That's an error? No, look. Yeah? I have to stand like this. Okay, turn around. What'd you do with the rest of the money? Ruxton National Bank, Dennison called. Right. This is the police operator. Get me the Ruxton National Bank. On fifth. That's right. Thank you. Safe deposit box, Tobin, is that where? Open account? Is that what you did? Or is it in another bank? We'll find it. We'll check all of them. Or, or did you hide it? Well, first of all, we'll tear up this room as a matter of procedure. Oh, this is the police, sir. Let me talk to the head teller, please. Artie was going... Go ahead. Artie was going to steal it. Yes, that's right, sir. This is the police. Yeah, I'm glad to know you, too, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, write down this name. Joe Tobin. Hang up. He... Hang up! Never mind, Mr. Goodwin. Go ahead, Tobin. He invested your money in the crap game, won, and all he wanted to give back was your original investment, is that it? Can you imagine a guy like that? Gambles my money without telling me, wins 40 Gs. All I wanted was my share, half of what he won. What you took after you killed him, huh? Threw his share right in his face. Then threw him out of the window. Well, sure. What do you expect? He was my part. A guy crosses a part, what can they expect? You got a 50-50 understanding, mister. Shaking hands with a guy, buddy. Guy crosses you? Kill him, huh? Sure. What else are you going to do with a guy like that? Uh, 
Broadway's given up now. The night is dying, and it's becoming another day. And for an hour, the Fury lies sleeping. Then an engine will start, and a horn will blow, and people will run out from under the earth and beckon over their shoulders and, and start the Fury all over again. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Anthony Barrett was heard as Joe Tobin. Featured in the cast were Barbara Eiler, Louise Lewis, James McCallion, Bob Sweeney, Benny Rubin, and George Peroni. Bill Anders speaking. Every Monday at the Star's Address, CBS Radio presents the Dean of the Drama Program's Lux Radio Theater over most of these same stations. This Monday night is no exception. For Screenland personalities and another full adaptation of an outstanding motion picture, be sure to be listening. Monday nights, it's Lux Radio Theater on CBS Radio. Stay tuned now for the Vaughn Monroe Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS radio network. Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Excitement and danger are the salt and pepper in Mike Shane's recipe for life. But at this particular moment, Mike seems fresh out of spice and seasoning. Life is very dull for our detective friend. So dull, in fact, he almost yawns right in the very pretty face of his secretary, Phyllis Knight. Ooh, ten minutes to four. You've had that poetry book propped under your nose since lunch. Well, certainly. If I'm going to write poetry reviews, I've got to read them. Exactly. Three people have walked through that door today. One bill collector and two guys asking where they could... Mike... Where they could comb their hair. Three plus one equals four. You, sir, are Monsieur Michael Shane, the private detective? If it's all right with you, ma'am. I am Madame Jolene Toulot. Uh, once again? Madame Jolene Toulot. But of course, I shouldn't expect a detective to know and the police. Jolene Toulot, the opera star, of course. Won't you have a chair, please? Uh, the other one, Phil, it's strong, uh, more comfortable. Young man, I weigh 230 pounds. If this chair won't hold me, I'll let you know. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. A big voice means a big body. Did you ever hear a voice from one of those little musical comedy with it? Uh, no? No more voice than a sick grasshopper. Madame Tello, you wish to see Mr. Shane about some problem, a case? Of course. What did I come here for? It's in my purse. Here, read this letter. Thank you. Madam, this is your last morning. 
If the book is published, you will not be here to enjoy the pain it causes. Hmm, that's all. It's unsigned. This is the second one I've received in the past two weeks. Oh, what on earth does it mean, uh, the, the book? My memoirs. Oh. Everybody knows I am writing them. A lot of famous people will lose sleep when they read what I, Madame Jolene Torlo, has told about them. But I want to live to uh, enjoy it. You you wish me to investigate who's sending you these notes? I do. I'm sorry, madam. I'm not a press agent. Writers have tried this publicity stunt before. Why, you young cochon. Very well. I'll go to a good detective. I wish you luck, madam. I like you, young man. You talk back to me and don't apologize. Only in months spelt with an R. <laughs> I admit I like publicity, Mr. Shane. I love to see my name in print, but not in the obituary. If you will take the case, I'll give you the names of the people that might have written these notes. Go ahead, Mike. We wouldn't want anything to really happen to Madame Chalot. Thank you, my dear. What is your name? Phyllis. Phyllis Knight. I remember hearing you sing Carmen when I was a little girl. Mm, you're older than I thought. <laughs> uh, you like <laughs> opera? Oh, I love it, yes. I've got record albums at home of Aida and Carmen, Rigoletto, Cavaliero Rusticana. Wait a minute. Didn't I see in the papers that you were singing that tonight? The, uh, the, uh, benefit series. Yes. My fifth farewell appearance. Uh, coming back to business, madam, you were going to give me some names. Yes. The first one is Roderick Mackenzie of the Newport Mackenzies, an old suitor of mine. Would, uh, he threaten to kill you? He's come clear out to the coast just to keep his name out of my memoirs. He wants to buy his letters back from me. Oh? My dear Julien, he says, I was wild, a wild and foolish boy, but that was long ago. So is my family, you, my uh, circle. You're writing this down, honey. Uh-huh, yes, yes. Uh, then there's my ex-husband, Edwin Buck. He's got political ambitions which my book might sour. And uh, Leonora Baril, Madame Baril. Do you think I have to sing tonight with that Hungarian foot owl? Uh, oh, and one other, Savadal, our maestro. They're all in your memoirs? Uh, any others? Uh, yes. Savadal, our maestro, he hates the air I breathe because I won't let Helen marry him. Helen? My secretary, Helen Smith. Oh. The girl thinks she's in love with him. She's too young, too good for him. Uh, you might add the secretary to the list, honey. Mm-hmm. Helen? Impossible. She couldn't. She's... No, never. Well, we've got four names here. Now, where do I find these people? Come to the opera tonight, the Figaro Theater. I will have them all there for you. Figaro Theater, Okay. Uh, it's a double bill, Pagliacci, then Cavalleria. I sing in the second half. Oh, oh let, uh, let us meet in my dressing room during the intermission. Uh, one thing more, madam. Do we have to listen to the opera itself? Of course. Someday you can tell your children you heard Madame Jeline Torlo. You will never forget tonight. Uh-huh. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> I wanted to hear the end of Pagliacci. Yeah, so do I. It can't end quick enough. Oh, you're just being childish. You like music and singing. Yeah, sure, darling, but when guys get up on the stage and insult each other, I want to enjoy it in English. Oh, my. Yes? Oh, oh, we thought this was Madame Turlow's dressing room. I'm sorry. It is. Madame has no come here yet. Oh, well, we were to meet her here in her dressing room. Can we come in and wait? I am awaiting to see her. Okay, we'll make it a threesome. Uh, the names are Miss Knight and Mike Shane. So? I am Savadel. The maestro? But I thought you were conducting... The... Cavalleria only, madame. Oh. Diavolo, she is late, late. But, uh, excuse me. Hello? Hello? Madame, the time I wait and wait and wait. So? See, they are here. You, Mr. Shane. She wants to talk. Oh, thank you. Hello? Mrs. Shane, I am going to be late. A certain person has been here at the house trying to tear up my memoirs. What? Who? I'll tell you when I get to the theater. Come back to the dressing room after the performance. Au revoir. Goodbye. I want to talk to her. I'm sorry, Maestro. She hung up. Oh, that woman, that big girl will not stand to this. I warn her. No, we do it. I do what? Hey, hey, just a second there. That, my dear, is what we artists call temperament. 
Fortissimo. Yeah, well, I've got a plainer name for it. <laughs> Come on, darling, let's go back to our seats and join the other sufferers. <laughs> Hey, that man conducting the orchestra, he doesn't look like Savadell. Yeah, you're right. It's the same bald head who umpired the first opera. Yeah, but Savadell said he would. I wonder what it means. Don't ask me, darling. The only thing I know about grand opera is the price of our tickets. Hey, that's... That's awfully funny. Yeah. Well, this is the last part of the prelude, and right now the tenor is supposed to be singing off stage. The curtain's huh? going up. There's nobody on the stage. Somebody's coming out, of the, out from the wings now. It's Sabadell. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please. I am regret to announce there will be tonight no Cavalleria Rustican. I have to announce there is a tragedy. Our soprano, Madame Turlow, is a dead. <laughs> We'll return to Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Many motorists blame poor mileage, sluggish pickup, and inferior engine performance on wartime gasoline. Now, it's true that all civilian gasoline must be restricted in quantity and quality due to government regulations. But if you've been having trouble with a rough motor, or your gas coupons don't seem to go quite as far as they used to... Ask yourself this question. How long has it been since my spark plugs were checked? You see, spark plugs have a lot to do with engine performance. If they're old or burned or dirty, they won't fire properly and they waste gasoline. In fact, engineering tests show that defective plugs can waste one tank full of gasoline out of ten. Now, there's no reason why anyone should put up with this condition when it's so easy to have your Union Oil Minuteman check your spark plugs. Union Oil Spark Plug Inspection is scientifically performed. The condition of each plug is carefully measured on a special machine, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minute Man will clean and adjust them. The cost of this service is only a few cents per plug, and you'll soon save that in extra mileage. You'll find Union Oil Minute Man ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. <laughs> The sudden death of Madame Turlot has been announced from the opera stage. It's a few minutes later. Mike and Phyllis are at the home of the dead singer. As they hurry through the entrance hall, Inspector Faraday is explaining. Well, for once, Mike, I beat you to the scene. Yeah. The old lady started to phone the police, but never completed the call. One of our operators heard gunshots over the phone. So you hightailed it right over. Yeah, when somebody at the opera phoned for her, I gave him the news. Well, this is the living room. The bodies, well... You can see for yourself. But, but, Inspector, there are two of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As bloody as Grand Opera itself. Oh. And when she came to our office, I thought it was a publicity stunt. Mike Shane, you're a hero. Oh, Mike, you couldn't possibly know. I haven't had time to identify the other body. It's a woman of, I'd say, 25 or 26. That's probably Helen Smith, the mm -hmm. secretary. Only we knew who was here with Madame Turlow when she telephoned you at the theater. Yeah. The somebody who had just tried to destroy her manuscript. So that's what it was, a manuscript. One of my boys found a pile of paper over there in the fireplace. Huh? A lot of it is burned up. Uh-huh. Looks like some old photographs and letters, too. Oh, well, maybe that's the coroner. Be right back, kids. Okay. Look at these, Mike. Here, these pages didn't burn. Chapter 5, My Husband. There never was a more dashing, gallant figure of a man than Edwin Buck. Hmm, there's something screwy here. She's giving him a gold-plated Oscar, unless it's supposed to be sarcasm. Her desk looks as if she'd been working on a manuscript, Mike. A lot of typewriter paper and carbon sheets. Only used a couple of times. Oh, good, good. You know what to do with them. Mike, what are you staring at? Blood stains on the carpet. They trail from the phone over here to the piano where she died. Oh. Well, she must have clutched at the music rack as she fell. There's music all over the floor. Uh-huh. She's got a couple of sheets crumpled in her hand. Looks like they were torn out of something. Let me see. That's part of an opera score. 
An area from Rigoletto. Could I G on I Z? Mike. Corsiani hmm? Virazzi. It's a baritone aria. I thought she was a soprano. Oh, Helen, Mamma mia, Helen. No, Sabato, no, don't touch her. I don't know who these men are, but they all insist they're special friends of Madame Turwell. What's your name, sir? Edwin Buck. I was once her husband. And you? Roderick McKenzie. I've known Jelaine for, uh, well, a long time. I was supposed to meet all three of you gentlemen this evening about certain threatening letters sent to Madame Turlow. Mm-hmm. So no, I, I understand. understand. Have you got those letters, Mike? Uh, I have one, Inspector, here in my purse. Maestro Savadell, uh, when we were in the dressing room with you, you blew your top about Madame. You said you uh, had warned her, and now you would do it. Uh, do what, Maestro? I was... I was a meaning for Helen. Madame, she said, we cannot marry. I'm say, Madame Turlow have no right to stop us. Tonight I'm going to decide. No more talk. We do it. And uh, where did you go when you slammed out? First I go for a walk. Get over my temper. Then I phone Madame. She's a very late. They say she's a dead. Mr. Buck, you came here for some reason, but you're very quiet. Yes, I... Oh, it's so horrible. And... How long ago were you divorced from Madame Turlow? About 18 years. I understand you have political ambitions. Is that right? I hope to run for Congress. And what your ex-wife wrote about you might do your opponents more good than you. Hmm? Why, no. From all Jelaine told me, she wrote rather well of me. From all she told us, that wasn't her idea. Can you tell us, Mr. Buck, where you were during the past hour? Why, certainly. At the opera to hear Jelaine. Mm-hmm. Mr. McKenzie, I believe you made a special trip here from New York to keep your name out of these memoirs. There's no crime in that. You tried to buy your letters back from Madame. I did. I have my family to think of, my social standing... Some of my letters were, well, full of youthful enthusiasm. I was afraid Jelaine would distort them. Mr. McKenzie, where were you during the past hour? I was at the opera. No, no, that is one a lie. He was here. I'm see him. All right, McKenzie. Drop the innocent act. What were you doing here? Well, if you must know, I, I came to talk to Jelaine's secretary. And? I was going to bribe her to steal my letters for me. But nobody answered the door. I never got in. You can't prove anything on me. Except that you're a poor liar, sir. That goes for all of you. Any one of you three could have sneaked up here from the opera and killed these women. Inspector? Yes, Mike. Madam has some uh, some of the musical score in her right hand. I want to borrow it for an hour or so. But, Mike, that's evidence. Nothing's going to happen to it, Inspector. And, honey, if you'll give me the keys to your apartment, please. Uh, what? Uh, I'll go with you. No, no, no. I want you here to sort of observe uh, proceedings. Mr. Shannon, please. I want to talk with you. It must be pride. Inspector Faraday will be glad to hear anything you have to say, Maestro. I'll uh, be seeing your children. Oh, Angel. Uh, you dropped your handkerchief. Hmm? Huh? Oh, thanks. All right, Mr. Sabado. What was it you wanted to tell Mike? Oh, it's a, like I say, it's a private. Okay, I suppose it's private why you came here earlier and saw Mackenzie. I'm all ready to tell. I come to see Helen. And say to Madame that we get them married. But nobody's opened the front door. They're already dead. Inspector. Now what? This isn't my handkerchief. It's got the initials LB. Mm-hmm. Of course. Leonor Beryl, the singer. Her name was on our list, too. Then she must have been here. Whew. We're knee-deep in suspects. Well, maybe this one is the fish we're really after. See you later, Inspector. Hey, Phil, where are you going? Where do you suppose? Right, Inspector? <laughs> I, I hope you will excuse my appearance, but I'm, well, I, I am so unstrung from this shock. Yes, yes, I understand, Miss Beryl. Shalene and I, were, we were such good friends. She was like a mother to me. Yes, you know. yes. Did you see her today? Today? Oh, no. No, I... Oh, my eyes, my scarrow. Oh, here, here, use this, thank oh, oh, thank you. You buy very expensive handkerchiefs, Miss Beryl. What? That handkerchief. It's yours. You dropped it in the living room. Jelaine Turlow's living room. Oh, you did see her today, didn't you? In fact, this evening. How did you know? <laughs> I didn't. There's a shot in the dark. I see you use a typewriter. What, what are you doing? Just checking something. Will not be... Yep, it's the same. It is the same what? The letter E on your typewriter, exactly like the E in the note threatening the life of Jelaine Tillot. All right. I was trying to scare her. She had me in her memoirs. I am trying to get my husband back. But if Savadell reads the malicious way she twisted things... Savadell? I... He's your husband? And our divorce became final last month. 
But I am going to get him back. Ah. He was going to elope with Helen. So you got rid of the girl. Then you had to kill the other woman. I killed... Get out of here. Get out of here. Gladly, gladly. I think you've told me all we need to know. trouble with women. They tell it too much. Oh, Zephardel, how did you get here? The inspector, he's a turn to lose everybody but Mr. McKenzie. Now, I talk to you. No, you don't. You stay. Stop it, I want to talk. You let go of me. Get over, Lord, she bite Stop it. Stop it, she's getting away. Sister, I am away. <laughs> of the time because Wait everything that please, she said... Please, Angel, please give it to me slow. I uh, can't get it all at once. Well, listen, all right. Faraday has turned everybody loose except Mackenzie. He's holding the wrong man. Well, it could be, but Inspector Faraday must have his reasons. But the handkerchief. Leonor Beryl admitted she was with Madame Tullow tonight, and she was married to Savadell. Uh, so you said. Well, doesn't all this mean anything to you? Savadell tried to keep me in that apartment. Mm-hmm. Men try that occasionally. Oh. By the way, did you check Madam's uh, carbon paper? I did not. I found more important things to do. Phyllis, I told you Mike, that... stop fiddling with that phonograph and listen to me. Leonor Barril sent those threatening letters. She wanted Savadell back, but he was going to elope with Helen. Don't you think Leonor would be mad enough to kill her and Jelaine Tillow? If you think that, why were you so scared of Savadell? Because... Because they're in it together. Mm-hmm. Oh. oh, by the way, honey, have you got some extra phonograph needles? This one's getting scratchy. Oh, Mike... What's my something wrong? Yes, you. Huh? I beat my brains out trying to help you on this case. You just stand there gawking at sheet music and phonograph records. Excuse, please, but the doorbell. That's the apartment phone, stupid. Down by the mailboxes. Oh, I'll get it. It's probably Inspector Faraday. Hello? Please. Mr. Phyllis and I. Well, who is it and what do you want? Senor Sabatel, I must see her at once. Look, mister, look, this is Mike Shane, and if you come around here to pester Phyllis, I'll put no, you... No, no, please. I want to talk to both of you. It's a secret. I have an idea. Oh. Uh, hello? Oh. Hello, hello? Oh. Hello? Mr. Shane. Yeah? The aria. The aria. Oh. Sabatel. Sabatel, what's wrong? Sabatel! <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures. A few minutes ago, we mentioned some of the reasons why clean spark plugs are important to the efficient performance of an automobile engine. Now, while you're having your spark plugs checked, it's a good idea to ask the Minuteman to look at your ignition cables, too. These cables are the small, fine wires which deliver electricity to the spark plugs. If any of them are broken or frayed or the insulation damaged, even brand new plugs won't help your driving. You see, old or damaged ignition cables leak electricity so that by the time the charge gets to the spark plug, there isn't enough juice left for the rich spark needed for instant firing. So to get full power out of old engines, ask the Union Oil Minuteman to check both spark plugs and ignition cables then you'll be sure of more power and better mileage. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Ignition Service. Thank you. For the second time tonight, a phone call has been ended suddenly by a revolver shot. It is minutes later. Mike and Phyllis are standing on the sidewalk outside Phil's apartment house. Two men in white are lifting a limp body onto an ambulance stretcher. Mike, do you think he'll live? Well, the doctor says he will if they get him to the hospital quick enough. Even so, we won't be able to question him for days, and that may be too late. Not a soul in this crowd saw who did it. Somebody decided Savadell shouldn't talk to us. Yeah. Oh, if I had only listened to him when he tried to tell me something at Madame Turlow's. Or you at Leonor Barrill's. Well, if we just knew, what do you wanted to tell I us? I think I have a sneaking hunch on me. You have? Yep. Yeah. Well, come on, bright eyes. We're going to phone Inspector Faraday and send out the invitations. Invitations? Mm Mm-hmm. To a midnight reunion at Madame Turlow's. The guest list will be very select and slightly dangerous. Uh, 
good evening, Inspector. Hello, Inspector. Did you round up everybody? I did. They're in the living room. Come on in. Okay. That package under your arm, Mike, what is it? Uh-huh. Now, patience, me lad, patience. Everything in due time. Mm, Mike, you tell me on the phone that Mackenzie was innocent to release him. Well, I haven't. You mean you've got proof on him? Mackenzie came clear across the continent just to stop Madame Tolo from publishing that book. He admits he was going to bribe her secretary to steal the stuff for him. And Savadell placed him here at the house at or about the time of the killing. That's enough for me. Now, uh, there's just one hitch, Inspector. What? How about the killer trying to remove Savadell, too, at the very time you had uh, Mackenzie at headquarters? Say, that's right. Yeah. Uh, unless Savadell's ex-wife did it in a fit of anger. Mm. Oh, uh, Miss oh, Burrell, yeah. this is Mr. Shane. So, I understand I have you to thank for dragging me out at this unearthly hour. Yes, Miss Burrell. Oh. Uh, Mr. Buck, how are you? As well as could be expected. Phyllis, uh, will you look up those carbon papers now? Yeah, yeah, right away. I believe Inspector Faraday has told you of the shooting of uh, Maestro Savadell, so the first thing we want to know from both of you is, uh, where were you during the past hour? Well, I was at home, reading the newspaper story about tonight. Oh, an incomplete story, I'm afraid. And you, Miss Perrin? Also at home. When uh, Miss Knight left you and Savadell, or should I say, escaped from you, what happened? Nothing. You and Savadell had a fight. He accused you of killing Helen so he couldn't marry her. I told him I didn't, and it's the truth. All right, all right, all right. Now, honey, how about the carbons? All checked. Madame Tello was still working on the chapter, My Husband. And? We were right the first time. She's anything but flattering to Mr. Buck. Rubbish. She was very kind to me. Well, here's the carbon sheets. We found them on Madame's desk, and they were used only twice. I just held them up in front of my vanity mirror and read what she'd typed, and it was not flattering. Well, how was I to know that? I thought it was all favorable to me. Well, that's a minor issue now, anyway. The real key is Helen Smith, the secretary. How do you mean, Mike? Madame Tello was against a marriage between Helen and Savadell. She told us it would never happen. Mm -hmm. Now, doesn't that strike any of, any of you as a little strange? Employers usually don't have such control over the lives of their secretaries. Okay, Mike, but get to the point. Ah, that is the point, Inspector. And now you wanted to know what I have in this package. Yeah, yeah. First, the music score we found in Madame Turlow's hand. A baritone aria from Rigoletto. The Cortigiane Virazzi. Pronunciation by courtesy of Miss Phyllis Knight. Thank, Thank you, you, darling. And uh, next we have Phil's record album of the same opera. Angel, will you warm up the Madame's phonograph for me? If you ask me, this is all very cheap and, and dramatic. Operatic is the word, Miss Borrell. You see, when Madame Turlow was shot, she made a dying effort to tell us who killed her and Helen, especially Helen. She tore a very special aria from the score of Rigoletto in a desperate gamble somebody would understand it. Mr. Shane, I don't believe you are the man to give us a course on opera appreciation. Well, we shall see, Miss Barrio. Photographs ready, Mike. Okay, darling. Now, uh, do you people know the plot of Rigoletto and what this aria means? Well, of course. I have sung Rigoletto. I'm afraid I have only a hazy idea. All right. This is the setup. A gang of the Duke's courtiers have just kidnapped a girl. Now this guy, Rigoletto, was cursing them. Now he's begging them to give her up, and they won't. Now he tells them a secret. The girl is his own daughter. Well, does that mean anything to you, Mr. Rill? Not a thing. You, Mr. Buck? I can't say that it does. Okay, then I'll put on the other record. Now, this is the end of the opera, the payoff. Miss Burrell, as an opera star, tell us what's happening on the stage right now. Why, Rigoletto had planned to kill his enemy, the Duke. Right. He has the body in a sack, and then he makes a discovery. Now, listen carefully, Mr. Buck. Rigoletto opens the sack and sees a girl's body. He cries, speak, oh, speak to me, my darling daughter. Oh, awful fate. By my hand, she hath fallen. Oh, what? What's that? Mike, what is my, it? my, my child. Helen was my child. Helen was Shalane's daughter. Then... Then Buck is her father? I... I didn't know. I didn't know. Yes. Her father. And her murderer. Are you feeling better? Ah, uh, Mr. Shan, to you, bigger congratulations. <laughs> Your work, bravo. She's the most brilliant. Well, thank you, Maestro. I thought I was pretty good myself. Good? Well, Buck could hardly add anything to his confession. He hadn't seen his daughter Helen since she was six years old. Buck says he just wanted to scare her, madam, out of publishing her book. 
Alan tried to grab the gun, it went off. Then he had to shoot again. Mr. Salvadel, you uh, had something you wanted to tell me privately. Now, can you talk now? Yes, yes, I can. Tonight, I see Aria from Rigoletto in a madam's hand. Mm -hmm. The ideas have come to me. Maybe Helen is not often the way she's a think. Maybe she is the daughter of Madame and Mr. Buck. The same idea Mr. Shane have, but I must tell in a private. Well, why under the sun would Jelaine Tello keep such a secret from her husband and her own daughter? We in opera are strange people. Mm. Madame Tello live and breathe opera. She is a very dramatic. She's in a joy secret, just like a storybook. Uh, speaking of operas, Angel, I noticed you got another record album up at your apartment. Maybe if I studied it, I might get the answer to another problem. Mike, not another crime. Well, they're a different sort. It's uh, the marriage of Figaro. Catch on, Miss Knight? Then, uh, Mr. <laughs> Shane, you must uh, translate better than your rigoletto. Huh? But just a minute ago, you were complimenting me See, about... See, only your thinking. But the audio, no. I have never heard such a bad translation. Oh, my. <laughs> Dear, I was so proud of your learning and your culture. Well, what about you? You didn't correct me. You're supposed to be the highbrow in this partnership. Oh, I am. Opera, music, books, poetry, reviews. Climb down off that pedestal, you fake. Why, Michael <laughs> Shane... <laughs> Bill, I... there's only one book a man wants a woman to review. I know, I know. A cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. <laughs> The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Even the busiest detectives can't always be detecting. And on this late Saturday afternoon, we find Mike Shane and his pretty assistant, Phyllis Knight, driving through the timber country high up near the Nevada border. They're on their way to keep an important date, a date with a wedding. But no, not theirs. It's the wedding of Betty Harrison, daughter of the timber tycoon, and Mike has been unwillingly dragged along to help Phil carry out her social obligations. You know, I ought to have my head examined coming way out here to see two people I don't know get married. Oh, Mike. Betty was my closest friend at finishing school. Yeah, but I only finished uh, high school. Now, where do I fit into this high society stuff? Michael, it's a quiet wedding. We're the only guests. And I'm supposed to hold the bridegroom's fevered head? Mike, where is your romance? Romance I've got, Angel, but when it comes to rice and orange blossoms, I'm strictly allergic. Mm -hmm. You're hopeless. Hey, look. Look, there's the Harrison place. Place, you say? That, my love, is quite a shack. And there's Betty. There's Betty waiting for us. Yeah, say, honey, that, that guy with her looks familiar. Huh? Mike, that's Inspector Faraday. In the flesh, and that spells trouble. Betty? Betty? Phyllis. Phyllis, I'm so glad you've come. Oh, you look wonderful. Me too. Betty, this is Mike Shane. Hello. I'm pleased to meet you. Well, I'll be. Mike and Phyllis. Say, Inspector, aren't you early with your vacation? No, I'm here on business, Mike. Mr. Harrison phoned me. Said he was leaving on the second section of 98. But he transferred to his own private trainer for me to meet him here. Father wasn't planning to come up for the wedding. Then all of a sudden, I get a wire that he is. Well, that must be Harrison's train now. Yes, it runs up to a little station behind the house. Well, then why don't we walk over and meet it, huh? Let's. Father will be surprised. Betty, 
Hey, where's the bridegroom? Don should have been here by now. Oh, bridegrooms are always late. Those last three hours. You be hey. quiet. Betty. Oh, there's Don coming now. Hey, he's a bit of all right. I'm hmm? sorry I'm late. Had a flat tire. Oh, Don, dearest, this is Phyllis Knight, Hello. Mr. Shane, Mr. Faraday, Don Manchester, my fiancé. How do you do? Hello there. How are you? Well, there she is, a coming around the mountain. You know, this is something yeah, to see an engine train. pulling one coach. <laughs> they dropped the lumber cars off at Camp Junction. Oh. Is that what hey, look. There, there's somebody getting off. Oh, that's Mr. Oliver, father's business associate. Oh, that's Mr. Miller getting off the back platform. I still don't see Mr. Harrison. No. Oh, Mr. Oliver. Oh, hello, Betty. Where's father? Oh, as usual, in his private compartment. Hasn't even stepped out since we left Northwood City. He's probably napping again. Mm, he certainly was fine company. Well, I'm going up to the house. Mm, that's one happy character. Let's climb aboard and get farther. Sort of like a welcoming committee, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Inspector, watch yeah. your lumbago on these steps. Never mind my lumbago, Mike. <laughs> watch out for those fallen arches of yours. Oh, oh give him. Man. <laughs> Here's Father's compartment. I'll sneak in and shout boo. <gasps> Father! Something's wrong. What is it? What is it? Father! It's Harrison stretched out on the floor. Oh, Betty's fainting. Here, put her on that couch, Don. Wait a minute. Rub her wrist. Wait a minute. I'll get some water. Well, Inspector, how's Mr. Harrison? He's dead, Mike. Looks like a heart attack. Uh-huh. Maybe so, Inspector, but this heart attack has had a little help. What are you talking about? About murder, Inspector. Froth on the lips and dilated eyes don't spell a heart attack. Somebody slipped Mr. Harrison a nice big slug of poison. Oh, there you are, Mike. Get Betty up to the house all right? Yes, Inspector. Phil and Don are taking care of her. You still think Mr. Harrison was poisoned? I know so, Inspector. Look at his neck, stiff, and his jaws locked, eyes wide open and staring. Mm -hmm. I've got a little plan, Inspector. Would you like to try it? You know me, Mike. Well, look, no one knows we suspect murder, and whoever pulled this job figured on a local dock calling it a heart attack. So? Now, you take Harrison's body into Northwood City, along with that thermos of coffee we found by him. Mm -hmm. While you're checking for poison, Uncle Shane here will keep his big ears open here. All right, honey, how's Betty? Oh, she's a little better, Mike. She's sleeping now. Oh, the poor kid. Say, uh, what was that Betty said about her father not coming up for her wedding? Well, originally, he didn't like the idea of her marrying. But she was going to go through with it anyway? Yes. Then Mr. Harrison changed his mind, that's all. Uh, Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Mike, when you start double-talking, I get worried. Angel, look, there were three men on that private train making a 50-mile trip. Now, come to the end of the line, what happens? Well, I'm listening, Mike. Miller gets off the back platform and scoots. Oliver hops off the front and goes away mad. And we go aboard and find Mr. Harrison dead. Uh Uh-huh, that's it. This Mr. Harrison is the big boss, honey. You'd think those other two would wait for him, sociable-like. Oh, it's probably just a coincidence, Mike. Uh, And is it a coincidence that Faraday is here? On business? All right, all right, mastermind. So what do you make of it? Uh Uh-uh, Angel. A good detective works from facts, so let's go get some. Facts? Where? Where, Mike? Mr. Miller's room is at the end of this hallway. Let's stop in and say hello, huh? Oh, I hope you know what you're doing. Yeah, me too. Here's his room. I'll knock. There's no answer, Mike. So, being friendly people, we'll go in and wait. Well, you can't just barge into somebody... Why not? The door's not locked. Come on, come on. Mike, I don't like this. Well, now, don't you worry your pretty head. Wow, the remains of a fire in the fireplace. I always love to poke around ashes. Now, let's see. Those look like letters. Mm -hmm. Letters they were. Letters to Betty. Well, she's asleep in her room. While someone conveniently burns her mail. Mike, let's get out of here. What's the matter, Angel? There's just us two. That's where you're wrong. Mike. Huh? Well, well, Mr. Miller... And with a nice shiny gun. We don't like snoopers around here. Get going. Uh, Just a mistake, Miller. Just a mistake. That kind of mistake isn't healthy. Get out while you're still lucky. Sure. By coincidence, we were just leaving. Come on, Angel. Right away. The gentleman doesn't like our type. And I'm afraid the feeling is very mutual.
These couple of scraps I took from Miller's fireplace don't help much, honey. Well, I can't understand why anyone would burn Betty's letters from her father. Mm. Oh, well. Yeah, plenty of books around. Michael, after all, this room is the library. Encyclopedia? Modern timbered methods? Look, honey, here's a book, Famous Scotland Yard Murder Cases. Well, that ought to help you, Mike. And here's a bookmark. In the section on poisons. Mike, here comes Don. Mr. Oliver's with him. Huh? Mr. Shane. Well, what's up, Don? I told Mr. Oliver you're a detective. He wants to talk to you. <laughs> yes, uh, something quite confidential. Miss Knight is my assistant. Oh, never mind. I... Never mind. I'll go look up a sandwich. Okay, dear. All right, Oliver. Now, what's the trouble? Mr. Shane, I want protection. Protection from what? Miller. He threatened my life on the train. Oh, what happened? Well, shortly after Miller came aboard Mr. Harrison's private train at Northwood City, I discovered him going through some of Mr. Harrison's private papers. Then what? We had an argument, and he drew a gun on me. What is Miller's position in the company? Frankly, I don't know. He's on Harrison's personal payroll. And Betty's been rather worried. She felt that Mr. Miller had some sort of a hold on her father. Yes, that's it exactly. There was a very suspicious relationship. And uh, you want me to do what? Watch Miller every minute. He's dangerous. Mike? Yes, honey? Mike? Yes? A telephone call for you here in the den. Oh, okay. Expect okay. Friday. All right. Okay, Phil, close the door. All right. Hello, Faraday. Well, what's the dope? Yeah? Well, that might help. Oh, sure, sure, they're all here. Don't worry, I'll be careful. Okay, Inspector, hurry back. So long. What did he say, Mike? I was right, honey, 100% right. Harrison was loaded with strychnine. Well, then it, it was murder. And that's not all. I heard the click of an extension phone... There are extensions all over the house, Mike. Someone listened. We're keeping company with the murderer, honey. And the trouble is, we don't know who he is. But he knows we're looking for him. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Dirty or burned-out spark plugs can cost you a lot of gasoline. In fact, as much as one tank full out of ten. Now, that's a serious loss in mileage, particularly so when it's unnecessary. Your neighborhood Union Oil Minuteman is equipped to give you complete spark plug service. The performance of each plug is accurately measured on a special tester, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minuteman will clean and re-gap them to the proper setting. If they're burned or worn out, he can furnish you with correct replacements. Then you'll not only save gasoline, but your engine will run smoother. Union Oil Spark Plug Service takes but a few minutes and costs but a few cents, a cost you'll soon save in extra mileage. So, friends, if it's been 3,000 miles or more since your spark plugs were checked, or if your engines seem to be rough and listless, drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Spark Plug Service. It will make driving easier, gas coupons go farther. It is a few minutes later. Mike and Phil have learned that what started out as a happy wedding has turned into a grim case of murder by poison. We find them walking rapidly towards the station behind the Harrison's house. The murdered man's private coach is still there on its siding made almost invisible by the tall trees which turn the weak moonlight into gloomy shadows. Come on, honey. Well, I'm hurrying as fast as I can. I want to see if that briefcase is still in the car. Inspector Faraday remembered that Harrison mentioned some important papers he was bringing up with him. Well, then whoever was listening on the extension, they know about it, too. Right, and I want first crack at that briefcase. Hey, maybe you do, Mike, but huh? so does someone else. Yeah, a flashlight. In Harrison's private car. Maybe it's the murderer. Hang on, honey, we'll find out. Mike, there he is at the end of the car. Hey, honey, look out! Mike, Mike, did he hit you? No, no, a clean miss. Well, he got away out the front. Could you see who it was? No, a flashlight in my eyes. Well, we'll catch up with him sooner or later. Oh. Let's go look over the compartment. Here it is, the briefcase. Oh, what a break for us. We frightened him away without the case. Uh, uh, sorry, honey, bad guess. The lock on the briefcase has been forced open. Oh, and whoever was here opened it and got what he wanted. Correct. Now, here's some papers. Business letters, checkbook. Some kind of a report. 
Honey. What's the matter? This report. It's from the Atlas outfit. Atlas? Uh-huh. The, the detective agency in Los Angeles? Sure, sure. Listen to this. On the basis of our completed investigation, you have sufficient grounds to instigate criminal action against Z. Z? Evidently, Harrison didn't want the name mentioned. Well, Mr. Harrison was certainly checking up on somebody. And getting ready for the kill. I'll bet that's why Inspector Faraday's here. Mike, this is the motive for the murder. All we have to do is find out if Miller or Oliver is the Z in that report, and we've got the murderer. Partly right, Angel, partly. But I'd say it was better this way. Find out which one of them is Z, and the other guy is the killer. Huh? I don't get it, Mike. Look, Angel, look. The murderer listened in on my, my telephone conversation with Faraday. He yeah. heard the inspector tell me about this briefcase, and he knew it held evidence that could hang him. Well, of course. That's why he dashed down here. Right, right? Angel. He beat us to the briefcase, and yet this report is here for us to find. Oh, oh. You see? Mm -hmm. He wanted us to find this report, and that means the killer isn't Mr. Z. As soon as we get back to the house, I'll send a telegram to the Atlas people. Okay, but these high heels don't go very well with forests. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. Someone on that other path. Freeze behind this tree. Right. Whoever it is, he's walking fast. He's going past. No, he isn't. Hey, you hold it. Hey, what the... Mike. Here. Mike, it's Miller. Hey, yeah. say. What's the big idea of roughing me? I just want to ask you a few friendly questions, Oh, Tom. now, look here. First, about a gun that took a couple of shots at us. Oh, you're off the beam. I'm not carrying a gun. No? Well, don't mind me. I'll just search. Oh, go ahead. Well? Well, Mike? No, no gun. But you could have ditched it easy enough. Oh, Miss Knight, Mr. Shane. It's Don. Well, what's the hurry, Don? Uh, I was out for a walk. Is something wrong? Plenty. I'm glad you're here. Oh, I don't understand. Yeah, Shane. How about you doing some explaining? Okay. Mr. Harrison was murdered. What? Murdered? But why? Who? That's what we're finding out. Miller, you're on the spot, and it's plenty hot. Are you saying I killed Harrison? He was poisoned on that coach, and you and Oliver were the only ones aboard. Oh, that doesn't prove a thing. It proves there's a 50-50 chance that you're it. Listen, smart guy. Your mathematics aren't so good. There were three of us on that train. Sure, sure. But only you and Oliver walked off. I don't mean Harrison. Somebody else got on that coach. Oh, <laughs> now we have the ever-present uh, mysterious third party. Hmm? Oh, not so mysterious. He's standing right next to you. All right, Don. That means you. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Shane, I did get on Mr. Harrison's train at Mill Junction. Well, Shane, guess I can be running along while you turn the heat on him. Uh, not so fast. I still think you know some of the answers. You know, maybe I do. And maybe I might just do a little talking to the right party. And when it will do me the most good. You're sticking your chin out a mile. This is murder. Well, I'll be around resting in my room. No, I don't trust him at all. Yeah? But you're still right in the middle of this, Don. You were on that death train. Oh, but I only stayed a minute. You see, Mr. Harrison was asleep, and I didn't want to disturb him. Which still doesn't explain why you drove out of your way from Northwood City to meet the train at the junction. Oh, it's a very personal matter. Look, Don, look, a man has been murdered. Wait, why should I want to kill my future father-in-law? Harrison wasn't too happy about you marrying his daughter. But he changed his mind. That's why he sent me a telegram this afternoon, asking me to meet his train. Oh, and what kind of a telegram might that be? Well, I have it right here. Read it for yourself. Here, honey. Huh? I'll hold the flashlight. All right, Mike. Wait a minute. Um, Don, have changed my mind. Happy to have you as son-in-law. Meet my train at Camp Junction. We'll ride in together. Much to talk over. Harrison. Sounds all right. Let me see, Angel. Here. Yeah, from Northwood City at 3.20 today. Yeah, I wish I could help in some way. Yeah, sure, but... Hey, what was that? It's a window. Someone lowered it. That's Mr. Oliver's room. Mike, he must have heard everything. Yeah, something tells me we'll be hearing his little story very soon. That's right. The telegram is to the Atlas Detective Agency, Los Angeles. Uh, this is it. Please advise immediately. Name of Z. Yes, Z, the last letter in the alphabet. Name of Z in report to Harrison. Right. Sign that Michael Shane. That's right. 
Send it right out, please. And phone the reply here to me at Harrison's place. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, the answer to that telegram should mean a lot, Mike. Well, it'll help, darling. But there's some angles I don't get. Miller is a mysterious employee of Harriet Harrison's, all very hush-hush. Oliver's scared stiff of Miller... And Don goes walking around in the moonlight right after somebody takes a shot at us. Oh, you can't blame him for that, Mike. Here the night before his wedding and his future father-in-law is poisoned. Yeah, sure, sure, but there's one thing we do know. There's a killer here. Well, there's a car outside. That must be Inspector Faraday and in a big hurry. It's too bad you haven't the murderer all signed, sealed, and ready to deliver. Now, Angel, now sarcasm doesn't become you. Well, well Mike, well... How goes the home front? Oh, quite a few interesting details for you, Inspector. Whatever you're figuring, Mike, forget it. Ah, uh, huh? uh, that means the Inspector knows something. Plenty. While you two were taking it easy, I cracked this case wide open. Yeah? Well, give. Who's the murderer? Miller. Miller? Sure. I thought his face had a familiar profile, so I checked on him with headquarters. And found what? He's got a record a mile long. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll be willing to wager it's for blackmail. That's right. But how did you know? Inspector, are you forgetting? Mike is smart. All right. I hope Miller's still around. He said he'd be in his room. Good, let's go pick him up. Okay, let's go. Well, Mr. Shane, it looks like Faraday beat us to it this time. Oh, he's just a good man, honey. (laughs) Tell me, what's the line on Miller? All the usual stuff. Hires out as a private investigator and then turns the information he picks up into blackmail. Wow, cute boy. That racket should put him in clover. Yeah, but this time, Mike, it'll put him right in the middle of the lethal chamber at San Quentin. Ooh. Here's Miller's room. Yeah, no need to knock, Mike. Just open it up. Okay, here goes. Miller, we want you... Say, what? Well, there's your man, Inspector. You can take him in. But unfortunately, he's very dead. We'll return to Mike Shane and his adventures in just a moment. It's true that clean spark plugs make a difference in engine performance and gasoline mileage. But it's also true that even the finest spark plugs cannot fire properly if the ignition cables are defective. These cables are the small, fine wires which carry the electricity from the distributor to the spark plugs. They should be carefully inspected whenever your spark plugs are checked because old or damaged ignition cables leak electricity which means that only a thin, weak spark reaches the plugs. So to get new performance out of old engines, ask the Union Oil Minuteman to check both spark plugs and ignition cables. Then you'll be sure of more power and better mileage. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and ask for Union Oil Ignition Service. Thank you. Phyllis, Mike, and Inspector Faraday have just burst into Miller's room, only to find him dead, shot through the heart. This new development has put quite a crimp in the inspector's plans, and Mike is pointing this fact out to him. Looks like you were wrong about Miller, Inspector. At least wrong about his being the murderer. Miller could still have been the one who bumped off Harrison, then somebody took care of him. Well, that would leave us with two killers. Well, could be, but it doesn't stack up that way. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to take Oliver in and charge him with murder. Okay, so you're charging him with murder. But how are you going to make it a stick, Inspector? How about motive? What, what evidence do you have? Oh, two and two make four, Mike. Harrison must have been poisoned on that private train. So it had to be Oliver. There's Miller lying there, absolutely eliminated. All fine and good, but it leads us to one other little item. Don was on that train, too. Don? Daddy's fiancé? Mike, you saw the telegram Mr. Harrison sent him. Don couldn't have been the murderer. In this business, honey, we've got to figure every suspect guilty until we know they're innocent. Yeah, Mike's right. Oh, Phil, would you step into the other room and phone the coroner down at Northwood City? Yeah, yeah, sure, Inspector. I'll give him your compliment. You know, this business is beginning to make sense. The one who poisoned Harrison had to get rid of Miller because he knew too much. Miller said he might do some talking when the right time came. Well, Mike, for my money, Oliver fits into the picture. He's our man, and I'll get some evidence out of him. Oh, I'm sure he knows Inspector. plenty, but... Yeah. Inspector, I tried to call the coroner, but the telephones are dead. Uh-oh, the wires have been cut. Well, that don't make much difference. Oh, yes, it will, Inspector. You see, I'm expecting a reply to a telegram I just sent, a very important telegram. About this case? Yes, sir, in connection with the detective agency's report to Mr. Harrison. The answer to that why might be just what we need. Oh, now that the phones are dead, what are we going to do? Do? Simple, darling. The inspector will sit tight here while you and I go for a nice moonlight ride back to Northwood City. There it is. 
There's the telegraph office just on the other side of the tracks. Okay, I'll park the bus here. Now, watch it. Easy crossing these tracks, honey. Oh, thanks for the tip, old boy. But you could have carried me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> More trains. Yeah, this is the main line from San Francisco. Isn't this the place where Harrison transferred to his private train? Correct. Well, here's the telegraph office. Folks, can I help you? Uh, yes, I'm Mike Shane. I'm expecting a wire from Los Angeles. Mm, Shane, let me see. Yeah, your telegram's coming in now. I'll have it for you in just a minute. Okay. Look, Mike. Hmm? There's another. The train just pulled in. Now, oh. that's 8.20, miss. Only stops for a few minutes. 8.20? Well, it's late. It's 8.35 now. Nope. Train's on time. That there's a second section of the 8.20. Oh, so many people traveling, huh? Yep, too many. That's why they run two sections. Like this afternoon, the second section of 98 came in at 340 with a whole parcel of folks. Is that right? You know, honey, that's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, of course it is. Isn't it? What are you staring at me that way for? Well, here's a telegram, mister. Oh, swell, swell. Oh, come on, come on. Who was Mr. Z in that report? Well, this does it, honey. This does it. That Z is nobody else but Oliver. Oliver? Then Faraday's right. No, Angel. Faraday isn't right. Oliver wasn't Harrison's murderer. But uh, come on back to Harrison's place for a little meeting of the minds with Inspector Faraday. All right, is uh, everybody coming? Yeah, they're coming. Mate. I told Betty, Don, Oliver. Good girl, good girl. Now, uh, now to open these French windows. There. Okay, Faraday. Now out on the porch with you. Right, Mike. Bill. Drape that beautiful body in that chair. Oh, thank you. Yes, well, Lord Master. Well, here comes Betty and Don. Oh, hello. I'm sorry it was necessary to bother you. Don and I understand. I'm glad to help in any way, Mr. Shane. Thanks, Don. Come over here. Stand by me out of range. <laughs> Certainly, but... Uh, out of range? I don't understand. Now, what is all this rigmarole about in the middle of the night? There's nothing to get excited about, Oliver. I asked Miss Knight to call you downstairs for a conference. A conference? About what? About mysterious happenings around here but particularly about why Harrison had you investigated by a detective agency. Hmm? Mr. Shane, what do you mean? I mean you've been cheating the Harrison Timber Company out of thousands of dollars. Oh, that's ridiculous. Why, Mr. Harrison trusted me implicitly. He did, until he finally caught up with you. That's why he was going to turn you over to Inspector Faraday today. I won't listen to this. There's no proof. There's plenty of proof, all written down in black and white. What's more, you knew Harrison had you dead to rights. That's why you poisoned him. You're mad. I never killed anyone. It's no use, Oliver. You're hooked like a fish. I didn't murder him. You can't frame me. He's running. He's running towards that window. I'll stop him. No, Don, no. Drop that gun. That's better. You knocked the gun out of my hand. You let Oliver get away. Oh, no, no. Here comes the inspector. And he's got our friend Oliver by the well-known collar. Oh, there he is, Mike. Squirm in, but safe and sound. I didn't do it. I'm innocent. Take him in, Faraday. You've got enough on him to make it stick and stick hard. Yes, he's a dead duck. Oh, Mr. Shane, I can't believe Mr. Oliver would kill my father. But, uh... He didn't, Betty. What? Well, you just told the inspector to take him in. Sure, Don. I'm taking Oliver in for theft. But for Mr. Harris's murder, we'll take you. Me? Oh, wh- what are you saying? Sorry, Betty. Don wanted to marry you in the worst way. He married a couple of other girls with wealthy parents. Oh, Betty, don't listen to when him. When your father suddenly wired he was coming up, Don knew it was the showdown. That's ridiculous. Oh, no, no, no. You had a hunch Harrison engaged Miller to investigate It's him. a lie. You saw the telegram Mr. Harrison sent me just this afternoon. Sure, Don, sure you got a telegram. A telegram you sent to yourself. All you did was slip over to the Northwood City, wait until the train pulled in, and then send that telegram to your own address and sign Harrison's name. Oh, nothing but lies. No, lies. no, 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 son. It's a fact, a fact that we can prove. Because you made a mistake, a bad mistake, Don. You saw the train pull into Northwood City and thought that Harrison was on it. But you didn't know that there were two sections of that train today and that Harrison was on the second section. You sent that telegram 20 minutes before Harrison got there. <laughs> Hmm? You know, it's wonderful to be getting back home, here by the Golden Gate. Oh, I like it. You know, honey, one of these days they're going to put up a statue for me, right on Market Street. Oh, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it at all. You're such a genius. <laughs> well, maybe not a genius, but quick with the answers, hmm. huh? Speaking of answers, is hmm? the couple you still owe me? Oh, please, honey, no more Now, questions. remember, remember, Mike, that statue to a genius? Okay, okay, shoot me the question. 
When did you know for sure that Don was the murderer? When we found Miller shot, of course. Why then? Don't you remember, honey, when we caught uh, up with Miller sneaking back to the house from Harrison's private train? He said he would talk to the right person when it would do him the most good. Yeah, yeah, I thought he meant Faraday. Oh, no, no, no. Our blackmailing friend was talking right through us to the only other party there, which meant Don. He was throwing out a hint for a payoff. Well, of course I know, but how about... That's all, honey, please, that's all. Positively all. And hold on to your hat because I'm turning. Just a minute. This isn't the way to the office. You're turning into Golden Gate Park. Ha-ha! Is that bad? Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. If some of you have wondered where Mike Shane has been during regular office hours the past few days, you'll find the answer on the front page of this evening's San Francisco papers. That's right, the murder trial of Jack Holmes. At this moment, which is along about 6.30, Phyllis Knight has one of those newspapers spread out on the desk before her. As she glares at the headlines, Mike is talking on the phone to Inspector Faraday. Yeah, Faraday, yeah, I just got back from court. Didn't take the jury long to decide. Less than two hours, Mike. That boy is no more guilty than I am. Sure, somebody killed the watchman, but not Jack Holmes. Now, don't take it so hard, Mike, just because his sweetheart hired you to investigate. All right, all right. Maybe I'm sentimental about those two kids, but I say Jack Holmes isn't the killer type. And with a nice girl like Janet Miley... Oh, Faraday, Faraday, I let him down, and Janet was so certain I could help him. Take it easy, Mike. You did your best, but the evidence was against you. Yeah, sure, if you're sure it was. Is that unusual? Why, I've cleared dozens of guys when it looked like... Janet, what's wrong? Hello. Hello, Mike. I'll talk to you later, Faraday. The girl's just walked in. Janet, are you sick? You're white as a sheet. Here, get her some water, honey, quick. Yeah. (laughs) Mr. Shane. Yes? Jackie. Yeah? Jackie. Oh, here, here, sit down, honey. Let me help you. Oh, the poor kid. She's all unstrung about the verdict. No, it's more than that. Her hands are like ice. He didn't do it. I just discovered what? the grocery. What? Janet, what are you trying to say, honey? My room. Somebody went through. Huh? Oh, oh, Janet. Here, here, Janet. Drink this water. Janet. 12.15. I, I just discovered I went and... Told him, thought he would. Oh, oh. Mike, Mike, she's fainted. I'm going to call a doctor. Phyllis. Yeah. Call Inspector Faraday. She's dead. <laughs> Okay, Mike, I fixed it. We can go to Jack's cell now. All right, all right. Now, remember, honey, not a word about Janet's death. Jack will go all to pieces and we'll learn nothing. I know, I know, but it seems so hard-hearted. This way, kids. Ah, oh, boy. Sad business, I eh? Guess the girl figured after that jury's verdict she didn't have anything left to live for. Suicide? Uh-uh. No, no. 
If Janet found something she thought would clear Jack, she certainly wouldn't take poison. Unless she took the poison before she got the information that would clear Jack. Hmm? No, then she would have called a doctor. If we can believe her dying words, she went first to some man, told him her discovery, then came to us. She didn't even know she was poisoned. All right, but who did it? We only knew what she was trying to tell us. Better pipe down. That's Jack's cell with a jailer standing outside. Oh, yes, sir. Now, let me do most of the talking. All right, Morrissey. Open it up. Yes, Inspector. Hello, Jack. Hello. How do you feel, Jack? Oh, top of the world. It's so cheering to be condemned to death for a crime you didn't commit. You had a fair trial, my boy. The jury could decide only on the evidence presented. I told them I left the warehouse that night way before it happened. At 12.15, I was at home. But no, they take the word of that cab driver. He did pick you up at the warehouse door, and he said the clock in the drugstore read a quarter past 12. I checked the clock myself the next day. It was an electric right on time. So did I, Jack. Unless the cab driver was lying, and he seemed like an honest guy. I see. Even my loyal detective, Mr. Shane, says I'm guilty. Oh, no. No, Jack, you don't understand. Go ahead. Say I killed the watchman. Say I stole the diamonds. You never were working for Janet and me. Yes, we were, Jack, and we still are. That's why we're here. It's about Janet. She's not so good. What? What are you trying to say? She came to the office a little while ago and tried to tell us something, some new evidence she had found, but, well, she got sick. What's wrong? Is she all right? Where is she? Now, easy, son, easy. She's still at the office. She said a lot of mixed-up things, Jack. Her room had been ransacked, something about a grocery that you weren't guilty, and she had discovered proof and told him so. Him? Who's him? Oh, that's what we don't know. Did, uh, uh, does Janet have any close men friends she might go to? Not that I know of. We've been engaged for almost a year now. She never mentioned any. Our boss, Mr. Phillips, is a good friend of both of us. Yes, yeah, he's paying the fee on the case. She might have gone to him, or maybe to his partner. Mr. Russell? Oh, no, not that old crap. Well, why come to me? Janet's the one to tell you. Well, as we said, Jack, she's all busted up over this thing, and she isn't well. Well, she can talk, can't she? she... Can't she? Jack. I can see it in your faces. Something's happened to her. What is it? Tell me. She... She's dead, isn't she? We're awfully sorry, son. See, you went out to my home, Mr. Shane. That's right, Mr. Phillips, and your wife told us you were working at the office this evening. Yes, Russell and I spent so many days in court on the trial. We had to work evenings to keep up with business. Well, I wouldn't imagine there'd be such a turnover in the wholesale jewelry line. You'd be surprised. Our firm cuts and mounts gems for at least half the better jewelry stores in the city. Then the robbery and loss of the diamonds didn't hurt your trade. It would have, Inspector, except for the capture and trial of Jack Holmes. Of course, we're covered by insurance. If you'll step into the office. Oh, Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Yes, Bauer? May I see you a moment, sir? Uh, yes, excuse me, please. Uh, go right into the office. Okay, sure. Thank you. Well, good evening, Mr. Russell. Miss Russell. Good evening. I uh, believe you and your sister know Inspector Faraday. Of course. Yes. How are you, Inspector? Fair enough, thanks. So the lady executives work nights around this company, too. If she's the treasurer, she does. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. And now, Mr. Shane, I suppose you'd like your fee, now that nothing more can be done for poor Jack. Well, I'd hardly bring Inspector Faraday along just to collect a check, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> well, I assume... The case is cracked wide open again. Janet Miley has just died. What? Janet? She was poisoned. She staggered into our office about an hour ago, gasped out a few words, and she died. I was afraid of this. Remember, Anne, I said to you, if the jury brought in a guilty verdict... It wasn't was no suicide, Mr. Russell. I said she was poisoned. Poisoned? Her dying words were that she'd found new evidence and that she had gone to him, some man, and told him. Well, of course, she came to me, but she didn't say anything about evidence. What time was this, Mr. Phillips? About six o'clock. She was crying and hysterical. Begged me to help Jack to get a retrial or an appeal. I tried to comfort her. Excuse me, Mr. Phillips, but I thought you'd like these invoices. I'm very busy, Mr. Bauer. Oh, yes, sir. I'll leave them here on the desk. If Janet found any new evidence, it'd hardly be likely to clear Jack Holmes. 
I'm pretty well convinced that young man is a born criminal. Mr. Russell, that's unfair. Is it? Look at the court testimony. Phillips and I found shortages in Jack's account books. We called him back to the office that night to explain he couldn't. Said he wanted to spend the night checking back through his records. Phillips and I left. Next thing we know, 1,300 carats worth of diamonds are missing. Night watchman's found dead. You never found the diamonds? Of course not. He hid them. I'm afraid it's true. The watchman's clock was smashed. It stopped at 12.10. The cab driver picked up Jack at 12.15. Uh, Mr. Bauer, would you mind leaving the room? Oh, oh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. He's new here. Bauer is the nosiest secretary I've ever hired. I'm... Bauer! Now I remember. Remember what? Well, I was in the outer office this evening. When Janet came out of this room, Bauer stopped her. I heard him say something about going out to a bar and having a little chat. I'm going to call him back. A bar, eh? Do you suppose the poison was slipped into a drink? Mr. Bauer! Oh, Mr. Bauer, hold on. Stop! Hey, Inspector, what's wrong? He's running for the front door! He's running. We'll return to Michael Shane and his adventures in just a moment. Week in and week out, a lot of motorists go along wondering why their engines lack power without realizing that much of their trouble may be due to dirty or worn-out spark plugs. Yes, that's right. Defective or worn spark plugs are to blame for a great deal of poor engine performance. For example, engineering tests show that faulty spark plugs can waste one tankful of gasoline out of every ten, which not only cuts down your mileage, but causes your engine to lose power. So, friends, if it's been 3,000 miles or more since your spark plugs were checked, or if your engine has been losing power, it's a pretty safe bet that the Union Oil Minuteman Spark Plug Service can do you some good. Union Oil Spark Plug Inspection is scientifically performed. The condition of each plug is carefully measured on a special machine, and you can see the results for yourself. If your plugs are dirty, the Minuteman will clean and adjust them. Or if new plugs are indicated, he can quickly install them. The cost of this service is only a few cents per plug, and you'll soon save that in extra mileage. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. While Inspector Faraday hurries off in pursuit of the fleeing Secretary Bauer, Mike and Phyllis have set off on an errand of their own. And now in the hallway of a certain apartment house. Oh, here we are. 327. Not much better than here. Mike, that's Secretary Bauer. He's tied into this somehow. Mm -hmm. Snooping around to hear what we said and then running from the inspector. Well, I'll leave that problem to Faraday, you know. Well, the place looks all in order. Hey, wait a minute, honey. Her bed. It's not made up, it's cut to pieces. Yeah, the stuffing pulled out of the mattress. What on earth were they looking for? Let's go here, let me see. Oh, the bathroom. Mike, look at the medicine cabinet. And the floor. Uh-huh. Bottles and jars scattered all over the place. Oh, every one of them with its top or a little cold cream jar. Here, the cream's been scooped out and dropped all over the basin. Huh? Oh, that's an old trick, honey. Hiding gems in a woman's makeup. Mike, you don't think Jack... Jan... That she had the diamonds. Well, somebody thought so. Maybe she did. No. No. That guess that that's too dizzy. Well, come on, let's check the other room again. Here. Yeah, there's something worth looking into. A desk. Yeah. Somebody else found it too. Drawers yanked out, everything's a mess. Well, I doubt if there's anything left for us, but I'll double check. Still searching. No. No, just the usual stuff. Say, how about that wastebasket, honey? How about it? Here. Huh? Put in my thumb and pulled out a plum. What a big girl am I? Yeah. A check shown in half. Mm -hmm. Paid to the order of Janet Miley. Two thousand dollars. And signed by... Well, I'll be a... Anne Elizabeth Russell. I think this note went with it, Mike. It's the same handwriting. Janet, take this and do as I say. That's all. Take this and do as I say. Which apparently Janet did not... $2,000 is a rather expensive no thanks. Well, stuff this in your purse, Angel. We're about to go places and ask questions. You know, if you ask me, Shh, Miss honey, Russell... Quiet. What? Please hmm? the door quick. Snap off the lights. Yeah. Or flatten against the wall. I'll jump up when he comes in. No, don't, Mike. 
Yo. All right, buddy. Come on, up with your hands. What? Let go of me, you dope. What? Faraday. You? Yeah, me. Oh, I thought you were chasing Bauer. Got away. I phoned Phillips for Bauer's home address. Turned out to be a gas station. Oh, a phony, eh? Well, we've got a lead that may be better. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Give the doorbell another push, Mike. You know, I wish these people would stay put. First we go to their homes, but they're working at the office. Now they're not at the office, they're home. Somebody's coming now. Yes? Oh, it's you again. Don't strain your enthusiasm, Mr. Russell. May we come in? Uh, yes. Mr. Russell, we would like to talk to your sister. And? Oh, well, she's upstairs. Will you ask her to come down, please? Yes, if you'll go into the living room. Anne? Oh, Anne, will you come downstairs? May I ask what you people want? Oh, you'll hear it. Oh, by the way, sir, I believe your sister is treasurer of your company? She is. For how long? Six or seven years. How long was Janet Miley with your firm? Mm, several years. She worked in the same department with Jack Holmes. Look here, I insist on knowing what this is about. Alfred? In here, Anne. Oh, so you're all back. Yes, these people say they want to talk to you, Anne. Phyllis, uh, give me that checking note. Ready and waiting. Miss Russell, would you look at this note and check, please? So Janet gave them to you. What did she tell you? Right now, I'm more interested in what you told her. What was Janet to do for your $2,000? 2000 And what's the meaning of this? I was merely trying to save you from yourself, brother dear. Save me? I've watched you for a long time, Alfred. What is... I saw the way you were mooning around Janet. I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Oh, don't you? I know you proposed marriage to the girl. And now with Jack out of the way, you thought she'd say yes. But I'm not going to have another woman in this organization. I have trouble enough as it is. That doesn't explain the $2,000, Miss Russell. Of course it does. I offered her the money to get out of town and not come back. And what right had you? You're not running my life. Well, this puts a new slant on everything. Could be that Russell wanted Jack out of the way so he could have a clear track with Janet. Mm -hmm. The diamond robbery might have been conveniently arranged. That's a lie. If Miss Russell didn't want her brother to marry Janet and the girl wouldn't buy off, then perhaps Big Sister thought of another way out. You mean the poison route, Phil? Well, how dare you? You, you, uh, 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 you mustn't. I know some naughty names, too. Oh, surely, Mr. Shane, you've got some brains. You don't believe such insane twaddle. Are you referring to my colleagues, Miss Russell, or to your story? No. It could be possible oh. you and your brother Alfred have been uh, putting on a little act for us. I'll answer that remark, Mr. Shane, but right now you're wanted on the phone. What? Oh, thanks. Hello? Mr. Shane, this is Power. Yeah? I've got to see you at once. What? Where are you? Listen. I have the real dope on the murder. Meet me at the old Dutch windmill in Golden Gate Park. What time? Let's see. It's just about 10 o'clock. Make it 10.30. And come alone. Don't tell anybody. Okay, Bauer. So it's Bauer. Where is he, Mike? Shh, quiet, Inspector. Well, Mr. Russell, I, I think we'll be running along. If we have any more questions, we'll be back. I'm sure you will. No, no, please. Don't bother to see us to the door. Mike, where are we going? Golden Gate Park. Ah, oh, wants to talk to us secretly. A great secret with somebody listening on the line. What? Who's listening? Miss Ann Russell on the extension phone right in the hall here. What time is it, Mike? 10.28. Now keep back in the shadows with Faraday. Oh, this guy at Bauer certainly picked a romantic spot to meet the old Dutch windmill in the loneliest corner of the park. Not to mention spooky. Look at those four huge veins above us like the arms of a giant hovering over our heads. Oh, Angel, your poetry picks the doggondest times to bust loose. Well, I can't help it. I'm nervous. What time is it now? 10.29. I don't know. This may be a trap. Uh, Bauer may be after you, Mike. I don't like anything about that bird. I don't like anything about tonight, period. Shh. I see a light through the bushes. Car's coming around the turn. Got your gun, Mike? I'm all set. Now keep back in the shadows. This sounds like he's driving fast. What was that? Sounded like a gun. Why, Grandma Faraday, your nerves. Here he comes. Mike, 
is passing you, Mike. Hey, Bowen. Bowen! He's skidding. Is he hurt? Is he hurt badly? Can't tell yet. Open his shirt, Mike. That's a waste of time, Inspector. Look at the back of his head. Guess I was right. We did hear a shot. But who would do it? Who knew he was coming here to talk? Oh, that phone call. Yeah, Ann Russell. Well, I guess there's no mystery about this killing. Hey, Faraday, here's his wallet. Maybe it will answer a few things for us. Let's see. Hmm. Well, what is it? What is it? I'm old enough to be told. Mr. Bauer wasn't any ordinary secretary. He was an insurance detective. Planted in that office to find the missing diamonds. Well, then maybe he ransacked Janet's apartment. Yes, he did. It says so here in his pocket notebook. Search girl's room, no evidence, no jewels. Janet went in to see Phillips. Something's up. Took her to bar. Told me to check on mistake. 12.15. 12.15. Mike, remember? Huh? Janet tried to tell us something about that. 12.15. That was when Jack was picked up by the taxi driver. Yes, according to the clock in the drugstore window. Inspector, let's telephone the coroner and then... Then what? Go take a good look at that clock. <laughs> Oh, this is a waste of time, Mike. I checked that clock the day after the robbery. So did we, Inspector, before the trial began. It's an electric. It keeps perfect time. It couldn't be wrong. Save your breath, pal. Mike's in another stubborn spell. Oh, the drugstore's closed for the night. Yeah, but there's the clock. You can read it a hundred feet away. Neon hands, neon numerals. Uh, it says 11.10. What time have you got, Faraday? 11.10. Now are you satisfied? Jack came out of the jewelry place two doors north of the drugstore. The taxi picked him up. The driver saw the clock in the window... The window. What are you staring at, Mike? The grocery store over there. Inspector, call a cab and get the driver who picked up Jack Holmes. In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. A few minutes ago, we mentioned some of the advantages of Union Oil's spark plug service. As a featured part of this service, the Minutemen also inspect your ignition cables. These cables are the small, fine wires which deliver electricity to the spark plugs. Normally, they give little trouble. But if anything happens to them, if they get broken or frayed, or if the insulation is damaged, even brand new spark plugs won't help your driving. In other words, a faulty ignition cable will leak electricity. And by the time the charge gets to the spark plug, there isn't enough juice left for the rich, full spark needed for complete combustion. So for a careful check and double check on your car's firepower, have a Union Oil Minuteman service your spark plugs and ignition cables. You'll get honest, accurate work, and you'll notice the increased power and snap from your engine as soon as you drive away. You'll find Union Oil Minutemen ready to serve you wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. It's a few minutes past midnight. At a lonely street corner in the commercial district, Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday are talking to a scared little taxi driver. Look, fellas, it's just like I said in court. I'm cruising along here and I see this guy. The inspector and I know that, Smitty. Now, we just want you to show us. Now, do exactly as you did that night. Yeah, cruise down the street and pretend you're picking up Jack home. And we'll get in the back seat and ride along. Okay, okay. Climb in. Here, darling. Come in. Thank you. I turns this corner here, see? Mm -hmm. And I'm moseying along when I spots him crossing the street. He waves at me, so I slows down. I stops right about here. Jack was standing in the middle of the street. You opened the door. Which one? The right one. He climbs in and gives me the address. Well, go ahead. Open the door, Smitty. See, ain't you got no imagination? Now, Smitty, when did you see the clock? Right now, when I leans over to close the door. There it is in the window, see? All lit up with neons. Okay, look at it. What time does the clock say? Uh, gee, it's just like that night. 12.15. Mike, you were right. He made the same mistake all over again. Look at it again, Smitty. Look hard now. Come on, look hard. What do you mean, look hard? The clock says, hey, there's something screwy. The numbers, they're backwards. Right, Smitty, right. You're not looking at the clock. 
You're looking at the reflection in the grocery store window. The real clock is across the street in the drugstore. The drugstore clock reads a quarter to twelve, but the reflection looks like a quarter after twelve. Thirty minutes difference, Smitty. Gee, I got a sworn. Say, I did swear. You ain't gonna pinch me, are you? No, Smitty. Now, are you willing to do something for us? Me? Yeah, sure. Anything, fellas. All right. We're going to pick up three passengers, and one of them is the murderer. Here we are, folks. Here's the office. All right. Mr. Shane, I doubt we'll find anything in here that the police haven't already gone over. Well, they had the wrong slant, Mr. Phillips. You see, someone planned to steal those diamonds, but they needed a fall guy, Jack Holmes. So they faked the shortage in his account books. Then they called him that night, very indignant at discovering his dishonesty. Just a minute. I was the one who found him out. Shut up, Ann. Jack said he wanted to check back through his records. He didn't leave till a quarter to twelve. About midnight, the thief came here and stole the diamonds. The night watchman surprised the thief and was killed. Then the cab driver blundered about the drugstore clock, and Jack was really on the spot. For the killer, it was a beautiful out. Janet discovered the mistake this afternoon. She told it to Bauer. He checked her story. When he discovered Janet was dead, he tried to tell me what Janet told him. That's why he was killed. Oh, that's rubbish. Bauer ran away from the inspector. Why? He must have had a reason. He had. He wasn't ready to talk yet. You see, there's one detail we didn't tell you people. Bauer was a detective himself. He was what? Oh, yes, yes. Hired by the insurance company to find those diamonds. You mean that he was... Do you think he found the diamonds? I'm sure he didn't. If we can step inside the office, Mr. Phillips, I'll show you why. Now, Bauer had a suspect, but it was the wrong one. He did know, however, that Jack was innocent. And uh, when he telephoned me, the same call you listened in on, Miss Russell... The killer knew he was trapped, unless... I don't believe it. I didn't hear anything on that phone. Oh, yes, you did, Miss Russell. You ought to have recognized it. Now, perhaps you will now. Mr. Shane, stop this cat and mouse business. Shh, please, please. That clock on the bookcase there, in five seconds, is going to strike the hour. Now, listen. One, two, three... This is fantastic. Four... Well, distinctive chimes, aren't they? This is the same clock I heard strike while I was talking to Bauer on the phone. He called from this very room. There was only one man who knew where I was who could tell Bauer where to phone me. Mr. Phillips. Me? You're insane. Am I? Bauer told you Jack was innocent. You sat there in your chair and heard him say to meet me at the old Dutch windmill at 10.30. So you killed him. He trusted the wrong person, just as Janet did. She came to you, told you about the drugstore clock. You had to stop her tongue. You poured her a drink from this water jug in your desk with poison in the glass. You anything to say to that, Mr. Phillips? No. No, nothing. I thought not. All right, Inspector. Oh, come on in the house, kids. Huh? Mrs. Faraday will be glad to fix us some eggs and coffee. Oh, no, no, no. It's pretty late, Faraday. I think we all better get to bed. Look at Phil here. She's almost asleep. I am not. I was just thinking. How did you know, Mike, that the clock you heard over the phone was in Philip's office? Oh, I heard it the first time we went there, dear. It just took me a little while to get it placed in my memory. Oh. Clocks ran all through this case, didn't they? The watchman's clock stopped at 12.10. The drugstore clock that convicted poor Jack. The office clock that caught the murder. Yeah, sometimes a clock can tell more than the time of day. Oh, oh, Mike, that's corny. But hmm? I knew you'd say it. I was just waiting for it. Well, <laughs> I guess Michael's entitled to a little corn off the cob tonight. <laughs> that was neat thinking, my boy. A clock reflected in the window and the hands reversed by 30 minutes. Doubt if I'd have thought of it myself. Oh, Faraday, please, Mike's ego. Huh? Besides, I think I know why he's so leery of clocks lately. Mm -hmm. Oh, now listen here, honey, if you mean yes, Go on, please. Phil, let's have it. Well, no, Mike no. had a date with me for six o'clock, and he was an hour late. No, no, Angel, please, and no, no. And guess what his alibi was? What? He thought he saw a clock that said 5 p.m. It was a grocery scale with five pounds of potatoes in it. <laughs> <laughs> This is Mike Shane again. On June 4th, we come on the air one half hour earlier. Remember now, that's not next Monday night, but the Monday for following. 
June 4. Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Joseph Curtin and Alice Frost. Unlike most people, Pam and Jerry North don't consider it a crime to be mixed up in a murder. And in some cases, the mix-up takes place before the murder even happens. For example, let's take a look into a theatrical office in midtown Manhattan and find out why a popular baritone like Victor Stefano is seeking the advice of his manager, Gilbert Spire. I tell you, I'm going out of my mind, Gilbert. I can't sleep. I can't eat. I can't even sing anymore. No, no, calm down a minute. Calm down, he says. How can I be calm when this hangs over my head like a sword? Well, uh, just what is the trouble, Victor? What makes you think your wife is trying to murder you, huh? I told you before. It's the little things. Like her staring at me. Like waking up in the middle of the night and finding her hovering over my bed. I'm afraid to let her out of my sight. But uh, what has she actually done, eh? That's just it. Nothing. Nothing I can put my finger on. If I could only catch her at something, my worries would be over. If I could only fathom what is going on in her mind. Now, look, Victor. You've been working too hard. Too many appearances at the opera. Too many concerts. What has that to do with it? You think I'm imagining all this? Well, if you seriously think your wife is trying to kill you, uh, why don't you go to the police, eh? Because there is nothing to tell them. There is no evidence. That is why I thought of the Norths. They might be able to help me. Mr. and Mrs. North? Why not? They have had experience in murder cases. Perhaps they can prevent one from taking place. But you hardly know them, and they've never met your wife. All the more reason for calling them in. He is a publisher, and I can introduce them to Yvonne without arousing suspicion. Now, wait a minute, Victor. No, Doctor. no. I can't afford to wait any longer. It may be too late. I'll invite them to my house tonight. All right. All right. If you want to bring in a couple of amateur detectives, go ahead and invite them. But if I were you, I'd get the police. Sure, this is the right apartment, Jerry. Darling, there's only one Victor Stefano in this building. Although I must say I can understand why he insisted on inviting us over here. I hardly know the man. Well, aren't you going to publish his memoirs or something? I will if you'll write them. But the last time I broached the subject, he... Yes? Oh, uh, good evening. How do you do? I don't believe we've ever had the pleasure of meeting you, Mrs. Stefano. I'm Jerry North. Who? Jerry North. And this is Mrs. North. How do you do, Mrs. Stefano? Uh, how, how do you do? Well, shall we go in? In where? Inside. I mean, we're Mr. and Mrs. North. Weren't you expecting us? Oh. No. Mr. Stefano didn't say a thing. Oh, now, isn't that just like a man? He invites people over for an evening and then forgets to tell you about it. Jerry does it all the time. Oh, wait. Wait, huh? wait Mrs. North. Oh, wait? Yes, uh, uh, I'd rather you wouldn't go in just now. The place is a mess. Can't we make it some other time? Oh, but uh, Mr. Stefano insisted on our coming tonight. Well, that's strange. He's not home. Well, for Pete's oh. sake. I, I'd ask you to come in, but... I'm late for an engagement downtown, and I still have to dress. Oh, that's perfectly all right. Well, we'll just forget about the whole thing. Well, 
I'm terribly embarrassed. Oh, don't be silly. We don't mind. Come along, Jerry. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Good night, Mr. North. Uh, good night, Mrs. Stefano. Nice to have met you. I don't get it, Pam. I don't get it at all. What, dear? The fact that Mr. Stefano wasn't in? No, the fact that you insisted on coming back home. Oh. And the other night, you'd have tried to make a big mystery out of something like this. Well, it is a mystery in a way. But it seems so personal, I didn't think we had a right to investigate it. Besides, I just know that Mrs. Stefano is innocent. Innocent of what? Anything. Well, I don't know who's responsible for the mix-up, but I had a feeling she was lying to us all the time we were at the door. Uh, that's why I believed in her. She lied so badly. Hmm? Well, isn't it true, Jerry? Bad liars are usually nice people. Sorry, but I don't follow that one. And if I... Uh-oh, there's a telegram on the floor. Oh, who's it from? Wait a second, now, and I'll see. Well, here's the answer to the mystery. Please cancel engagement for tonight. Wife has theater date and can't be home. We'll call you tomorrow morning, signed Victor Stefano. Well, I knew it'd be something like that. Only Mr. Stefano should have called up instead of sending us a telegram. Maybe he did while we were out to dinner. After all, I'll get it, dear. Hello. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. How are you? Oh, pretty good. Something on your mind? Well, it isn't exactly a blank. Say, how soon can you and Pam get up to the Lordo Apartments? Lordo Apartments? Why, we were just up there to see Victor Stefano. That's why I'm calling you, Jerry. Victor Stefano is dead. What? He was murdered less than an hour ago. the story, Bill? How did it happen? Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to find out. What are you acting so mysterious about? Is he still there? No, no. The body's been removed. Oh. But he was murdered in this apartment. Oh, Bill, when? Who killed him? Hey, have you got any leads? Oh, Pam. But we have to know, Bill. We were here before, and we... Oh, oh I'm sorry. I, I didn't know anybody else was here. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. North, this is Gilbert Spire, Mr. Stefano's manager. Oh, how do you do? How do you, yes, do, how do, you do? I'm glad you were able to get here, Mr. North. Although I don't understand why you weren't here before. But we were. When? I told you on the phone. We were here just before you called up. Are you sure you were in this apartment, Mr. North? Why, of course. Mrs. Stefano answered the door. Oh, she did, did she? Well, what'd she say to you? Well, she acted very peculiar, Bill. She wouldn't let us in. Did she say why? Well, uh, she... So what is this? Why are you cross-examining us? Don't you believe we were here? Of course they weren't, Lieutenant. I told you they were lying. What? I don't know what they're trying to do, but it's a good thing you had me waiting in the other room to hear their story. What story? This lie you're telling about being here talking to Mrs. Stefano. Yes, why are you lying, Mr. North? Who's lying? If you don't think we're telling the truth, just get Mrs. Stefano and we'll prove it. Mrs. Stefano? Are you crazy? I am Mrs. Stefano. Now, wait a minute. If this woman is Mrs. Stefano, who's the one who answered the door for us? That is what I would like to know. How did she get into this apartment, and what was she doing here? Well, it's beginning to look as if she was here to murder your husband, Mrs. Stefano. Oh, now, Bill, uh, don't jump to conclusions. I'm sure that sweet little girl had nothing to do with it. She couldn't have. Why not, Mrs. North? Uh, well, uh, this may sound silly to a man who manages business affairs, but there was something about her, Mr. Spire. Something very soft and, and frightened, like Little Red Riding Hood. Oh, for crying out loud. Well, there was, Bill. She had such a, a gentle expression and such big open eyes. Anything like the ones in this picture, Pam? Oh, what picture? The one I found in this locket. Here, here, take a look. Why, Bill, that's her. Whose locket is this? Well, hers, I imagine. Found it right here in the apartment. Just a minute, Lieutenant. I know who this woman is. Who? Mr. Spider's secretary, Sally Ford. What? Well, that's her picture, Gilbert. And if she was in this apartment tonight, she must have killed my husband. Why do you say that, Mrs. Stefano? What do you know about Sally Ford? A great deal more than I want to know. Now, Mrs. Stefano, please. Well, why conceal it, Gilbert? Everybody knows what has been going on. Everybody but me. All I've heard is her name. Well, I wish I had never heard it. She did everything she could to come between Mr. Stefano and me. Oh, it wasn't as bad as all that, Ivan. Wasn't it? 
Are you going to stand there and deny there wasn't anything between them? Well, it might have been a harmless flirtation, perhaps, but uh, certainly nothing more. Oh, how can you say that, Gilbert? I threatened to leave him if he did not give her up. And this morning he said he was going to. Well, that's how it happened. She came over here tonight and he told her he was through, so she killed him. No, I won't believe it. Just because you found her locket in this apartment... I didn't find it in the apartment, Pam. I found it in Mr. Stefano's hand when I examined the body. Well, that doesn't mean that she killed him. Doesn't it? Now, look at the way this chain's broken. It was torn from her neck during a struggle. Stefano reached out and grabbed this locket in an effort to protect himself. And that's the last thing he ever did. Bill, are you sure you won't reconsider before Miss Ford answers the doorbell? After all, arresting an innocent woman... She's not an innocent woman, Pam. And it won't do any good to tell me about Red Riding Hood. But if you make a false arrest... Pam, will you let the poor man alone? Yes? Miss Ford? Uh, yes? Uh, don't be afraid, Miss Ford. Uh, you remember us, don't you? Oh, no. Oh, I, I wouldn't try that if I were you. <laughs> Trying to slam the door won't help your case any, Miss Ford. I'm Lieutenant Wigan, homicide. Well, what do you want of me? I want you to come down to headquarters for questioning. I'm taking you in on suspicion of murder. But I didn't kill him. I swear I didn't. He was dead when I got there. Who? Oh. Don't you know who I was talking about? Well, I knew he was dead. I admit that much. Then you better come with me and admit the rest of it. No, wait. I I had no reason to kill Mr. Stefano. I was very close to him. Perhaps a little too close. Now get your things, Miss Ford. You're going to be gone for some time. But you're not even listening to me. Won't you give me a chance to explain? Sure, go ahead. What's your alibi? Well, I haven't got an alibi. Hey, you see, Bill? See what? A good murderess would have one. Who said she was a good murderess? I'm not one at all. Then what were you doing in Mr. Stefano's apartment tonight? How'd you happen to be there just about the time of the murder? He sent for me. I mean, he left a message for me to come there. But he was dead when I opened the door. Is that why you didn't call the police? Well, I, I was so frightened, I didn't know what to do. And then the doorbell rang. Is that and I... us? Yes. I didn't know who you were, and I was afraid you'd think I had something to do with the murder. So I didn't let you in. But you could have told us you weren't Mrs. Stefano. Well, I, I didn't want to get involved with the police. Then you should have picked up this locket before you left the apartment. Where did you get that? I found it in Mr. Stefano's hand. He tore it from your neck just before you killed him. No, somebody put it there. Somebody's trying to frame me. Now, take it easy, Miss Ford. You're in this deep enough already. Hey, what's going on here? Dick, you keep out of this, please. Now, wait a minute. Who are you? Dick Ford. He's my brother. But he doesn't know anything about it. Heck, I don't. You're on the wrong track, copper. Sally didn't murder Mr. Stefano. How do you know? Because I did it. Myself. Dick? What are you saying? I killed him. I did it to get even with him for the way he was treating you. Dick. I know it was a crazy thing to do, but I couldn't help myself. I didn't want to kill him. I just wanted to beat him up. And what happened? He reached for a gun and I grabbed hold of his arm. We fought for a minute, but he pulled the trigger before I could get the gun out of his hand. Bullet went right through him. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Ford, but you can't protect your sister with a story like that. What do you mean? I killed him in self-defense. Oh, sure, sure. You shot him with his own gun. Only he wasn't shot, Mr. Ford. He was stabbed. It's no use, Pam. Bill's got an airtight case against her, and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, I'm not going to let her spend the night in jail just because he arrested her. I just know she's innocent. Well, I don't. That brother of hers looks like a cutthroat that probably runs in the family. Oh, don't be silly, Jerry. She isn't anything like her brother. All right, all right. I'm sorry I mentioned it. Now let's go home and get some sleep. We've been walking all over the city of New York. Oh, but it's so nice out, Jerry. Let's just walk a little while longer. What for? Where are you taking me to? Oh, no place. (laughs) No place, huh? Isn't that Mr. Stefano's apartment house on the corner? Hmm? Oh, is it? As if you didn't know. What's the idea of dragging me back here? What are you up to now? Well, so much has been left undone, Jerry. I mean, there's no actual proof that Sally's the one who... What's the matter? Over there at the side entrance of the building. That Mrs. Stefano? It is, a that. I wonder what she's doing there. Well, let's ask her. 
Mrs. Stefano. Oh, oh, just a minute, Mrs. Stefano. Don't run away. That's yes, funny. She ducked into that alley as soon as you called her. You think she heard me? Of course she did. Quick, let's follow her. Oh, are you into that dark alley? It probably leads to the basement of the building. Come on, dear. We'll lose her if we don't hurry. Oh. Easy now. She must be around here somewhere. Jerry, sort of creepy in here. Nothing but dark walls to look at. Well, don't look at the walls, dear. Look for Mrs. Stefano. She could be lurking behind any one of them. Oh, golly, so sad. I'm sorry I bumped into an ash can. Well, I wish you'd tell me when you're going to do things like that. I, I thought I was dead. Mrs. North. <gasps> Good heavens. It's me, Mrs. North, Mrs. Oh. Stefano. Well, what are you trying to do, scare the life out of us? Oh, I'm sorry. I did not mean to frighten you. What did you mean to do? Why did you run away from us just now? Well, I got a call to come downstairs. Just now, a man with a mysterious voice called up and told me to meet him here. Just now? Yes. He said he'd kill me if I told anyone about it. So I was afraid to speak to you. Well, where is this man? I don't know. Sounds awfully phony to me. Me too. That that phone call probably was a trick to get you out of the house. Somebody wanted to be in your apartment while you weren't there. What for? I don't know, but we'd better get right upstairs and find out. Anybody inside, Jerry? Like there's somebody in the kitchen. Wait, I'll go see. Yeah, this way, Mr. North. The pantry door's right over here. Can you see through the glass? Just about. There's a man in there fiddling around with the refrigerator. What's he doing? Holy mackerel, it's Dick Ford, the girl's brother. Open the door, quick. All right, just let me get my hand on something solid and I will. Now stand back. There we are, Mr. Ford. Uh, what? There we are, I said, or I'll hit you over the head with this chair. I, I wasn't doing anything. No? What'd you come here for? And why'd you call up Mrs. Stefano and threaten to kill her? Because I... I wanted to search this apartment. Search it for what? Evidence. Somebody's trying to frame my sister. And I've got to prove she didn't do it. Well, that's no excuse for threatening my life. Maybe it isn't. But I'm glad I came here just the same. Look what I found behind the stove, Mr. North. What? The murder weapon. All wrapped up in some newspapers. With a pair of blood-stained gloves. Let me see those gloves. Just a minute, Mrs. Stefano. I'll take those gloves. But they're mine. You bet your life they're yours. I've got your initials on them. Then Mrs. Stefano is oh, the one... Oh, no, who... I didn't. We'll see about that, Mrs. Stefano. At police headquarters. Yes? Mr. and Mrs. North are here to see you, Lieutenant. Okay, send them in. You want me to go, Lieutenant? Oh, no, no, no. Stay where you are, Mr. Spire. The North will be interested to know what you've been telling me about Mrs. Stefano and uh, her husband's suspicions about her. At least it, it explains why... Bill, I've got to talk to you, Bill. Oh, well, what's all the excitement about, Jerry? We've got the murderer. Oh, really? We have, Bill. She's right outside. You mean she's downstairs in a nice little cell? I've got Miss Sally Ford under lock and key. Oh, well, you'd just better let her out, because she didn't commit the murder. It was Mrs. Stefano. <laughs> Mrs. Stefano. That's right, Bill. We've got the murder weapon and the glove she wore when she used it. Here, look. Hey, what kind of gag is this? No gag. Dick Ford found this package behind the stove in Mrs. Stefano's apartment. Well, he must have planted it there himself, the crazy fool. This isn't the murder weapon. How do you know? Because I've got the murder weapon right here in my desk. I've had it there for some time. Are you sure it's the right one? Well, of course I'm sure. I found it myself, didn't I? Where? How do you know it's the one that killed Mr. Stefano? Oh, I know, all right. Because I found it in Mr. Stefano's body. I don't understand it. I, I just don't understand it, Bill. Well, you would if you'd stop trying to defend the wrong person. You see, Pam, the murder weapon isn't a knife. It's a letter opener with a steel blade five inches long. And now that I've had time to make a few inquiries, I found out who it belongs to. Who? Mr. Spire's secretary, Sally Ford. 
Isn't that right, Mr. Spire? Now, just a moment, Lieutenant. I never made any such statement. I told you Miss Ford had a letter opener like the one you've got there. But uh, I didn't say that one was hers. Well, it is just the same. Her fingerprints were all over it. But what about the knife and the, and the blood-stained gloves? Yeah, they were just plants, dear. Dick Ford was trying to frame Mrs. Stefano for the sake of a sister. Exactly. Well, I still don't believe that Sally did it. Well, if you need personal proof, I think I can give it to you. You'll see in just a moment. Tom. Yes, sir. Send Miss Sally Ford in here, will you? I'd like to speak to her. Yes, sir. Bill, what are you up to? Well, I uh, I don't usually do things like this, Pam. But just to convince you and Mr. Spire that Sally is guilty, I'm going to confront her with a murder weapon and let you watch her reaction. I don't get it, Bill. What will her reaction prove? Plenty, I think. If she's innocent... She should have no reaction at all. And if she's guilty? If she's guilty, Mr. Spire, this letter opener will make her very uncomfortable. In fact, it might even drive her into a confession. Oh, she won't react to that letter opener at all. Won't she? No, because it isn't hers, and she didn't kill Mr. Stefano. Oh, shh. She's at the door. You wanted to see me, Lieutenant? Uh, Yes, come in, Miss Ford. How do you feel? All right, I guess. You letting me go? Why, no, no. I just wanted to ask a few more questions. About what? About this letter opener, Miss Ford. (gasps) Good heavens. Do you happen to know who it belongs to? Where did you get that? That's my question, Miss Ford. Do you know who it belongs to? Yes, it belongs to me. I thought so. But what's it doing here? How did you get hold of it? I got hold of it when the medical examiner removed it from Mr. Stefano's body. No. Don't say no, Miss Ford. It's the weapon that was used to commit the murder. And you're the one who used it. No, I didn't. I haven't seen that letter opener for over a week. It's been missing from my desk. Can you prove that? Well, I can't actually prove that it was missing, but it was. Don't you see I'm being framed by the one who stole it? I don't see anything of the kind. And if you can't prove what you say, you'll go to the chair for the murder of Victor Stefano. I won't. I won't. I tell you. Well, no, Bill, she got the letter opener. Here, you put that down. Stay where you are. Put it down, oh. I said. It's my head. Well, that's better. Now, sit down and behave yourself. Oh, Pam, are you satisfied? Completely, Bill. Now I know she didn't do it. What? You proved it yourself by what you just did. I don't follow you. Well, it's simple, Bill. When she came at you with that letter opener, what did you do? Well, reached out for a hand, of course. Well, exactly. And that's what any man would have done, including Mr. Stefano. I still don't follow you. Well, we'll figure it out, Bill. The, your whole case against Sally is based on the fact that her locket was found in the dead man's hand. And according to your theory, Mr. Stefano ripped it from her neck when she came at him with a letter opener. Well, what about it? Well, don't you understand, Bill? When somebody rushes at you with a knife or a, a letter opener, you don't reach for any lockets. You reach for the hand that's about to kill you. Hey, then the locket was planted in Mr. Stefano's hand after he was murdered. Why, of course it was. It was planted there by the real murderer. And the real murderer invited Miss Ford to Stefano's apartment so she could take the blame for it. Then I was framed every step of the way by the only one who could frame you. Who? Oh, don't you know, Mr. Spire? Or were you too busy noticing Miss Ford's reactions to the letter opener? Uh, too busy to notice your own. I beg your pardon? Uh, your little trap worked, Bill. Only it worked on Mr. Spire instead of Miss Ford. He was scared to death she wouldn't react properly. That's a lie. You can't prove anything against me. I had no reason for killing Stefano. He was my best client. And you took him for plenty, Mr. Spire. As his business manager, you were in charge of all his financial affairs, and you could use his money whatever way you please. Don't be a fool. Don't you be one. What I'm saying is the truth. Mr. Stefano suspected you of misusing his money, and he told me so. He told me he was going to, to ask you for an exact accounting. And you were afraid to face that accounting. So you killed him and framed your own secretary. Watch him, Bill. Oh, no, you don't. You're not getting out of here just yet, Mr. Spire. You let me go. Not for a long time, Mr. Spire. Until we've had a chance to take your fingerprints and see that they match the ones on the inside of this locket. Come with me, Mr. Spire. You're going to have your picture taken. Well, Pam, your hunch about Miss Ford was absolutely right. Spire is the guilty man, and his account books furnish the motive. He swindles Stefano out of almost half his property. Uh, well, Pam's hunches are always right, Bill. Oh, not always, dear. Well, almost. You know, I don't know why I bother about clues and things when you're around. 
I should just blindfold you and let you point to the murder. No. I don't think I'd have pointed to Mr. Spire, Bill. Not until you twisted that letter opener out of Sally's hand. Now, now that's another reason I knew she was innocent from the very beginning. What? Her hands. They, they were so soft and attractive. Yes, they were sort of pretty, weren't they? Hmm? Yeah, sort of small and dainty, like a, like a little girl. Oh, is that so? I didn't know that you'd taken in noticing other women's hands, Jerry. Well, I, I didn't really notice them, darling. I, I was just following one of your hunches. The Adventures of Mr. and Mrs. North are brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Someone's come. Help me. What's the matter? What's happening? Oh, it's awful. Oh, Mrs. Horton, Mr. North, she's just fine. Her dress is all torn. Yeah, I see. If you don't cut that out, sir, Mr. Horton, crazy. Don't, don't let him hit me again. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Joseph Curtin and Alice Frost. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, The Premature Corpse. It's a beautiful night in New York, clear, fresh, and in the snug apartment of Purdy Hathaway, warm. A night for music, for friendship, for love. And Shirley Hollis seems to have this last on her mind as she snuggles up to Purdy on the sofa. Oh, Purdy, I was just getting comfortable. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to run along, Shirley. Some people are coming over in a little while. Will they be here long? I don't know. It's business. He's Jerry North, a publisher. They're going to discuss a book I've written. Well, I'll wait till they leave. I want to talk to you, too. I, uh... Come here. What do you want? Put your arms around. Now, look, Shirley. Then I will. There. Hello, Ferdy. It's, uh... It's getting awfully warm in here. Yes. Isn't it? I, uh... Yes, Ferdy? Is this what you want? <sighs> oh, yes, darling. That's just what I want. Now, that didn't hurt, did it? You little cheat. Ferdy. My brother's wife. What do you want with me? You know I don't love Doug. I knew it when you married him. But you loved his money... I tried to tell him, but he wouldn't listen. I don't know why you've always hated me. Because you're a little cheat. You married Doug for his money, and now... Yes, now, now what? What do I want with you? You don't have money. You want something. I want you. That's all. Can't you see that, Ferdy? It's always been That's like what that. you want me to think. But I know you. It's just another one of your schemes. I wouldn't put it past you even to try to get me to... To get rid of Doug for you. Now that you have his money. Is that what you want, is oh, it? Oh, poor suspicious Ferdy. You didn't answer my question. I know why you don't like me, Ferdy. It's not Doug. There's nothing to do with Doug. You still it's didn't... It's that stuffy superiority of yours, that stuffy righteousness. You're a Hathaway and I was just a chorus girl. That's why you didn't want Doug to marry me. That's why you think you're too good for me. You're a cheat. Oh, That's why I... Oh, that Hathaway superiority. Well, how about Doug? I suppose he's not a cheat. What are you talking about? I'm talking about your brother, a Hathaway, a crook. That's a lie. You know it isn't. Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you've blinded yourself with that phony righteousness of yours until you can't see what's going on right in front of you. What do you mean? What's going on? You say I married Doug for his money. Well, how did he make that money, huh? The Hathaway fortune? Business. Sure, business. Some business. Black market in the wartime. You're crazy. It so happens I can prove it. And that's not all I can prove if I have to. I know enough about Doug to send him to jail. How would you like that? A Hathaway in jail, Get huh? out of here. Why don't you stop kidding yourself, Ferdy? So your grandfather was Colonel Hathaway. You're just a hack writer. Your brother's a crook. Stop it. Come on off that high horse. You're no better than I am and no worse. We could be friends. Good friends. Never. Oh, Ferdy. Look at me. You cheap, lying, dirty oh, little... I'm not taking any more of that. Let go. I tried to be nice, but you I... don't want it that way. All right. Hey, those nails are sharp. And so am I, Keith. Oh, I'm... You're asking for this. Put down that poker. I will on your head. No, no, you don't let me have it. Oh, you're 
hurting me. I haven't started. Ah, don't try biting again. Or I'll make sure you don't have any teeth left to bite with. Now, come on. Drop that poker. Uh, all right. There. That's better. And now get out of here. I've got to get cleaned up before the Norse get here. What's so funny? You're always concerned about impressions, aren't you, Ferdy? Well, brother, I promise you, you're going to make a beaut. The more I think about it, Jerry, the more I think his sister will have to be killed, too. What? Oh, but not shot. I think strangling would be better. What on earth are you talking about, Pam? Well, about Mr. Hathaway's book, of course. Well, what did you think? I didn't know. The way you start a subject out of a clear blue sky. It wasn't a clear blue sky. It was a murky green elevator. Mm. And it's in Mr. Hathaway's building, so I, I should think you'd know what I meant. I see. Well, let's go tell Mr. Hathaway the sister ought to be strangled. I'm sure he'll love the suggestion. It'll mean rewriting three chapters. But it'll make a story much stronger. In one woman's opinion. Well, did do... Ah! Golly, what was that? Sounded like it came from the apartment at the end of the hall. Jerry, is Mr. Hathaway's apartment? Yeah, I wonder what... Oh, thank heaven someone's come. Help me. What's the matter? What's happening? Please. Oh, it's all... Don't oh, listen to her, Mr. Norton. She tried to jump. kiss me when I wouldn't let him. He hit me. Jerry, her dress is all torn. Yeah, I see. She's just trying to embarrass me, Mr. Norton. Why would she try to do that? It's kind of hard to explain. You bet it is, you maniac. Oh, stop it, Shirley. Did you hit her, Mr. Hathaway? Her face looks bruised. Well, yes, I, I guess I did, but... Why? Well, be, because she bit me. Stop it, Shirley. Jerry, he's hysterical. It's just an act. If you don't cut that out, Shirley, I'm going to have to hit you again. Hit me. He won't. Now, come on. Let's go in and see what this is all about. No, no. I, I want to go home. I, I want to see Doug. I want my Doug. Doug. Doug, it was awful. When I wouldn't let him make love to me, he... Well, he got like crazy. He, he said all kinds of awful things about you and me. All right, Shirley, forget it. It's over. Well, I can't, Doug. I, I'm afraid. He said he'd see you in jail. What? That's right. He said you were crook and he can prove it. Bertie and... said that? Yes, he started talking about your tie-up with gambling. How and... does he know about that? I don't know, but he said he's going to make sure you get what's coming to you unless... Unless I... Oh, oh Doug, I can't. Not even to save you, I can't. All right, sweetheart, you won't have to. I can handle Ferdy. Oh, he'll deny it. He'll make up some story. Don't worry. If you don't believe me, you can ask the North. They saw... I believe you, Shirley. I... I hate... hate to have to tell you this about your own brother, dear. Yeah, my brother. My dear, sanctimonious brother. It'd be just like him to keep his threat and run to the police now that he knows about me. I've got to figure some way to shut him up. But how? I'll think of something... And one thing's for sure, he's going to keep away from you, or I promise you, Shirley, I'll kill him. What's the matter, Ferdy? Don't you like this restaurant? Sure, Laura. You're not eating. I'm not hungry. Laura, I've got to tell you something. I don't know how to begin. Laura... Yes, Ferdy? I love you, Laura, you know that. (laughs) For someone who says he doesn't know how to begin, I'd say you're doing fine. I only hope you believe what I'm going to tell you. My sister-in-law, Doug's wife, Shirley, came over to my place last night. Yes? She made a play for me. What? She tried to get me to make love to her. When I wasn't interested, she blew her top. Ah, the woman scorned. It's more than that. She doesn't want me. She wants to use me. Use you? What for? I'm not sure, but... Well, you know, she only married Doug for his money. Yes. I think she wants to get rid of Doug. I think she wants me to help her. Get rid of him? Well, how? How? Kill him. Oh, no, Fred. You don't know Shirley like I do. Yeah, Laura, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what she wants. Well, why are you telling me this? Because I think Shirley's going to try to go through with it, with or without my help. So I've got to warn Doug. Well, I still don't see... He's not going to want to believe me. Especially because she's probably filled him full of lies. 
But I, I may be able to convince him. I've got to. Maybe if I tell him some of the things she said about what him. What things? Oh, it's beside the point. The point is, she's going to be afraid I may convince him. So she's going to try to shut me up. How? I told you about last night. Yes. Well, she's already turned that around to make it look like I attacked her. Oh. Yeah. And that she's poured it on heavy to Doug. Yeah, that's why I wanted to get to you first. I, I wanted you to hear this story from me the way it really happened. I see. Because you've got to believe me, Laura. I, I can't let her break us up. And she's going to try. I know she is. If she can't shut me up one way, she'll try another. There's nothing she won't stop at to get what she wants. But it's not going to work. At least, I hope it's not. Hello. Hello, Jerry. This is Bill Wagon. Oh, yes, Bill. How are you? Okay. Say, Jerry, what can you tell me about Ferdy Hathaway? Hathaway? I'm considering publishing a book he wrote. Why, does he want to go to your office and do research on how the homicide squad works? No, no, it's the other way around. What do you mean? Well, we got to see him, and it's not research. This is the real thing. You mean he killed somebody? No, that's the other way around, too. Somebody killed him. Let's go. Pam, it hasn't been two minutes since I hung up the phone. And you asked me to tell Bill we couldn't possibly to get over to see him for at least an hour. Oh, we're not going to see Bill. We're not? No. But darling, he wants to talk to us. I told him about the incident last night and he wants all the details. Oh, we'll tell him. Later. <sighs> all right, dear. But if we're not going to see Bill right now, where are we going? To see Laura, of course. Oh, yes, of course. Laura. That's a good idea. Oh, I thought you'd agree, darling. Uh, there's just one thing, though. Oh, what's that, dear? Who in blazes is Laura? Oh, you know, Jerry. I do? Uh, Laura Arnold. Uh, Freddie Hathaway's girlfriend. Hmm? Oh, don't you remember? He mentioned her last night. He was afraid that she might hear about Shirley's accusation and, and might believe it. Oh, that's right. And if she did believe it, it might make her angry. Do you think it might have made her angry enough to commit murder? Well, you never know. At least it's worth checking up on. As long as Bill wants us to give him information, maybe we can take him more than he counted on. Yes? Are you Laura Arnold? Yes. Well, I I I'm Pamela North, and this is my husband, Jerry North. Oh, the publisher. I've heard Freddie mention you... What do you want with me? We'd like to talk to you, if we may. Well, I'm I'm pretty busy right now. We'll only take a few minutes. Uh, well, all right, come in. What's it about? Ferdy. What about him? I'm afraid you're in for a bad shock, Miss Arnold. He's been murdered? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Why do you ask that? He said Shirley wouldn't stop at anything, so... Well, naturally, I've been afraid... When did he tell you that? Today at lunch. And that's the last you saw of him? Yes. I, I came home right afterward, about one. I've been here ever since. Well, that's funny. When we asked if you were in just before we came up, the desk clerk said you got in only about 20 minutes ago. Well, I... Well, it, oh, Mr. North, I'm frightened. I don't know what to do. Well, maybe we can help you, if you tell us the truth. Yes. Yes, the truth. I, I did have lunch with Ferdy. He told me about Shirley. Uh, then we went back to his place and talked a while... And I left. But about an hour later, I realized I'd left my gloves up there. So I went back. Mm -hmm. And there he was. On the floor. Dead. I'll never forget how he looked. I don't want to think about it. You'd better sit down, Miss Arnold. <laughs> there are a couple of things I'd still like to ask you. Because if we're going to help you, we'll have to know what we're doing. <laughs> says she was afraid you'd suspect her, Bill. That's why she wouldn't give a name when she phoned that uh, she'd discovered the murder. And why she ran out before you got there. Uh-huh. 
Well, I'll get around to her later, after I've had a talk with Hathaway's brother and the brother's wife. Uh, find out if they own a, a yellow convertible, Bill. Yes, that's right. Miss Arnold says that a yellow convertible pulled away from in front of Purdy's place just as she arrived the second time. Did she know the make? No, she said she never saw one like it. It was very long and low. And, and... it had a funny-shaped back, uh, kind of like... Um, uh, well, the, the way she described it, it, it must look something like... Well, like the back of that car parked right in front of us. Hey, Pam, that is the car. Fits a description to a T. And it's parked right in front of Douglas Hathaway's apartment. Well, let's go in and see what he has to say about it. I know you have your job to do, Lieutenant, but is it necessary to question me now? After all, it's quite a shock hearing my brother's been murdered. Well, suppose we question your wife. And from what I hear about last night, I don't imagine his death should make her too unhappy. I didn't kill him, if that's what you're implying. I'm not implying anything. I just want to ask you some questions. I suppose you want to know where I was. Well, I was right here. I've been home all day long. Was your husband with you? No. He was at the office, Mrs. Norman. Oh, well, then nobody was with you here. Nobody saw you. The servants did. Part of the time, anyway. And part of the time, not. Oh, Doug, are you going to let them suggest... No. Look, Lieutenant, I can't take this now. I don't feel up to questions, and I certainly don't intend to sit by while you badger Shirley. Well, let's clear up the matter of the car, at least. What about the car? Did you drive it to work this morning? Couldn't. It's brand new. It wasn't delivered until noon. Then you didn't have it with you at the office. I just told you... Oh, all right, all right. You didn't have it. And you, Mrs. Hathaway, uh, you didn't go out at all? How many times do I have to tell you? Well, then who did have the car? Nobody. The salesman delivered it, left it out front, and it's been there all afternoon. Well, if you want to get by with a story like that, you should get a car that's not quite so distinctive. What do you mean? Tell her, Jerry. Well, Mrs. Hathaway, it so happens your car was seen driving away from your brother-in-law's right after the murder. And with a custom job like that, there can be no mistake. Well, I... Well, that is, I, I don't... All right, Lieutenant. I had the car. Oh, you did, Hathaway? Yes, I... I came home from the office early and picked it up, went to see Ferdy, but I didn't kill him. Why'd you go there? I wanted to talk to him, but there was a man with him. What I had to say was private, family matter. Didn't care to discuss it in front of a stranger, so I left. Well, who was the stranger? Ferdy didn't introduce us. I was only there a minute. What did he look like? Tall, blonde, well-dressed. You'd know him if you saw him again? Uh, yes, but now that's enough question. Uh, not quite. I still I said want to that's know. enough. Now, look, Mr. Hathaway, I'm just trying to find out with... What? Say, where are you going? To call my lawyer and see if I have to put up with this. Don't answer anything until I come back, Shirley. When you know Doug better, Lieutenant, you'll know better than to try to cross him. What? What was that? Well, there must be someone in there with Doug. They're fighting. Oh, shot. Come on, Bill. Yeah. There's Hathaway on the floor. Oh, oh, he, he got away. Window to the terrace. I'll go see what I can find, Jerry. And you stay with Hathaway and see if he's all right. Right. Doug. Oh, oh Doug, what happened? He was hiding in here. A fellow I saw at Ferdy's tried to slug me with a blackjack. But I heard him and turned, just grazed the side of my head. Yes, you've got a gash there. I put up a fight. He broke away, ran for the window. I fired at him. Guess I missed. Blow had me kind of woozy. You're sure it's the same man you saw at Ferdy's? Positive. Well, I took a quick look outside. No sign of anyone now. Well, he could have crossed the terrace to another apartment or, or gone down the fire escape and ducked in below. But then he's still in the building. Yeah, he'll be out of it before he can do anything about it, Pam. Then what do we do? Well, first of all, Hathaway, you stop being coy and give us a detailed description of this character. Or do you still want to call your lawyer? No, Lieutenant, you win. I'll tell you whatever I can. There's your coffee, Jerry. Jerry. Jerry North! Uh, oh, uh, uh, what, Pam? Your coffee. I, I know you don't like it cold. Oh, thanks. Where were you? What? Just now, in your thoughts. Y you were miles away. I was thinking about the Hathaway case. It's been three days now, and no sign of the mysterious stranger. Well, maybe they'll never find him. He had time to get far away. But I don't think he did. That's what I've been thinking about. Do you think you know where he is? Maybe. Anyway, I'll bet there's one place they haven't tried yet. Where's that? The morgue. The morgue? Mm-hmm. And somehow I have an idea it might yield results. Well, I have to admit that was a pretty good 
idea of yours, Jerry. Uh, I don't know, Bill. Wait till we see if Hathaway identifies the body. Yeah. I could be wrong, but this seemed like the logical bet. Well, here's where we find out. Here's Hathaway. Morning, gentlemen. Morning. Oh, good morning. Am I late? No, right on the nose, Hathaway. Well, should we go in and get it over with? Yes, let's. All right. Right through here. You really think it's the right man, eh, Lieutenant? Well, that's for you to say, Hathaway. He seems to fit the description you gave us. Oh, here he is. Well, Hathaway? That's the man. Are you sure? Yes, Lieutenant, I'm sure. Well, Jerry, seems you were right. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, Hathaway, this is very interesting. Now, you say you saw this man at your brother's the day your brother was killed. That's right. Your brother was killed on Tuesday. But it so happens this fella died on Monday. You see, Pam, I thought that if Hathaway was lying, he'd jump at the chance to strengthen the story. So I suggested that Bill show him a corpse that approximated the description he gave us. Yes, after all, the corpse couldn't talk back. Right. And now that we've eliminated the mysterious stranger, we can concentrate on the real suspects. And Bill thinks he can wrap it up. That's why he asked us down here today. Come in. Oh, Pam and Jerry. Huh? Well, how's it going, Bill? We just started. I don't see why you had to bring them in, Lieutenant. Because, Mrs. Hathaway, they were present when you had your unpleasantness with your brother-in-law. All right, we had an unpleasant scene, but it wouldn't make me kill him. That depends on the reason for the scene, Mrs. Hathaway. I told you the reason. He tried to make love to me. And... I can suggest another. Yes, Jerry? Suppose Mrs. Hathaway wanted to get rid of her husband. What do you mean? He has a lot of money, Mrs. Hathaway. Maybe that's what you married him for. Then you tried to get Freddy to help you kill him, and when he refused... You're lying. You're lying. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, sure. Don't talk to me like hey, that. Hey, that's just... enough, Mrs. Hathaway. Now, stop it. Stop it, Mrs. Hathaway. Stop it, Mrs. Hathaway. I'll tear his eyes out. I believe you would. Oh, Doug, help me. You know he was lying. Of course he was, so calm down, will you? You don't believe him, Doug. I told you I don't, but this is no way to answer him. Yeah. Yes, you're right, but you made me so mad. I see I did. You have a low boiling point, Mrs. Hathaway. You couldn't expect her to like what you were saying, North. I didn't. You just said it to upset her. I just said it because I wanted to see if it were true. What on earth gives you the idea that it might be? Things that Laura Arnold told us. So that's it. Laura, wouldn't you know? Why do you say that? Can't you see she's behind this whole thing? It all ties up now. I'll bet she's the one who claimed to have seen my car at Ferdy's, too, wouldn't she? What if she is? Lieutenant, you said I've been trying to shield Shirley. I have. Mm Mm-hmm. When you said my car was seen at Ferdy's, I could see Shirley was upset. She didn't know what to say, so I stepped in and said I'd been to Ferdy's. And you hadn't? No, but I thought Shirley might have. But now that I know she wasn't, at least not at the time of the murder... How do you know that? Because now I know when the murder happened. It's been in the paper. Well? Well, I did have the car at that time, but I was nowhere near Ferdy's. So if Laura says she saw me there, she's lying. Hmm. It seems to come down to your word against hers. Well, I've sent for her, too, so let's see what happens when she gets here. Oh, uh, I don't think we'll have to wait for that, Bill. I know which one to believe. You do, Pam? Yes, Laura. Mr. Hathaway's still lying. So it looks like he's the murderer. Don't be ridiculous. Laura says she saw my car at Ferdy's. That means she had to be there herself. Uh, that's just it, Mr. So Hathaway. naturally, she's going to lie, try to place somebody else there, but too. But she couldn't have been lying. Why not? You told us your car was brand new. It had been delivered just a short time before the murder. That's right. Well, then, how could Laura have described it? Unless she really did see it at Ferdy's. <laughs> Jerry, get him! All right. I've got him. All right, Hathaway, sit down. Looks like you've told one lie too many. It's a beautiful day, isn't it, dear? Yes. Poor Shirley. Well, how do we come to Shirley? Out of a clear blue sky. The sky's clear, and you just mentioned the weather, so you see, there is a logical connection. You win, dear. <laughs> but why do you say poor Shirley? Well, it's quite obvious that she just married Doug Hathaway for his money. Mm-hmm. And now that he's caught for murder, they've broken him down about how he made his money. His whole crooked house will come tumbling down. That's right, Jerry. And all his money is tied up. And so poor Shirley gets none. You see what I mean, dear? Poor Shirley. Uh Uh-huh. But somehow it doesn't break my heart. She knew Doug was a crook. Ferdy knew it, too. That's why Doug killed him, to shut him up. He claims Ferdy was always a tattletale as a kid. Hey, Pam, why are you stopping? Oh, I just want to look in this window. Look at that car, Jerry. Isn't it beautiful? Mm Mm-hmm. It's sort of like the Hathaway's car. Oh, it must be wonderful to be able to afford a car like that. Well, even if you could, where would you ever find a parking space for it in Manhattan? Well, if you didn't live in Manhattan. But we do live in Manhattan. And we can't afford the car anyway. I know, Jerry. I'm just thinking. 
Don't you ever like to think of what it would be like to have a car like that? I don't let myself. How do you prevent yourself? Oh, easy. I just walk over to the curb, like so. Yes. And then? Then I just shout, like so. Hey, taxi! <laughs> The adventures of Mr. and Mrs. North are brought to you through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. was a hunt through a jungle of city streets with danger waiting at every intersection until halfway through when the hunters became the hunted and death brought an end to the game. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Grim Hunters. The morning paper had headlined Prices Rising. My bank statement in the afternoon mail had worn balance falling. And I had wasted the evening on behalf of a client who ran out on me when I tried to collect. All of which added up to the end of the day and me unhappy in my office at 10 p.m. With one hand on my checkbook and the other one raised in almost solemn oath. I, Philip Marlowe, private detective and too often public servant. Hereby resolved to one way or another jockey my budget into something close to equilibrium. And from this day for... Hello. Marlowe speaking. My name is Helen Palmer, Marlowe. I need your help badly. Yeah, but look, I... I'm up at 8700 Magnolia Terrace in the Hollywood Hills. Now, please, drop whatever you're doing and... No. No. No! I must have let go of the phone, grabbed my hat and coat, opened and closed the office door, piled into my car outside and raced up into the Hollywood Hills because... The next thing I remember after Helen Palmer's scream was swinging off North Bronson Drive onto Magnolia Terrace. But a minute later, when I scraped to a stop away from number 8700, scrambled out from under the wheel and started on the run for the front door, I was no longer sure of anything. Because the house in question, a stock southern mansion complete with stable boy statue in a gravel driveway, which according to the book should have been as dark and as quiet as the inside of a coffin, was anything else but. And when I got to the oversized bronze door knocker and dropped it hard... I was beginning to doubt that I had the right address. Can I be of some assistance, sir? I don't know. I'm looking for a woman named Helen Palmer who called me at my office. Said she needed help. And a second after that, she screamed. Uh. <laughs> Tell me, sir, what is your name and occupation? In that order, Philip Marlowe, private detective. <laughs> Good for Helen. Good for Happy, her. aren't you? What's going on here? What is this? Why, it's a party, sir. A scavenger hunt. It looks like Helen Palmer's the now, winner. wait a minute, laughing boy. I had a call that was interrupted by pistol shots, and I... <laughs> All just part of the play, sir. Yeah, Helen Palmer had to bring back one private detective. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you see, Marlowe, 
Each list, aside from the usual hard-to-find objects, had a human being on it. That's right. I had to bring back a Hoover vacuum cleaner salesman, and believe it or not, he's already sold our good host, Thaddeus Grover, the deluxe model. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, he did it bad. <laughs> You see, Mr. Marlowe, Helen Palmer wasn't permitted to actually hire you. That's why she had to pretend to be in trouble. Well, the net result that I nearly broke my neck getting up here. Mr. Grover, where is Miss Palmer? Well, I don't know for sure, Marlowe. She called just a bit ago and said that she only had to catch on to you and one other item and be back after that. Which makes her the winner, Mr. Marlowe, because none of us did better than half our list. Oh, by the by, you don't happen to have the breech lock of a 57-millimeter anti-tank gun with you. <laughs> At the moment, no. Nor do I have time for scavenger hunters. Not even when they most cordially invite you in with the finest serve and the finest style southern fried chicken imaginable. Come on, Mr. Marlowe. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I... Come on. Come on, well, come on, come it's on. delicious chicken. Well, okay, the chicken did it. <laughs> the inside of Thaddeus Grover's house was also a stock southern mansion from a giant cut glass punch bowl. Belonged to my mother, sir, first lady of Atlanta, Georgia, sir, to a wide and winding colonial staircase. It left you expecting the descent of Scarlett O'Hara at any moment. There was one strange note in the soft southern surroundings. Piled three feet high in the middle of the room were the crazy quilt results of the evening scavenger hunt, including a wooden cigar store Indian, a pair of Hickox suspenders from a local fire chief, one red motorcycle, a stuffed owl, a set of antlers, and more. And behind all that, my counterparts, a bring them back alive items from each list, a streetcar conductor in uniform, a waiter bald and under 40, a school teacher red-headed and over 50. But I was the center of attention. But Thaddeus introduced one after another of the guests to the genuine, 100% non-shrinkable private detective. And now, Mr. Marlowe, sir, a very special friend of mine. At 31, sir, the president of Sample and Claiborne, best building contractors in the city of Los Angeles. Oh, that's so very interesting, Mr. Grover. Yeah, moreover, Mr. Marlowe, Sample made it right to the top in the past two years. Uh-huh. Yeah, ever since old Joshua Claiborne got killed falling off a scaffold. He did. Cost between you and me and the gatepost, some folks say it was Suicide. Oh, Larry! That boy, uh, I'd, I'd like you to meet Mr. Marlowe, a private detective. Mr. Marlowe, Larry Sam. How do you do? Hello, Mr. Marlowe. Glad you're with us. Uh, Thaddeus has Rhonda called in yet. Last time I heard from her was when we split our list in two, and she headed out after a Latin American rumba team. <laughs> <laughs> well, if she went after a boy, she'll bring her back. That's Rhonda Langley we're speaking of, Mr. Marlowe, Larry's lady friend. Oh? Nicest person I know. Except, of course, my fiance, Helen. Helen is in Palmer, my patron, Mr. Grover. <laughs> yes, sir. One and the same, sir. Well, we certainly have a lot of fun, even if we don't make much money, eh, huh, Marlowe? Yeah, you certainly... <laughs> Mr. Grover, did you say money? Most surely did, boy. Oh. You know, dollars and cents. Yes. Well, gentlemen, you'll excuse me, please, but I do have to run. Good night, Mr. Sample. Good night. And Mr. Grover, sir, it's been a distinct pleasure, sir. I bid you goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. You're a car. <laughs> <laughs> back to my office, which I had left lights on and unlocked. My telephone was ringing. At this late hour, gullible me took faint hope that it could be a client who might still save the day. When I picked up the receiver... Marlo? I let go of that straw fast. Marlo? It was Detective Lieutenant Ibarra. Marlo, do you know a girl named Helen Palmer? Helen Palmer? Hey, Ibarra, don't tell me there's a pair of somewhat flat feet on the ladies' scavenger hunt list. Very funny, Phil. How do you know her? No, not beyond a panic telephone call that ended in a make-believe scream and a couple of pistol shots. All designed to bring me running to a party at 8700 Magnolia Terrace. Mm-hmm. Well, that adds all right, because the only items not checked off a list are a night watchman's badge and one detective private, which must be you, since your name is circled in the classified directory here in this phone booth. Here in what phone booth? Where are you, Barra? At a closed filling station on Van Ness off Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah, but wait a minute. Why is a girl's list there with you? Because it's clenched in her right hand, Phil, and she's folded up on the floor of this booth, dead. Oh, no. Two bullet holes in her back. Oh, yeah, but, but Ibarra, her call was a gag. The shots weren't. Anyhow, it looks like a stick-up since the lady's purse is gone and a wino we Who? picked up. A wino we picked up saw what he calls a curly-headed guy with short legs do it and run. Also, the wino says that the murder had been hanging around for a couple of hours like he was looking for a well-to-do prospect. Yeah, I know, but it's still kind of strange. Me getting that call, I mean. Well, I'll drop around to headquarters tomorrow morning, Lieutenant, if you need any statement from me. I think you'd better make that tonight, Phil. At the 8700 address. I'm sending Mooney up there now. Oh, but wait a minute, Ibarra. You don't need me, and I do need business. If you think I'm going to get it by... Phil. Huh? Phil, let's say that I'd appreciate it if you'd show for a few minutes. A 
okay? No. Well, okay, a few minutes. Just so long as you appreciate it. Goodbye. <laughs> Driving back to Magnolia Terrace, I used Detective Lieutenant Ibarra as an oversized whipping boy for the day's disappointments. So when I finally break to a stop behind a half-parked squad car, which meant that Police Officer Mooney was already on hand, I was about back to normal. But then in the next quick moment, I forgot all about Ibarra because in the shadows ahead, sneaking away from a side entrance to number 8700, looking as guilty as Lucretia Borgia leaving a corner pharmacy, was a young lady, brunette and beautiful. She hurried directly to a gray Nash parked in the rear and, without looking back, climbed in and took off. Following her had to be more fun than conversation with Mooney. <laughs> Ten minutes later, the lady came to a stop in front of a dark, politely landscaped cottage on North Ogden Drive. In another two, she was inside and the light was on. When I got to the front door and leaned against the bell, a card over it said... That this could be one Rhonda Langley, Mr. Larry Sample's girlfriend. But that same card also gave another name, Helen Palmer, the lady dead in the phone booth. I rang again. When the door opened, it was the brunette, still beautiful. Only this time, something had been added. In her right hand, a forty-five, ugly and pointed straight at my head. What do you want? One straight answer, Miss Langley. <clears throat> Why did you run away from 8700 Magnolia Terrace? And a cop with routine questions. Wait a minute. Who are you? How do you know my name? I'm a private detective labeled Philip Marlowe. Item number eight on the late Miss Palmer's list. And I know about you because I've already been to Thaddeus Grover's party. Now, after you put this gun away, oh, we'll get back to my question. Why'd you run? Come on, talk, lady, now before I yell copper. All right. Come in. Thanks. Mr. Marlowe, I don't think Helen Palmer's murder was any run-of-the-mill robbery. You don't think what? I stayed just long enough to hear the policeman say Helen had been killed. Oh. When I got to your welcome, Matt, I was greeted with a forty-five. Talk some more, Miss Langley. Real plain well, like, right. huh? Give me half a chance, will you? I didn't say anything to the police about this because I don't want to do any damage before I'm sure about a few things. Like what? Like the kind of a mess that Helen was in. Mr. Marlowe, I need help. I- I've got to know some facts. Please, will you work for me? I'll pay you anything. Well, at this point, let's call anything 25 a day in expenses, huh? Uh, About Helen and the mess you spoke of, how much do you know? Very little. Only that I think Helen was blackmailing somebody. Somebody who was at the party tonight. Like Grover, your boyfriend, Larry Sample? I don't know. Oh, you've got to believe me, Mr. Marlowe. Well, all right. For the time being, I will. Now, first of all, how'd you lash on to this blackmail? Well, yesterday morning, I accidentally overheard Helen talking to someone on the telephone. She spoke of a payoff that was to be made at Thaddeus's party. I don't know who she was talking to, but she warned the person not to try anything rash. As in murder? She didn't say. But she did say that she'd already airmailed a letter to her lawyers in San Francisco that would protect her from any harm. And she laughed about the scheduled scavenger hunt and hung up. Mm-hmm. You said nothing to her about this, huh? Well, no, I, I was afraid... All right, the letter to San Francisco. Did you see her mail it? Well, I mailed it myself earlier in the day, along with one of my own. Mm-hmm. I didn't think about it until after her call, when she pointedly asked me if I'd remembered to mail a letter... My letter, that is, which she knew that I'd written to an aunt I have in Passaic, New Jersey. Well? Well, that's the whole story. If you want me, I'll be over at Thaddeus's place. Thaddeus? Yes. He was in love with Helen. Yeah. Maybe she was returning that love with blackmail. What do you think, Rhonda? I don't know. The thinking is now your job, Mr. Marlowe. I left Rhonda Langley and started back to my car as a bona fide private detective with clients. I wasn't sure whether or not I was happy about the whole thing. But a second later, at the sight of a man in the dark ahead, half crouched behind a tree, I quit deliberating the point and got ready for trouble because, from what I could see, the gentleman in hiding had both the curly hair and very short legs that Ibarra had mentioned as a sign of Helen Palmer's killer. I kept walking straight until I was abreast the tree, and then I pivoted sharply, took one step toward him, and swung! <laughs> Come on, brother. Why, you dirty... You haven't got the time. They believe me. Enough, fella. Enough, will you leave me alone? Sure. Sure I will. After you start talking. Now, get up. Okay. Okay, don't hit me again. I'll talk. I'll tell you... Hey. Hey, look there. No. No, don't. Oh, that lousy nut. In 
just a moment, we'll return to the second act of the adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, you can do a lot of singing for $14,500, so they say. And tonight, some CBS listener may be able to speak with authority on this subject because $14,500 is what's waiting for whoever can solve the mystery behind the new Phantom Voice on CBS's great Saturday night quiz game, Sing It Again. Listeners from coast to coast will be quizzed by telephone about the new Phantom's identity. And they'll also be given a chance to win one of the other famous prizes for solving the riddle songs which feature Sing It Again's Hour of Saturday Night Fun. Here, sing it again on most of these same CBS network stations tonight and every Saturday night. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Grim Hunters. Shots crashed out of the darkness. The life ran out of the little man like air from a kid's balloon. I couldn't figure exactly where the shots had come from, and I stopped trying when a pair of spiked heels clicked fast across the concrete driveway between me and the house. Then a motor started, and a second later, a car roared by with Rhonda Langley at the wheel. I yelled at her to stop as she went by, and ran out in the street after her and yelled again at the retreating car. But she ignored me. When another car came around the curve behind me, I tried to flag it down, but the driver didn't even slow up. So I just stood there while the two cars twisted out of sight down the winding street, leaving nothing but silence and a lot of unanswered questions hanging in midair. I walked back to the corpse, went over it carefully. But there was no identification, nothing but a gun to indicate how he fitted into the screwy mosaic of murder, scavenging, and blackmail. I went inside to call Ibarra, and five minutes of tracers, relays, and busy signals went by before I... I finally got through to him with my news about Helen Palmer's killer. What? Uh, where are you, Marlowe? In a house on Ogden Drive, 4310 North. It was shared by Helen Palmer and my new client, Rhonda Langley. Uh-huh. Did she kill my suspect, Marlowe? Mm, could be. She left here in a big hurry. Another thing, Ibarra, there's more behind this business than robbery. Like what? Like blackmail. Maybe so. We just found the Palmer's girl handbag in a trash can. Nothing left but a lipstick and two letters. Incidentally, one is addressed to your client, Rhonda Langley. That figures. They shared the house, so Helen happened to pick up the day's mail. What's the other letter? It was one return for insufficient postage. They forgot that air mail is six cents these days. Oh, return... Wait a minute. Is that letter addressed to a law firm in San Francisco? No, it's addressed to Sophie Kilbirdie. Sophie of... kill who? Kilbirdie of oh. Passaic, New Jersey. Why? Well, Ibarra, listen. Helen was blackmailing somebody, and she covered herself by mailing a letter to her lawyers in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. If that letter was returned for insufficient postage and the blackmail victim knew it, he'd have no qualms about killing her, right? Sure, but the letters were in Helen's purse. Oh. Don't you think she'd have known her protection was gone? Phil, I'm going to put out a pickup call on your client. And you get on down here so we can go over this mess one step at a time. Where's here? Still at the gas station on Van Ness off Hollywood Boulevard. Okay, Barra. How long are you going to be there? Just until Thaddeus Grover shows up to identify the body and give me some answers personally about that scavenger hunt he threw tonight. What about this curly-headed corpse I've got here? Have you gone over him? Yeah, yeah. Nothing but a gun, some small bills on him. Then he'll keep. I'll expect you in a few minutes. Okay. So long, Ibarra. When I put down the phone, I was convinced that a big switch was due any minute because... Finding those letters in Helen Palmer's purse made a lot of sense in one direction and not a bit in another. I could have made more heads and tails by flipping a ball bearing than I got out of the facts he borrowed given me. Just then, the shadow of a man slid up the walk. I heard a pair of feet mount the stairs two at a time. It was the Wonder Boy executive I had met at the party. Better hold it right there, Sample. What? Marlowe. Why the gun? So the same thing won't happen to me that happened to the dead little guy outside? Another murder? Marlowe, where's Rhonda? Is she all right? She left here as fast as an eight-cylinder motor wide open could move just after it happened. Then it was Rhonda I saw. On my way over here, a speeding car almost crowded me off the road. It looked like Rhonda's, but I wasn't sure. And Marlowe, she was being chased by another car, a fast one. Chased, are you sure? Yes. The first car missed me by inches when it swung around a curve. I don't know yet how she made it. Then a second car came along and passed the curve, but it stopped, backed up, and then took the same road Rhonda had taken. You think she got away? I don't know. Hmm. Well, come on outside, Sample. I want you to take a look at this. By the way, how long have you known Rhonda? About a year. Mm hmm She's a brilliant girl, Marlo. Came out from the East, and I gave her a job as my secretary. She's more than that now, huh? I'm in love with her, if that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here it is. Oh. Marlo, I... 
I know this man. That's Nate Murdoch. He used to be a foreman with our firm. He left and went back to Atlanta right after Claiborne's death. Atlanta? Isn't your host Thaddeus Grover from Atlanta? Why, yes, he is. Oh, brother. When did you see Grover last? Well, the police asked him to go and identify Helen's body. He left the party while the officer was still questioning the rest of us. Yeah, and on the way, he could have taken time off to drop by here, kill Murdoch, and make a try for Ronda, too. Come on, let's get to the phone. But why, Marlowe? Good heavens, Grover's our friend. He and Helen were engaged to be married. All right, so it doesn't make sense. But his fiance and his short friend from Atlanta are both dead. And Ronda's burning the tires off a car to keep out of reach. Those are the facts. It'll make sense later. Now, call Grover's place and hurry up. Yes. That's where she intended to go when she left here, to console him, no less. Scavenger hunt my Aunt Minnie. Uh, hello? Hello, is Mr. Grover there? No. Well, has Miss Langley arrived yet? Oh, it's the maid, Marlon. Mm -hmm. Rhonda had... What's that? She's coming up the walk now? Uh, hold the line a minute, please. She just got there, Marlon. What'll I tell her? Tell her to leave again. Tell her... No. Where do you live? 4406 Ardmore. All right. Tell her I said for her to wait outside in the back of the house until you can get over there to pick her up. Take her to your place and I'll pin Grover down. Right. Where are you going now? See Lieutenant Ibarra, and I can get there faster than I can call him on the phone. Good luck, Sample. Sample was repeating my name over to Grover's maid on the phone as I left. And a few minutes later, at the mobile gas station off Hollywood Boulevard, I found Ibarra looking sardonic in the blinking light from a flying red neon horse above his head. As he flipped through a stack of papers on top of an oil drum. It's about time, Arlo. Where's that client of yours? Now, wait a minute, Ibarra. I had her pegged all wrong. She's a pigeon. Has Thaddeus Grover been here yet? Just left. He's quite a character, that guy. You didn't let him get away alone. Yes, he was... What do you mean, get away? Ibarra, there's a, there's a big connection between Thaddeus Grover and Murdoch, the guy who killed Helen. Now, Grover might have hired him for the job, and now he's trying to get Ronda. Now, Marlo, how does that figure? It doesn't, but so help me, Barr, that's the way it is. Well, Grover was heading for his friend Larry Sample's house, and he left. Happened to know where Sample... Holy smoke, that's exactly where I told Sample to take the girl. 4406 Ardmore. Well, that's great, Marlo. They'll all be together in one place. I'll pick up the whole crew in right now. You're going to pick up the pieces, you mean? You think there'll be a showdown? Any minute, Barr, it can't miss. Okay, so we'll take some firepower along. Hey, McGaller! Great! Yeah, Let's go! Yeah. Come on, Phil. Now look, Ibarra, maybe Sample hasn't gotten home with Ronda yet. I'll go up to Grover's and try to head them off, okay? Okay, Marlo. But if you get them before I do, bring them in. And no alibis. I'll see you. Ibarra was grim as he climbed in his car and drove off fast. I headed for my car, then as I turned, my arms swept the scavenger list Ibarra had left on the oil drum off onto the ground. When I picked them up, Ronda Langley's name was on top. Her list was as goony as the others, but near the bottom was an item strangely familiar to me, which hadn't been checked off. It was a canceled ticket from Woodhaven Ballroom. All at once, I realized why it was familiar. The sign I'd been half conscious of on top of the big squat building across the street read, Woodhaven Ballroom, closed tonight. On a hunch, I dug for Helen Palmer's list. Yeah, Ibarra was right. Everything but a night watchman's badge and one detective private had been checked off. And that gave me half of the switch I knew I had to show up. I ran to my car and headed for that southern mansion in the Hollywood Hills. In the end of a very complicated frolic. And with every turn of the road, I gave myself another whack for being such a nearsighted sucker. When I got there, the big house on Magnolia Terrace was dark except for a light in the servants' quarters. I stepped down the block, walked back, and edged around to the patio where the garage, the hothouse, and the king-size barbecue loomed only as shapeless lumps of shadow. I stood still and watched. And I saw him move, walking slowly, gun in hand along the fence toward the hothouse. I started toward him quietly, just as he found out what he was looking for. Oh, you're clever, my dear. But it's all over now. I know you're in there, so come on out with your hands up. Oh, no. You're hanging yourself for murder right now, Larry Sample. I've got all the proof I need. I don't know what good it'll do you, Rhonda. I'll never pay you a cent for it, you blackmailing tramp. I'll kill you first. And that protection letter you wrote to your lawyers was returned, darling. I found it accidentally in Helen's purse tonight at the party. So no one will know. Now, come on out, or I'm going in after you. I wouldn't try that if I were you, Sample. Marlowe's due here any minute now. He called me and told me. That was I, dear. You? I used his name when I talked to the maid. Oh, I should have done this myself in the first place instead of trusting that stupid Murdoch. Are you going to come out of there? No, and I've got a gun. You can't see me, and I know it. But your white dress makes a perfect target, you little fool. Drop it, Sample. Oh. 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 
Now let's have that gun. Well, I'm so glad you got here. It, no, no, he... he's not dead. Oh. And he won't be from bullets. Give me your gun, too, huh? Come on. All right. I, I was too scared to use it anyway. Thanks. Now sit down and shut up. We're going to wait for Lieutenant Ibarra, then you're both going to the pokey. What? Listen, you, I don't go for blackmailers, male or female. Even the cute ones are ugly, lady. Very ugly. Oh, Phil, wait. You've got to understand something. Two years ago, Larry Sample killed his partner, Joshua Claiborne. I knew it, but I couldn't prove it. So I pretended I could and blackmailed him. Don't you see? If he paid off or, or tried to kill me, that would be proof of his guilt. And he did, Marlowe. Mm-hmm. Why should you pull a stunt like that? I'm a divorcee, Marlowe. Langley is only my married name. Okay, so what? My maiden name was Claiborne. Claiborne? I'm Josh Claiborne's daughter. Oh. And I can prove that. Is that reason enough? Well, why didn't you level with me instead of labeling Helen a blackmailer? Well, Helen was already dead. And I needed your help desperately. I thought I had to lie to get it. Okay? Yeah. Okay, baby. <laughs> Anyone care for more coffee? How about you, Lieutenant? Oh, no thanks, Mr. Grover. <clears throat> well, Marlowe, you got it all to come out even anyway. <laughs> Frankly, that's more than I expected, and I left you at that gas station. Yeah, yeah, we were lucky, Burr. I, um, I guess I owe you an apology, Mr. Grover. Oh, shucks, it's all right, son. It was a shock to me to be accused of poor Helen's murder, but, well, it's over now. Yeah. Um... You said it was the scavenger list that set you straight. How'd you figure that, boy? Well, there was a Woodhaven ballroom ticket on Rhonda's list, so she had to go there for the ticket, you see. Ah? Uh-huh. A sample knew that. And he told his killer, Murdoch, coincidentally, he hired the murder Claiborne two years ago, that the girl who went to the Woodhaven ballroom was his target. Ah. Uh-huh. But Helen happened to go there after the night watchman's badge. Which he could have picked up any place in town. Yeah. A terrible coincidence for Helen. That that was all that saved my life, really. That's right, honey. Murdoch made the mistake, and when he and Sample discovered it, they made another try at Rhonda's house. But I caught Murdoch there, so Sample shot him before he could talk. And when I left, he followed me in his car. I knew they were after me, and I thought for sure they'd killed you, Phil. That's why I ran. Yeah. That threw me for a loop. And Sample came back to make sure that Murdoch was dead and sold me a great big bill of goods at the same time. Ah, it's a terrible, terrible thing. Yes, Mr. Grover, it is. Uh, Lieutenant, I want to thank you personally for your participation. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, I've got everything I need, so I'll say good night. Yeah, me too. Hey, I... Phil? <clears throat> yes? Yeah? Shall I mail you a check? Why, yes, I, I think... Uh... No, 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 wait a minute. Yes? Yeah. You know, honey, with uh, with your knowledge of postal rates, so uh, why don't you uh, just deliver it in person, maybe? Huh? <laughs> Love to. Count on it, Mr. Marlowe. Good night. I drove down from the Hollywood Hills with a check warming my wallet and the echo of a soft invitation warming my imagination. You know, that was quite a party at Grover's house. (laughs) Scavenger hunt. People determined to have a good time even if it killed them. You know what? It did. I know another game. Associations. It goes like this. Grover's party. Rhonda Langley. Rhonda... Hmm... Date. Hmm. I wonder if she likes baseball. They were born at the same hour on the same day of the same parents. And they were identical in beauty and talent. Only one was deadly, but the other was not. And I couldn't tell which was which until I found a green purse, a fresh corpse, and a pair of dancing hands. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character as CBS presents... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now... 
with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Dancing Hands. The telegram I found stuck in the mail slot when I got back to my office after a long and roundabout day read, Enclosed find a $50 money order. I want you to investigate a man. The table is reserved for you at the Saddle Club where I work. Come in time for the second show at 11, important. It was signed Beth Tyler. So at a quarter to 11, with 50 bucks worth of inspiration behind me, I drove over the Coenga Freeway and out Ventura to the Saddle Club, which pretended to be old English by showing its beams through a flagstone facade. I went in the carefully rough-hewn oak door, and even before my eyes became adjusted to the cozy lack of candle power inside... Neil Redmond, owner and operator of the place, glided toward me, sporting his genial host smile, which tonight was even more forced than usual. How are you, Marlo? It's been a long time. Business a pleasure, Phil. It's always a pleasure to come to the Saddle Club, Neil. I've even got a reservation. You know my food better than that, Marlo. Uh-huh. Aha. <laughs> Just don't let it get it rough, will you? Come on, I'll find your table out front. I want you to see this show. A pair of twins in a twin piano act that's sensational. Yeah? Edie and Beth Tyler. Oh, here, how's this? Fine. Incidentally, uh, Edie will be the one on the left. Well, they're twins, what's the difference? Funny. Edie may be Mrs. Redmond one of these days. Well, oh. Mrs. Redmond, but you are wanted on the phone, sir. I uh, Get the number, George, and I'll call back. This gentleman said you would talk to him, sir. It is uh, Mr. Paul Cedar. Paul Cedar. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Excuse me, Marlo, uh, this is important. Redmond reacted to the name Cedar like a punch in the nose. But I figured that was none of my business, which was more than I could say for a flabby, dull-faced character at the next table who followed the nightclub owner all the way out of the room with a pair of watery red eyes, which he deliberately avoided turning in my direction. But at that point, an MC stepped out on the stage, and so I stopped worrying about Flabby in favor of the first look at my client. The Saddle Club is proud to present its second show of the evening, featuring the incomparable piano stylist, Edie and Beth in Dancing Hands. Here they are, ladies and gentlemen, bring them up. Ah! Curtains parted on a stage set with an oversized full-length mirror which reflected a grand piano, a black vase of yellow flowers and a tall brunette with a wry, crisp waistline who touched up a piled-high hairdo, put on a pair of long black gloves, checked her hemline and sat down at the piano. And she ran through an involved arpeggio while her reflection in the mirror looked on in admiration. It was an old but cute routine. And the illusion was perfect because the Tyler twins were practically identical. I took another look at Flabby, whose face was pushed up in a nasty leer. He stood up, dropped his cigarette into his drink, and tossed a crumpled bill down on the table, just as the lights went out for the trick part of the act. On the dark stage, two pairs of purple hands danced over two glowing silver keyboards. It would have been good, except that the pair of hands on the right, which belonged to Beth, suddenly stopped in midair and hit blue notes like a nine-year-old at her first recital. When the lights came up again, my client's face was as white as middle C, and the flabby character oozing a victorious smile was on his way to the door. Well, they wrapped it up fast after that, and Beth ran into the wings, leaving Edie to take the bow alone. The band took over in a hurry and brought things down to normal. So as couples moved down to the dance floor and George the waiter headed to my table, I sat back and waited for that message from my client. Compliments of the house. Oh, thanks. Any message with this? No, sir. Just that Mr. Redman had to leave. Oh, thanks, George. I sipped the double scotch and wondered if I should take the initiative and contact my client. When the message I'd been waiting for came, good and loud. I jumped up, shoved my way through the gaping dancers to the dressing room hallway behind the stage. A gang of club personnel was bunched in front of a door, obviously locked. Labeled Edie and Beth Tyler. Hey, it was one of the twins, wasn't it? Hey, what's the matter? It's one of the twins. She's screaming. We gotta get in. Uh, that door's locked. Break it down. Uh, but get I, out I, of the I, way. It's Edie. It's Edie. All right, no, wait, a minute. wait a minute. Hold it. She's all right. Clear out and give her a chance. Come on. Outside, everybody. Beat it. That means you two. Come on. Out. <laughs> Here, Miss Tyler, take it easy. You're all right now. Come on, sit down. Tell me what happened. I don't know for sure. I was worried about Beth. I came back and didn't see her anywhere. Then I heard a noise in here. It was dark. I came in and, and someone grabbed me. A man? Yes. I don't know who it was. Mm-hmm. I screamed. He knocked me down. Then locked the door. Got out through the window there. 
were you? Well, I'm Philip Marlowe, a private detective. Your sister hired me to investigate a guy. I was to meet her here after your number and find out about it. Any idea what's that? No, I can't imagine. But, gee, Beth has been terribly upset ever since last night. Oh? What happened last night? Well, for one thing, my purse was stolen. Mm -hmm. But I I don't see why that should upset her. Gee, there was nothing in it but $12 and my makeup stuff. Where's Beth now, do you know? No. I haven't seen her since she ran off the stage. I'm not even sure she came in here. No, she was here, all right. She dropped one of her gloves. You're still wearing both of yours. Where do you girls live? Maybe she went home. Well, Beth has a cottage out on Hazeltine. 4179. You don't live together? How come? Well, gee, Mr. Marlowe, just working with Beth is hard enough. She's so sarcastic. <laughs> okay, I'll wear my thick skin. Uh, one more thing, Miss Tyler. Do you happen to know where Neil went? Neil's gone? Mm-hmm. Gee, that's funny. He always stays till the place closes. Oh, he must be coming right back. I'll take a look. Then I'm going out to see your sister. Sarcasm and all. I spent ten minutes questioning the help on the whereabouts of the boss and got nothing but double talk for answers. So since I was still carrying Beth's glove around with me, I dropped it in my pocket and went outside to my car. I'd opened the door and slid far enough under the wheel so I couldn't back out before I realized that the dough-faced flab was already there on the seat. His right hand wrapped around something blunt and menacing in his sloppy jacket pocket. You better come on in. What are you doing in my car, blubber boy? Don't get sassy now, mister. And the name is Sippy. That's no improvement and that's no answer. All right. I, uh, saw you inside making with the big talk, so I says to myself, he's an interested party. I should look him up. Maybe we can do business together. All right, stay over there. What kind of business? I'm particular about the gutters I crawl in. It has to do with the twins inside there. You can get in touch with me later for further details. I got an angle, mister. You'll see when I leave. Yeah? When you tried to work that angle, you got to the wrong twin in the dressing room. Do you know that? I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sippy, where can I reach you? You'll find out if you really know what's up. <coughs> Don't try to follow me, though. I'll be seeing you. When Sippy slid out of the car and beat it, I made one move after him and then stopped cold. Because lying on the seat where he'd been sitting was a green leather handbag with the name Edie etched on it. I snapped it open. It had been stripped of everything but the scent of Amir and a smudged slip of paper that read, Number 9 Arrow Motel, Lancashire Boulevard. So that was Sippy's address, and he had the stolen purse. But the why of all the commotion over 12 missing bucks was still the number one question mark. And I figured the best place for an answer to it was at Beth Tyler's. So I drove out to Hazeltine. But even before I stopped at number 4179, I heard the piano. I walked to the door and stood there a moment, listening. I eased it open. Slipped inside. Soft, indirect lighting accented the figure of the girl at the piano. The little waves of iridescent crimson chased themselves over the smooth, satin gown as she played. Glossy, blue-black hair fell to her shoulders. Beside her, a burning cigarette sent a single plume of smoke into the still air. Just for a moment, I found it difficult to remember that she was my client. <clears throat> You're... you're looking better, Beth. You're Philip Marlowe, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I dropped by to return your glove, among other things. Just put it there on the table. With the other one. Where did you get it, Marlowe? In your dressing room at the club. Your sister tangled with an unidentified man who was hiding there after you left. While we were on that, why'd you shove off so fast? I was scared. How'd you know I'd find you? You're a detective. Remember? Mm hmm Look, if you want to burn up your retainer playing hide-and-seek, it's your business. Now, who's the guy you want me to check on? The flabby one who made you blow up tonight? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Why? Because I think my sweet twin sister is mixed up in something a little more serious than her usual scatterbrain escapades. Hmm. And the flabby guy is in on it because he has a green purse, right? How did you know that? He left it with me. 
name is Sippy. He lives at the Arrow Motel, number nine. Knows something worthwhile about this business, and he's anxious to sell it. All of which puts him a hop, skip, and a jump ahead of your detective. Now tell me, why is everybody, including Neil Redman, all wound up over one stolen purse? What's it all about, baby? I don't know. Baby. Suppose you find out and tell me. Wouldn't have anything to do with the fact that Neil loves your sister and you love Neil, would it? Marlowe, I hired you to investigate a man. Not to pry into my personal affairs. And you'll get more for your money if you stop holding out on me. It's my money. Besides, I'm not holding out. Believe me. I'll try. Real hard. Well, as soon as I've got something, I'll call you. Where are you going now? Uh, my retainer entitles me to know, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does. First to the club to find Redmond and get his side of it, and then I'll probably drop in on our chum, Sippy, at the Arrow Motel on Lancashire. Good. I'll, uh, keep a light in the window for you. Oh, sweet. <laughs> also keep your door locked. From the inside, baby. As I drove down the dark, winding street toward Ventura Boulevard, I caught a flash in the rearview mirror of a station wagon behind me. It looked like a tail, so I opened up. But it stayed with me. When it swung out into the left lane to pass, it suddenly cut in front of me. I jammed on the brakes as a spotlight slashed at my eyes, and when my front wheel banged against the curb, I was already half out of the car. Stop right where you are, fella. Don't come one inch closer, or I'll drop you. <laughs> I switched off the spotlight and I saw a face the texture of a doormat over an embroidered purple shirt and orange tie. He had hand-tooled high-heeled boots on and was topped off by a ten-quart cream-colored Stetson. But the doormat face was grim and the silver-barreled cold pistol in his hand looked right at home. I followed you up here from the saddle club. I don't know what your game is or why you're messing around and what don't concern you, but I aim to find out mighty quick, so start talking. Okay. First, I resent being crowded off the road. Second, I resent a spotlight in my face. And third, I don't like pistols pointed at my stomach. So cool off, Jesse James. You're wasting your time and mine. You got it wrong there, friend. Paul Cedar don't waste his time, and you're going to find that out. Paul Cedar? Huh? Yeah. Don't tell me you're all excited over a stolen purse with 12 bucks in it. $12? Yeah. Listen, clown, there's 30 grand missing somewhere between Redman and me, and I'm going to get it. 30,000? Yeah. Redman's a high roller, and that's okay with me. But he lost it fair and square in my joint over in Nevada, and I've been holding his markers much too long. So if I have to chalk that dough off to experience, it's going to be a pretty unpleasant experience for a certain party. Get me? Yeah, I get you. But you're shoving the wrong way, Longhorn. Somebody's trying to make a fool out of me, bright boy. And I don't stand for that. I'm liable to shove a lot of ways. And hard. So don't get underfoot. Now you're sure to get stepped on. So long, dude. <laughs> just a moment, we'll return to the second act of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But first, tomorrow marks the anniversary of an important event in American history, the signing of the first peace treaty between the Indians and the Plymouth colonists. In commemoration of these events, CBS's Sunday night stars, Amos and Andy, will be found with a kingfish burying the hatchet deeper than ever in their hopes and dreams. And CBS's own Jack Benny will be back again tomorrow with his special guest, Van Johnson. Invite some friends over. Sit back and enjoy the Jack Benny program. You can hear Amos and Andy every Sunday on most of these same CBS network stations and Jack Benny over them all. Now, with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Dancing Hands. The Texan from Nevada galloped off in his t trusty station wagon. I forgot all about Neil Redmond and headed instead for Sippy and his further details at the Arrow Motel on Lancashire, where Bungalow 9 turned out to be an all-alone green and white collection of clapboard that showed light, a half-open door, and nobody home to my knock. When I tried knuckles on wood again and still got only a faint echo for reply, I stepped inside. There in the center of an ivory-white throw rug and clamoring for attention like an only child at a family reunion was a wide and wet circle of red. From there, the ugly splotches that narrowed as they got farther away trailed off until, finally, in the next room, the path ended where I expected it to. The quiet form of Skippy, sprawled over an upset chair and holding his hands tight against the red on his left side. When I got to him, he was going fast. Thirty grand. A lot of 
dough. Didn't know I was shooting that high. And the, the twins... The twins... Well, one what, Sippy? One of them. Did one of them do this? One. To... He's dead, isn't he, Marlo? Yeah. Yeah, Redmond, he's very dead. Oh, no, Marlo. I only found him a few seconds before you did. Yeah, and the rest of that run, you heard someone coming, you didn't want to be seen, so you ducked back out of sight, huh? I don't buy it, Redmond, because for one thing, it's too pat. For another, how do you explain being here in the first place? Come on, fast. Okay, I'm here because I'm on a nasty jack. Like what? Like $30,000 I've got to pay in the next hour to a guy named Paul Cedar who's running out of patience in a hurry, believe me. About that, I do. I've already met the gentleman. But right now, Redmond, we're talking about Sippy. Okay. Last night I had things to do, so I gave Edie Tyler the money for the payoff to Cedar. A couple of minutes after she stepped out of the club, somebody roughed her up and got away with a purse and the 30 grand. You're a liar, Redmond. Edie herself told me that purse only had 12 bucks in it. How come? Simple like, Marlowe. In my business, you never yell copper too soon or too loud. It doesn't pay. Mm -hmm. Now look, for the third time, Redmond, you and Sippy, how do you figure? I don't know. He was at the club tonight acting funny. When he left, I got a glimpse of Edie's green purse sticking out of his topcoat pocket. Later on, I saw him run away from a car near the club, so I followed I ended up here a couple of minutes behind him, and that Marlowe was a truth, I swear. Would you do at the drop of a... Uh... Hey, wait a minute. Look, if you're telling the truth, I begin to get a different picture. And by that, I specifically mean a very talented but very sly dame named Beth Tyler. Oh, no, Marlowe. Why not? Because you love Beth's sister? Face it, Redmond, it doesn't add up any other way. Sippy here couldn't have stolen that purse from Edie. If he did, he'd have taken his dough and blown, not spent his time putting out feelers... But on the other hand, if Sippy happened to see Beth take it from Edie, empty it and toss it away, we've got another story, right? Yeah. Because he wouldn't make a move until he knew how much he had gotten away with. Exactly. But there he ran into trouble because he was trying to get close to Beth. And in doing that, he got mixed up and went for Edie instead, like tonight at the club. Sure. And that dying man's words just now about one twin. To which you can add the unpleasant fact that I personally ran off at the mouth when I was up at Beth's an hour ago. So she knew where to come for Sippy. Look, Redmond, it's got to run that way. I'm sure of it. Well, maybe you're right, Phil, but right or wrong, I'm still in the jam. So if you don't have any objections, I'm going back to my club now for a last try at raising that money again before Cedar shows. You mean you're going to face him, Neil, with or without her? I've got him, Marlo. You see, I own a fast club, all right, and I gamble a lot, too. But I don't welch on my markers no more than I knock over flabby little guys. You know what I mean, Phil? I think so. But don't fold now, Neil, because... I might still be lucky enough to catch up to Beth Tyler and your money both before your time runs out. And right now that means fast to a phone and a call to Edie who might know which way a runaway twin would head. I'll see you, Neil. Well, the nearest phone was at an all-night mobile gas station a block away. As I dialed Edie's number, a thought hit me. Maybe Beth wouldn't head anywhere. Maybe she'd just stick around. <laughs> Hello? Edie, this is Marlo. Seen anything of Beth? No, I haven't. But why? What is it, Marlo? Well, from where I stand, two things. First, your sister has the $30,000 and $12 that was in your purse last night. Oh? And second, she's just about it for a sloppy around the edges murder. Oh. Now, look, have you any idea where Beth would head if she had to get out of town in a hurry? No, I don't, Marlo. Oh, well, maybe somebody up around her place does. I'll call you later. Marlo, wait. Are... Are you sold on this? I mean, about the things you said Beth did? Just about, Edie. But for your sake, let's hope I'm wrong. All the way, honey. Goodbye. <laughs> Driving fast back toward Beth's place on Hazeltine still left me enough time to think about a not-too-small detail that I'd completely overlooked. Thanks to me, the entire Los Angeles Police Department knew nothing about what was going on in and around the Saddle Club. Five minutes later, when I had parked away from the dock and obviously deserted number 4179, I had walked back and around to a pair of uncurtained French doors at the side. I knew that oversight is what is generally called a blunder. But in the next second, I knew it was nothing compared to the one I was making currently. If you so much as turn your head again, Marlowe, I'll kill you. Not like you did Sippy, please, Beth. I'd hate to go that way. Sippy was a mistake, Marlowe, believe me. I was rushed. So you shot and ran, huh? Yes. But I didn't run too far, because from where I stood, I could hear and see both you and Redmond and talking the whole thing over. 
And when you knew that we'd caught on to your act, you decided to follow me and see where I was going before you made your next move. Is that it? Exactly. Now get inside. Go on, the door's unlocked. Mm. All right. Now get over there, near that closet, and don't turn around. Why not? Afraid of the look on my face when you shoot? Shut up, Marlowe. And stop being brave. Because unless I have to, I'm not going to kill you. After all, you've already served your purpose. Which I presume was getting mixed up in this mess just long enough to find out about Sippy for you. You presume correctly. Mm -hmm. Also, you talk too much. Now open that closet and get inside. All right. Go on. As you say. But first, baby, one question. Did you do all this for the 30 grand alone? Or does it tie in with Neil Redmond and the way he feels about your sister, Edie? It's a little bit of each, Marlowe. But as I said, you talk too much. So get in there and shut up. Getting out of Beth Taylor's half-inch thick old closet was like arguing with an umpire. You couldn't be subtle. So 20 tiring minutes went by and the heels on both my feet were numb before the paneling finally gave in and I was out and over to the telephone to put in a call to the police. It should have been made a long time ago. But then, even as I was halfway through dialing the numbers... I saw something on an end table nearby that made me slowly change my mind. It was the two black gloves that Beth wore in the Dancing Hands Act. And while I stared at them like they were alive and beckoning, I thought hard for what must have been a full minute. And then suddenly I knew that my next stop had to be the Saddle Club. As I parked at the Saddle Club, I saw light drifting out of Neil's office, which was something I had expected. Inside, I moved along a dark hall toward what I knew would be the trio of Neil Redmond, the Nevada Texan, and Eddie Tyler. All right, Redmond. The raucous this voice of Paul time. Cedar was anything but happy. How stupid you think I am? Oh, oh, that Cedar, I'm telling the truth. Edie had the 30 grand, but somebody got it from her when she was on her way to you. That's a stinking line. You know it, Redmond. You never had the money. This whole thing's been a frame to stall me. And one way or another, I'm going to get you to admit that. No, you're not, Cedar. Uh, and if you don't drop that gun now, you're never going to do anything ever. Come on, let it go. Uh, All right. Now sit down and shut up and listen hard because Redmond's telling you the truth. What? Marlowe, you know where the money is? That's right. And I also know who took it. Less than an hour ago, a little after I called you, Edie, Beth caught up to me and confessed the whole shebang, exactly as we figured it, Neil. You mean she admitted getting the money from Edie and using you to locate Sippy? That's right. But there's only one drawback to everything she admitted. None of it's true. What do you mean, Marlowe? I mean, Cedar, that Beth Tyler didn't steal your money from Edie here any more than she killed Sippy. I also mean that as far as I can tell, Beth Tyler was nothing more than a girl who played the piano and got upset when a stranger named Sippy started to bother her. That I never saw the real Beth Tyler after she ran away from a piano in the club tonight. That she's dead and that you, Edie, have been posing as Beth all night because, one, you yourself stole Neil's money and, two, you murdered your sister as well. No! Yes, Edie, come on, admit it, it's true. No, no, it isn't. I... I guess it isn't that, Marlowe. In Beth's body? In our dressing room. In the closet. I didn't want to kill her. But she found out that I had only pretended to be robbed when there was no one around. And that Sippy had seen me scream and get rid of the purse myself. Sippy, who was only trying to muscle in on a deal, went to her by mistake, huh? Yes. That's how she knew what I'd done. When she confronted me in the dressing room, just before you came in and said that she wouldn't stand by and let me do a thing like that to Neil. I lost my temper. You killed her, Edie. Yes, I did, Neil. And when Marlowe showed up after a scream, I said that someone had attacked me. And then I pretended to be both Beth and myself from there on to get out of the whole thing. And I... I almost did. But... But now I'm so sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> A couple of bad hours went by before the police had everybody's story, and Paul Cedar and the 30,000 was gone for Nevada, and Edie was gone for good. That left just Neil Redman and me alone and standing near the main bar in the club. <laughs> He was doing his best to stay all in one piece. Well, Marlowe's got a tough night for you, hasn't he? Yeah, but a tough one for you, Neil. What with Cedar and the money and the girls, Marlowe? Yeah. Yeah. At least it came out right before the cowboy got too tough, thanks to you. 
So tell me, Phil, how'd you know that Beth was dead and that Edie was both people all along? That was a couple of gloves, Neil, the ones they wore in their dancing hands act. You see, when I first met Edie in the dressing room, she was wearing hers, and one of Beth's was on the floor. Hey, pour me one, will you? Yes, yes. Okay. I took it, and later when I met what I thought was Beth, I returned it, and she put it with what we both thought was its mate. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. But a little while ago, when I got close to the gloves again, I saw that that couldn't be, that they were both for the left hand, Neil. Ah. Then when Edie went to Beth's place to pass herself off as her sister, who she had already killed, she was smart enough to know that she should have only one glove around. Yeah, but not smart enough to think about which glove it should be. From there, I worked backwards. Until you got to the three of us at the club and tried what you knew might be the right answer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, you were right, Phil, all the way. Yeah, but I was still gambling. If I had been wrong, Neil, I was giving the real Beth a long head start. Mm. It's always that way when you gamble, Phil. I know. Sometimes you pick right, sometimes wrong. Mm -hmm. Cards, dice. (laughs) Even with twins. Good night, fella. When I finally got to my car, started out of the valley and back toward Hollywood, it was better than 8 o'clock in the morning. And here and there as I drove, I... I saw people who I'd never heard of and who, well, who'd never heard of me, stumbling outside after their morning papers. And I got to wondering what they were going to think when they read about a girl who had killed both a twin sister in a nightclub and a flabby guy in a motel who wasn't much good. Well, it was hard to say. And for myself, I was too tired to think. Or maybe I just didn't want to. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Lou Krugman, Ed Begley, Paul Fries, and Bert Holland. The special music is by Richard Orant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... When it started, it was simple. Just a lawsuit for damages. But before it was over, it was far from simple, and the damages were murder. All because of a red-headed woman, a ghost rider with ambition and a match that burned with a bright green flame. <laughs> Didn't think I'd make that one, did you, Sam? No. Think I'll be the club's billiard champion this year? If you play this way, Roger. But will I? That's the question. Here, see if you can make the same shot. How how silly can you get? Well, I'll try. Ah, Missed. Didn't look easy, and it wasn't. If you want to see a hard one, watch this. You're trying to make me feel worse than I do already. What I'm trying to do is make myself feel better. Watch. That's what reverse English does for you. Here now, you try it. See if you can. No, I've had enough, Roger. Hey, hey, Sam. Nice boys don't throw cue sticks on the floor. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, but it's no use, Roger. What's no use? I can't stop thinking. I, I can't stop wondering who I was and what I did before I came to town. Look, Sam, you've been talking about that now for ten years. Will you cut it out before you give everybody the creeps and drive yourself crazy? I can't. Lately, it's been getting worse. Listen, I'm Sam Fisher now, but I wasn't before I lost my memory. Roger, don't you understand why I'm so jumpy? I came to this city a little over ten years ago with no memory of who I was or where I'd been or what I'd done. I had an accident. And I woke up in Kansas City, and I didn't know my name. No one did or where I'd come from. They just found me in the streets. 
Unconscious. So what, Sam? Everybody knows who you are now. You're a happily married man, an important business executive, one of the city's best-dressed men. But I've got to know who I was. I've got to. I'm sorry, Roger. I've, I've got to get out of here. This, this place is getting on my nerves. I'm, I'm going to get some air. Don't go too far away, Sam. <laughs> Mrs. Fisher, please. Speaking. Oh, Rita. I didn't recognize your voice. This is Roger. Oh. I'm in the billiard room at the club. Your husband just walked out on me. Oh, is poor darling Sam upset again? Upset? That obsession of his is driving him out of his mind. Oh, the poor dear. Yeah. Isn't it a shame? <laughs> <laughs> shame it's taken him this long to begin to crack. Uh, pretty soon, Rita, we can do exactly what we planned. And now on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Now let me get this straight, Mr. Fisher. You don't think you're really Sam Fisher? No, Blackie. How can I be? Just the name I gave myself when I came to after an accident in Kansas City ten years ago. I see. Well, why did you pick that particular name? It, it might have some bearing on your past. No, I'm, I'm afraid it doesn't. You see, I call myself Sam Fisher because my doctor's name was Sam, and he was an excellent fisherman. Well, that takes care of that. Tell me this. How much effort have you made to find out who you were before you became Sam Fisher? None. I was afraid to. Afraid to? Why? Well, somewhere in the back of my mind, I had a vague memory that I'd done something wrong. Mm -hmm. But it was just a glimmer of a memory, so faint it never took shape, never, never gave me an inkling of my past. But it's always with me, always haunting me, poking at my conscience... Blackie, I, I just can't stand it much longer. So you want to find out who you were, where you've been, and what you did before you became Sam Fisher? Yes, I've got to. I've got to know no matter how terrible the truth is. Mr. Fisher, why are you so convinced that you did something wrong before you had that accident? Why do you think that? I just think it, that's all. I can't help it. It's there in my mind. Blackie, you've helped others. I know you can help me. I'll give you all the assistance I can. But how can you help me when your memory stops with that accident ten years ago? Tell you something I've told only to Mrs. Fisher and a few of my closest friends. It's about a dream I have. A fantastic dream that I have almost every night. I oh, Excuse me. Hello. I'd like to speak to Mr. Fisher, please. I understand he's there. This is Mrs. Fisher. Oh, just a minute. Uh, this is your wife, Mr. Fisher. Oh, thank you. Yes, Rita? Oh, Sam, I hope I've called you in time. The maid said you left for Boston Blackies an hour ago. How much have you told him? Well, not very much of anything, dear. You sound awfully upset. What's the matter? Well, Roger just phoned. He's found out something about you. Before the accident? Yes, Sam, and it's awful. Don't tell anybody anything, not until you've seen Roger. He's found out something about me. Yes. What? What did he find out? I don't want to talk about it over the phone. Roger will tell you. He's waiting for you at the club. Now get down there right away. All right, dear, I will. Right away. Well, that sounded important and encouraging. Blackie, I'm sorry, but... I'll have to leave. Well, leave? But you were just about to tell I'm me about... I'm sorry, Blackie, but I can't tell you anything now. Wait a minute, Fisher. Do you... I don't think I'll... I'll need your help. I... I don't think anybody can help me now. So I was right about myself, Roger. I was a murderer before I lost my memory. Well, it isn't positive, Sam. There's only an indication that you were. I'm... I'm checking it further. Ah, you get in a cab and go home to Rita. How can I? Murder. Well, no, I don't know for sure yet, Sam. Don't you understand? When will you know? It'll take a little while. I want to check slowly and carefully. Here, there's a cab waiting at the stand. Taxi! Hey, Roger. Let me help you check up on this thing. No, no, Sam. You stay out of it. If not for your own sake, for Rita's. Well, you, you'll let me know your progress, won't you? If I make any. Now I'll get in the cab. Go on home and don't worry. Don't worry. I won't sleep till you find out the truth, Roger. Find it out soon, will you? As soon as I can. Night, Sam. Night, Roger. Thank you for everything. Bye, Sam. <laughs> You're a nice guy, Sam. You'll live a long and happy life, I imagine. But you'll never be seen again. <laughs> Mrs. 
Mrs. Fisher, the Missing Persons Bureau can't go out looking for every man and woman who stays away from home overnight. But you don't seem to understand, Lieutenant Martin. My husband's never done this before. And he was terribly upset last night when he got into that cab. I know something's happened to him. Why are you so sure? Because it's something he was afraid of. He thinks he has amnesia. That he's not really Sam Fisher at all, but someone else. A killer, maybe. Are you talking about the same Sam Fisher I'm thinking about, Miss Fisher? He's the Sam Fisher who was voted one of the city's best-dressed men this year. Well, we're talking about the same man. Oh, then, I don't have to describe him for you, do I? Oh, no, I know what he looks like. Well, he won't be hard to find, Miss Fisher, if he's really missing, which I doubt. Oh, but I think he is. I know he is. He's probably run away or suddenly become the person he was before he lost his memory. Hmm. Oh, it might be. You say he was last seen getting into a cab in front of his club? Yes. By Roger Ainsley, a friend of his. Uh-huh. Had, uh, had your husband done anything out of the ordinary yesterday? Well, no. No, but he was especially upset about himself, though, when he went to Boston Blackie for help in finding out about his past. Went to see Boston Blackie, huh? Yes. Did he see Blackie? Yes, I phoned him, and he was talking to Blackie then. All right. I think I'll call Inspector Faraday. He might be interested in this. Oh. Why, Lieutenant? Do you think Blackie might have something to do with my husband's disappearance? Well, I don't know, Miss Fisher. I'm just checking that angle as a possibility. Oh, I see. Faraday speaking. Hello, Inspector. This is Lieutenant Martin over in Missing Persons. Oh, hello, Martin. <laughs> you found anything lately? <laughs> No, we just lost one. Yeah? Sam Fisher, last seen getting into a taxi outside the Arnicle Club. Arnicle Club, huh? Yes, I know that doesn't interest you, Faraday, but this might. Fisher was up to see your friend Blackie the evening he disappeared. Up to see Blackie, huh? Well, this is more interesting to me than you think. It ties in with a case the homicide department's just started work on. I can follow your missing Mr. Fisher's tracks step by step, Martin. You can? Sure. He left Blackie, went to his club... Took a taxi from his club to the waterfront, and then disappeared. How do you know he went to the waterfront? Because we just found the cab he took. The cabbie's report shows his last stop was the Arnicle Club. The cabbie described Fisher as his passenger? The cabbie wasn't in condition to describe anything. He was dead. Strangled with a necktie. And I think I can tie Boston Blackie into this, too. <laughs> you guys finish with those pictures and let's get that body out of here maybe you guys like the salt air of the waterfront but i get seasick on a park lake so i'll make it snappy hello there inspector faraday hello lieutenant martin fine blackie yeah here he is yes here i am faraday and here you are and here's a dead body and here's where i solve another case for you ho hum i'll ho hum you i know who killed this guy blackie it was sam fisher the lovely red and green tie around the cabbie's neck came from around fisher's neck only it fits the cabbie's neck a little too tightly huh yeah and you know why Fisher killed this cab driver and where Fisher is now. Well, do you or don't you? Don't I, Faraday? <laughs> Say, uh, by the way, Faraday, keep away from the waterfront or you'll wind up mounted on some fisherman's living room wall. And don't try to get me connected with this. All I know is Fisher came to me for help last evening. He thought he was suffering from amnesia and he wanted me to find out who he was before his mind went blank. And what else? There's no more else, Faraday. He got a phone call from his wife and then beat it out of my apartment. I haven't done anything on the case because I was out with Mary last night. Good. Now you can go out with her again right now. I just wanted to hear your story. I know what happened here. Fisher has run away. He killed this cabbie so he couldn't tell... Which we... way he went. That's a nice theory. Few inspector shows remarkable logic. But as usual, it's wrong. Because you say so? No. Because the green and red necktie says so. It was found twisted around the cab driver's neck, right? So? So somebody twisted it around his neck. Chances are somebody was wearing the necktie, took it off, and strangled the driver. That's right. Somebody named Sam Fisher. Who, if memory serves me, was one of the city's best-dressed men. What's that got to do with him not killing this guy here? Fisher wouldn't wear a tie like that green and red thing Faraday. It's monstrous. He wouldn't be found dead wearing it, much less use it on somebody else who's found dead. Some... That's what I like about you, Blackie. You keep saying that you're always helping me, and the first thing you do always is complicate things. If Fisher didn't kill the cab driver, who killed him? I don't know, Faraday, but as long as I told you who didn't, I might just as well try to find out who did.
And now, back to Boston Blackie. Wealthy and prominent Sam Fisher recovered from an accident ten years ago, but suffered loss of memory. When his friend Roger Ainsley tells Fisher that he has made a mild discovery about the years before the loss of memory, Fisher gets into a cab and is not seen again. But the cab is found, and so is the driver, dead. Strangled with a necktie. As we return to our story, Boston Blackie talks to the missing man's friend, Roger Ainsley. Mrs. Fisher tells me you're one of her husband's closest friends, Mr. Ainsley. Man, his greatest admirer, Blackie. Oh, why shouldn't I be? I had a little two-by-four business eight years ago, and look at my office today. Thanks to the contacts I made through Sam Fisher. Apparently, you're indebted to him, yes. Perhaps you can help us find him. Well, I don't know how... He's still missing, and the cab driver who took him to the waterfront is dead. You put Fisher into that cab, didn't you? Yes. Did you get a good look at the driver? No, I didn't, Blackie. It was dark, and besides, all cab drivers look alike to me. Do the police really think Sam killed that cabbie? They think so, but I don't. That wasn't Fisher's necktie found around the cab driver's neck. It wasn't his type of tie, and it wasn't expensive enough for him. Well, I will say Sam had expensive taste in clothes. And good, too. Do you remember what Fisher was wearing when he got into that cab? Yes, I do. A blue double-breasted pinstripe suit. It was his newest. Yes. Yes, that's right. He wore it up to my place. And that's further proof Fisher didn't kill that driver. He never... Well, never in the world would he wear a green and red tie with blue. And he wasn't wearing it when I saw him. Well, so much for Sam Fisher's present. What can you tell me about his past? Nothing. I've known him only since he came to town. That was about ten years ago. He never told me anything about his past because he didn't know anything about it himself. You believe he actually suffered from amnesia? I don't know. He told a convincing story, and he told it often. It's possible he did have amnesia. I'm sure of that. Well, that and the fact that he didn't kill that cabbie are the only things I'm sure of about this case. Thanks for your time, Ainsley. Don't mention it. Well, I will mention this. You may hear from me again. Well, you know where to reach me any time you want. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, sailor. Sailor? Hey, what's the matter with you landlubbers? Can't you steer a straight course? Well, sorry, maybe I thought I was plowing through mine water. Uh, Hello, Ainsley. Captain Dunn, what are you doing here? You don't know, Mr. Ainsley? (laughs) Well, you got a surprise coming. Look, you're a fool to come here. Boston Blackie was just here. If he saw you, he might start putting things together. You said you'd stay on your ship until it pulled out. If everything went according to plan, Mr. Rainsley. Well, didn't it? You got your $5,000 to take Sam to China with you, didn't you? I did. <laughs> well, then what's wrong? I kept my part of the bargain and I left Sam lying on the wharf for you, just as I said I would. You did. Then what are you doing here, you fool? You realize somebody might get the connection between us and... And look, Sam was still there when you came ashore to get him, wasn't he? He didn't come to and walk away, did he? No, he didn't walk away. <laughs> he couldn't. And he didn't come to. He couldn't do that either. Hmm? Now, what did you hit him with? The broadside of a four-masted schooner? Well, no. Why? What do you mean? I mean, whatever you used, you hit him too hard. What? When I found him on the wharf, he was dead. Dead? No. Dead I. Dead as the wind in the Sargasso Sea, but I got rid of the body. <laughs> This wasn't in the plans. And it wasn't in my plans to have to get rid of a body either. So I've changed my price. (laughs) The $5,000 you give me is just a down payment for my services now. You better come aboard with $5,000 more. But I I don't have it. You don't have it, eh? (laughs) You better get it, landlubber. (laughs) You better get it. Rita, honey, Sam's dead and you're going to come into a fortune from his insurance alone. But I'm going to be careful how I spend it, Roger, darling. All right, pinch every penny of it until it squeals if you want it, but you've got to give me that $5,000 for Captain Dunn. You kill Sam, you pay Captain Dunn. I don't have it. Besides, I I didn't mean to kill Sam, it was an accident. I hit him too hard. You certainly did. Look, Rita, (laughs) what's the matter with you? Why don't you stop? You trying to get rid of me, too? No, I'm not. I'm trying not to get rid of $5,000. Yeah. You're willing to do anything to get rid of Sam. You thought it was wonderful. 
when I came up with the idea of telling Sam I knew something about his past. And then to see that he got lost for good, so it looked like he ran away. It was a brilliant plan, Roger. Brilliant. It was perfect. You were even going to write to him after Captain Dunn shanghaied him to China. You were going to tell him that we were sure he was a murderer, so we knew he'd stay away. And I was, but I'm not going to have to write to him now. You killed him. He's not in the mood for letters. Look, will you give me that $5,000 for Captain Dunn? That's all I ask. You killed my husband. That's something I didn't ask. All right, maybe I did kill him. I said, maybe I did. I don't know. All I know is that I got to the waterfront before him and his cab, and I did slug him. But I also know I didn't kill that cab driver. And I think you did. I did? Yeah. Why, Roger, yes, I don't know... you. That's it. You killed that driver. Only you and the cab driver knew my plans. <sighs> After all, he was well paid to take the long way around to the waterfront so I could get there first. But... You were the only one who knew where that cab driver would be and when. Well, what if I did? I had no reason to kill him. Oh, no? No. You killed him so he wouldn't tell that I paid him to drive Sam to the wharf. You killed him so that there'd be a murder involved in our scheme and I'd have to keep my mouth shut forever about it. You get out of here, Roger. Not yet, I won't. You knew when that driver would drop your husband off at the wharf. You waited up the road until the cab passed and then you hailed it. The driver and his cab were found just a little ways up the road from the wharf where Captain Dunn found Sam. You have a beautiful imagination, darling. <laughs> Too bad it imagines all the wrong things. Oh, yeah. All right, go ahead. Deny it if you want to. But that won't stop me from getting your money to keep the words out of Captain Dunn's mouth and us out of a jam. <laughs> Listen, Blackie, are you trying to make a beachcomber out of me? We've boarded two ships in this dock. And there are only three, Faraday, so come on, let's get aboard this one and find out what we're looking for. Or go home. I don't know why we're looking for anything down here. Do I have to tell you all over again? We're looking for the ship's captain that came to see Roger Ainsley this afternoon. Yes. So there's bound to be a connection between the sea captain and Ainsley. Because you think there's a connection between Ainsley and the disappearance of Sam Fisher. And the dead cab driver, too. Let's not forget him. Let's forget to go aboard this ship, and let's remember to go back uptown. Too late, Inspector. We talked our way right up the gangplank, and here There's we... nobody on deck. Let's go. Oh, but there's bound to be someone aboard. Hello? Hello, anybody home? Hey, who's there? That's the man, Faraday. That's the man who saw him see this afternoon. Yeah. Ahoy down there! Who's calling? I am, Captain. I want to talk to you. Hey, well, come up to my quarters. I'm pressing to go ashore. Thanks. Come on, Faraday, at these steps here. Blackie, if this is a wild goose chase... Oh, come I'll... on now, Faraday. Want aboard a ship? Be nautical, if anything, we're on a wild gull chase. Throw that joke overboard, will you? And don't let go. Oh, you Faraday. You men want to see me? Uh, well, it's always proper to pay a visit to the captain of the ship when you invite yourself aboard, isn't it? Uh, you are the captain. Aye. Come in. Hmm. <laughs> you know me, I've seen you before. You have. You bumped into me just outside Roger Ainsley's office door this afternoon. Oh, so I did. <laughs> You're still steering a zigzag course. No, from now on I hope to go straight to port. Uh, this is Inspector Faraday of the Homicide Squad. Uh, how are you, matey? I'm Boston Blackie. I don't think you told us your name. Dunn. Harvey Dunn. What do you want aboard my ship? We'd like to know why you went to see Ainsley this afternoon. Personal business. I suppose you want to know why I'm wearing civilian clothes to go ashore tonight. <laughs> That's personal business, too. Anything else? No. But I wonder if you know a man was killed and another man disappeared in the vicinity of this wharf last night. Yes, I know. Heard it on the radio. Hmm. Yeah, nice new tie you have there, Captain. You got something on your mind, Blackie? Uh, that tie, Captain Dan. The rest of your short clothes are rather old. But the tie is new, brand new. You didn't leave your old one somewhere, did you? No. I threw it away. You threw it away? It flew down the road and wrapped itself around a cab driver's neck and choked him to death. Hey, Blanky, that red and green striped tie would be okay with the captain's suit, wouldn't it? Yes, Faraday, but it isn't okay with the captain that we've caught him with his Mike! tie. Mike! Henry! Come here! Mike! Henry! Here, Captain Dunn. Uh-oh, Faraday, these guys are big. Mike! Henry, get to work on these. I can't oh, right. All right, get out of here. You're in this too, Captain. Scram, Faraday, and get to a pole. I can't. I'm too busy. Oh, yeah. Come on, Captain. 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 Come on,
You all right, Barney? A little bruised, but still here. How about you? Present. And Dan and his slugging chums are all accounted for. Yeah. It was that table leg that accounted for little Mike there. It's a handy little gadget, table leg. I got Henry, boy, with an arm. My arm with a fist on the end of it. And look at our friend, the captain. He looks all at sea. Why don't you stop that? All right, Mr. Fisher, Mr. Mm. Ainsley. I'll see you in my office now. Oh, of course. All right. Thank you, Inspector Faraday. Oh, stop whistling that turkey in the straw. Oh, of course. Come on, come on. Oh. Well, what's the verdict, Inspector Faraday? I didn't kill anyone. Don't you let Roger say I did. He's lying. I am not lying. lying. You're himself. the one. That's, That's enough really of that, both of you. Well, Blanky, shall I tell him the bad news? Or would you like to? Well, I'll tell him this much, Faraday. Ainsley, Mrs. Fisher, we got a confession from Captain Dunn a moment ago. He killed both the cab driver and your husband, Mrs. Fisher. Mm. And you know I didn't do it. And I didn't. No, Ainsley. Fisher was very much alive when the captain found him on the wharf. Unconscious, but alive. You didn't hit him too hard. That's right. Now, here's what happened. Captain Dunn killed the cab driver first. He waited up the road near the wharf and hailed the cab. After it had been down to the dock to drop Fisher... The driver had brought Fisher to the wharf so that uh, you could get a slug out of Ainsley. Captain Dunn killed the cab driver to cover up the murder he was about to commit. A dead cab driver can't talk about his last passenger. But, um, why did Captain Dunn kill my husband? He thought he could get more money from Ainsley if Ainsley here thought that Sam had died from that blow on the head. Oh. It was a blow from the captain that killed him, though. So you two ought to be happy. You're not going to jail for murder. I know well, I'm that's happy. Something. Uh, don't let that become a habit. Neither you nor Mrs. Ainsley is in the clear. But why? Well, we didn't do anything. Well, of course not. All we did was... All you did was conspire to defraud and injure the person of Sam Fisher. There's a charge being placed against you for that. Charge? Why? why don't you whistle, Ainsley? Or is the turkey in the straw unhappy because he's going to be a jailbird? <laughs>
Yes. Six hundred on Calabash and a fork. Check. Yeah. 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 Y
You're sure our organization wants to spend this much, Mrs. Martin? Yes. We all voted at the same time we decided you would head the purchasing committee. I'm very proud you selected me. Even though I have a hunch my friend Mary Wesley talked you into it. <laughs> I'll work on this right away. We want to buy this home immediately, Blackie. The need is terribly urgent. Children's homes are miserably crowded. The real estate man said he'd hold the property only until tomorrow midnight. Good enough. Well, there's your receipt, Mrs. Martin. Thank you very much, Blackie. And here's the money in this envelope. $20,000. Oh, you didn't have to bring cash, you know. A certified check would have done just as well. I didn't know that. This is uh, all very new to me. Well, it's all right. Mrs. Martin, I'll go out and see about the purchase of that house tomorrow morning. Fine. And I'm going to try to get it for less than 20000 too. I'll phone you tomorrow and let you know how I make out with a real estate agent. Thank you. I'll be waiting to hear from you. Oh, uh, you won't be nervous with $20,000 in cash in your apartment, will you? I'll put it in the safe right now and uh, sit up all night long with a shotgun across my knees, Mrs. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Blackie. The children will appreciate what you're doing. Goodbye, Blackie. Goodbye, Miss Martin. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, back again, Mrs. Martin. Come in. Guess I ain't making an intrusion now, am I, Matt? Huh? Who are you? The guy to Boston up to pay you an anti-sociable call. A what? A call with an expression of business. Sorry if this is making an intrusion on you, Blackie. I used my etiquette and stood out in the hall till the old dame departed. Look, who are you and what are you... Oh. <laughs> I might have known... With every face like yours, there's a gun. Only the gun is always prettier. Sure, I'm sorry to do this to you, Blackie. I know it ain't polite to point, especially a gun. But a guy's got to make a livelihood and... Never mind the apologies. What do you want? First, I want to offer you a little friendly tip. The boss don't like the idea of you cutting in on his profits, and especially in such a crude manner. That's interesting. It's of great importance to the length of your long liberty, Blackie. Oh? The boss says you ain't flashing no rod in any of his wagering establishments anymore, or else you ain't living anymore. Hey, now, wait a minute. I hate you... to talk to you like this, Blackie, but I'm only working for a livelihood and imparting to you the boss's sentiments. And I'm also taking everything you got to sort of teach you a lesson. Look, you don't think... Don't don't me, Blackie. I sure hate to do this, but I, I know. Got... You have to make a livelihood. Yeah. And I don't want to have to impair your health in doing it. So keep your hands up while I see what's around. It... Ah, it's safe. And open, too. Nothing but papers in there. Maybe. Since you were so polite as to have the safe open, I'll be polite and take what's in it. Ah, jewelry. Blackie, you should be ashamed. You were kidding me. And this envelope looks interesting. Look, that envelope isn't mine. And what's in it is... Money. United States currency. Thanks, Blackie. You're extremely generous. Look, take everything else in the apartment, but leave that envelope. That's charity money. It doesn't belong to me. That's right. It belongs to my boss now. You take that money now, and I'm going to... Now, Blackie, don't get angry. I don't want to be harsh with you. So let you be likewise with me. So long, Blackie. Wait a minute. I'm warning you. If you take ah, that now, money, I'm going to... Blackie, be nice. Haven't I been nice and polite to you? Want more of anything, Blackie? Yeah. The waiter's looking over this way. Oh, no, Jane. So I guess I've had enough for one meal. <laughs> <laughs> You're cute, honey. Not enough for one. You had enough for three. Well, food's good for the soul. <laughs> mm, for everything but the figure. Yeah, nothing wrong with yours, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> See anything in the shops downtown that was good enough for you? Oh, lots of things, Blackie, but they were all so expensive. Oh, so what? They don't cost a lot. They aren't worth anything at all. Uh, here. Here's a couple of hundred. Get started with that. Oh, Blackie, thank you so much. Yeah, I was sure lucky to meet you almost the very day I came to town. Uh, you know, uh, after you spoke to me, I still couldn't believe you were Boston Blackie. Why not? Well, you look so different from the pictures I've seen in the newspapers. Oh, those pictures? <laughs> You don't think I'd let the newspapers get hold of decent pictures of me, do you, baby? Oh, I'm not that dumb. 
Now, uh, <clears throat> look, baby, I got work to do. Uh, suppose you run on downtown, do a little shopping, and then call me at my apartment, huh? <laughs> you know the phone number? No, I don't. Well, I'll write it down for you. What time should I call? Uh, late in the afternoon, say about five. Right. <laughs> here, here, here's the phone number. If there's no answer, look for me here at mealtime. I always eat here at Londo's. Thanks. What are you going to do today? I'm going to be busy. Oh, I see. Doing what the papers say you've been doing? Uh, what do you mean? Well, there were a few hints in the columns this week about you and those uh, horse room robberies. You don't say. Mm -hmm. The columns just hinted, Blackie. They didn't come right out and say you were the one. Well, I didn't see the columns this week. Well, maybe I'll have to catch up on my columns and with a few columnists. Now look, uh, don't phone me at five, baby. You better make it around seven. Oh, why so late, Blackie? Well, I have a special job to do this afternoon. A very special reason to get my hands on a lot of money. The teletype says there's been a horse room holdup, Sergeant. Uh, yes, Inspector Faraday. That's why I phoned you. The flash came in a minute ago, and the details are coming in now. Uh -huh. There's something about Boston Blackie. Blackie, huh? And he yelled he was robbed last night. What does the teletype say? Never mind, I'll oh. read it. Oh. It says, bedding room, 1119 Elm Street. Robbed at 318 this afternoon by masked and armed bandit who got away with an undetermined amount of cash after killing... Joey Hester, bookmaker, of same address. The killer escaped, but his identity is known. Before the killing, he boasted that he was Boston Blackie. I can't believe it, Inspector Faraday. You can't, and I don't want to. Well, there's something crazy here. Blackie himself was robbed last night, wasn't he? Mm, so he said. And when he said he wanted help, I believed him and had the detective bureau investigate. Oh, oh there's the end of the dispatch, Inspector. It's the end of more than that, Sergeant. I see what's happened. Blackie couldn't wait for the police to find the man who robbed him. That was charity money he lost. $20,000 of it. So he couldn't wait for us to find it. He had to go out and try to get it back by himself. And Blackie really did hold up that bookmaker. Yeah, and killed that bookie. Huh. Sergeant? Uh, yes, sir? This is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. But get on that teletype and send out a flash to pick up Boston Blackie. Dead or alive. <laughs> And now, back to Boston Blackie. A thief who boasts he is Boston Blackie successfully robs several bookmaking establishments. Afraid to go to the police for obvious reasons, one bookmaker tries to get even with Blackie by robbing him. In the loot taken from Blackie is $20,000, money belonging to a charity for which Blackie has promised to buy a children's home. Following this... Another bookmaker is robbed, and a bookie killed. The thief again brags that he is Blackie, and Inspector Faraday orders his men to capture Blackie, dead or alive. As we return to our story, Blackie is about to report on the missing money to the charity organization. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Here is a report on the purchase of the Manchester Charities Building by Mr. Boston Blackwell. <laughs> One moment, please. One moment. As you know, Boston Blackie has been doing charity work of all kinds on his own, all for a great number of years. Now I want him to acquaint you with the work he has done for us. Mr. Boston Blackie. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Martin, and ladies and gentlemen. You were generous to give me credit for my interest in charity, but you all know that Mrs. Martin gave me $20,000 of this organization's money with which I was to buy a place for homeless children. And you did it too, didn't you, Blackie? No, I'm sorry to have to report that I haven't purchased the property. Blackie, why haven't you bought the home? The man said he had to have the money by midnight tonight. Wasn't the $20,000 enough? It was quite enough, Mrs. Martin. But I didn't have the money. But I have a receipt proving I gave it to you. You did give it to me, Mrs. Martin. I don't deny that. But I don't have the money. It was stolen. But, Blackie, the police... The police, Mrs. Martin, don't believe it was stolen from me, I'm sure. 
In fact, they have other ideas about me. But I have until midnight to buy that house, and I'll have the money by then. Well, you'd better, or we'll be forced to turn you over to the police. Don't bother, Mrs. Martin. If I don't recover that money and buy that house, I'll turn myself over to the police. Six hundred on Queenie in the sixth. The you nuts that race was over ten minutes ago, and Queenie ran out. Hey, Pete. Yeah. Pete. Yeah, Carl. Come here, Pete. Grab this dough and take it into the boss. It's getting to be too much sleeve lying around loose. Sure. You're having a nice day with the suckers, huh? Every day's a good day as long as there are guys who think they can beat the horses. Get that dough into the boss, huh? Oh, sure. Sorry, I don't mean to be slow, but a lot of money makes me nervous. When I'm nervous, I'm slow. That's all right. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Haynes. Oh, come on in, Pete. Well, take for the day doesn't look bad. Now, have a peanut? Uh, no, no thanks, Mr. Haynes. They don't agree with me. Oh, that's too bad. You don't know what you're missing. Um, just put the money on the desk here. I'll put it in the safe after I come. Um, sure you don't want a peanut? No, no thanks. Okay. I see where our friend Blackie didn't learn a very good lesson from you, Pete. Yeah, I heard the bad tidings. He not only took a lot of hard-earned cash, but I understand he left Joey Hester deceased. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to. Just relax, you two. Nobody's going to get hurt. Boss, it's a stick-up again. This is getting monotonous, huh? Yeah, and I know who's behind that mask, too. Our friend Boston Blackie. Good guess, Haynes. Now I'll just take that. I hate dough. to do this to you, Blake. Hey, you fall on reach for your gun. Uh, most brave guys are dead, aren't they? Okay, Haynes, now I'll take your money. Go ahead, take it. Take the whole place if you want to. I'm getting out of here. Yeah, but not you're going where you stink. <laughs> the phone. I can only manage to get to the telephone. Operator? Get me the police. What? One moment, please. 23rd Precinct, Sergeant Sweeney. Sergeant, I've been shot by Boston Blackie. Hello. In all my Hello. life, I Hello. tried to be so nice and polite to everybody, too. You know, Faraday, it seems to me that I'm in this office of yours almost every day. I must like it here. Blanky, this is not the time to fool around. You're in trouble, and you know it. Yes, I know it. And what's worse than that, I know it. When you know anything, that's news, Faraday. But as usual, you're wrong. I didn't rob those bookies and I didn't kill anybody. Somebody's impersonating me. Will you stop trying to be funny? Faraday, that's the truth. You ought to know it. Look, Blackie, will you quit acting so innocent? This is tough enough as it is. I don't like any part of it. Well, I don't either. Especially this part. But, Faraday, I can prove what I'm saying. Give me a few hours' time. Nothing doing. I've heard that one before. Please, Faraday, just a few hours. No. Five hours. No. Four, three, no. Three. No, no, I said. Well, all right. Look, uh, I have to go into the next office in a minute. Go ahead, I don't care. Well, you better be here when I get back, you understand? Yeah. I understand. Yeah, and I want you to understand this, too. If you're not here when I get back, don't forget I can pick you up and... Say, uh, two hours. And once more, I will. Mm-hmm. Uh-oh, the phone. Okay, okay. Hello. Hello, Blackie. Yes? This is Jane. Who? Jane. Jane Powers. You told me to call your seven. I did? Blackie, what's the matter with you? Don't you remember? Well, um, 
uh, so much has happened today that I... Uh, who'd you say this was? Jane. Oh, Jane. Well, why didn't you say so? I did. You did? Yes. Well, the, the connection must have been bad. I I didn't hear you. I, I was hoping you'd call. Well, you asked me to. Oh, that's right. I did. Well, I'm glad you remember something. You know, but the funny thing about that paper with your phone number on it, though, is the one you gave me in the restaurant today. Uh-huh. I thought I wasn't going to be able to call you. Uh, why not? I lost the piece of paper, but I got your number from information. Wasn't I smart? Oh, I'm getting pretty smart myself. Where can I meet you? Well, do you think it's safe for us to meet? I, I mean, with the police and... Everything. Well, it isn't safe for me to go wandering around the streets, but I'm not far from the public library. Will it be safe for us to meet there? Yes, if we don't meet in the reading room. Uh, tell you what. I'll meet you on the west side of the library between the second and third partition. All right. At what time? Uh, between eight and nine. Between the second and third partition. Jane? Yes. How did you know my name? You were supposed to meet Boston Blackie here? You're not Boston Blackie. Uh, no, I'm not, Jane. That is uh, not the Boston Blackie you know. I don't understand. Well, let's say uh, Blackie sent me to bring you to him. Oh, well, in that case, that's different. Where is he? At, at home or at the restaurant? Which do you think? Well, he never wanted me to know where he lived. I, I've always met him at Londo's restaurant. Well, let's go then. But uh, first to a telephone. Telephone? Why? I have to call a friend. A friend named Faraday. <laughs> There's your Boston Blackie. Mm, it's an improvement. He always eats in this restaurant. He's the man sitting at that second table there by the wall. How did I ever get mixed up like this? Never mind. You stay here with Faraday, Jane, like a good girl, and nothing will happen to you, just as we promised. Okay. Blackie, are you sure you want to go over there and grab that guy alone? I've got the place surrounded by cops. But, uh... I have a personal interest in this guy, Faraday. Uh -huh. And you may be just a little too impersonal about the way you treat a killer. Let me have two minutes with him, and then you can have him for the rest of his life. Go to it. Yeah, and that won't be for long, either. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh. <clears throat> Mind if I sit down at your table? No, go ahead. Thanks. <sighs> Rather crowded in here, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. You know, your face is rather familiar. Do I know you? No. Oh, uh, oh, but I'm sure I do. I think you know me, too. Never saw you before. No? I'll bet you know my name. <laughs> Never heard it. Oh, yes, you have. You've used it. Huh? My name is Boston Blackie. That's your name, too, isn't it? Wait! I don't fall for the table. No, but you fall for this. You mean you will. <laughs> oh, yeah, you punk. Come on and get him, Faraday. Okay. Everything he has is yours. With the exception of a, a few dollars, I imagine. Yeah. I think he ought to pay his check. Even though he's checked out. Nice mess we're making of that guy's room, Blackie. I think he told the truth when he said the loot was stashed here. Yep, Barney. And here it is. All of it? Yeah, we'll have to count it. It'll take hours to do it. Phew, that's some pile of money. The whole wall must be full of it. Uh-huh, and don't forget, 20,000 of it is mine. Or oh, it would be Boston Blackie. admits he robbed Haynes, the bookie, and killed Pete. And it was Pete who robbed me. I know you've got 20,000 coming to you. You'll get it. And those kids will get their home, too, huh? Uh-huh. Say... Did you ever find out why that guy called himself Boston Blackie? Yeah, it was in his confession. He planned on leaving town after he was through here, and he thought if he used your name, the bookies themselves would get you if we didn't. Kind of cute, wasn't he? Well, that girl of his, that Jane, she was cute. She was dumb. Same thing. Cute, dumb. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't say that, Faraday. You wouldn't? No. For instance... 
You're not cute. <laughs> Side. Morning, Harry. <laughs> How's that fuss of yours? Still all in one piece, huh? Well, as far as you can tell, in one look, it's all in one piece. But I wouldn't want to have to pay a dollar for every nut and bolt it's dropped from Valley Junction to the main highway. Well, you ought to get the company to buy you a new bus, Harry. The drivers in the city get new buses. Uh, folks on my route wouldn't know me if I was to turn up with a new bus. How's business, I? Si? Oh, good. Always good this time of year. Have a store full of people nearly every day from sun up to sunset. Eh, sort of glad it's a little slow now. Yeah. You was out taking a little ride near my place yesterday, wasn't you, Si? I come to think of it, I was. Yeah. You don't recollect who you saw out in the orchard with me, do you? No, don't think I do. Well, now, that's being mighty smart of you, Si. Huh? Uh... Don't exactly get what you mean, Harry. I mean exactly what I said. You're being mighty smart, not recollecting who you saw out at my place yesterday. I don't remember seeing anyone. Yeah, well, now, that's just the thing to remember if anybody asked you. Because if you remember you did see somebody, and if you know who he was, why, there's no telling what will happen to you. You know what I mean? So long, sir. Telephone. That's what I'll do. Uh, 
Operator, this is Cy Gardner at the general store in Valley Junction. Get me the city, will you? I want to talk to a fellow named Boston Blackie. And now meet Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. <laughs> How many more miles to Cy Garden store, driver? Well, I tell you, Blackie, my run from the main highway through Cross Creek and Indian Hollow and Valley Junction, that's where Cy's store is, it's 18 miles and three quarters. Yeah? That's for bus. But as the crow flies, it's only six. Only six, huh? Yeah. Well, next time I think I'll come by crow. <laughs> <laughs> for bus or crow, Blackie, what's taking you to Valley Junction? Ain't there enough excitement for you in the city, or is it too much? Well, I had a phone call from Cy Garden yesterday afternoon said he was in some kind of trouble. I would have used my car to come out here, but it's in the garage. Yeah, well, it's just well you didn't use it, Blackie. After this bumpy road, <laughs> like snot would be in the junkyard. Well, this bus of mine ought to be. Cy Gardner in trouble, eh? Huh? Well, he sounded as if he were. Sure, he's mighty peculiar. Why, I've known Cy Gardner for, oh, 18 years come green up. He ain't never been in any trouble I heard of. But then, of course, Cy's the sort of fellow that keeps his trouble to himself, Blackie. Uh, pardon me, sir. You speaking to me? Yes. Did I hear the driver refer to you as Blackie? Uh-huh. That's, uh, that's Boston Blackie, of course. Yes. Well, allow me to introduce myself. I'm John Jeffrey Wells, president of the Farmers Finance Corporation. Traveling on business, of course. How do you do? I didn't expect to meet anyone so famous on the Buster Valley Junction. But, of course, when you travel, you never know whom you're going to meet. No, you never know whom or what you're going to meet, either. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the interesting things about travel. One of the reasons I like to travel, of course. Coming into Cross Creek. Anybody that wants out at Cross Creek gets off here. Well, looks as if we're picking up another passenger, and a pretty one, too. Uh, another of the interesting things about travel, Blackie. Of course. Is this the bus to Valley Junction? Yeah, it sure is. As long as it's going in this direction, it's going to Valley Junction. Okay. How much? Oh, you pay when you get off. Mm. Next stop, Indian Holler. Okay, if I plant myself next to you, mister? Sure, go ahead and plant yourself. Just don't grow on me. Well, <laughs> I can tell you aren't from the stick. <laughs> a handkerchief in the breast pocket means a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> well, my bandanas are the cleaners. <laughs> yes, you have an answer for everything, don't you? <laughs> Well, don't try to give me an answer for this, because it isn't a question. You're oh. getting off the bus right around this bend in the road, Boston Blackie. Oh, really? Who says so? Take a look at the two of us, me and this gun. Both of us mean business. Come on, Blackie, we're getting off this bus now. Hey, driver! Yeah? Uh, stop the bus, we're getting off. Hey, now, wait a minute, I don't... Blackie, t- don't be stop stubborn. I'm reasonable, but my gun is restless. Well, what have you got to say? Driver! Stop the bus! Okay, if you two want to get out in the middle of nowhere, it sure ain't none of my affair. Passengers get on and off where they want. Says so in my franchise. So long, Mr. Wells. Uh, look here, Blackie. If there's something I could do, I'd be glad to help you, of course. Uh, no, thanks, Mr. Wells. This is just an example of what we were saying about travel. You never know what's going to happen next. Uh, what do we owe you, driver? Why, dollar twenty for you. Nothing for the girl, I guess. Okay. There you are. If you see Cy Gardner in Valley Junction, tell him that I'll be there, all right, but a little late. Yeah, I'll tell him. Well, now what? Now, thanks, Blackie. Thanks so much for getting off the bus. Don't thank me. Thank you, Gun. I'm sorry I had to do that, but I just had to make sure you got off with me. Oh, I'll put the gun away. How's that? It's better, but still not so good. What do you want? Come on, let's walk up and get my car. It's parked near here, and I'll tell you on the way. My name's Marjorie Cleland. Nice name, but it means nothing to me. Look, Blackie, I, I want you to listen how I got myself in a jam. I'm listening. Well, now, you've got to help me, Blackie. The reason I got on that bus is because I knew you were on it. How'd you know that? I was inside Gardner's store when he phoned you, told you what bus to take and when to take it. So that's the background for us on a bus, huh? Yes. All right, let's have you... Okay, listen, sirens. Yeah. Look, police cars, and are they rolling? And we better start hopping. They're not sure. slowing down for anything. We better jump for the bushes. All right. The bushes are ruining my stocking. Well, 
that's nothing to what those police cars would have done to them and you. They didn't even see us. My best nylons, too. And my best friend is the reason you ruined them. What? Inspector Faraday of the Metropolitan Police was in the first squad car. Those were city police? Yes, men from the Homicide Bureau. wonder if they're going to Valley Junction or just late for a picnic. Well, I'll find out pretty soon. Let's have your story now, Marjorie. Um, I, I don't think I'll bother you with it, Blackie. Why not? Oh, I don't know. I just changed my mind. Okay, get moving, Blackie. Oh, no, not a gun again. You wouldn't want me to prove it was a gun. I'll take your word for it. What happens now? Now I'm getting in the car. But you're going to start walking. Not me. I'm allergic to footsteps. I think you'd be more allergic to lead. Start walking, Blackie. <laughs> Just been around the village, Inspector Faraday. Yeah? No one in Valley Junction heard the shot that killed Gardner. Thanks, Guggen. No one heard the shot, huh? Well, that could be. The sheriff figures Gardner was killed about four hours ago, so I guess everybody in town was taking a noontime nap, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Have we found anything in the store to hint why Gardner was killed? Well, it's a simple case of murder in the act of robbery, Guggen. Gardner's safe had been opened, and his cash register's empty. Mm. I guess we'll just... D- Hello, Faraday. Blackie, you. Yes, Faraday, me. Well, what's left of me after walking practically all the way from Cross Creek to Valley Junction? Walk it. <laughs> you look as if you've been crawling. Oh. Through a dust bowl, too. Never mind about me. What are you here for? You decided to go back to the farm where you belong? I'm here on business for the sheriff. What's the matter? Doesn't the sheriff want to be reelected? There's been a murder here, and the sheriff asked me to handle it for him because this county's never had a killing before. Don't tell me, Faraday. I know who the victim is. Cy Gardner. That's right, but how did you know? Because Gardner called me up yesterday, and he told me he was in trouble. When was he killed? About four hours ago. Huh. Doesn't make sense. What doesn't make sense? I was on the Valley Junction bus until a girl named Marjorie Cleland invited me to get off. I had the idea that she got me off that bus as a stall, but... That was only two hours ago. Look, I talked to everybody on that bus when it got here. And if you'd pay less attention to pretty girls and uh, more attention to what you start out uh, to skip do... Skip the lecture, Faraday. Uh. I still think that girl is connected with Gardner's murder in some way or other. Gardner was killed by someone who robbed him. It's that simple. Now, come on, I'll drive you back to town. Hey, uh, Guggen. Yes, Inspector? Lock this place up good and tight so nothing is touched before I send a special investigator out here. Right, Inspector. Come on, Blackie, I'll drive you back to town. Yeah, no, thanks, Faraday. I think I'll stick around. I'm going to find that Marjorie Cleland again. Look, will you quit wasting my time? Come on. I'll tell you what you can do, Faraday. What? I saw a rooms for rent sign about five miles down the road. You can drive me that far. Why do you want to stay? Do you like it here? No, but I would like to find out who didn't like Cy Gardner. <laughs> Oh, driver. Oh, hi, Mr. Wells. When do we make our next stop? Well, let's see. We left Valley Junction an hour ago. Next stop's Northville. Be there in about a minute, so. Uh, thanks. By the way, I noticed the police questioning you back at Valley Junction. Yeah, they sure did. Poor Cy Gardner. They questioned you, too, didn't they, Mr. Wells? Yeah, they questioned everybody on this bus. Though why they questioned us, I don't know. We were going toward Valley Junction, not away from it. The murderer would be doing. Yeah, I guess that's so. Poor Cy Gardner. Nice fella? Oh, the best. Well, I'm glad the police didn't hold us up too long. Yeah. I'd like to keep this bus on schedule. Yeah, of course. Who did it, Harry? Who killed Gardner? I don't know, Biggie. But I didn't, if that's what you're thinking. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. In fact, I was thinking you did it. Well, all out for Northville. Passengers for Northville, all out. <laughs> There's the rooms for rent sign. Stop here, Faraday. Uh, all right, Guggen. We'll let Blackie off here. Right, Inspector. Uh, thanks for the lift, Faraday. I'll solve the murder for you sometime. Yeah, we'll wait for you, Blanky. <laughs> there might not be a room. Then you'll have to walk all the way to the main highway. Don't bother. I understand it's fun sleeping in the hayloft anyway. It uh, must be. The mice never complain. Yeah? You have rooms for rent, don't you? 
I'm particular who I rent to. Who are you? Boston Blackie. Well, I have rooms for rent, but not to you. Well. <laughs> What's the matter, Blackie? Did she like your references? Go ahead and laugh, Faraday. <laughs> How could I help laughing when she slammed that door in your face? Come on, get in. I'll drive you to town. No, I'm staying, Faraday. Only this time by request. By request? What are you talking about? The three words on this little slip of paper right here that the woman just gave me. Maybe she slammed the door in my face, but look what she wrote on this piece of paper. Huh? Let me see it. Now, I'm sure you can read it, Faraday. It's just three simple words. It says, don't go away. And now, back to Boston Blackie. Blackie receives a phone call from Cy Gardner, storekeeper in the rural town of Valley Junction. But en route there by bus, he is met by Marjorie Cleland, who promises him a ride in her car, but changes her mind, pulls out a gun, and forces him to walk. Blackie arrives in Valley Junction to learn that Gardner has been murdered. He feels the girl had something to do with the killing, tries to rent a room in a farmhouse, and is refused. But the woman owner passes him a note telling him to stay. As we return to our story, Marjorie Cleland is in the farmhouse talking to the owner. You were a smart cookie, Mrs. Davis, setting Blackie away just like I told you. Somebody helped you up pretty good, didn't they? It was that gun you were holding that made me say what I did to Blackie. Hmm. That's what I meant. You were smart. Hey, this isn't a bad joint you got here. This is the kitchen, isn't it? Yeah. Is the kitchen so difficult to recognize? <laughs> well, gals like me don't ever have to know what a kitchen looks like. Um, where's your telephone? We don't have any. What? The nearest one is down at Cy Gardner's store at Valley Junction. But the police have that store padlocked since Cy got knocked off. Now what do I do? I'm sure that's no concern of mine, young lady, but I have my chores to do and I'm going to do them. Oh? This I gotta see. Hey, what was that? What was what? Noise at the back door. It sounded like somebody fooling with the lock. I didn't hear a thing. Oh. Must be getting nerved. Well, go on, Mrs. Davis. Go ahead with those chores. You were... Hello. Nobody at the door, huh? It's you, Blackie, that's gone. Come get her, Blackie. I've got her arm. Oh, thank you very much. I'll take that gun, young lady. I've got her. There we are. Thank you. How did you know to come back here after this dame sent you away, Blackie? She held a gun in back of me, Blackie. That's why I had to tell you to go away when you knocked at the door. I figured that from the note. Well, Marjorie, what goes on? What's the score? You're supposed to be smart. Figure it out. Okay. Let me see. You got me off the bus so that you could keep me from getting to Gardner's store. Then, while I was talking to you, the police cars came by, heading in the direction of Valley Junction. How am I doing? The mouth is moving and words are coming out, but they don't mean a thing. I think they do. Yeah, I'm beginning to like this now. Mm. When the police cars came by, you knew they'd get to Valley Junction in a hurry, so there was no reason to keep me away. You didn't want anybody there, did you? Why don't you turn around? I don't want a yawn in your face. Oh, I'd like to fetch her a slap where it would do the most good, Blackie. Not now, please. I want to get on with this. I think you wanted the bus to reach Valley Junction before anybody got there. And the reason could be that you and whoever murdered Cy Gardner are working together. What do what you are mean, you talking Blackie? about? Yeah, yeah, this is making sense. The murderer dropped something at the scene of the crime, realized it later when he was away, and then had to get back to Valley Junction before the murder was discovered and had to make sure nobody got there first. But Faraday didn't find whatever he left. So I'm going back there right now. You. Hmm? Where are the keys to your car? Here they are. Catch. Thanks. You're being very cooperative. Mm hmm? It's being smart. Try driving the car and see what happens, Blackie. There isn't a spark plug in the engine. I took them all out and hid them. Thought maybe you'd try something fancy. Cute kid. Why don't you try forcing me to tell you where I hid them? The idea sounds like fun, but I've got work to do, right? Um, Mrs. Uh, Davis. Uh, Mrs. Davis, where's your telephone? Oh, I don't have any, Blackie. The nearest one is at the gardener's store. Oh, fine, fine. How do I get there? Oh, that bus you were on comes back this way in about an hour. That isn't too bad. I'll wait. I tried walking there once, and I didn't like it. But the bus driver will be going in the opposite direction, Blackie. That's what he thinks. 
And if the driver doesn't want to turn around, we'll find out how he likes walking. Hey there. Uh, you in the bus. Stop, will you? Stop. Yeah? What is it, Blackie? Turn the bus around. We're going where you just came from. Oh, sorry. You can't do it, young fella. This bus runs on a schedule. Subject to change without notice. I'm getting in. Yeah. Close the door and swing the bus the other way. I guess maybe you're looking for trouble, Blackie. Well, I'm glad to convenience you that way. I'm going to knock you up. Wait. Are you kidding? Uh, Yeah. Oh. More people are getting hurt in cars these days. Oh, well, I guess I can drive this thing to Valley Junction. Only I shouldn't have hit this guy so hard. Now I've got nobody to talk to. Yes? Mr. Boston Blackie? Yes. Did you get uh, the call through to the city? Yes, sir. We're ready now with Inspector Faraday at police headquarters. Well, you're ready and I'm ready, so what are we waiting for? Just a minute. Go ahead, Inspector Faraday. Hello? Hey, Faraday, this is Blackie. I'm up here at Gardner's store in Valley Junction. Good. Stay there. Now, don't get cute. I've been trying to reach you for an hour. Where have you been? I've been feeding the pigeons in the park, uh, but I saw a couple of squirrels and they asked for you. It's a good thing they didn't get too close to you or you'd never have come back. Yeah, very Faraday, funny. listen to me, will you? I've found something here at Gardner's store. You found a padlock on the door and the windows boarded up. How did you get in and why did you? Because I thought there was some kind of a tie-up between this place and the bus trip I took. I was looking for something here in the store and I found it. What was it? Part of a cufflink. It's right here on the counter right beside the telephone. And, uh, guess what else there is here? Why should I guess? You ought to know. Three bags of what you're going to. Seed. What, what you're going to But, uh, skip that. Faraday, I want you to do something. Look in your files and see if you can find someone who looks like that John Jeffrey Wells character. That cufflink belongs to him. Now hurry. Hurry, he says. If I listen to you, Blackie, I'd be hurrying the rest of my life. Good. Then it wouldn't last so long. Oh, I don't know why I do these things. Hang maybe, Blackie, one of these days I'm going to stop doing what you ask. Hang it up, or I'll give it to you right here. Hello, Wells. You'll be doing exactly what you Want me to ask. hang up the phone, huh? Are you okay. listening to me? Did you have a nice chat with Inspector Faraday? Oh, as nice as usual. I didn't mean to eavesdrop, Blackie, but I was standing in the doorway, and I overheard everything you said, of course. Does everybody in this neighborhood carry a gun? What's the matter, Wells? Don't you want me to know what Inspector Faraday is going to find out about you? I can tell you everything Faraday can tell you. But will you? Why not? Don't move, Blackie. Well, I'll tell you what Faraday's going to find out. But it's not going to do you any good. Uh-huh. Just knowing you killed God, you know, uh, won't make me happy. I'm such a curious fellow, I always want to know why. I'll tell you why. Because he recognized me. Any crime in that? I went to prison for a crime once. I didn't like the place, so I left it without benefit of parole 15 years ago. Well, you've been in hiding a long time, haven't you? I've been hiding as an important and legitimate businessman for 15 years. But when I came to visit my brother the other day, Cy Gardner saw me and recognized me. I had to kill him to keep him from talking. And I robbed the store as a cover-up. You came here to visit your brother? Yeah, me, Blackie. Oh, uh-huh. so Mr. Wells, you and the bus driver are brothers. Don't tell me Marjorie is your sister. No, Marjorie's a girl from the city I hired for the occasion. What occasion? The occasion of your arrival in Valley Junction. You knew I was coming? Oh, yes. And on what bus, too? (laughs) See, I was listening at the window when Harry here talked to Cy about recognizing me. Oh, I see. Or do I? You didn't try to keep me away before the murder. It was after the murder. Was that because you knew you'd drop this cuffling? Uh Uh-huh. And I wanted to get here before you did. I get it now. When Marjorie saw the police cars go by, she realized there was no use in stalling me. Too bad the police locked up the store after they left, or you could still have picked up the evidence I found. Well, instead, I'm picking you up. Bus already, Harry? Yeah, it's ready, Biggie. 
Oh, Biggie, is it? Yes. Or uh, do I still call you Mr. Wells? You won't call me anything in a little while. Harry, we're taking a special passenger for a special trip to the main highway. Yeah, a special delivery. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot to both of you. Nice of you to give me a lift. I hope you like it, Blackie, because it's the last thing you're going to get from anybody. <coughs> Can't we make better time? It's two hours since we left Valley Junction. You want me to skid off the road and pile up in a ditch, Biggie? The rain's made this road slippery as weak molasses. Take your time, Harry. I'm in no hurry. No, I guess you ain't, Blackie. But I got news for you. Another mile and we're at the highway. One more mile. Your last one, Blackie. Of course. But why are you bothering to take me all the way out to the highway to kill me, Wells? I could have died just as dead in Valley Junction. And it's so peaceful in the country. Too close to home back there, Blackie. We're going to knock you out, put you on... Sirens, Harry. I hear sirens. Yeah, so do I. If you hadn't been so busy talking, you would have heard them before. Look at what's coming around the turn up there ahead, a police car. They won't want us. They have no reason. Just slow down and they'll go by. That's what I was going to do, Biggie. Really? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm yanking the bus into the... Hey, 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 let go of That bus was pulled into the ditch on purpose, sir. Look out. Piggy might be in there with a gun. He's he's in here with a gun and a bump on his head, Faraday. Relax. Frankie. Frankie, you all right? Yes, as long as you don't, don't take my driver's license away from me for this. I dumped this crate into the ditch. Nice going. Uh, but look, it's a lucky thing for you. There was something wrong with that phone in Gardner's store. There wasn't anything wrong with it. There wasn't. Now, how could I hear everything you and Biggie said after he made you hang up? How? You remember those bags of seed I told you were on the counter next to the telephone? Yeah, so what? So instead of hanging up the receiver, I just leaned it against one of the bags so you could hear what was going on. Biggie thought I hung it up when he told me to. Well, I'll be... Well, I checked our files and found Wells was Biggie. Now we've got him and his brother. But where's the girl? Probably still at Mrs. Davis's rooming house. Oh, she'll be a cinch to pick up. Look, Faraday, you better open the door and get inside this bus. Get inside? What for? You don't know what for? No. You're soaking wet. Well, at last you proved it, Barney. Proved what? You don't even know enough to come in out of the rain. (laughs) 